This story comes to us from absurd and nihilistic, yet another new manager facing the consequences of their action story. Let's jump right in. I'll keep the details vague as possible because I'm still with this organization. I work for a government department. We have offices and locations all over the state. I'm based out of a city that's a two and a bit hour train ride to our head office. At the time, I was working in a team that had members working remotely all across the state, looking after policy, process, and quality assurance. Our old manager had gone and gotten himself promoted for being genuinely brilliant at his role. So our new manager, Steve, was hired in from the glorious world of banking, and he was here to whip us lazy public servants into shape. A few days after he began his role, he called us all to a teleconference to inform us he wanted all of us to be at the head office 8 a.m. tomorrow morning for an all-day in-person team meeting. He wanted to see us in meet space to size us up, understand what we were doing, and see where we weren't keeping up with the private sector. As I mentioned, due to the nature of the work we were doing, we were all across the state. So in person, whole team meetings were rare, and if they occurred at all, they were booked weeks in advance. We were all adept at video conferencing long before COVID. Some of us tried to tell our new high flyer manager that almost none of us were in the same city as him, and to be there on such short notice would mean travel expenses, meal allowances, overtime, etc. He didn't seem to care and told us in no uncertain terms to just be at the head office tomorrow at 8 a.m. before abruptly hanging up. Now, I should explain something. I'm one of a handful of union delegates in our department. I know our award back to front. Specifically, the sections dealing with travel, allowances, and overtime. So I engaged malicious compliance mode. If Steve wanted us there, fine, but it'll cost him. So I quickly went about emailing my team what Steve had done by requiring us to be in the head office at 8 a.m. and what to do. Because we'd have to travel outside our normal work hours, our workday clock started ticking the moment we left our homes and only stopped once we got home. Some of our team traveled overnight. They were entitled to overtime travel, a dinner allowance and accommodation for the night, and the same returning. As someone traveling in the morning before 7 a.m., I was entitled to a breakfast allowance, lunch allowance, and if I got home after 9 p.m., a dinner allowance also. So I left my house at 5 a.m. to catch the only train that would get me there in time. The train was running slightly behind, but I made it in time. So my first three hours of my workday down and I'd done no work. After a brief period of us introducing ourselves to Steve, he proceeded to spend the next four hours telling us about all of the things he did at the bank, how he made so much money for them, where they'd sent him as a holiday bonus, how we're all stuck in the past in the public service, the work he'd seen wasn't up to private sector standards, etc. He had all the cocksureness of a finance bro who had always failed upwards because others had picked up his slack. By 3 p.m., my entire team were into overtime pay territory, and Steve was just warming up with his non-charm offensive. About three hours go by with Steve verbally patting himself on his back, deeply in love hearing his own voice, but all I hear is cha-ching, cha-ching. Steve decided that 5 p.m. was a good time to finish up. He stopped mid-sentence, looked at his watch, and unceremoniously said, that's all for today, go home now, and walked out. After I and a few others gave a few awkward shrugs to each other, we all packed up and started to make our separate ways home, after doing no work all day. I myself got to the train station pretty quickly and saw a train was leaving soon that would get me home around 8 p.m. Or I could catch the all stations train and get home closer to 9.30 p.m. You know what? No matter how fast I could run, I just couldn't catch that earlier train. Darn, I just have to catch that all stations train and be on the clock for another hour and a half. Plus, have my dinner paid for. Such rotten luck. I submitted my claims the next day, four and a half hours at double rate, my train tickets, my taxi fares to and from the train station, my breakfast, lunch, and dinner allowances. For me alone, it was close to a $500 expense claim. The rest of my team followed suit and ensured they claimed everything too. 
Steve tried to fight us on approval for the claims, but quickly learned that unlike in the world of banking, most public servants are union, and we'd raise living heck if he denied our award guaranteed allowances. His all-day Steve Fest symposium blew a good $6,000 hole in his budget. Needless to say, while Steve was our manager, he never required us to attend an in-person meeting again. Video conferencing was just fine. He only lasted six months before leaving for new opportunities. He just went back to his old job at the bank. Guess he was the one who couldn't keep up. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, there's one from a user called W. Nichols. It says, Steve's biggest mistake was not understanding the climate of your department and prejudging everyone as knowing nothing. Arrogance is the reason some leaders aren't adaptable. But as long as Steve stays in his lane at the private company that allows him to blame his shortcomings on employees, he'll prosper in ignorance. It seems to me Steve's whole personality was, I am so special and my crap don't stink. He really did embody the term seagull management. He flew in, he made a lot of noise, he crapped all over everything, and then he took off again. This story comes to us from Sarah Sill. You want to send me home? Sounds good. Let's jump right in. So I was a sarcastic and easily annoyed guy in my 20s, and this often didn't help me get along with older or corporate types. I was working at a certain pumpkin-colored big box home improvement store one spring, in the flooring department. It was just starting to get warm out and the store didn't have much AC. So I was looking forward to a magical date where certain employees were allowed to switch their pants for shorts. Problem is that we had a new department manager, I'll call him Dick, who was aggressively chasing a promotion to assistant manager, then store manager. He thought he could accomplish that by being a super by the book hard butt and being relentlessly metrics focused. This translated into a manager who was a know-it-all, micromanaging dick. Anyway, I'm scheduled to open at 5am on the fabled day of cooler bottom wear, and I walk in all light and airy and bare-legged. Dick, who was an overnight manager the previous night, saw me and threw a fit. Why are you out of uniform? He asked. I'm not. I can wear shorts starting today, I proclaimed. Not your position in your department. Who told you that you could? He retorted. The employee's handbook and standard operating procedures? I can show you if you don't believe me, I offered. I know the SOP, and your department doesn't get to wear shorts. That's only garden. Go home and change right now. He demanded, face getting redder from my defiance. Okay, Dick, if that's how you want to play it, I'll be back in an hour, I sighed. Maybe the loss of an hour of pay will teach you something. So I know better. The reason I know better is because I'm one of the weirdos who actually read the entire standard operating procedure document. The employee handbook, which is actually just a subsection of the standard operating procedures, and I really hate being wrong. So I checked the SOP before doing anything different day to day. In my store, the SOP was like invoking God. If the SOP said so, that won every single argument. So I go home, change into pants, but bring my shorts back to work with me. By now, Dick's shift is over, and I ask the new morning manager on duty, Darren, to meet with me. Why? What's up? Oh, just an SOP issue. Oh, okay. Give me like 10 minutes. So I swung by my desk and printed out several things. One, my latest pay stub that included my official job title and department number. Two, the company directory that listed the department names and their associated numbers. Three, the standard operating procedure that dealt with when and which departments and employees can wear shorts. Four, the annual email from the regional VP confirming which departments could wear shorts starting when, which also included the line, and this letter is to be posted at the time clock between the dates of this and this. Five, the SOP detailing the company transportation and mileage reimbursement policy. Six, a Google Maps route that mirrored the route I take to and from work with the total mileage highlighted. So I meet with Darren and explained what happened and handed him each page in turn as they became relevant. At the end, we agreed that I was right on every single account, and asked me what I wanted. 
One, I wanted the time. I was turned away before I could clock in, so I wanted to be paid starting at 5 a.m. Feel free to check the CCTV if you want to confirm when I arrived. Two, I want the mileage, because Dick sent me on essentially a company errand with my own vehicle through no fault of my own. Three, I want this letter posted at the clock like it says it's supposed to be. Four, I want you to talk to Dick about this, because I told him this was the SOP before he sent me home. Five, I'm changing back into my shorts. All of that sounds more than fair. Get the paperwork for the clock adjustment and mileage to me today and I'll sign it. The letter mysteriously went missing from the time clock the next day, but I replaced it every day until I happened to see Dick angrily snatch it off the board and throw it away. I reported that as well and the letter stopped going missing. He didn't talk to me much and I was transferred to another department a month later, so all in all, win-win I think. This is another example of a person who has absolutely no business being in a management position. One of the hallmarks of a good manager is somebody who can look at what they said, admit their mistakes, and then make the changes needed to make things right. Crapping on people all day doesn't make you a good manager, it makes people resent you. And once your employees resent you, well, there's really no coming back from that. This story comes to us from Rugby Player 96. Doesn't matter if the case is closed or not. Okay then, let's jump right in. I work in a call center that primarily deals with the public, with issues or queries they have, and whilst we can deal with a lot ourselves, there are a lot of things we must either log for another department to look into or transfer them across to that department. For example, if someone calls about a broken street lamp, they get transferred across to the street lighting team. But if someone calls about a pothole, we have to log it for the highway team to fix it. Some departments don't have an internal number for the caller to get transferred across to or a number we can call to speak to that department. And one of those departments is the enforcement department. Of all the systems and departments we use and liaise with, the trickiest one we deal with is the enforcement system. Basically, ranging from food safety to the environment, there were multiple teams that enforced things, and all of these issues had to be logged on this system. For example, if someone called to report their neighbor for being too loud, that had to get logged on the system for the noise enforcement team to investigate. But we had to arrange for letters to be sent out about it. If someone reported an abandoned car, we logged it, and the environment enforcement team went out to investigate. If someone said they got food poisoning from a restaurant, we logged it, and the food safety team investigated it, and so on. The reason why it was so tricky was because if you missed a step, it didn't get logged properly, and it didn't go to the correct team, which meant that someone would complain to your manager about it. And crucially, this was a legal system, which meant that if the issue escalated to court, whatever you wrote in your notes could be used in the court proceedings. This wasn't a second nature, eyes closed kind of system. You needed to be concentrating because something you log can bite you in the butt a month later. For example, when someone calls to say that they haven't received a letter and it turns out you didn't send it in the first place. The way it worked was that a case was logged, which meant that it was open and it got assigned to an officer like pulling a name out of a hat. And throughout the time that it was open, if someone called back to give you more information about the case, you could update it, and that update went directly to the investigating officer. And then, when the investigation had finished, the case was closed by that officer. Basically, once a case was assigned to an officer, they had to see it through from start to finish. Whether it was deciding if a noise complaint was justified or going through black bags that were reported as fly tipping to see if they could find anything that tied someone to that rubbish and so on. It wasn't as simple as that though because there were cases that had been open for years with multiple updates. There were multiple cases that had been opened and closed between the same properties for the same reasons. Or someone had called about something and you weren't 100% sure it should be logged or not, etc. I'm not sure how my colleagues dealt with those situations, but whenever I got a call like that, I just emailed the investigating officer just to explain the situation and ask for advice and CC'd in their colleagues just in case the investigating officer was off. Or 
I just emailed the team to ask if they wanted me to log it as a new case or not. Since if it was an ongoing situation with multiple cases for the same thing, many officers may have dealt with it and they may have not wanted me to log it as a new case. I didn't see an issue with it because they either emailed me back with an answer or they didn't reply but logged it themselves after they'd looked into it. But one day, I got a thorny email from a thornier senior environmental officer, basically telling me off and telling me not to send them emails anymore because the system was there to be used. I emailed him back, explaining that it wasn't that simple because there were tricky cases that I needed help with and I didn't want to update an old case or log a case if I didn't need to, to not unnecessarily add to the caseloads of the officers. And he replied back, reiterating that I shouldn't send any more emails, and finished it off by telling me to either update the case whether it was open or closed, or open a new case. Q malicious compliance. From that day forward, I did not send another email. If I got a call about an issue, and the last time the issue was raised was in 2017, I updated the 2017 case. If I was on the fence about logging something as a new case or not, I just logged it anyway. If I checked the last case and the investigating officer had left, I updated it anyway. I was unaware of this, but when I told people that the investigating officer would call them back like they typically did after we asked them to in our updates, they would call us a couple of weeks later to ask why they hadn't received a call, and my colleagues would have to raise a new case for them because the one I updated was closed. The officers also suddenly had an influx of new cases, because every time I updated a closed case, it reopened, which added to their caseload. The system they used worked on dates and caseloads. For example, if I asked them to call someone or inspect a property in my update, the system generated a time frame for them to complete that action by. But if they were too busy to do something I'd asked them to do, it went red, which counted against them. Also, for example, if they had four cases open and then they closed three and they'd gone down to one, they'd go back up to four again if I updated three of their old cases. So based on the system, they were not doing their jobs properly because they constantly had open cases. This put their stats through the floor. This went on for ages, and one day I was hauled into an office by my manager, and waiting for me was his manager, the senior enforcement officer. His manager, an HR advisor for me and HR. They told me that I was doing call avoidance, gross misconduct, purposefully misadvising callers and not triaging calls correctly. From what they were saying and the paperwork they had with them, I knew it was a you're fired meeting. HR asked me if there was anything I wanted to say. So I looked at the enforcement manager, pointed at the senior enforcement officer and said, he told me to do it. The enforcement manager looked at me, looked at the senior enforcement manager, looked at me again, and then asked me to clarify what I meant. I explained it all from start to finish, making it clear that when I was sending emails, I always asked for advice and offered to log a case for the enforcement team if they wanted me to, and that before the email from the senior enforcement officer, my emails either were not replied to, but someone logged it for me, or someone replied to me to tell me to log a new case or to not log a new case. The enforcement manager sighed and then asked me if I could send him that email, so I quickly left, went back to my desk, sent the email thread to him, and came back into the office. He read the email, sighed deeper than he did before, and then asked us all to leave, but asked the senior enforcement officer to stay. And I left with a massive crap-eating grin on my face because I knew that I would keep my job. The fallout was pretty big because the IT team had to go in and manually close all the open cases so that the stats for the enforcement officers would go back to normal. The payroll department had to backdate all the months that the stats were messed up so that the performance bonus matched what would have happened had I not put their stats down. I didn't know they had performance bonuses until afterwards, and the senior enforcement officer got demoted to an enforcement officer based on their new email signature. A couple of weeks later, when the enforcement manager was less busy, he emailed me to basically say that he gives me permission to go back to emailing the enforcement team about cases, but I should use my own judgment. 
if I think I could justifiably get away with not logging something on the system, as in I could explain to my manager why I didn't think I should have logged it, then I shouldn't log it. And that logic would cut down the amount of emails I had to send to the enforcement teams. No one got fired, but someone got demoted and a lot of work happened in the background to fix what I did. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called your wise old friend. It says, when the higher ups tell you something, make sure to meticulously document that fact and to keep copies of it so that you can refer to it. They will mercilessly plow you into the ground if it suits them in the moment. So you keep records and should the need arise, you point at the person responsible and say, he or she made me do it. Upon which statement you produce the goods. If it's not up to you to question management, it's not up to you to suffer the consequences of their decisions. This is something that we've mentioned in many previous videos, that when you're told to do something that just doesn't sound right, no matter what it is, ask your boss to give it to you in writing. There's a couple of things that will happen when you ask this. Either they look at what they told you and realize that they've made a mistake and they change it, or they give it to you in writing and you have backup when the crap hits the fan always cover your butt. This story comes to us from Dark Altar 2000. Leave the floor wet? All right, enjoy your rotten wood. Let's jump right in. First time posting here because I just remembered this incident. Back in the early 2000s, my mother, 40 female, worked as a cleaner for a couple places and took me, 13 male, with her to help. One place we worked for was the only real estate place in town. We cleaned up before the people who worked there got in. When I started there, it was small and somewhat dirty. Old smelly cubicle partitions in faded brown, off-color walls, ingrained dirt in the linoleum. We cleaned and I literally couldn't tell the difference after we were done, except the mirror in the washroom not having any spots on it, and the floor being wet from the fresh mopping. Then, the town started becoming a cottage town, and it is decided that they will move to a nicer place. Cottagers must find the griminess a little off-putting. New place had a bit more space, brand new blue cubicle partitions, newly painted walls that still smelled the first day I cleaned in there, and a cheap hardwood panel floor. That floor was a bit of a problem. See, before, when we mopped, we would just leave the water to dry on the linoleum. We could do that because we got there at 6.30, and they opened at 7.30. The place was small enough that it was mopped by around 7 o'clock, before we left and would mostly be dry by the time people arrived. If we did the same thing for this cheap wood floor, my mother was worried we would have water seep into the cracks between the wood panels and rot them. So a new method for mopping was devised. First, I dunk the mop, then ring the mop lightly, mop up, ring the mop again, but fully this time, and then mop up as much of the excess water as possible. This new method actually visibly got a lot more water off the floor. By the time we left, some of the earlier mopped areas would look mostly dry. Good solution, mom. Couple weeks into the new place, my mother gets contacted by the manager and a new order comes in that we are not to dry the floor. I asked if she explained why we dried it, she had. I found this order a bit baffling at the time and it only occurred to me today the reason why he ordered this. The manager got in earlier than everyone else at about 7.15, so I actually saw him a few rare times when we ran late. The old floor would have still been visibly wet in the old place when he got in. The new floor was now dry when he got in. Ipso facto, we must have decided to skip mopping to leave early. Even though I didn't understand at the time that he thought we weren't doing our job, I, of course, found this new order stupid. I thought, he wants the floors wet when he gets in? Fine. Cue malicious compliance. You see, I did the mopping while my mom cleaned the washroom because I was a young strapping lad, and she was mom, so I did what she said. I now had a standing order from the boss to leave a wet floor, and by gum, it was gonna be sopping. From that day forth, not only did I not dry the floor, I now didn't even wring the mop after dunking it. I dipped it in the water and just let water slop off the mop as I pulled it directly out of the bucket. There was no way this was going to dry before he got in. Probably not for an hour after he got in either. 
two weeks after I started doing this, lo and behold, the wood paneling is already starting to separate at the seams. Dirt is accumulating between tiles. It proves impossible to remove. I was a bit shocked at the time how fast that had happened. Four weeks into the new mopping routine, the floor was rotting. Was my mother psychic or what? It was apparently very cheap fiberboard with a paper thin plastic wood grain pattern on it. I would have guessed a laminate wood grain on top of a semi waterproof fiberboard if you'd asked me four weeks ago. The floor now had visible divots and lines where the plastic paper sank into the deteriorating wood underneath. These trap dirt in them as well. How classy. The floor, not even two months after they had moved into the place, was even worse than the old beat up linoleum one. At this point, I asked my mother if we should start drying the floor, and wouldn't you know it, she had already asked. The answer was no, leave it wet. Baffling. We cleaned there for another month or so. I barely felt safe walking on the floor, as it was now a tripping hazard, with warped parts popping up. It was also disintegrating. Splinters of wood would pop up every time I swept. The floor now had the dubious distinction of being the worst floor I had seen in a place that wasn't dilapidated. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Myros. It says, nice one. I have to wonder though, was there never any feedback because of that rotting, warped, ugly floor? Manager and or employees clearly would have had the same issues moving across it as you and felt it was unsafe and unhygienic. Guess that guy went to a top-notch manglement university then, didn't want to go back on his previous order, and accepted his fate with the destroyed floor. Any clue if the floor got changed at some point? OP responded to the comment and said, It was a real estate place, so after we stopped cleaning there, I never had the occasion to go back. They must have fixed it at some point though. At minimum, just putting down rugs or something, it would be insanity to just leave it like that. So just think about this, you're a new couple, you're deciding to get your first house. You walk into the real estate agent's office and the floor is falling apart. If they can't even keep their office from going into disrepair, what does that say about the houses that they're trying to sell? I would have absolutely no trust in these people at all. This story comes to us from Chia Seed Mess. Your trash cans may only be out at specific times. Let's jump right in. We live in an HOA, and if you don't, lucky you. We have never had any real problems. They don't do much other than make sure the park and gardens look good. Anyhow, for whatever reason, they decided to add a new rule. It wasn't needed, but I guess they got bored and wanted something to do. Maybe someone kept leaving their trash cans out all week. Fine, just ask them not to. It's not that hard. The new rule states when trash cans can be put out. They can't be put out before 6 a.m. on Wednesdays and must be put back before 6 p.m. the same day. This is obviously stupid and has a few problems. First of all, some people use a different company. The HOA provided one goes on Wednesday and it's cheap so most people use it, but you don't have to. Some people have theirs go Monday or Tuesday. Also, a lot of people here work in the medical field and just aren't home during those times. So no one is there to put out or bring in cans. So a few of us got together on how to comply, but be annoying about it. We decided to comply with their set times as best we can. Take it out at 6 when a lot of us go to work or go for a morning walk. And take it back in at 6 since most of us are home. Some of us help by taking others' bins to the street if they're at work. But when it is time to take out the trash, do it as loud as effing possible. Bin has wheels? Drag it. Got it to the street? Make sure it's firmly placed on the street. Need to take out other bags? Slap it in there and let the lid slam shut. For those who have trash go out on other days, comply with the times, but do it on your trash day. Then, also put them out on Wednesday as required. If you can, leave trash in them and leave the lid open too. It would bake in the sun all day. Yes, it did smell like hot trash. That's the point. After three weeks of this, an email was sent out. The rule was thrown out, and we were all simply asked to put out and take in our cans within a reasonable amount of time, preferably on trash day. 
Was it really that effing hard to ask nicely? Why not just address whoever was the problem? Know that because an HOA rule was changed, a lawyer was paid to look over it before the CCNR could be updated. That means this stupid rule cost every resident money. Anyhow, we are already planning on voting out one member of the board who we know is the problem come the summer election. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called SonginHeart17 that I completely agree with. It says, The strangest part of this whole story to me, as somebody who doesn't live in the US or an HOA, is that you have different days for garbage pickup. My city contracts with one company to manage the collection for the whole city, covered by taxes. Yep, I didn't really understand this one myself because my city does a contract with one company and they pick up everything in the whole city. Although we do have to pay two bucks a bag, which kind of sucks. Another way that OP could have complied in this case would have been to get everybody together and put all their garbage on one front lawn during those pickup times, but just having a massive pile of it right there on one property. That would have been hilarious. This story comes to us from Land in the Sky. Manager tried throwing me under the bus, so I showed everyone her incompetence. Let's jump right in. I recently worked from a toxic workplace as a data analyst at a startup. It was promising at the start, but not long after, I noticed many red flags, including the fact that my manager had absolutely no data analysis or management experience prior to being promoted. How can you manage analysts without knowing basic Excel functions? I ignored those red flags and trusted her leadership because I liked the company's goals. Little did I know, this would be the worst decision ever. I basically did all the work for the team for the whole year I was there. When I ran the numbers for reporting and analysis of team performance, she always asked me to dumb it down so she can present it to high-level management. I thought everything was going well because I only got good feedback from her and the rest of the team. About a month ago, a coworker who I don't get along with made a complaint about me, which was absolutely untrue. Manager believed it without investigating, and all of a sudden, I was placed on a performance improvement plan. She spouted all types of lies to HR, and when I refuted those claims with written evidence, they doubled down and started gaslighting me. You're just too negative. I refused to sign and was threatened with termination. So I complied and started building a case against them. I knew she was doing the performance improvement plan to terminate me as she looked for internal candidates to replace me in secret because she was dumb enough to set the meeting up beside me. Once I signed my contract for a new job, I did basically F all and started working from home. Before my resignation, she asked me to do some reporting for her, so I ran the numbers and sent her the raw data, told her where the files were located, and that she can analyze the data and make the presentation herself. Since she's the data analyst manager, she should know how to do it. She tried reporting me for that, but ultimately it backfired because they asked her if the work that I did was actually wrong, and was forced to admit she didn't know what she was looking at. Everyone else in the team was questioned, and I believe they are now being audited by an external investigator. Credibility destroyed. I'm now working for a manager who is competent and has clear goals for the team. But that was a hell of a ride. Small win against toxic management. But a win is a win. Jumping down to the comments on this one, there's one from a user called CABird78. It says, Good thing the data doesn't lie, unlike your former boss. I bet she's now Googling Excel functions for beginners. It kind of makes you wonder how unqualified people get promoted into positions like this when they don't know what they're doing at all. I'd have to assume that in their previous position they were probably riding somebody else's coattails, and it was only a matter of time until they were found out and brought down. This next story comes to us from Dubalendar. No refunds once you've stepped out of the store? Fine, I won't step out of the store. Let's jump right in. This happens in a large store in a European country. When you purchase something from them and for any reason want to return the item, their policy is that they never give money back. They only give you a voucher redeemable the same day only. I went to the store today and purchased quite a long list of items. I got home, my wife looks at them and says we don't need some of them. 
I go back to the store barely 20 minutes pass. The returns manager smiles at me as I tell her I just purchased these and would like to return them. She tells me that I stepped out of the store so she can't refund, only give me a voucher and I must buy something else. I'd already bought everything I needed. Then she tells me to take the products home and keep them for the next time I would need to buy something. Then I can come and get the voucher and redeem it. Imagine keeping a pair of shoes and a bowl and remembering to bring them with you the next time you happen to need something. I tried to reason but she was adamant. Those are the rules. You stepped out of the store. You don't get a refund. And then it clicked. I asked, so if someone wants to return an item without leaving the store, they get the money back? Yes. You see where this is heading? Malicious compliance kicking in. I ask to return the items and get the voucher. I take the voucher, get inside the store, find a product to exactly the same amount, buy it with the voucher. Right after the cashier, there's the returns manager. Straight from the cashier, I go to her, hand her that random product I just bought, and say, I'd like to return this, I don't want it, and I never left the store. She is looking at me with barely contained rage in her eyes, I kid you not. The awkward pause was getting longer, and then her manager comes along, looks at us, and I smile at him and say, I never left the store, and I would like to get a refund for this, please. He nods, silent and not looking at me. She proceeds to refund me the money in cash. Company policy, right? Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Gumnos. It says, this has the audacity of a dog staring at you while it poops on the carpet. And I know you don't like this and there's nothing you can do about it without making matters worse. <laughs> Very nicely done. Yep, this one is definitely on the store. If they didn't have any fine print on that voucher saying that you couldn't return things for cash value, well, that was their own dumb fault. OP just took advantage of their own rules and came out on top. Well done, OP. Our first story today comes to us from Edic FZ. How not to get new clients, lose existing clients, and get two weeks paid time off. Let's jump right in. Some 10 years ago, I was switching jobs after over seven years at my previous one. I decided I was done with printers and stuff and wanted something new, and I found this company that was supplying CCTV, security, and fire alarms. The company had branches in a few bigger cities in my country. The pay was worse than my previous job, but I figured it's not that bad, and I really wanted to switch jobs. I was contracted for three months of a trial period. It's common practice in my country. It's a type of short-term job employment contract, usually one to three months, that legally has the same terms as a regular job contract, with often some limits on company benefits like private Medicare or gym pass or whatever, after which we'll decide if I'm staying or not. My boss was the regional manager and I've had a coworker who had been hired earlier. Our branch was open for a few months at this point. Now, it's important to note that the company only dealt in business to business. No retail, we didn't even have a fiscal printer. That is mandatory if you want to do retail sales. So our clients were all big companies, big and small that per company policy, specialized in electrical equipment installation. In my country, all businesses are registered in a central database, and the type of stuff done is one of the required stuff from a vast catalog of what can be done commercially. This is tied to the pricing levels. You run an electric company, you get better prices than a flower company, you get the idea. The company had a CRM, Customer Relationship Management Software, in which we were required to note every interaction with our clients. When I asked our RM about how it should be kept, a conversation followed. So I need to note only sales or some other stuff as well, everything, each call, each visit, each sale, and you need to schedule the client's next visit or call. You're to contact each of your clients at least once a week to keep up relations and note everything in the CRM. It's connected to the phone billing, so we know when you've made the calls or not. So I'm supposed to call each client at least once a week for a chat? Yes, and make notes in the CRM. You realize calling that often will annoy most clients? This is the company policy. We want our clients to be cared about and it's your job to do it. I think everyone knows this is not how you build a positive relation with your potential clients. 
we're all sick and tired of banks or phone companies calling with another great offer. But fine, it's not my place to argue with company policy. I split with my coworker the clients we had registered, found few more potential contracts on the internet, and for the next few weeks, I'd call each of my clients. First, to introduce myself as their new sales guy and ask if I can contact them once in a while to check up on things. I didn't note how often I'd check up on things. After a few weekly calls, some clients stopped answering, others blocked me. I noticed I get straight to voicemail, that's pretty obvious. And some got annoyed with the pestering and voiced that with all manner of euphemisms or straight up insults about wasting their time and if they want something from me, they'll get back to me. I obviously noted every call in the CRM as explicitly instructed, but just in case someone actually read it, I refrained from citing insults and just went with client angry about two frequent contacts, next contact on this date. That was always in one week time. All this didn't win me any favors with the client base with one exception, but it hardly made a difference. Because we managed to antagonize most of our current and potential clients, we obviously didn't get many sales done, so we weren't allowed to keep many wares on our local stock. This meant that if someone would actually stumble into our store, the shelves would be mostly empty, to the point that putting together a small CCTV setup would be impossible, because we'd have like one DVR, two cameras of the same type, and one hard drive for the DVR. By that point, we'd get resupply twice a week, so if client ordered something on Thursday, the order would arrive on next Tuesday afternoon at the earliest. This was often unacceptable, so clients would scrap the order. We did some business from time to time, but I'm pretty sure our branch was not making enough even to sustain itself, not to mention making a profit for the company. After about seven to eight weeks, I was dialing one of my clients again to check up if he doesn't need anything. Let's call him Red. I was about to hang up with no answer when he did pick it up. Hi, this is Ed from Company X. Can I take a moment? At this point, he furiously interrupted me yelling, Are you effing serious? I nearly fell off the ladder thinking it's something important and it's you again? Didn't I effing tell you not to bother me again? Are you effing stupid? This rant went on for a while. Guy was really creative when it comes to various combinations of insults something that I think is impossible in the English language. When he finally made a long enough pause for me to chime in, I went with my, at this point, usual explanation. I'm sorry you find these calls disturbing, but it's our company's policy to keep a close contact with our best clients. Red never actually bought anything. I don't give an F about your company's policy. Get me your supervisor. Yes, sir. I happily gave him my boss's rank, name, and phone number. He paused for a moment, I'm guessing to note the info I've given him, and then hung up without a word. I dutifully noted the conversation in the CRM, noting that client angry, requested contact to supervisor, complied. After about half an hour, my RM called me. Did you call Red today? I did, like I do on a weekly basis per instructions. Okay, don't call him again. I'm sure Red gave him a piece of his mind about the company policy. Next week, the one guy that didn't mind my calls strolls into the store and from the door asks, I hear you're closing up shop? I look at my coworker with surprised expression. She mirrors it. We asked him where he heard about it, and he answered vaguely, that's the word around town. We told him that we don't know anything about it. He ordered some basic stuff we as usual didn't have on hand, and left. When I put out the order to arrive in the next shipment, I got a call from the headquarters warehouse. Hi, did you order X and Y? I did, is there a problem? Yeah, kinda. All your deliveries are on hold and we can't ship anything to you. I put the two and two together, thanked them for the info, hung up, and shared the revelation with my coworker. She contacted the RM to ask about it and he claimed it must be some kind of mistake and not to worry. The same week on Friday, the RM arrived at nine o'clock. We opened the store at eight and went straight to the point. Here are the papers to relieve you from work as of Monday. Today, we pack all of the stock and equipment. At 1400, there will be a truck to pick everything up and the store is done. Work relief is a document that basically tells you that you're still employed as per contract, 
keeping the pay and social security, but you don't have to actually work, and it doesn't deplete your annual batch of vacation days. We get 20 to 26 days of paid vacation per year. It's used usually when an employee needs to be terminated with notice period, but you don't want to keep him around for the remaining time. In my case, I was two weeks until my trial period was to end, so I got the remainder of that time off with pay and the contract would just end. My coworker had two week notice period per her contract. I listed the brief time spent at this company as branch closing specialist on my LinkedIn. I think it's more accurate than the technical and sales specialist I actually had on my contract. The company is still there, but scaled back on its branches. And as far as I know, they loosened up their policy a bit. I went on to switch industries once more, cable TV, but got back to CCTV and stuff for the next company where I've spent four years, where I had a lot of regular clients and didn't call any of them once without a specific reason. In the comment section for this one, there were a lot of people saying things about the RM not telling them that their branch was closing. Unfortunately, this is just a normal thing in the retail world because if you tell somebody that their branch is closing, you're either going to lose them right away to another employer or their work productivity is going to go through the floor because they know they're losing their jobs and they just don't give a crap anymore. Going back to the weekly calls though, it sounds to me like that policy was put in place by somebody who's never really worked with clients themselves. It sounds like the company brought in somebody from outside with absolutely no experience who thought, well, we need to build better relationships, so let's bombard them with phone calls. Anybody who's worked in sales or customer relations knows that one of the quickest ways to sour a relationship with a customer is to contact them too many times when they haven't explicitly told you that they need your services right then and there. Our second story today comes to us from the same OP, Etic FZ, you shall not move the printer. Let's jump right in. This is not an epic tale, but still makes me smile when I think about it. Some years ago, I worked in a store that deals with security devices, CCTV, alarms, home automation and stuff. It was part of a larger chain. The headquarters was in a town some five hours drive away and the chain itself was set up in a way that the store manager was, in most cases, on a business-to-business -business contract with the store chain. My store was a bit different, because the guy who hired me was in charge of two stores, ours, the smaller one, and another one in his hometown about one and a half hours drive away. That meant I wasn't directly connected with the chain management structure. This would have consequences later. Now, the store I was working in was managed by a girl, let's call her Barb, that's, and it's important, about 1.7 meters tall, about 5 foot 7 for you imperial crowd. And what she lacked in height, she made up with character. When she knew something was dumb, she pointed it out loud and direct. If it happened to be a manager or director in the company chain, well crap, he gets blasted in the face both barrels. She was great at her job though and I liked working with her. She showed some restraint toward customers, but when a Karen showed up, well, we didn't get many Karens in our store. Our manager was also a great guy that always stood up for us and since he was our employer, he was the buffer between us and the higher ups. Our store on the other hand was the smallest in size from all of the nearly 40 stores across the country. Like literally 40 square meters including basement storage. But since we often got results rivaling stores twice our size in cities three times bigger, we finally got to move to a larger place. We were happy about it for two reasons. One, the new place was three times bigger and on one level. And two, it had air conditioning. Our old place barely had any ventilation. When the move was finally approved, we, per the chain company request, needed to get it done in two days. So day one, we pack all our stock, our stuff, PCs, register, documents, etc. in boxes, dismantle the furniture that could be dismantled, and book a van to move all this stuff to the new place. On day two, we move, with the support of our manager and three guys from the chain, two of whom were on the company's board. The company was kind of weird in this way. Their job, along with helping with manual labor, was to make sure everything goes smooth and take inventory. Day one took about 12 hours. On day two, we started at 8 a.m. and got everything moving. 
it was dark out when we finally got everything set up, after about 12 or 13 hours of work. At this point, we had all of the front end customer ready, with minor details to go, one of them being where the printer will go. We, me and Barb, wanted it behind our back on a low shelf, easy access. Enter Bob, nearly 1.95 meters, six and a half feet tall, bulky, bald dude, senior manager and member of the board of the chain company. He argues that the printer should go below the desks. We had two large desks making a counter that spanned nearly the width of the store, leaving only a small gap that we used to get out to the front of the store. So the customers won't see it. We noted that the place that he wanted the printer was taken by the trays for all the invoices and other documents we produce in excess on a daily basis. You can take the paper to the back, Bob says. After every printout? You serious? Barb replies. Ever seen a miniature pincher barking up a Doberman? It looked something like this. Only the Doberman was as angry as the pincher. They were on each other's throats for a good 10 to 15 minutes. Everyone else was dead tired after what was essentially a full 12 hours of manual labor. This is when my tired mind got the best of me, and I said, Barb, just let it go. We'll do it his way, and when they leave tomorrow, we'll set it our way. I only realized that I said it out loud when it became dead quiet and everyone stared at me. Bob was pissed. Now, I am 1.9 meters tall myself, 6 foot 3, but still only a lowly salesman and I just basically told the board member to suck it. Barb looked at me, then at Bob, and finally at our boss. The moment when our boss said, see, you have no power here, just leave it, was the moment I realized I was holding my breath. Bob sighed loudly and told us to do whatever, which we did. When I left the company some three years later, I got tired of retail, but still remain on good terms with the company. The printer was in the same spot I put it on that day no one from the chain dared move it. Okay, so I read that whole story, but I'm still focused on one thing here. Where in the world is a five foot seven woman considered short? Where I'm from in Canada, that's probably high average height for a woman here. I honestly couldn't help constantly thinking about that all the way through this story. I guess that's just the way my silly mind works, I don't know. Our last story today comes to us from Laid E. Love. Customers always write, right? Let's jump right in. So I work as a minimum wage cashier at a discount store. I see a lot of people in a day, especially people who know how to do my job better than me due to their lack of experience and profound understanding that my job is the easiest in the world. Now I always shut that crap down in the classic corporate happy public service employee way. Well, actually, it makes it a little easier this way, but thank you so much for helping. Like I'm talking a toddler down from an upcoming tantrum, but I don't leave room for arguing. It's almost like I'm playing a character, honestly. It works for me. But I never just let someone do something stupid, like letting them walk out with a bag too heavy without double bagging it, or letting them leave putting their receipt in their bag if it looks like they might want to return it. But not today. It's Saturday, so it's busy. All day, as I would finally get a minute to get my other work done, someone would come up taking forever to consider the impulse buys while I'm stuck waiting for them at the register getting nothing done. This woman did that, but twice. She got up there, pondered for a minute, got a line behind her, decided to go look at something else. I'm stuck with this line till just before she gets back and ponders again before finally getting to me. She's your average looking middle-aged soccer mom, but already she's getting on my nerves. But hey, it's Saturday, every customer gets on my nerves, so whatever. She's got a lot of larger but lightweight items with some smaller items like bags of candy and socks. So I'm getting half of it in one large bag, half of it in another large bag. So I go to get the second bag, handing her the first one, when she goes, no, I don't want a lot of bags, you can fit the rest in there, it's fine. You should ask before getting more bags. It's your job to do things how the customers want and asking. Otherwise, you should just know to do one bag if you can. It's wasteful. I only want one bag. And I thought to myself, wow, it sounds like she's never done retail a day in her life. She must know what she's doing. 
Now, it's also worth noting that she had a few heavier items. Not many, but a few. They were glass jars of sauces with lots of pigment and staining properties. It's also worth mentioning she was getting some chips that came in bags with pointy sharper edges that eat bags for breakfast. The bag gets too heavy and they press into the sides at any angle and that bag is toast. It's also worth mentioning she was getting several white clothes made of very stainable material. Nice clothes. She said they were for an important party she had to go to that night, bragging. Normally, I would double bag, which would keep the sharp corners in check. But she was right. She only wanted one bag, so that must be all she needs. So I get the glass jars in with the clothes nested in there nicely spaced out, where they wouldn't hit each other with the clothes between them. And the bags on top spread around the top, so it was easier to lift the bag just like she wanted. That darn bag was already looking like it would bust wide open any second when she took it from the counter. Luckily, a line hadn't formed behind her yet, just someone looking the impulse buys over. So I couldn't really step away, but nothing to do but watch where I had a clear view of the parking lot. I watched as she struggled out the two front doors, no automatic, got a quarter of the way to her car when the bag bust glass and sauce everywhere. She had like $15 worth, about five jars. She struggled to force them back into the bag, hoping she could at least pile them in her arms with the bag holding it together, trying not to cut herself on the glass she had wrapped up. It broke some more. She tried to salvage it and balance it back up. Failed, gave up, grabbed as much of an armful as she could, had to take like five trips, her blouse and pants ruined. Huh, maybe after over a year and a half of cashiering nearly every day, I know what I'm doing. Shocker. OP mentioned in the comment section down below that this lady did not come back in to complain or try to return things or put blame on OP for using one bag. It kind of sounds like they put their tail between their legs and left because they knew that it was their problem, and this was exactly what they asked for. All right, our first story today comes to us from Cole Carmont, Bleeding IT Dry, Malicious Compliance in the Print Hub. Let's jump right in. I currently work in a print hub and mentioned in a previous post that malicious compliance kind of just comes with the job. Here is another one that I just learned the outcome for this week. I had been on medical leave for quite some time. During that time, a number of systems and programs we used changed. In particular, our online systems for business cards and similar products had changed. The way the system was before my leave was that when a customer uploaded the file, the system would slightly stretch the file to include a bleed. If a file was submitted with a bleed, nothing would be done. For those not in the know, a bleed on a print file is an excess of the image in the design that is meant to be cut off. Most business cards have colored blocking for style, and this ensures that there is no ugly, uneven white edge on the finished product. Essentially, it allows the customer to get what they envision. Astute readers would realize our old system could cause issues, however, especially when writing or images are close to borders. Information could be cut off due to being over the bleed line after the image was stretched. As such, we as workers knew that a change was going to happen. This change happened during my medical leave, as the online system was updated to allow more customizations. When the customers uploaded files, they were presented with a digital canvas where they could change their text and images on their file. Two boxes were presented on this canvas, one box showing the finished size of the product and one showing the bleed we needed to ensure a proper cut. The problem is, the system no longer automatically stretched the provided file to the finished size and certainly not to the bleed size. The new system allows the customers to properly fit themselves, but rarely do they size it to bleed. As such, when we print and cut the finished product, there is often this ugly white band on two of the sides, as the cutting system is all automated, and without those bleeds, there will always be problems. Additionally, our large guillotine cutter is constantly in use for orders that need it, and to reprogram it and interrupt orders to trim a millimeter off every order was unreasonable. My manager, who will be named D, brought this to the attention of the system admins and IT, but was pretty much dismissed. 
he was told to push those orders that did not have bleed into problem status, and they would take a look at the problem. Also, to send a list of problem orders still not handled at the end of each week. When I returned to work three months ago, I was given a rundown of everything that was new, including this new problem. I followed this malicious compliance currently in progress, none the wiser to what D was doing, pushing the orders without bleed into problem status, which was quite a fair amount to be honest. I didn't really think much about it, however. Towards the beginning of this month, D had asked me to scan in February's problem orders, easily 500 orders, ensure each problem was its own separate file, then file them in a filing cabinet out back. I have read and listened to horror stories about office scanning, but I don't really have an issue where I am, as we have high capacity automated scanners, so this was no issue. I did as I was told, in the folder they told me to put it in, on the shared computer, and then went to file it. There were over thousands of problem orders stuck in limbo due to this bleed issue in this filing cabinet. Not only did this likely make us look bad to head office, but the customers were probably pissed. When I asked D what was going on with this issue, he explained everything and informed me of his plan. It turned out IT intended to do nothing about this bleed problem. They wanted us as production to fix the problem, which meant designing. The design team gets paid a lot more than we in production though, and as we weren't being paid that wage, D was having none of it. He was told each week to send in all orders that haven't been fixed as of yet, so he was. D and the supervisor created a program that would submit each problem order as a ticket to IT, one at a time, at the end of the week. Previously, they had sent everything in as one ticket. This is why they had me scan each problem order as its own file, rather than just a single PDF with everything in it. This program ran on Friday, late afternoon, just before IT's weekend started. D knew IT needed to acknowledge all problem tickets before they left the office. Every 15 seconds, a new problem ticket popped up and they needed to acknowledge it, all 500 files before they left. I don't know exactly how well it worked, but it certainly worked. Two hours, five minutes, after hours at least, depending how fast their PCs are. I did the math, and that's only the stuff that I scanned myself. From my understanding, D and Supervisor had also decompiled the files they had already submitted and resubmitted them as well. After the first week, the regional manager, who is a really cool guy, we'll call him Ray, stopped by to check in and asked why IT was cursing D's name, and D explained it. Ray said, in no uncertain terms, if they haven't done anything about the jobs by the end of the week, you should follow up, wink. At the end of the last week, D set up the program to ask for updates on each of the problem jobs, as well as the program to submit new problem jobs from last week, and set it to run. When we came in this Monday, we got an update from IT that the system had been adjusted, and customers should not be able to submit jobs anymore that do not have borders meeting the bleed line. We still have some issues, as reorders can override this fix, but it's been a lot better now, and this week has been extremely productive. D, meanwhile, came into his email having over 20 unread messages, and over 500 junk mail as the spam filter kicked in. Each message was the program's response asking for an update, with the first few responses from IT being, we are still looking into it, and the later responses simply being the letter A. There is still the matter of the order still stuck in limbo, so there may be an update, but the main compliance has been settled. Now, OP added an edit at the bottom here. It says, edit one. The reason why this problem was not fixed before was all the other locations were doing workarounds to fix the problems themselves. We were the only location making a stink about the issue as the workaround was outside the scope of our paycheck. So it was considered low priority. Still does not excuse them, but they changed their tune in the end. Down in the comment section for this one, there's one from a user called Low Tessa. It says, yes, so satisfying. D is my hero. OP responded to this one and said, there are horror stories of people coming off leave to new managers and staff, but I am extremely fortunate that all the problem staff ended up leaving my place of work and replaced by a really close knit crew. Although I am sad my previous manager is gone, D and Ray are absolutely fantastic. Their motto is, no one wants to work in a dull place. 
as long as your work is done and done correctly, do what you want. Morale is at an all-time high. Another user down below commented with this name that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> it says, your workload moving forward will also be lighter as some of the customers who got their time wasted will go somewhere else. OP responded to this one as well and said, I am willing to bet that a lot of those orders in the system were already complete or cancelled. By this story, I'm sure you can tell, IT for this company are not the brightest. In addition to this issue, they also don't properly clear their tickets on their end. When they get new files or fix the issue, a new job ticket is submitted, rather than the current job ticket being altered. Then, they would need to link the new job ticket and the problem. When the new job ticket gets cleared, the problem ticket is cleared as well. I am processing upwards to 100 jobs a day, so I can't recognize all orders pushed into problem, but as we have not received any consequences or word from head office, I am assuming we were still running the orders at some point and customers receiving their orders even if they weren't clearing from the system. Okay, I can't help myself, but does those white lines on the edges of my business card mean that I'm on the bleeding edge of my field? Okay, something to think about, this is a system that they used to replace a system that was doing an okay job. Sure, it cut off some of their print jobs, but it sounds to me like it was having a lot less problems than the new system was. So when they realized there was a problem with the new system that was causing a massive issue, they should have just rolled back to the old system. It would have been a lot easier until IT or whoever could rewrite that new system to make it work properly. Our next story today comes to us from Scarlet Witch 713 Don't want to follow the rules of the log haul road? Sure, go right on through. Let's jump right in. Long time lurker, been debating posting this. I tried to keep it short while providing context. For context, I, 27 female, work for a small local security company. We mainly do oil and gas and logging roads. I typically work pipeline security, but I'm between sites at the moment waiting for spring breakup, when the ground starts to thaw and heavy equipment and trucks can't operate because this is swampland. Before breakup, they've got a 24-7 log haul happening on one of the big logging roads in our area. Now, because of this, traffic going against the log trucks is being restricted by us. I sit down at the far end of the log road and control who can go through the wrong way. This is limited to three companies and their subcontractors because their sites are close to my end of the road and they don't interfere with log trucks. Any company that is in violation of this rule receives a $10,000 fine and their road use privileges are affected. In this case, they can still only travel one way on the road once breakup hits and the log haul has to stop until the logging company says otherwise. One company in particular has been one massive pain this whole time. Let's call them Stupid Incorporated for privacy reasons. Now, Stupid Inc. site sits about halfway down the log road. They have to go down to the far end of the road and drive the same direction as the log trucks. Well, they don't bother telling their subcontractors this, so all day every day I'm busy turning these guys away. One morning last week, this big pickup rolls up and I ask the usual of, where are you headed? He gave me the kilometer number of where the site is. It's Stupid Inc. Only he gives me a different company name, a subcontractor. We'll call that one Prick Company. I informed the guy that he couldn't go this way and he lost it. Starts cursing and swearing, yelling about how it's complete BS and I shouldn't be allowed to do this. He tells me he's gone this way down the road plenty of times when he's not working and it's never been an issue. The thing is that private users, so just regular people, are technically allowed. Legally speaking, we can't stop them as roads are public to a degree. There's a whole thing that I'm not going to get into. Private users are allowed to use the road, though we strongly caution against it. All right then, I'm a private user and you can't stop me. You just told me that you're here for work, but all right, if you say so, you've been warned and he floors it on down the road. What followed was a four-day manhunt. I immediately notified the road patrol supervisor, as well as road patrol and my boss. I was asked questions for four days while they tried to identify this guy. Because he said he was going to work for Stupid Inc., they got hit with the fine. Of course, this didn't go over well with them either. Next thing I know, the site superintendent is asking me tons of questions about the guy, 
when I said he worked for a prick company, well, that didn't go over well. From my understanding, Prick Company was at risk of losing the contract they had with Stupid Inc. over this. Prick Company then started digging around, and I heard they found out who it was, and the guy lost his job over it. The kicker? He wasn't even working for Stupid Inc. that day. The superintendent told me they didn't have Prick Company out working on anything. One of his employees had seen the truck I described way on the other side of Stupid Inc. site. He hadn't even stopped there. As far as anyone knows, he actually was there as a private user, and had he just said as much, none of this would have happened. OP added a long edit on after this one. It says, apparently I need to clear up a couple of things. It's not like the guy said, yeah, I work for this company, but I'm off today. I get that a lot actually, and never have an issue with it. The guy specifically told me he worked for Prick Company and was working down at Kilometer X, which was the location for Stupid Inc. I asked him to confirm the company he was headed to work for, and he specifically named Stupid Inc. I told him that company and their subcontractors were not allowed to go that way, and he started yelling and swearing at me. During his hissy fit, he said he's been down that road several times when not working. I told him that private users, so individuals not there on behalf of a company, legally can't be stopped. It's a legal gray area. Yes, it's stupid but private user equals not there representing a company equals can go. Employees and subcontractors equals there to do work on behalf of a company equals cannot go. After explaining this, he got all smug looking and declared he was a private user. He thought he'd found a loophole. It wasn't like he said, well, I'm actually not here for work today. I just do work for this company. Instead, he was a straight up butthole about the entire situation and very clearly lied to my face about being a private user. Again, I don't know why he was truly there. I never found out. All I know is he lied to my face, gave me trouble, which is another finable offense actually, but that's a whole other thing, and thought he'd found a loophole. The way the situation itself played out, I guarantee based on the information given to me by him that I was not confused on the matter. Also, when I say four-day manhunt, what I mean is that it took four days for the various companies to figure out exactly who this guy was, as he didn't give me a name. And it's an incredibly common truck description. He didn't vanish into the woods never to be seen again. Apologies for any confusion there. I was never hoping the guy would lose his job. Honestly, I wanted him to get chewed out as a nice bit of karma. This dude was nasty very colorful language, and at 6.10 a.m., I was so not in the mood to get screamed at. I knew about the fine, which is why I said, you've been warned, prior to him taking off. I knew that things were going to be ugly for him when the boss got their hands on him. I did not hope or really expect he would lose his job. I can't deny that I do feel a tiny sliver of satisfaction because guys like this need to be taken down several pegs but I also feel bad that it cost him his job. I believe this would be a case of F around and find out. And I sincerely hope he's learned something from this and will be nicer to people just doing their jobs in the future. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Stabmaster. It says, so he knew that as a private user, you wouldn't be allowed to stop him. Yet for some reason, he thought it was a good idea to lie about why he was there even though it was completely unnecessary and places liability on himself, his company, and whoever he's out there working for. Sounds like all you did was speed up the natural conclusion of him getting himself fired. And he probably blames you for it entirely. OP responded to this one and said, yeah, I have no idea what the heck was going through his mind, but 100% he blames me. <laughs> Those types always blame someone else. All right, our first story today comes to us from Petty Rusty. You get angry and belittle me when I want to follow the instruction manual on your new piece of kit? Enjoy your brand new Rusty Wheel Slicer. Let's jump right in. It's been years, but I'm still worried that this person is going to hunt me down in my sleep. Hence the throwaway. I used to work at a deli shop slash cafe place just to make ends meet while I went to uni. And the owner of that place was a real piece of work. If you got on her bad side, you were on the crap list. 
and she would be both openly and passively aggressive with the general vibe that you were an incompetent idiot no matter what you did. I heard that woman scream at a 15-year-old on her second day because she had mixed up coffee and teacups, which differed in size by about an ounce, just to give you an idea of her personality. After this whole experience, my dad told me that, as a general hint, it may be good to be suspicious if a workplace hires exclusively teen girls with no experience because they're very unlikely to recognize crappy workplace treatment. There were two people in this place who didn't take her crap. Me, a mid-twenties recovering addict who's seen way worse, and a 45-year-old Iranian man who told her she could go F herself when she berated him for not being willing to come in early to his 11-hour shift to prep ingredients, off the clock of course. I liked that dude. With the stage set, on to the malicious compliance. When I started, this place desperately needed a new wheel meat slicer. The one they had made constant screeching noise and drove everyone crazy. About a month and a half into my employment, they got one. Industrial grade cost 5,000 bucks. Both looked and worked accordingly. Amazing piece of kit. As we were all celebrating and unpacking it, I flipped through the instruction booklet to look up how it works, and specifically, how to clean it, as there were quite a few parts. Manual says to clean everything detachable thoroughly, but that the wheel itself should be cleaned by letting it run on very low speed with safety precautions and using a cloth and alcohol-based cleaning agent on the exposed part. There were some pictures and detailed instructions on how to do this, and it explicitly stated not to take the whole wheel off and deep clean it as this would remove the wheel lubricant and anti-corrosive agent and risk damage to the machine and to especially not let water or any cleaning agents get into the machine without making sure to thoroughly replace any lubricant. I was working the evening shift, so 99% of the time it was up to me to clean it. The instructions is how I clean the machine, because I trust the designer to know how to clean it. Or, I do for about two days until my boss sees me, asks what the F I'm doing, and why I'm not taking the wheel off to clean it. She berates me about food safety and hygiene standards, telling me how disgusting I am for doing it this way. I stand my ground and inform her I do it this way because of the instructions, that I'm following the manual, and explain the reason behind it. If we scrub it down, especially the inner part, the grease will go away a lot faster and will risk damage to the machine. She basically tells me to shove it and do it her way. Now, I'm not going to ruin a $5,000 thing, because one woman doesn't understand how lubrication works. But the very next day, my manager sees me clean the machine and gives me an extremely condescending talk down on how this isn't how we approach hygiene and how boss told me you don't seem to understand food safety. My explanation falls on deaf ears again, and I'm also informed not only am I expected to take the wheel off and scrub it at the end of the day, but after every use. Boss also wants me to make sure I spray off the inside section to ensure there's no bacteria in there, with some hints that there'd apparently been a whole colony of life growing in there due to my two-day negligence. She wants me to spray soap and water mixture into the cogs of a machine they just bought. The blade is stainless steel, but the effing cogs aren't effing fine. If that's the way you want me to do it, that's what I will do. Every day, five times a day, I take that effing machine apart and scrub it down. Every day, I see that lubrication disappear more and more. And after a week, it's all gone, eventually becoming replaced by growing patches of rust. I feel bad for the machine, but I do as I've been told. I only work six days a week, so every day I come in after my break thinking that surely yesterday, my manager would have reacted. Nope. She takes it apart just like I do, clean it like I do, and doesn't seem to think twice about the fact that this brand new machine is rusting apart in front of our eyes. In fact, she goes the extra mile and also scrubs the cog itself, which is probably why a year or so worth of lubricant disappeared in one week. The thing about rusty machinery is that it usually works up until a certain point, but once it reaches that point, there's no going back. One day, I turn it on, and it makes a screeching noise I can only imagine came from the soul of this bit of kit, wondering why God has forsaken it. 
and it's like the clocks all stop. My coworker in the pastry section comes over to ask what the F that noise is. My boss and manager come into the room with the same question. And I just shrug and slice my salami. Boss tells her coworker to go get some lubrication for the gears. And after a minute, he puts some effing spray on oil lube in front of me and tells me to lube the gears up. I ask him where the lithium lubricant paste is, since according to the instructions, that is what you need. And he seems flabbergasted that putting something made for hinges and ball bearings isn't appropriate for a meat slicer. Two days and some tinnitus later, he's acquired some grease and then proceeds to be stumped when I let him know I'm not going to stop doing my regular job to spend 30 minutes greasing up this machine, unless someone else takes over my station or they pay me overtime. My boss is meanwhile demanding to know why I haven't told them we needed to stock up on lithium grease, which I don't even bother to respond to. I make sandwiches, I'm not your mechanic. I left that job a few weeks later, and when I did, the machine was still crying the song of its ancestors every time we turned it on. And we were still scrubbing it down from the inside out daily, of course. I have since then gotten a sneaking suspicion, I know what happened to its predecessor, and me and my dad, who is actually a mechanic, still laugh about it sometimes. My boss did ask rhetorically, at one point, how the heck the machine got to that stage so fast? I answered that it's probably because we've been scrubbing the lubrication and corrosion protection off several times a day. And I take great pleasure in the memory that she completely ignored me. It's the only time while I was there that she didn't snap back at me. And I like to think she remembered back to when I explicitly told her that if we clean this thing in that way, this is exactly what would happen. Overall, I don't think a $5,000 machine would make or break anything, but F me, did that feel good. Well, OP, from the way you've described this, it just sounds like your bosses wanted that thing to be squeaky clean. <laughs> oh, that was lame. All this talk about a meat slicer reminded me of the time that I worked at that fast food restaurant. You know, the one that has the cowboy hat on the logo, and they deal almost exclusively in roast beef. Yeah, that one. Anyway, I was in there, had the roast beef on the slicer, and it got knocked off onto the floor. My manager told me to wash the roast beef off in the sanitation sink and put it back on the slicer and continue working. Oh, that was my last day at that job. This was well over 20 years ago now, but that memory is still so clear. Our next story today comes to us from Cole Carmot. Approve the order? Okay, boss. Let's jump right in. I don't know whether to put this in Tales from Retail or here, but I ultimately decided here since I did what I was told, knowing there would be fallout. A couple years ago, before I joined Reddit, I worked front desk at a print and marketing shop, receiving orders from customers and processing them to be ready to print. A woman came in while we were rather busy, and we'll call her fortunate for the eventual play on words. One of the ways I normally handle this is handing order forms to waiting customers to fill out their contact info while they wait. This woman was strange. She filled out the order form, but waited until all the customers were out of the store before she came to the counter. She handed a USB to me and the order form. To my surprise, the order form was already all filled out, from the quantity of pages, type of paper, binding options, laminated pages, to say she wanted everything but the kitchen sink would be an understatement as this was easily a $100 order for what appeared to be a single copy of a 23-page book. The file was even PDF format already, so essentially print ready. However, Fortunate then gave me a cryptic request as I plugged the USB in. Could you please complete the order without looking at it? Now, while some would immediately call this a red flag, for me, it's just another Tuesday evening. It's not uncommon for people in relationships to get specialized calendars or photo prints done of, let's call them distasteful nudes. Not raunchy stuff, but straddling that border. Holiday calendars and Valentine's Day photo books have desensitized me to that stuff. Unfortunately, I have to open the file to make sure everything is formatted correctly. Even then, as the finishing work gets done, people will have to look at it. I do offer to her, however, that if she is concerned about many people seeing it, I could do it myself and ensure only I look at it to minimize eyes on it. 
Alternatively, she could also do it in the self-serve section and forego the finishing. Fortunate gets flustered at this point and without saying a word gets up and leaves. I called to tell her that she left her USB, but she just left and told me to destroy it. Okay, now I'm curious. I plugged in the USB and there was one file, doc underscore one dot PDF. I opened the file and while I don't remember exactly what I was expecting, it wasn't this. Your husband is cheating on you with me in custom font with a picture of a guy nude on a bed and who I assume is fortunate beside him. Fortunate was Mistress Fortunate. Her face was expertly blurred out. This was clearly a graphic designer. The document was short and to the point. One sentence in big custom font on each page. It explained who Fortunate was and that she had no idea that the husband, who will be named Jerk, was married as they were dating. Pictures and everything. She explained that she wanted to keep her identity a secret to protect herself, but felt the wife needed to know the moment she learned of her. Okay, well, that's a story that isn't over yet. Later that day, I was processing orders from our online system. This basically involves opening files, skimming through them, making them print ready, then approving them for production. I did not expect much, until suddenly, I opened a file titled doc underscore one dot PDF and saw the following. Your husband is cheating on you with me. Yep, Mistress Fortunate put through the order on our online system, but something was off. Fortunate had a very unique name, but this name was Mary, not real name, duh. The phone number and address were also different. She didn't. I immediately brought this to my manager's attention. While I currently have the best boss ever, my first boss was not so good. We'll call her Karen. I told Karen what I thought was going on and said I was uncomfortable approving this order. Karen took the USB and looked the file over. She then asked me if it went against any of our big no's. Basically, anything illegal, copyrighted stuff, sheet music, or original art not signed off by the artist. I said no, but explained that I didn't think the customer listed on the contact info was the customer. If it doesn't go against our policies, we have to produce it. Okay, you're the boss. I'm pretty sure she was only seeing dollar signs for minimum work, but whatever. I pushed the job through to production, though add a note saying under instruction of Karen to cover my own butt. The night shift manager who is now my current manager, let's call him D, messaged me about the job as it was pushed to them due to the amount of finishing it needed, and I told them the story behind it. D told me that I should not have to deal with the fallout, and told me to take the next two days personal time off, and he will make sure to reimburse that time. I gladly did. The fallout. Obviously, this is secondhand information, but things got heated. When my replacement called Mistress Fortunate the next day to tell her her order was ready, the person on the other side was confused. She didn't place an order. My coworker insisted she come to pick it up. A few hours later, a person who was not Mistress Fortunate came in to pick up the order, Mary. I don't remember the exact way it was described to me. It was in sports lingo, but it translated to, she didn't even open the book, she saw the cover page, threw the book at me, and marched out the door. There then proceeded a fight in the parking lot between Mary and Jerk. Mary eventually took the keys to the car and left Jerk out on the sidewalk. Jerk then came into the print shop and started blaming everyone in there for ruining his life. A brochure display was smashed on a self-serve printer, breaking the display and cracking the printer casing. Fortunately still functional, those things are like Nokia phones. Cops were called, but Jerk was gone by the time they arrived. Karen tried to throw me and the night crew under the bus for the incident. We had a meeting with HR where Karen screwed up and the HR rep had a brain. Well, technically it's not his fault for approving the order. How was he supposed to know it wasn't her? Because he told me he knew it was her. Wait, so he brought this to your attention and you still had him approve the order? Points out the note I placed on the order. Karen opens her mouth and inserts her foot. Come to think about it, I think this started the downfall of Karen as my manager, but I didn't have anything to do with that story, so I'll leave it to the ones who led that coup against her. Why did this story come up years after it happened? Well, my boss was going through files on Karen's old computer, 
and he found a file named doc-1.pdf. Ay ay ay, if this was one that was maybe mailed out to Mary without any interaction from the people at the printing shop, then I could probably get behind it. But Mistress Fortunate, well, she put all of the workers in this place really in danger because she didn't know how that guy was going to react. I mean, I think she's actually kind of lucky that the guy only damaged property and didn't actually harm any of the people working in the store at that time. There were many other ways that Mistress Fortunate could have let Mary know that her husband was cheating on her. I don't think this was the best way. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Epic Sausage 69 Only do what is in my job title? Fine. Good luck paying employees. Let's jump right in. So, I work for a construction company as an inventory admin. My job is to basically schedule counts of our warehouse and input the numbers they give me for inventory. Then, try to see what the problem is when the numbers on the last count and the current count don't add up. There is a little bit more to it, but I will not bore you with the specifics. The problem with this job is that when you have been doing it long enough and are good at it, there is less work to do. In the beginning, when counting one rack out of 60 racks of material would take a few days, it was fine because I was always busy. But now that everything is in order, the entire warehouse can be counted in three days. This leaves me bored for most of the time. So, to fix this, I studied up on our cloud-based ERP service that we use for all internal and external transactions, and have become sort of an expert on it. Every single aspect of this company uses this ERP service to do their job. Timesheets, HR, payroll, accounting, scheduling, management, manufacturing, ordering from vendors, delivering, inventory, etc. All runs through this ERP service. So it's very important that this service is up and running perfectly 24-7. I became so proficient in this service that our VP decided to cut ties with our consultants of the ERP because I could do what they did, but better, quicker, and much cheaper. For reference, we were paying these consultants $5,000 a month just to be on standby if we needed them for some sort of problem that could arise from using this ERP, and had to dish out more money to fix those problems depending on how many hours of their time was spent to fix said problems. Not sure on their exact rate, but it was something like $200 an hour and they took weeks to fix anything. Well, I could fix the problem in time for my daily afternoon crap break. I never got an official job title or raise of any kind for being an expert on this service. The company just saw me being able to do it and let me fix things that happened so they no longer needed the outside help. I wasn't too upset because it gave me something to do, so I was glad to help the company save money, even if none of that money fell my way. Skip ahead a few months, we now have a new warehouse manager and someone in the warehouse F something up in inventory by sending a bunch of materials to the wrong job with no records of it being shipped. We are talking half a million dollar F up here. In the same day, our ERP had an update that caused a bunch of bugs with our accounting department. So I decided to work on the ERP problem first because the warehouse's F up is more of a delay F up and not actually stopping anybody from doing their job at the moment, while this accounting problem means our bills are not able to be paid. You can guess what kind of issues we will have if bills are not paid. The ERP bug turns out to be quite big and numerous, so it ends up taking me a couple days to figure it out, but I fix it before any bills are actually due, and decide to take lunch a little early to celebrate a victory, crisis averted. New warehouse manager storms into my office after I get back from lunch and is livid. Apparently, the bosses were pinning the blame on him for the warehouse F up, and considering he is the one who oversees shipments and personnel in the warehouse, the blame is rightfully placed. He starts laying into me, asking why I have not fixed the problem yet, yelling and screaming like a child. I tried explaining that I was fixing an ERP issue and have not had time to look at the warehouse problem yet. He gets even more angry and notes that it is funny how I have time to take early lunches, but not do my job. That started to piss me off, but I held my tongue and kept calm about the situation. He then ordered me to only do what is in my job title and to leave the ERPBS 
to the people competent enough to handle it, as he put it. Since this guy was technically my supervisor, I had no choice but to obey. I asked him to send me that in writing, and he snarks and storms back into his office. Five minutes later, I get an email stating that under no circumstances am I to work on anything related to ERP unless it involves inventory. Q malicious compliance. I do nothing but inventory from that point forward, knowing darn well that we would be essentially coasting until we hit a problem that I would refuse to fix. Sure enough, not even a week later, I get an email from HR that some sort of bug in the ERP system was preventing them from accessing payroll to pay employees this week. I reply an apology that I'm no longer able to work on ERP bugs due to supervisor and refer to the ERP system help guide for further assistance. I know the help guide was not going to help her in the slightest, but it was no longer my problem, so I was not going to deal with it. Skip a few days later to Friday, I checked my bank account in the morning before getting to work and laughed because there was no money deposited. That problem never got fixed. I hurry up and get to work, excited to see the chaos unfold. And what I was expecting was an understatement. When I show up to work, I see the entire warehouse staff of 50 people walking out of the front door. I stopped one and asked why they're leaving, and they reply with, I didn't get paid today, so I'm not coming back until I do. I go into the office and see the warehouse manager in a panic. He has jobs that need material and nobody to load it onto trucks or deliver. I ask him if he needs help with anything, and he just screams at me to leave his office because he's getting phone calls out the butt from superintendents of jobs asking why our material has not arrived yet. I pass by HR on the way to my office and see a bunch of the bosses huddled up over her computer with angry and confused expressions on their faces, I guess trying to figure out the problem. I felt bad for her because it really was something out of her control but I knew she would ultimately be okay because she had been there for so long that they would never fire her. When I get to my office, I see the VP waiting for me there. He has a very pissed off expression on his face. When we get inside, he demands to know why I did not fix the problem in HR when she emailed me about it. I replied that I am no longer allowed to work on ERP problems as it is not in my job title. He has the most shocked look on his face and asked why all of a sudden I had a change of heart. I show him the email from the warehouse manager, and I could see the dots connect in his head. He immediately storms out, and I see him heading straight to the warehouse manager's office. They were in there for a few hours, but eventually, he comes back to my office. He seems calmer now, and asks me politely if I can fix the problem in HR, and if I can resume fixing the ERP if needed. At this point, I liked the relief of responsibility and told him I would only do it if he put it officially in my job title along with a raise. His calmness turned to anger again and he says I cannot believe you as he storms out and returns to his office. A few hours later, he sends out a mass email that he has hired the old ERP consultants to fix the problem and that next week everyone would be paid for the money they are owed along with the money they earned if they returned to work. This one surprised me, as he would rather pay over $60,000 a year to consultants than give me a few extra bucks an hour for better work. I think he expected me to change my mind and just do it for my own paycheck, but I decided to wait because I knew how these consultants were, and if they managed to fix this problem in a week, I would streak naked through the office. Most of the warehouse staff agreed to return, but were still upset about not getting paid. Sure enough, next Friday comes around. Nobody gets paid again. At this point, it is becoming a real problem, and the entire staff is becoming agitated. They have bills to pay. I even heard a bunch of the warehouse talking about some competitors nearby they could go to for work. At this point, I even considered just fixing the problem because the warehouse didn't deserve to be treated like that due to poor management. Maybe I am the butthole here for this, but I am severely underpaid and can barely afford my apartment. There is no reason I should do extra work for free. That same day, the VP returns to my office and hands me papers. These papers said that I would be promoted to a newly created position 
that dealt with inventory and ERP upkeep. It would be its own department and he would be my direct supervisor. Also came with a hefty raise. All I had to do was sign and agree. I looked up at him after reading the paper and he had the saddest look on his face. Please just sign it. The consultant said it would take them weeks to get around to fixing it due to the high volume of clients they have taken on and we cannot keep skipping paychecks. I happily signed it and immediately got to work on the HR issue. Managed to even fix it that same day. It was just a simple problem with the permissions of HR and payroll in the ERP due to the update. Now, down in the comment section for this one, OP was told that they should probably look into working for the ERP consultants because they probably pay a lot better considering what they're charging. Now, OP said that they've definitely been looking into that, but they might become a consultant themselves independently when the company they're working for crashes and burns. I think the biggest lesson we can take away from this story though, is that when one of your supervisors tells you to do something sketchy that you know is going to hurt the company in the long run, yeah, make sure you get that in writing. Cover your butt. That's the only way you're going to come out on top in the end. Our next story today comes to us from Albino Raven 666 Customer asked me to count out a bag of live crickets in front of her, loses out on bonus crickets. Let's jump right in. I, 32 female, work part-time at a pet store to supplement my income as my salary of a full-time teacher doesn't always pay the bills. Plus, I have a few pets and 20% off in-store purchases is rather helpful. Anyway, one of the things we supply are live and frozen feeder animals for things like reptiles, certain aquatic creatures, and invertebrates. These include things like mice, rats, dubia roaches, bloodworms, mealworms, waxworms, superworms, and crickets. The mice and rats are either frozen or live, but either way, they're easy to count and box up for the customer. Dubia roaches, mealworms, waxworms, and superworms are pre-packaged and price marked, but the crickets are not. Crickets are kept in these large containers with a mesh top, egg cartons for the crickets to climb and hide in, cricket food, and hydration. This means when customers ask for crickets, which we usually sell by the dozen, we have to count and retrieve them manually, while putting them in a plastic bag, we then fill with air and tie off to go with the customer. Our method for transferring the crickets is to lightly tap the egg cartons over a funnel-like object that doesn't have a hole at the bottom. We tap the crickets in, wrap the plastic bag around the mouth of the funnel, then tip it and lightly tap the crickets into the bag. Some crickets jump in out of order or cling to others, so often customers are given bonus crickets, which we're okay with. It's better than shorting them. So customers are always given the right amount or often more than what they asked for without an increase in price. Most people get this. The customer in this story did not. A woman comes in and she asked for four dozen crickets, 48 crickets total. I went to the back, tapped the crickets from the cartons into the funnel, and then counted them into the bag. As per usual, the occasional extra cricket tumbled or hopped in, probably putting the total to be a bit over 50 by the time I was done. I bagged them, tied the bag, then took them to the counter. Now, I don't know if this woman was having a bad day or if she had been stiffed by another store in the past, but she demanded that we count out the crickets in front of her before she pay for them. I explained that it was likely she got more than what she asked for and counting out 48 crickets individually would take a little while. She insisted she wanted to be sure we weren't ripping her off. So I got one of those small plastic critter keepers and a pair of tongs. I opened the bag, making it deflate and slightly more painful to work with, and inserted the tongs. Delicately so not to crush the crickets, I grabbed each one with the tongs and started counting slowly so not to crush the crickets with the tongs or lose my place while counting, something I do struggle with and dropped each individually counted cricket into the critter keeper. So after about five to 10 minutes at the counter, meticulously counting crickets with tongs, and maybe deliberately taking a little bit longer than I had to out of spite, a line was building up behind the woman, and I was getting close to the end of my count. Eventually, I hit the grand total of what she paid for, 48 crickets. And wouldn't you believe it, there were 10 left over in the bag, almost a whole extra free dozen she would have gotten had she not asked me to count. 
I said, oh, would you look at that? My mistake. You were right. I did miscount. I'll put these other ones back and ring you up for the 48. I'll be right back. And before she could protest, I wandered off to dump the last 10 crickets back into the cricket container. When I came back to check her out, she was silent, not looking at me, did her best to ignore the irritated looks of the customers lining up behind her while I poured her 48 crickets back into a plastic bag. She paid, then slunk off sheepishly out the door without a thank you or a glance back. I then got through the rest of the line quickly and apologized to the customers in line for the wait. I sent them home with some free samples, thanked them for their patience, then continued along with my shift. She never complained, and she did return to the location several times after. She never asked anyone to count crickets again. Now, OP added a couple of edits on at the bottom. It says, edit. Wow. So this kind of blew up. Uh, just a couple of things I want to respond to, common questions and statements, etc. One, people keep saying they've read this before. You may have read similar stories. If you look at some of the older comments in this thread, you'll see links to different stories with similar themes. A cricket story from two years ago, there's a feeder fish one, and one about a guy who sold mini samosas. There's also a lot of people in the comments who have worked similar situations sharing their stories. So while the situation in which this happened may not be unique, this is an original story I wrote yesterday based on a real experience I had at the pet store I work at. Two. Yes, I get paid horribly as an educator and that sucks, but I do love my teaching career. I enjoy working with students and seeing them grow and develop into the adults they will become. It's an honor to nurture and feed that development. But yes, we are underpaid and underappreciated. Thank you to those sympathizing. What a world we live in when the people that educate our children and get them set up for the big bad world after school have to take on second jobs because we don't pay them enough to do that. That is a load of BS. Getting back to the crickets, OP said in another comment that they're about 95 cents per dozen after tax. Let's even say hypothetically that somebody gets shorted one or two out of however many they bought. They could probably pick up more change on their way back out to their car from the ground than it would cost to get those two extra crickets. I just don't understand some people. Our next story today comes to us from Shabuti. Working during my planned vacation, then have to pay me extra when I leave. Let's jump right in. I'd been working at this company for about three years. I had been consistently growing in my role and eventually was given a project to own, with one to two other team members if needed. But it was a major project with a quick turnaround. I determined I could do it myself, though it would be tight. And since I was hoping for a promotion, I took on the project solo. I was able to deliver the project slightly ahead of schedule and with better quality than expected, which allowed us to make a huge sale. The head of the company gave me an award at an all hands meeting for the work I did. And my boss let me know I was on track for an end of year promotion with a nice pay raise and more responsibilities. But I was needed in another part of the business so I was going to have to transfer under a new manager that was notoriously hard to work with. I transferred to this manager and the first meeting we had to get on the same page, I brought up that I had a three week planned vacation in four months. I had never taken vacation, so had six weeks saved up and did not want to start losing it. He told me, of course, that would be fine and we would be able to make it work. About a week later, we have our first meeting with our product team. They had a new, large product idea and wanted it to be released in just three months. As my team looked over the details, we knew this was a six to eight month project at best, and it would be better to deliver it in smaller increments so they still had something to show in three months, or we would need to push out the schedule. My boss was adamantly against both, so throughout the next week, he made us have last minute three to four hour brainstorming sessions every day but he would not even tell us until around 3 p.m., forcing all of us to work late every day that week. At the end of the week, there was no way we could figure out to deliver everything on the shorter timeline. And so my boss asked me to stay behind after the meeting. For another hour, he railed against me saying I was failing at this project and that he could not see me getting a good annual review in four months and that a promotion wasn't even on the table. 
this annual review would also include the project I had just received an award for, and is supposed to encompass 12 months of work, but he was basing this off of the first two weeks on this new team. At this point, I knew he was ready to use me as a scapegoat for his bad management, and started applying elsewhere. We continued working on the project, and sure enough, at the end of three months, we were still far from being able to deliver, and my boss was getting heat from up above. Right around this time, I received an offer from another company that would be the promotion I wanted and an even larger pay increase. I accepted the offer and negotiated my start date to be after my vacation, now three weeks away. That same day, my boss calls me into his office and tells me, we need to talk about this vacation. I reminded him that we had talked about it months before and that everything is booked, flights, hotels, etc. He would not let up and told me there was no way I could take three weeks off with how behind schedule we are. He told me I could go on my trip, but I could not take vacation and would be expected to be online during our business hours throughout the trip, 4 a.m. to 1 p.m. local time in my vacation spot. Q malicious compliance. Every morning while on vacation, I would log on at 4 a.m., check emails, answer questions on our internal chat, and do the minimum work expected, logging off as soon as it hit 1 p.m., all without burning any vacation. With one week left in vacation, I requested a conference call with my boss to give him my two weeks notice. He was shocked and tried everything to get me to stay and finish out the project, including bringing back up a possible promotion. I told him I had already accepted a job with a start date upcoming. I worked my last two weeks before moving on to my new job. Because my boss required me not to take vacation, the company had to pay out all of my accrued vacation once I left, a little less than seven weeks at this point, including the three weeks I had originally planned to take. Now short-staffed, I hear from other coworkers that the project missed two more adjusted deadlines and eventually the manager was demoted before being let go from the company. About six months later, the head of the first company asked me to lunch to offer me a role taking over my former boss's old position. I negotiated an even higher pay increase, as well as company equity, and ended up going back there for three more years. Okay, this story just kept giving and giving and giving. OP was an absolute genius in how they just shoved this back on the company. I mean, they got to sit on a beach having quote-unquote vacation while still getting fully paid for it, and then when they went back, they got a vacation time accrual payout? Oh, that was just beautiful. All right, our first story today comes to us from Extreme Conditions. Put that on my personal credit card? Okay, let's jump right in. In 2000, I was hired by a company in the construction industry. In 2002, they asked me to help start a new division of the company. They are the owners and the general manager. The general manager made it known he had a bug up his butt for me after my first year. Intermittent little digs, flippant attitude, demeaning, etc. Cut to after we get the new division up and running, and I request being able to start a web presence. Ownership is all over the endeavor. While the general manager brushes me off and says, it's your division, do what you want. My division functioned with a separate business name. As I'm purchasing the domain name, my thoughts turn to the mothership and how it has zero web presence. Checked out and lined up the actual two business names and several close permutations so they would be somewhat secure in knowing their business names couldn't be taken out from under them. I go to the general manager and ask for a check from the main company to pay for the domain names and he, again, brushes me off saying, it's your division, his favorite line, do what you want. You've got a credit card, expense it like anything else. I did start to ask, are you sure you want me to put it on my personal and it was curtly cut off. By 2004, my division was running at a 44% profit margin which netted $750,000 US per year. In the first six months of its existence, I'd already paid back the build-out, training, machines, equipment, all the startup and setup. That is how successful the division was. The general manager became jealous of my achievements and tried to seize control over operations. 
citing he was the general manager of the entire company, whereas prior, it was my division to do what I wanted. Each horn in by him, I'd deflect and defend my division. By 2005, I'd had enough and ended up quitting as I heard he was preparing to fire me to fully seize the shiny penny as his own and take all the credit. I planned ahead, saved money, quit, and took six months off. It was a spring to fall extravaganza of doing whatever the heck I chose. Good times. Good frickin' times. About a year later, I can't remember exactly how long, a charge appeared on my credit card for my former company's domain names. Being for several, the amount stood out like a sore thumb. I called and verified the charge and who or what it was for, and in my conversation with a very nice person, they said, yes, Mr. X, all of these names are registered to you. About three years after I left the old company, my phone rings, and guess what number pops up on the screen? Oh yeah, I let that go to voicemail. The message was from the bookkeeper, asking if I could return their call. Next day, here they try again, but straight to voicemail they go. After a week of messages that were now pleading me to call them back, I return the bookkeeper's call. Well, the cat came out of the bag, and the main company finally decided to build out a web presence and had shelled out a ton of money to do so. Think online catalog, interactive web page, all the things we expect now but were high tech then and were just coming into functional reality. Lo and behold, when they went to get their beautiful .com up and functioning, their exact name was taken as well as a string of similar ones they could have used had I not snatched them up. The bookkeeper asked me to release the names to them. I indicated that would be very easy to do. It's a simple matter of signing them off, no? They agreed as their anxious web builder had prepped them for the chat with me. I said I'd be happy to turn the keys to the kingdom over to them, but I wanted a few things. Reimbursed for all expenses up until that point for owning the domain names. A finder's fee, that pissed them off, but what can I say? I was yelled at to put their domain names on my personal credit card, and the general manager himself would have to hand deliver the check. That third line item was a sticking point, but dear Mr. Manager was forced to bend the knee. I mean, I certainly wasn't going to budge. General Manager shows up at the appointed place, hands me the check, and barks at me about returning their domain names to them today. He did this so loudly, people in the coffee shop we met at turned and stared. I laughed and said, after the check clears, sure, yeah. He balked and insisted I immediately transfer the names to them as I was holding up the entire show. As I left, I smiled and said, you're to blame here. You yelled at me to put the domain names on my credit card? He was absolutely fuming at this point. Besides, I love taking your advice to do what I want, remember? And I am. Okay, I'm not completely sure of the legalities on this one, but if OP was the rightful owner of those domain names, well, they should have charged that company a lot more to get them back. In fact, you'd think they could have sweetened the deal a little bit here, and maybe redirected those domains to some kind of, you know, raunchy website. <laughs> that would have made the company be willing to pay a lot more out for it. Although it might have opened them up to a massive suing, I don't know how that works. I'm sure you guys will let me know in the comments. Our next story today, which also has an update post, comes to us from Dio Bean. Boss told me to deep clean the back and to not come to front for any reason, so I did. Let's jump right in. I'm a 20-year-old male that works at a very popular restaurant in a very snobby area. My main job is to assist the servers in any way I can, so they only have to worry about sweet-talking the customers. I do all the heavy lifting for them, whether it's cleaning their tables or taking their drinks and food to their tables, I'm doing it, and all they have to focus on is making the customers laugh. They get tips that range from $17 to $40 per table, well, I make $8 an hour and get treated poorly. Enough backstory, cue the malicious compliance. My manager came up to me in a I'm better than you mood and told me to deep clean the floors, ice makers, walls, trash can, and racks, and to not come to the front for any reason. I'm very annoyed at this because none of those things are my job duties. We have a staff that deals with all the cleaning of the back so it didn't make any sense to have me do it. 
These tasks would have taken me an hour and a half max, but I was feeling a bit cheeky and decided to really deep clean the back until it was spotless. About 30 minutes later, the same manager comes up to me and tells me that there are four tables that need cleaning and two other tables just got sat and I need to bring their drinks to them. I looked at this man with the stare of a 20 year old that has no bills to pay. And I say, no, I'm not done cleaning. He looked shocked and responded angrily. You can finish later, they need help. And I countered with, no, it's filthy here. We don't want a health inspector to just walk into this filth, do we? He storms off like a toddler that didn't get their candy. Two hours go by and I'm on my hands and knees scrubbing as if I was working for chef Gordon Ramsay himself. The same manager comes back again with a smirk and says, wow, this looks like it's going to take you all day long. Maybe you should come to the front and help the servers since there's a huge Sunday rush. I replied with, you know, you might just be right. And I go back to cleaning. He storms off again. Fast forward to two minutes before my shift ends. My knees, legs, and fingers are all aching from cleaning. I shuffle my way to the front where my manager has been waiting for me. And he says, you finally decided to come help, huh? And I look at him without saying anything and clocked out. And then I tell him, sorry, I'm not clocked in. I walked out to my car while he was blowing my phone up. I didn't care. I had five days off back to back and he can't fire me since I did as he told me to. The moral of the story is, don't think you are better than someone that has nothing to lose. OP added a couple of edits at the bottom here. The first one says edit. For all the people that have been commenting that he can fire you, yeah, you are right, he could, but he won't do that because I'm the only one that is working the position and no one has applied to come work at the place for $8 an hour. There are more details to the story than what I told, so instead of trying to be smart, just ask, why do you say that? Instead of assuming I'm just some entitled kid who thinks they run the world. Thank you for reading. OP's second edit says, second edit, Good morning, everyone. Sorry I can't read most of y'all's post, but I'd like to say thank you and answer a couple questions on here. I don't have any living, food, or insurance bills. The only things I have to pay for are my flight school and saving up for a car, which I don't consider bills, since I'm not being hunted down for those. I am also having a job interview tomorrow at a place that pays $17 an hour, and I'll be working one-third of what I am at my current restaurant job. Lastly, I do get tip shares from the servers, but it goes straight to my paycheck. So that means that the servers can report less of what they made and give me less. So instead of making $8 an hour, I'm making $9 an hour. I did the math through my paycheck. Thank you for reading. P.S. Update will be on Friday. Jumping right into the update that was posted four days ago, it says, Starting off, sorry for not updating on Friday the 10th like I said I would. Life got in the way. Plus, several events happened. This will be a decent sized update. Friday rolled around after I was coming back from the small vacation I had. The location had no service. I greeted some of the servers I'm cool with and they all gave me an oh crap look since apparently my boss had been trying to call me to come, open, and close on Wednesday and Thursday. Obviously, I didn't know this since I had no service where I had been at the time. I make my way to the boss expecting to get a freak out from him, which surprisingly he didn't have. He welcomed me back and asked a couple common questions about my trip. After five minutes of talking, he springs on me, since you didn't come in on Wednesday and Thursday, you need to come in Monday and Tuesday of next week. To which I replied, did you schedule me for those days? And he immediately replies with, no, but I know you have nothing to do since you're just a team. At this point, my face just looked like I had seen a bear riding a bicycle while juggling bowling pins. I was absolutely amazed at how those words came out of his mouth with such ease, like he really believed he had any sort of power over me. I paused for a moment and said, no, I don't think I will be doing that since I'm not currently scheduled on those days. I will not show up on those days. He then tried to argue that he had to come in on his day off to cover my shifts. I learned from the servers that he never showed up. The last thing I said to him before I started working was, this isn't my problem, hire more people, and walked off. Saturday, the 11th. Today was looking like it was going to be pretty mundane, busy floor, a lot of food needing to be run, tables that need to be put back together. 
pretty usual tasks of the job until my boss showed up and started barking orders, even though the restaurant was very packed and we needed all hands on deck. But obviously, that's not what he wanted. He couldn't care less if the restaurant went to the toilet. All he cared about was being in control. The boss tells me and a server to go clean the storage closet, and if we don't, we can just be cut. We both reluctantly go and do it since he had four tables to attend to, and I wanted to help him so he wouldn't get bad tips just because a man-child wants to give tasks that can be done later and lay it out on the table for us to see. Super Bowl Sunday, the 12th, was supposed to be a really slow day since we don't have any TVs on the walls and we don't serve bar food. But as soon as church got out, we were super slammed to the point you couldn't see the front door. It stayed like that until 3 p.m. and I was just ready to leave. So I did. I clocked out on time as you would at any other job. And my boss saw that and said, you're not being a team player right now. You're just going to abandon ship just like that? To which I reply, well, yeah, you only have me scheduled for the time scheduled, not for when it's convenient for you. I have no problem working over the time I'm scheduled for, but I just can't with this snarky remarks and annoying temper tantrums he has on the daily. I'm just very done with him. So why would I go above and beyond for him? Plus, it was the Super Bowl. And of course, I had plans. I wanted to hang out with my friends and not work. Thursday the 16th, I received an email from the new place I'm going to be working at and I got the job. The new job will be paying me $16 an hour, double of what I've been making. I also start Monday. I had gone to work the same day and told my boss, I will not be able to put my two weeks in. However, I will work through this Sunday and that will be my last day working for you. I hope that is enough time for you so you can find my replacement. And if this doesn't work for you, I can always make my last day be today. Since Texas doesn't require employees and employers to submit a two-week resignation. He starts to freak out since Monday to Thursday of next week, the restaurant has a bunch of large reservations. He replies with, if you stay with us, I can give you a big raise for all your hard work. My eyebrows raise since there is no way that his raise will match my new employer's rate. Intrigued, I ask, how much were you thinking of giving me? Drum roll, clears throat, I can give you a 25 cent raise, which will make your paychecks a little bit heavier. I am dumbfounded. My brain packed up and jumped off my head. This was the best deal I could have gotten ever. Screw the new job. Who can say no to an extra $20 to their paycheck? <laughs> Kidding. I politely declined and told him I had already made up my mind, and for the rest of my shift, he was in the office scrambling around posting job listings and looking at applications. It's really crazy how someone goes from being a complete dictator to a servant when they lose their power. These last two days, he's been nothing but cupcakes and sunshine because he knows I can leave whenever I like. Thank you all for reading. I will try to post an update this Sunday on my last day working here, if there is a big enough event. OP really needs to look into if this new employer has a referral for bringing other employees on, because they could go back to that old workplace of theirs, tell all the other people there that aren't making good money about this new job, and try to get them to come over and make some money in the process. I mean, I'm willing to bet OP wasn't the only one being treated like crap by that manager, I've had a manager like that myself in the past, <laughs> screw you Rick, and you just want to shove it to them. Now if I could have taken other employees with me when I left my job, oh, I would have done it in a heartbeat. So I recommend that OP does the same thing. This is another one of those stories that proves the point that most people don't quit crappy jobs, they quit crappy managers. Most jobs aren't bad, people are bad. <laughs> a 25 cent raise. Should have told the boss what he could do with that quarter. Our next story today comes to us from CurrentFly8346. Oh, that was Katie's job. Let's jump right in. I was working for a manufacturer years ago. It was a small operation run by a husband, CEO, and wife with a sister business of a front end platform that was run by the wife's brother. The husband's mom and some cousins also worked there between the two businesses. With an operation like this, you had the typical micromanagement from CEO, minimum wage pay for top dollar performance expectations, and the general nonsense you can expect in a setup like this. 
I had this job while in college and needed to build my resume. They let me have a flexible schedule so I could leave early for my night classes and when I had midterms and finals, so I knew I had to stick it out. After about six months of working there, my job responsibilities grew tremendously, but my salary did not. There was a high turnover rate in the office from the we're a family environment that meant actual family got special treatment and everyone else was expected to do a crazy amount of work without getting any credit. One of my friends, we'll call her Katie, was looking for work and my company was hiring. I told her what she was getting into, but as a recent college grad looking for office experience, she decided to give it a shot. First, my referral bonus never came, even after she worked there for 90 days, and I was told that I shouldn't inquire about it because I referred someone to help the company, not to get the extra money. I wasn't in a position to push, so I didn't. I trained Katie in her role as she was taking some of my old responsibilities. Well, the CEO and the wife didn't like how much time the two of us spent talking to each other, or how much time we spent away from our desks, which was genuinely us using the restroom and getting water. This made no sense because I handled product onboarding, and Katie suggested products for curated events, so it was important that she knew what new products were coming out and when she could start promoting them, so that stock wouldn't sit in the warehouse. We separately had meetings with the CEO and office manager, putting us on probation for this behavior. Q, malicious compliance. We stopped talking as much in the office, effectively cutting me off from curated events and making it impossible for Katie to use our new products on the upcoming events. Events could be scheduled anywhere from a week to several months in advance, so it was a great way to boost sales and visibility of our new items. My friend ended up getting fired for having a brain and questioning some of the stupid policies. Also, for doing something so outrageous as taking her unpaid lunch hour, showing up at 9 and leaving at 5. Normally, I would have gone back into the platforms to curate events until they found someone to take over the role, but I was petty. I had been there for a little over a year. I was training employees, teaching myself the ins and outs of all our retailers' back ends to upload products, coordinating with our factories overseas, the freight companies, and our warehouse so that products would be live as soon as we had stock, and was still getting paid like I did for the minimal role I had when I got hired. So not my job, not my problem. Fast forward a few months, the CEO decides to show up to work on the office floor instead of working out of his private office. Whenever he was on the floor, he was always super loud and disruptive to the general flow. I hear him talk about sales from the past few months, specifically about sales from events, so naturally my ears perk up. He starts getting louder. I don't get it. There's this huge decline in sales. None of our new products are getting any traction. I haven't been addressed, so I keep tapping away at my computer and act oblivious. He calls over the office manager, and they start hashing it out. Six months ago, the sales for our new items went down significantly. I'm thinking, yeah, duh, that's when you told me and Katie to stop talking. The initial data that was supplied with product photos and descriptions weren't clear. It would have been a very long process for Katie to sift through the new products to try and match them to events, as opposed to what we used to do, which was she would tell me the theme and what she was looking for, and I'd get her data on a short list of items that she could review to match to said events, as opposed to dumping 100 products on her. Then, three months ago, they became almost non-existent. Sales have dropped almost 70% with these events. Three months ago is when Katie got fired. Eventually, the two of them piece together that they need to blame whoever is curating events, and the CEO starts asking everyone in the office, whose responsibility is to work on events? Finally, it gets to a point where I can't stay quiet. The office is too small, and I play too big a role in product management. So I chime in, oh, wasn't that Katie's responsibility? CEO replies, she hasn't worked here in three months. You mean to tell me no one has been submitting products for three months? He is livid, and it's clear that I am now in the path of his rage. Why has no one been handling this? Everyone is kind of looking around and the office manager, let's call her Karen, starts shifting the blame onto me, since technically Katie was in my department. 
once the finger pointing started, I was prepared to defend myself. Well, Karen, I thought you were the one who was in charge of managing and keeping track of every employee's role. So Karen replies, I am, but you knew this is an important part of our sales and marketing. I reply with, the week before she was let go, didn't you specifically get all of her passwords and a complete list of all of her tasks? Karen replies, yes. She is clearly concerned with where I'm going with this. And after she was let go, did you communicate to me that those tasks were now my responsibility? Well, no, but I shouldn't have had to. But you're in charge of delegating tasks and making sure all work is assigned to employees. Are you implying that I was supposed to know that you had a list of tasks unassigned? Why would I assume that you didn't delegate those to another team member when that's an essential part of your role? Needless to say, Karen was very annoyed with me, but I wasn't taking the fall. They didn't ask me to curate events. Karen handled that which got them to hire another person very quickly because it was too much work for her on top of her other duties. The story of me and the new girl needs its own post, so I'll end this one here. OP, you can't leave us on a cliffhanger. Come on, we need this new story now. We deserve it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but in this story and the previous one, they both seemed like they really didn't have anything to lose, so they were willing to push back against the management. Now, if you're a family person, you're responsible for taking care of a whole family of people, and you only have this job without something else lined up, I don't think you're going to be anywhere near as willing to call out your management team like the OPs did in this story and the previous one. But I'd love to know what you guys think. Please comment down below. All right, our last story today comes to us from Gloomy Ideal 3670. Dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Let's jump right in. I work for a family business with 30 plus employees. This is a company that has friends and family members as top tiered management and often made up rules whenever they felt like it. When new employees join the company, they sign a basic employment contract stating the compensation, benefits, and work hours. The company does not have a written code of conduct. One particular manager is a friend of the president. Let's call her Sally. Sally manages a team of eight employees, including myself. We aren't allowed to make small talk while working, and we are required to let her know when we start taking our breaks and when we return from breaks. Sally interjects whenever a team member is asking another team member questions because Sally is a micromanager. Sally also makes us come to work early once a week for 30 minutes unpaid so that she can recap the previous week and often uses this time to tell us what we're doing wrong. She made it clear that this weekly meeting is mandatory. During one meeting, she brought up expectations for continued employment at the workplace. No swearing, no talking bad about customers amongst ourselves, no personal phones on desks, no music during work hours, no talking to other departments unless it's work-related, etc. Then she brought up dress code. It's important to note that we've never heard of a dress code at work and our jobs do not require face-to-face -face interactions with customers. Most of our dealings are via phones or emails. We may see a customer drop by once or twice a year. Most of the team members wear hoodies and long sleeve t-shirts with jeans or leggings. I usually wear a simple top with pants with my hair neatly blow dried. Apparently, that's not appropriate enough. Sally said we should try to dress better and more professionally to keep up with the company's image. Her sell was, dress not for the job you have, but the job you want. She made us all sign a document citing the topic of discussion at the meeting. You want us to dress for the job we want? Okay. A few of my colleagues and I decided to maliciously comply the following day. I put my hair in a messy bun, wore my Costco leggings and my husband's old t-shirt. That was my everyday look when I was unemployed. Sally saw me when I walked through the door and asked why I was underdressed. I said, you asked us to dress for the job I want. I want to go back to being a stay-at-home mom. I loved staying at home. She said, that's not what I meant. I meant bigger aspirations and goals, as she looked at me with exasperation. Shortly after, my other colleagues showed up one after the other, two wearing full workout gear, and one wore her anime costume. One guy wore a t-shirt with expletives. The president noticed and asked us if Halloween came early, and we told him what Sally said. 
I don't know what happened, but safe to say, there was no mention of any dress code since. So OP, these 30 minute meetings where you're not getting paid, well, those are illegal. And the only reason they keep getting away with that and saving the company money on that time is because nobody is making a stink about it. Now, I have a feeling if you were able to get all of those coworkers to go with you on dressing for the job they wanted, you'd probably be able to get a bunch of them to report that meeting as illegal as it is and maybe get the company to do something about it or even get them to refuse to go. Because if enough people do that, it'll send a very clear message to the management. I mean, if one person complains, it's a bit annoying, but if a whole bunch of people complain, well, that's a problem that they need to fix. There's safety in numbers, OP, and you need to use that to your advantage. Our first story today comes to us from Graveyard Pixie. No vacation or PTO until October? Okay, I'm taking all of October off. Let's jump right in. Something happened at my husband's work last night that reminded me of this decade-old story. For context, at the time, my husband worked overnights at one of the largest supermarket operators in North America. I was about six months pregnant and the store he worked in had a change in who the store manager was. And when I went shopping, I used either a wheelchair or a scooter with a cart on it due to a disability that makes it difficult for me to walk under normal circumstances. Background. Originally, we had felt pretty lucky that between all the pregnancy tests I had done to confirm that yes, I am in fact pregnant, and at the ultrasound, the earliest and latest due date we had been given all fell in the first week of September. So, my husband had planned to use one of his weeks of vacation that week, and then use his paternity leave after that week so he would be able to be there while I was at the hospital in recovery, and for the first days of our baby's life. His boss seemed genuinely confused by the request. He was 22, single, and called his truck his baby but had said something along the lines of, hey man, it's your vacation, you should use it how you want to. Then, about a week later, I came home from one of my doctor's appointments to a message on the answering machine saying, unfortunately, I have to deny your request for a vacation and paternity leave in September, as someone with more seniority has put in for those days off as well. I hope this doesn't cause problems between you and your wife. I burst into tears on the spot but my husband said he'd go talk to the person who had requested those days off, explain that he had asked for that time off because it's when the baby is due and see if he could offer them something to give him those days off instead. Unfortunately, it was one of his coworkers who was going to have major surgery and needed that time off to recover, so we couldn't ask him to trade vacation weeks for us. My husband put in for time off in the second week of September and is denied. Then he tries the third week and is denied again. But this time his boss tells him that he won't be able to use any of his vacation time until October due to his position and who has time off. Cue the malicious compliance. We realized that because this boss was new, he probably didn't realize that my husband had been saving all his vacation days, PTO and paternity leave. When we added up all the time, it amounted to three weeks of time off. And if we worked it around to start around when his days off were, he would be able to be home with the baby from October 1st until November 9th. His co-workers on the night crew and several of his friends on the morning crew felt that he had been seriously shafted by the new boss. So they got in on this plan with us. We waited until the boss's day off, and that's when my husband put in the schedule for the time off he was requesting, which was approved by the scheduling manager and the night crew manager. This was in July, so the only thing left to do was wait. Our baby was born in the early hours of the morning, about two days before our earliest due date, after 29 hours of stage two and three labor. I ended up having an induction due to the fact I had been in early stage labor since the beginning of August, and it just wasn't progressing. When my husband called the night shift manager to say that I was going to the hospital to give birth, he told my husband to call in if he was going to miss any more days of work, and they would make sure it got covered. It wasn't PTO, but it was considered an excused absence. After I came home from the hospital, my mom started staying overnight with us temporarily to help out preparing meals, taking care of the dog and the household chores, so I could focus on taking care of myself and the baby. That first month home was pretty rough, 
So I was relieved when October rolled around and I finally had his help 24 seven and my mom was able to take a break. The aftermath. First up was the three days of paternity leave. On the morning of the fifth day of his 40 day long vacation, the boss woke me up at 6 a.m. wanting to talk to my husband. I told him he was feeding the baby and asked why he was calling. He said he was checking in to see why my husband no call no showed the night before. And I said sarcastically, oh no, that's terrible. I'll go get him for you. I put the phone on speaker so my husband can talk to his boss while he's feeding the baby so I get to hear everything. The boss, very smugly, informed my husband that his paternity leave was over, and since he didn't come in the night before, he would be written up for a no-call no-show. My husband said, yes, I know my paternity leave is over, but my first vacation week started last night. First vacation week? Yeah, I have three. I was going to use one in September, one in October, and one in November, but since you told me I couldn't use any PTO until October, I decided to just take all of October off to be with my wife and newborn. I'll call you back after I look into this. I don't know how I managed to stay silent and not laugh at this conversation, but somehow I did. We got a call back later that day and it went something like this. Yeah, I'm gonna need you to come into work tonight. I never would have approved your request for time off if I knew you were taking the whole month off. You didn't approve it. The night manager and scheduling manager both approved this, so I'm not coming in tonight. Clearly thinking this is a gotcha moment, I didn't approve it and I need you to come in tonight, so you'll be here at 10 on your regular schedule for the rest of the month or you'll be written up. No, I won't. I submitted the request in July and you never denied my request. It's been approved by the other managers and it's already started, so it's too late for you to deny it now. I'll call you back. After that, my husband called the union steward to confirm that he was in the clear, and they say that he is. We got another call the following Sunday, which was my husband's next day off, asking if he would be coming in that night since he wasn't listed as being on vacation in the system. Am I on the schedule? No. Then it's my night off, so no. He hung up after that. But we got a call like that every night my husband wasn't on the schedule due to it being one of his regular days off, and him not being marked as being on vacation in the system. Some of the ladies in the bakery and deli section of the store put together a card shower for us and gave them gift cards since we never said anything to them about when my baby shower was or where we were registered, oops. Later that week, I made a trip into the store one afternoon to pick up some stuff and introduce them to the baby and my mom came along too. While we were over there, the store manager came up and said, you must be husband's wife. I was feeling petty, so I pointed out that we would have met sooner if he didn't have a habit of running away and hiding in his office when customers approached him. I don't know if that irritated him or if he was planning on saying this next anyway, but the next words out of his mouth were, you don't look like you need help with the baby. Husband said he was taking time off to help you with the baby because you have a disability, but I guess you don't need it, huh? The bakery deli ladies glared at him and my mom went pale because she knows I usually react very strongly to those comments. But my mom also raised me to be civil and mannerly, so I just smiled and said, I hope you don't speak to your employees like that. That can get you fired, bless your heart. And one of his employees told him I was right, so he sulked off. He seemed so desperate to find any reason he could to force my husband to come back to work before the end of the month. I started wondering if he was being petty and might try to retaliate after my husband came back to work, or if he was just desperate. So I called one of my husband's co-workers. Remember when I said new boss was 22? Well, he also had a habit about bragging about how he started working for the company as a cashier when he was 17 and worked his way up to management in just five years. At some point after the baby was born, District came and did a walkthrough and it turned out his dad was the district manager, and he didn't work his way up to management, he was a Nepo baby. That burned bridges with more than a few employees. Then he turned up in a brand new truck and said with the year end bonus he was going to get, he could pay it off in one go. Several employees walked, including two on the night crew. Since my husband was on paternity leave, he had to work overnights to make up the slack. 
He'd never showed up to cover overnights when they were shorthanded before that, so we figured he was desperate to get my husband to come back because working overnights was cutting into his dating time. Finally, the end of my husband's vacation time came and his boss called again. You used up your paternity leave and your vacation weeks. You're coming in tonight, right? No, I still have PTO days left this year. And since I won't be able to use them all between November and the end of December, and they don't roll over into next year, I decided to take them now. Well, when are you coming back to work? November 10th. Boss called back the next day to tell my husband that actually he had used up his paternity leave while he was at the hospital giving birth, so he would have to use PTO to cover that. And actually he had used a week of PTO when he took me to the hospital with fake labor. So actually he would be coming back to work on November 1st. My husband called the union steward and filed a complaint that his boss was retroactively deciding what counted as paternity leave and what counted as PTO and trying to force him to use PTO days to cover days where he either went in late or left a couple of hours and then came back and stayed late to make up the missed hours. He went in to fill out some paperwork and we didn't hear from his boss again between then and when he got replaced at the end of the following January. OP added a quick edit onto the end of the story. It says, edit. To clarify some questions in the comments regarding FMLA, we didn't use it. This was us cashing in all of my husband's vacation he had for the year, as well as PTO days, we think in total it was 29 days. Plus, three days paternity leave we stretched to 40 by only applying for time off on the days he was actually scheduled to work. At the time, the company only offered three days paid paternity leave. I don't recall how much they offered unpaid or the total amount though, so we decided to just use the paid days since my parents were close by. As for why we put up with the calls coming in for so long, simply put, we were both exhausted and as much as we wanted him to stop calling, period, we didn't want to offend him since neither of us knew how long he'd be there. We had expected him to be gone in three months like most of the other rotating cast of store management had been, so when he stayed longer than that, we decided it was just easier to deal with him long enough to enforce a boundary. It was really interesting to read through the comments on this one and see the different amounts of parental leave that are allowed depending on the country that you live in. Apparently in the USA, it's actually some of the worst amounts of parental leave that you can get. Three days is absolutely ridiculous. Now, I don't remember exactly what it is up here in Canada where I am, but I know I was able to split the time off with my wife however we wanted to do it for a period of 12 months, I believe. So I could have taken three months, she could have taken nine. I believe in Germany, there's 14 months of parental leave that can be divided up between the parents as well. It just baffles me that they don't have something like this in the US. Now, did you notice that part where they said, bless your heart? Isn't that the polite Southern way of saying, well, ain't you a pretty little dumb thing? All right, our next story today comes to us from Meekly Enthusiasm. Entire class skips optional early start to lab. We were given an hour for lunch and we're going to take all of our time. Let's jump right in. I'm a second year veterinary student. This is the time when we start our live surgery labs. We work in teams of three students, a surgeon, an assistant, an anesthetist, and are absolutely overseen by certified specialists, anesthesiologists and surgeons, and many experienced vet nurses as well. We have lectures 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. Lunch is 11 to 12. Our lab begins at 12 p.m. sharp. However, we were told we have the option to come to lab early and begin. It became very clear after the first week, this is an expectation, not an option, that we will skip lunch or eat during lecture and come straight to the OR. During one lab at 11.50 a.m., the anesthesiologist yelled at a student for a few minutes in the pharmacy area while getting drugs for lab for not having his patient ready and waiting in the induction room, 10 minutes before lab even begins. And this group was set to induce during the last wave, normally one to one and a half hours into lab. There's no reason to be an hour early when your group is final wave. Being on time is sufficient, and they were actually still early. Our class has been getting berated by this anesthesiologist, as well as some of the surgeons in this lab. Just as one example, a student surgeon asked for help. A surgical resident came over from another patient to help, 
and she was now not sterile. The resident told the student she was holding her forceps wrong, proceeded to grab them from her hands, and then made the student leave her patient on the table to re-scrub, re-gown, and re-glove, and open a new instrument pack, all because she wanted to ask a question. This is common technique they will use on us when we've done something incorrect to get us to remember it next time. Well, the entire class is fed up with this. Our class called a meeting about it, and we all decided we are all going to start showing up to lab at 11.50 to 11.55 a.m., only 5 to 10 minutes early. Not for petty reasons either, but it's a matter of patient safety as well. Several students have fainted from skipping lunch to go and operate instead. We were given 11 to 12 for lunch, and we were going to take all of our time. So that's what we did. At 11.40 a.m., one of the surgeons came to our lecture hall, where the majority of us stay and eat lunch, and asked us why we're not in lab yet. A student at the front of the room said simply, lab begins at 12 noon. The surgeon gave us a long spell about professionalism, and how we are being inappropriate, and putting our patients at risk, and she left. The OR is a two-minute walk from the lecture hall, so we finished lunch and all showed up around 11.55. The clinicians were very mad about it and reported our class to the dean, and so the dean called a school-wide meeting about it. Some of our classmates spoke eloquently about our reasons and our actual patient safety concern, turning it right back on the clinicians citing patient safety. And the school claims to care immensely about student mental health, since this profession has one of the highest suicide rates and our own class even suffered a loss and cutting our break and lunch is no way to support us. Beyond that, the schedule says we begin at 12, and we are still showing up a few minutes early to ensure we can begin right at 12. Ultimately, the dean just released a statement saying they cannot force us to begin lab an hour early, and we will start at 12 when the dean's office scheduled lab to begin. It's a small win for us. Certainly we will face backlash, but we will have a break to eat at least. Our class is known for not putting up with BS from the school. We got a dinosaur of a professor fired for comments she made to a student in the middle of a lecture, after she had terrorized students at this school for decades. She forgot our lectures were automatically recorded on Zoom during COVID. We're hated by the clinicians, but at least the classes behind us are having a slightly better time. OP for this story added a quick edit on at the bottom as well. It says, edit. About the fainting thing, yes, from skipping a single meal, most healthy adults shouldn't faint. Add on top of that the mental stress of operating for the first few times, the heat from the surgical lights being covered head to toe in a non-breathable sterile barrier which traps in your body heat, a mask putting that heat back on your face, having to stand relatively still in one place for hours, no access to water for hours, you can't move your arms out of the sterile field, so limited and no stretching, plus the sight of blood being a common trigger for vasovagal syncope, and you have plenty of lightheaded or fainting students. Skipping food is added insult to injury when you last ate at 6 a.m. It's now 4 p.m., you haven't had water since noon, and you're overheating and stressed. Not to mention, vet school is a concentration of type A high-achieving perfectionists with chronic stress from constant high-stakes exams. Fail, you're out of the program, some of which are right before you go off into operating or maybe occurring the next day, rampant anxiety and depression, sleep deprivation from our schedule and or insomnia. I know several classmates with disordered eating or full-blown EDs. It's not merely an isolated incident of skipping lunch one time. I truly don't understand this expectation for people to be places earlier when they're not scheduled to be there. And this goes for any kind of workplace, not just in veterinary like what we're reading here. You're living by the clock. You should enforce your activities to the clock. You be professional and show up still a few minutes before you start, but you definitely don't need to be there an hour early. These people were being unprofessional, demanding, and entitled which unfortunately I think happens a lot in that specific profession. Our next story today comes to us from Department Large 9472. By all means, eat your words. Let's jump right in. 
I used to work as a food receiver in a retirement home kitchen. I won't say the name, but I will say it sounds vaguely Nordic. When I took over as food receiver in the primary kitchen, didn't have much training. I was just told, you helped the previous guy, you know the most, the job is yours now. Over the next almost eight years, got that place maximized for peak use of space. Every now and then, we would get a new head chef, and they always made the mistake of trying to run it like a restaurant. Usually, in about two weeks, they'd realize that it was a different vibe and tone, and adjust accordingly. Had a great head chef as a boss for about five years. He knew that since deliveries were food and to some degree perishable, my schedule needed to be a little fluid and flexible to account for late deliveries while not having me rack up overtime. We worked out a great system where I basically set my own hours and got everything done. Fast forward to a regime change. Head chef was a tool, but with him came a woman whose job title was never told to any of us in the kitchen. We were just told she outranked all of us. First thing she did was decide I would no longer have a fluid schedule. My shifts would be posted on the board like all the others two weeks in advance. I didn't like it, but okay, fair enough. Cut to about two weeks later, I had to leave early for a dentist appointment. That had been submitted and approved months ago. I reminded her the day before and the day of. Day after, she gives me a dressing down and a written reprimand for leaving before end of scheduled shift. She told me she didn't care what happened before. She never had papers for this request. Luckily for me, the head of the entire dining department, even above head chef, told her that she had been given all those time off approved papers when she started. And if my shift didn't reflect my pre-approved leaving early, it was her fault for not paying attention. Unluckily, she decided to take it out on me, saying that, from now on, once schedule is posted, no changes unless it's in writing and signed by both of us minimum of two days prior. No exceptions. I looked at the calendar and saw I'd get to have fun and get a paycheck. See, being a food receiver, a monthly job of mine was to do end of month inventory on all food, beverage, and cleaning items. I had actually created the inventory paperwork myself. So instead of being alphabetical, the items were all listed together based on which area they were stored in. Dishwasher chemical closet, freezer, dry food storage, soda syrup room, etc. Meaning after a few months, I could go room to room quickly and be done in less than two hours. Catch was, it had to be done either last thing, last day of a month, or first thing, first day of a month, and could not do two in the same month. With no weekend deliveries, I worked Monday to Friday. Now, under the old cool head chef, if I had to do it on a Saturday or a Sunday, I'd just come in and do it, then leave early on a slow day, canceling extra hours. And lo and behold, this was one of those months, where inventory would have to be done on a Saturday or Sunday. Days she had me down as off on the calendar. I grinned like Tim Curry in Home Alone 2 and waited. Sure enough, last Friday of the month, she asks me, which day are you coming in to do inventory? I told her I wasn't. I was scheduled off. She goes into a tirade about, it's your job. You don't tell me no. I'll have you written up, etc. I calmly told her making the schedule was her job and responsibility, not mine. This earned me, I don't care what the schedule says, you're coming in this weekend, to which I sweetly and sarcastically asked, if she had a paper signed by both of us and dated no later than yesterday about us agreeing to this switch. You know, I said, the policy you created when you got called out by head office for not properly handling my scheduled early shift. If smartphones had been commonly around in 2009, I would have taken a picture of her face. I found out from weekend crew, it took her almost an entire day to do it herself. That was first of many times she found out the fun way. About half the tasks I did under the old regime were technically not required by my work position. I just did them when I had extra time to help a boss I respected. Update number one, or DLC for the gamers. Some of you have asked to hear more about the head chef mentioned in passing. I'll add the first and short instance now, the second and longer later. My failing is I get mad when I start thinking. 
and without realizing it, I end up filling the story with lots of insults and swears, and I need to rewrite to be somewhat professional. Chef Weenie number one. So for the head chef and his nimrodic attitude, as I stated before, my shift was Monday to Friday. Never found out if this was a company policy or just for the kitchen staff, but technically, we in kitchen were supposed to work either one day every weekend or every other full weekend. The previous cool chef realized that only food delivered on weekend was three boxes of pastries. And Monday to Friday, there was a constant stream of food orders I needed to either place or receive and quality check. So he circumvented and had me, the food receiver, work the days when there was actually food to receive. Now, Chef Weenie comes around. He thinks I've politicked to get all weekends off and tells me, you're coming in Sunday. I tried to explain to him there's a logistical reason I have off weekends. He just interrupts me, claiming that my days of special treatment are over and that even though there's no deliveries, just find something to do, clean the freezer, fridge, or something. So I come in on Sunday. Now, I kept areas pretty clean on a daily basis, only falling behind by a day from time to time if I had heavy deliveries or something. Two walk-in freezers, one walk-in fridge, one dry food storage room, and one soda syrup room. Except this Sunday, they were all recently cleaned with no issues, so I spent eight hours pottering around. Now, a side tangent about the delivery schedule, Chef place orders for the raw meat and seafood and fresh produce daily deliveries. I placed orders for twice a week ice cream deliveries, twice a week milk deliveries, and the big orders of bulk foods. I forget ice cream and milk schedule, but bulk orders were placed on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday deliveries. Everything got ordered on Friday for the first delivery day of the following week. So back to the week. I've worked Sunday into Wednesday now, and it's before they added me to the printed schedule, so I go to the chef and ask what my two days off that week are going to be. That's company policy, by the way, not entitlement. He says, well, take Saturday off, there's no deliveries. I then ask about my second day off. He looks at the calendar and gets an, oh, fornicate me, look. Starts stammering about all the orders that need placed or received both of those days. I agree that yes, there are a lot of deliveries and orders to be taken care of, but repeat that I need a second day off per company policy. He then starts in about how no one else here really knows how to place or take care of orders. I hold firm that it's not my problem. I'm supposed to have two days off. The heads of dining for the entire campus get involved. Right away, the chef is asked, why did you have him work a day when there's no deliveries? So, A, I got the next day, Thursday, off. B, chef had to scramble to get Friday orders placed for weekend, not even knowing where the order forms were. C, he didn't schedule me for any more weekends. And yes, that's the shorter incident. Now, OP mentioned that they were going to post a longer incident, but at the time of this recording, it looks like they haven't updated with that longer post. So, I'll keep an eye on this one and update it at a later date. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Illustrious Tank 356 It says, A lot of clown managers need to learn that oftentimes, the best method of management is just leave people the F alone. As a middle manager myself, that's what I strive for. People who do the work know exactly what they're doing, and I don't get involved. Awesome. I get paid for doing very little, and my job would only be handling exceptions when they raise, or just lending a helping hand wherever I could. If there's one thing I learned about being a manager, it was to surround yourself by people who are smarter than you and can figure out things themselves. Micromanaging will absolutely get you nowhere. And if you're coming into an established business as a new manager, look around and see what's working well, because most of the people there are gonna know their jobs already and you can just sit back and let them do their thing. I mean, if you've got a good team, being a middle manager can actually be a very cushy job where you do next to nothing. You're basically the buffer between the workers below you and the management above you, making sure that the management above you doesn't have their crap roll downhill to the workers below you. You're the buffer. Figure that out. 
All right, our first story today comes to us from the Invisibun. Check with your boss about your availability? Sure, let's jump right in. I'm the HR manager of a medium-sized company based out of the United States. We are in an industry that relies heavily on most people having an assistant to manage their schedule, handle their phones, etc. I had someone tell me on a Wednesday that their assistant was leaving. Let's call the assistant Andy. I talked to Andy who said his last day would be the next Friday. It's less than two weeks notice, which is annoying, but not illegal. And I understand that things happen, so I'm not going to put up a stink about it. Andy was a nightmare for the next week and a half. When trying to schedule interviews for replacements, he kept insisting on prioritizing certain candidates because he wanted to do it his way. He wouldn't follow our recruiting protocol and complained to his boss that we were pushing back when we most certainly weren't. But the worst part was scheduling the transition meeting and exit interview. At my company, our policy is to conduct a transition meeting and exit interview together. I do these meetings and they are usually pretty harmless. I'll give the employee their final paycheck as required by law, tell them about how to sign up for benefits after they leave if they want, COBRA, share info on porting over their retirement, etc. After going over all the transition information, I'll conduct a brief exit interview, asking them about how we can improve the working experience, etc. I always tell them that this exit interview is for their benefit as a final means of giving feedback to us, but I also make it clear that they don't have to share anything they don't want to. All in all, these meetings usually take somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. At first, I had a time on hold with Andy to do an exit interview on his last day. He then emailed me and said he wouldn't be able to do an exit interview because his priority was wrapping things up for his boss. Let's call him Ben. I let him know that I needed to be able to give him his final paycheck and additional information. He told me to just leave the paycheck on his desk. By this point, I'm fed up with him because his emails are incredibly rude. So I CC my boss the head of HR, let's call her Carol. I tell Andy that there's more than just the final paycheck that I need to share, and that I'd be more than happy to share more about our company policies in our meeting. I also said he's welcome to reach out to anyone on the HR team to ask. Andy ignores my email. I follow up the next morning. I run into him in the elevator, and he literally refuses to acknowledge me, not even to say good morning or smile awkwardly. He ignores this email too. By the afternoon, I'm over it. I tell Carol, who calls Andy. Carol says, Hey, I heard from OP that she's having a hard time getting a hold of you to schedule an exit interview. He responds that he's just so busy wrapping things up for his boss, and he really appreciates us following up, but no, he won't be available. And if there are any issues, we can reach out to his boss. Cue the malicious compliance. Carol lets him know that this isn't optional and that it'll only be 15 minutes, but if he's so busy, we can certainly reach out to Ben to make sure there's time carved out. He stutters and isn't able to make a coherent sentence. Ben says, we don't have to do that. Carol says, it's okay, we understand the need to make sure Ben is on board. So we'll call Ben on his cell, and she hangs up. We then call Ben, and she tells him, I'm sorry to do this, but Andy let us know he won't be available for an exit interview, could you make sure he has time for it? We're trying to schedule something and are having a hard time. He asks how long, and she says 15 minutes. He says, that's effing ridiculous. He should have 15 minutes. I'll call him and take care of it right now. Carol thanks him, and we continue to have our meeting. A few minutes later, Andy comes by and is fuming. He demands that we do the exit interview at that moment. I calmly tell him, there are important documents I need to prepare, which is why we are trying to schedule a time. Carol then calmly tells him that there are policies and procedures to follow when you leave a company. The assistant says he doesn't appreciate us going to Ben, and that he felt really disrespected. Carol gently reminds him that he said it was okay to check in with Ben, and we're glad it's a priority now, and how does 10am sound tomorrow? Andy stormed down the hallway, and we had our exit interview the next day at 10 a.m. Best part? It would have been a brief 15 minutes, but then Andy got argumentative, and we went over time. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, there's one from a user called CFWY Dirk. It says, You kinda lost me here. 
When trying to schedule interviews for replacements, he kept insisting on prioritizing certain candidates because he wanted to do it his way. He wouldn't follow our recruiting protocol and complain to his boss that we were pushing back. Uh, I don't do HR, but you let an assistant who is leaving have a say and let them prioritize interviews for their replacement? Crazy. I agree with the commenter on this one because why would they let somebody who is on their way out the door do that? If they have no foot still in the company and no benefit to them, what's to say they're going to help bring on the best person for the job? It seems like in this case, they were trying to prioritize people they knew anyway, so that kind of proves my point. I think if this company is solely relying on the person who is outgoing to find somebody new to replace themselves, well, that HR department isn't doing their job and maybe they should be reviewed. Our next story today comes to us from Woody Debris 1953 Penny Wise, Pound Foolish. Let's jump right in. Years back, I worked in regional sales. My base was in Portland, but the job had me traveling to Seattle on a regular basis. We had a small branch there. It had been downsized, leaving me with the responsibility to manage their existing accounts. The business was on a long downward slide, but that's a story for another day. When I made these monthly or so visits, the drive was far enough that it required an overnight stay. The unspoken rule was, stay somewhere decent, but not extravagant. Knowing that the company was suffering a bit, I chose a national chain hotel that had several advantages. It was clean and safe, within walking distance of the branch office, offered a continental breakfast, and free parking. Free parking is not all that common at hotels in Seattle. We were also given a per diem for each of three daily meals. I chose the hotel based on the fact that I would not need a breakfast, and therefore save the company money by staying in lodging that offered a free one. That worked well for me, because I'm not a huge breakfast eater, and when I was up there, I liked to maximize my time with branch personnel and our customers. I had to pack a lot into short two-day visits. On one trip, I had to get up very early in the morning to begin a particularly packed day. I skipped both breakfast and lunch altogether. I simply didn't feel that I had time to waste. Plus, Seattle is big, traffic is bad, and often there were many miles between customers. I'd start out at 7 a.m. and finished about 6.30 p.m. I was tired but even more famished. I went to a nice but not overly expensive place for dinner. When I got the bill, it was about $10 more than my dinner per DM limit. I figured it was no problem, since the total was only about 10% more and still far below the daily allowance for all three meals. About a week after I got back, the branch manager in Portland barked at me, come into my office. I hadn't a clue what I'd done wrong, but the look on his face told me he wasn't pleased. He pulls out my expense report and says, What's this charge for dinner? You know that's more than you're allowed, right? I think he expected me to fall on my sword and beg for mercy for having violated policy. I did the opposite. I said, DB, please understand that I never charge for breakfast, although I could. Also, on the day in question, I skipped lunch as well. So the total, while above the limit, is still far below what I'm entitled to for daily meals. He grunted. He still wasn't happy. I continued. I know the company is struggling. That's why I chose to stay where I stay. It's affordable, has free parking and free breakfast. If you look back, I've never charged the company for it and only about half the time for lunch. He knew I was right, but he decided to show me that he was the manager and that I had to adhere strictly to the rules. Well, that's all well and good, but the per diem limits are clear and you are never to exceed them again. I don't want to see another expense account like this on my desk ever again. Is that understood? He peered at me over his glasses with a stern grimace. I said perfectly and left his office. From that day forward, I charged the maximum allowed per diem for each and every meal. Over the next several years, it cost the company many hundreds more than it needed to. But since reason and accounting skills weren't my manager's forte, I felt more than justified for strictly adhering to the rule and was a richer man for it. I'm willing to bet if we had a dollar for every per diem story that appeared on the KCC channel that we could probably get ourselves a really nice meal at a fancy restaurant, you know, like McDonald's. 
Okay, okay, jumping into the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Unasked for Advice. It says, why bother bending over backwards to help in ways the company won't appreciate or care? You only hurt yourself by skimping by taking less than your allotted per DM allowed. I can see that OP did it to save a bunch of time in certain cases, but OP did say they did it to save the company a little bit of money. Now, it doesn't sound like OP was responsible for how that company was running, or really had any part of how the financials run in that company, so yes, OP didn't have to do this, but they probably just did it so they had a clear conscience and felt that they might be contributing to their job actually being there and the company not going under. Our next story today comes to us from ChillDude890. Per the policy, you need to pay. Let's jump right in. I had the unique displeasure of working in customer service over seven years. My longest job was at a bowling alley in a mid-sized town. It was the high-end bowling alley in the town and thus attracted some pretty entitled people. While I got pretty good at zoning out their dumb requests and simply complying, there were a few times that malicious compliance was warranted. Backstory, the bowling alley required people to purchase bowling by time, $20 per hour, etc. When I turned on the lane, the bowlers got a 5-minute buffer period in addition to their time purchased. Most of the time, this was not an issue and people came and left with no issue. Upon request, however, people could get an extra 15 minutes for free in the case of mechanical issues or large groups that were in the 8th frame or higher. I bet you can imagine where this goes bad. Main story. So one day, a family that consisted of a dad, two daughters, and a mother came in and started a tab with one hour. We let them open tabs since we had servers and food service too. The kids were younger, but I had seen this dad in the bowling alley before, as he played in one of our leagues. He was just one of those snobby looking bowling guys with a rolling bowling bag, beat up bowling balls, and a huge belly that seemed to go hand in hand with the pro bowlers that came to this alley. He had scammed a lot of free stuff from us before, and we had actually been warned about him as employees. Fast forward an hour and his time is almost up when all of a sudden I hear a large crash. It was the sound that a bowling ball makes when it hits the sweep that wipes the pins off the lane. There's a small window of time that a bowler can hit the sweep while it's clearing pins. And of course, the dad I discussed earlier was the one that hit it. He comes bumbling over and tells me the lane is broken. I could clearly see that the lane was broken because the lane monitor screen had the code for a jammed arm. I apologized while holding back the barf in my mouth and called the mechanic. After doing that, he demanded 15 minutes of free time since he had to wait for the mechanic to fix the lane, which took two minutes. Since it was his first incident, I gave it to him. That was my first mistake. This happened again a second time when his time was getting low as he had just started a new game. He came bumbling over and did the same routine. I, regrettably, gave the second set of time to him for free, and then he went away. As you may have guessed, it happened a third time. This time, however, I decided to charge him for the 15 minutes since I knew what he was up to, and our policy, posted on the front counter that every customer agrees to, specifically states that we only give 15 minutes for free. On the fourth time, the guy came over again and I charged him again. This happened a total of five times and I charged him for three. When he finally decided to pay out, he saw his bill and got furious. He came thundering over to me and barked at me, saying that I was wrong and that he needed to see my manager. When my manager came out, he gave his side of the story, which, of course, was about how I was an idiot and that our lanes break way too easily. I then gave my side and calmly explained that I gave him more free time than our policy stated and that due to his continued request for more time, I gave it to him at cost. My manager then asked to see the tab and looked through it. Not only did my manager agree that I was right, but he also made the guy pay for the second set of 15 minutes that I had originally given to him for free. My manager cited our policy and told the man what he needed to pay. After some intense yelling, the guy cursed us out, vowed to never come back, and left. He came back for league three days later, he knew what he was doing that day, and was just mad he got caught. 
Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Base Josh. It says, I'm a bit surprised he got away with it a second time. I remember hitting that sweep, no idea what it was called, as a kid in league and getting yelled at by the alley employees. You'd think a pro would know better than a dumb kid who never ever did it again. OP responded to this comment and said, ironically, I think the very reason that this whole thing happened was that he knew that it was my first day at the front running things on my own. I had just recently been promoted and he had actually gotten someone written up in my new position for bad treatment not too long before me. So I had no interest in messing with him. In hindsight, I should have said something sooner, but oh well. A few months later, however, he was eventually banned from the alley. He actually broke a super light ball of his, since six pounds or lighter can't be used on our lanes, and he got angry when my manager refused to fix it. In his anger, he threw the ball at one of our glass doors and broke it. He was arrested and asked to pay for damages while also being restrained from the bowling alley. Can't imagine how much of a loser you must be to get a restraining order from a bowling alley. Okay, so in this story, I was really happy that OP didn't spare us any of the details. They managed to stay out of the gutter and deal with the customer accordingly. I still don't know how they managed to not pin the customer down and strike them, but I guess dealing with them that way wasn't up their alley. Okay, okay, that was kind of lame. All right, our first story today comes to us from Remote Syllabub 7412. Don't want my help? Sure, go ahead and get yourself fired. Let's jump right in. A bit of background. A while back when I was still in high school, I worked at the local cinema to earn a bit of pocket money and experience. I stayed for a couple of years, working weekends when school was in session. I think it was halfway into my second year when the target of this revenge came into the picture. We'll call him Luke. Luke was a new hire and was just learning the ropes. This was common as turnover was high since we were all students. He seemed all right at first and everyone was nice to him since we were all pretty close and knew one another from high school and we welcomed him in. I don't think even a week passed before the problem started. The first issue I heard of was that Luke was trying to flirt with one of the girls. Thing was, this girl was already in a relationship with one of the other employees and everyone knew this, including Luke. That didn't stop him though, and eventually, the girl told him to his face to cut it out. It only got worse from there. Now, I do my best to see the good in people and give them the benefit of the doubt. Despite what the others were saying, I still tried to get along with him. This unfortunately changed during the first real conversation I had with him. We were on break at the same time, and about five of us crowded into the little break room for lunch. I forgot what exactly we were talking about, but I remember it was an uncomfortable topic, and Luke was using a lot of expletives. The break room was not soundproof, and there were patrons outside, especially children. I tried to warn him about using that language so loudly, and that he might get in trouble if a customer heard him. Immediately, his attitude toward me changed, and he responded with something along the lines of, I can say what I want. I have the right to free speech. Don't tell me what to do. What? Sheesh. Okay, chill. I was just concerned, but you do you. A few minutes later, the convo had switched to high school, and Luke was raving about how Caucasians were the majority in all the high schools in our district. Now, for my high school, this isn't true, as most of the community and students attending were Latino and made up about 70% of our student body. I told him as much. That's not the case for my high school. Uh, yeah it is. White's the majority everywhere. I have a friend that goes there. I actually go there. It's mostly, why are you talking? Excuse me? Who invited you to this conversation? I wasn't talking to you. Who asked? Now, this irritated me. I know it's a joke about looking for who asked, but this was before that became a thing, and I found it extremely rude. But in a moment of clarity, the best comeback came to mind, like arguing in the shower by yourself. And to this day, I could only wish to be able to recreate the moment. Smiling, I threw his words right back in his face, free speech. The others at the table were laughing as I threw away the rest of my lunch and left the break room. My heart was beating too fast from the weird adrenaline rush I got and I spent the rest of my break in the back of concessions until it was time to clock back in. 
I think that combo was what sparked Luke's hatred of me. Ever since then, he would glare at me whenever I walked by, would dump the trash from his bin when we were sweeping the floors for me to pick up, and generally was a jerk. His behavior kept getting worse. He would threaten to fight people. He was a short potato of a boy, so no one was really scared. Argue, say rude, passive aggressive, or downright racist things, and was just generally a jerk. At some point, during a shift I wasn't there, he cornered the girl he had been eyeing and kept verbally harassing her, to the point that she hid in the manager's office where he couldn't get to her. She was a sweet and loyal girl and a friend, and she and her boyfriend could be described with the phrase, puppy love, and had been together for a long time. The boyfriend was angry when she texted the group chat about what had happened, and wanted to get Luke fired. However, people were hesitant about this, saying that managers wouldn't want to because he'd claimed discrimination, he was trans, and that he hadn't done anything blatantly wrong. Then, another one of the employees made a suggestion. Luke was incompetent, we all knew this, why not make the manager see it too? Revenge time. It wasn't hard to do, since Luke would tend to shoot himself in the foot. When possible, we'd point him out to managers when reviewing the cameras in the halls about him dumping his trash can when sweeping onto the ground in front of patrons. When he was cursing up a storm during break, a text would be sent and someone would lead a manager to him to be caught. He rarely cleaned up, was rude and loud, and the incident with the girl didn't help his case. It still wasn't enough, and week after week his name was on the schedule. Then my opportunity came. See, at the cinema, there's a position called Point, aka the ticket taker, that lets you into the theater area. It's the second most dreaded position, the first being self-serve cleanup, as you have to stand in place and interact with customers at a rapid fire pace, smiling and listening for the theaters to be called at the same time. When the night ends, the last person on Point has to close and clean the self-serve stations. Today, to my initial dread, Luke and I were both on point. The entire time, Luke would leave his station and pace the lobby, toward me, then back, not even sweeping the ground as he went. He wasn't supposed to leave point, and had to walk around customers to get back to his podium to help them. He was told off by a manager once or twice for this, but he continued his antics anyway. Then, as things slowed down, one of the managers approached me and told me we were going down to one point, one person at the center rather than at both entrances, and that I'd have to explain to Luke how to close point before I went back to help clean concessions. It had to be this way, since I had already taken the sanitation test and Luke had yet to do so, and therefore wasn't allowed behind concessions. When I finished closing my point, I walked over to Luke and told him to move his podium to the center so he could take closing point. He did, though scowling at me. When he was set, I began to explain. So, you'll be closing point tonight after the last movie starts. You'll need to go to the- Go away! What? I don't need your help, so don't talk to me. But I need to teach you how to close point. I don't care, shut up. I know you don't like me, but this is work. You need to- No, I don't want your help. Shut the hell up! But, F off, don't talk to me. At this point, I was beyond upset. I was furious. I was trying to help, even after how he had acted, how he treated everyone here. I didn't care what he said in the break room, but it shouldn't affect work. This was ridiculous. I must have snapped or something, because I complied, walking away saying, fine, I don't care, don't ever talk to me again. Hey, I said, waving a hand over my shoulder, don't talk to me ever again. I went behind concessions to help, where he couldn't reach me. I don't know when, but I started crying out of frustration, and one of my friends came and hugged me, bringing me to a corner to cool down. I don't get angry often, and when I do, it makes me scared. I was just sick of his antics, sick of the way he spoke to me, just sick of his attitude. I'm not sure how long I sat back there, but soon enough, that same friend came and waved me to the front of concessions. I wiped my face and walked out, and he pointed to point. There was Luke being instructed by the manager on how to close point, and the manager did not look happy with him. Arms folded, 
frowning, flat tone, everything spoke of irritation. My friend said they'd already explained that Luke refused my help when the manager asked them what was going on, as point can be seen and heard from almost the entire lobby. Seeing the scene lifted my spirits a bit, and I was able to end the night relatively easily. The next weekend when the schedule came out, I didn't even have to check my email. It was posted in the group text, specifically the section with Luke's name. It was blacked out. If he had quit, his name would have been removed, but the fact it was blacked out meant it was a sudden event. Luke had been fired. I'm not sure what it was that they fired him for anymore, but considering we were always low on staff and they had to worry about discrimination, I'm guessing there were enough complaints that they had to fire him. I'd like to think that last interaction I had with him was the final nail in the coffin, but I was just glad to see him go more than anything. I heard he worked at a common fast food place for a while, but ended up getting McFired from there too. Good luck in life, Luke. You weren't missed. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Lady Norbert that says something that I say myself all the time. It says, sometimes the trash takes itself out and sometimes it dumps itself on the floor for someone else to sweep up. To me, Luke seems to be one of those people who thinks everybody around them is a giant butthole. But as we know from a bunch of these stories here, if you think that everybody around you is a giant butthole and they treat you like crap, it's probably because you're the giant butthole and you've been treating them like crap. One more thing, the whole discrimination comment really bugs me because regardless of who a person is, if they're doing a bad job and there is just cause to fire them, then there should be nothing holding you back from firing them. Our next story today comes to us from Intrepid She. Don't make others uncomfortable? Let's jump right in. This is long, but it has to be to provide the needed details about what happened. About 10 years ago, I worked in a team of scientists, which is almost enough to drop the mic right here, when one day our boss told me others perceive me as contemptuous. I was shocked beyond words. I certainly did not feel superior or feel contempt for anyone. I was so flabbergasted, I was silent for probably two solid minutes. I asked for an example of when something I had said or done gave someone that feeling. He said he couldn't divulge that information. Okay. Then I asked for an example he had experienced or observed himself. He said he had none. I said, since I have no clue what I've done, how am I supposed to adjust my behavior? He said he didn't know. I said, basically then, I just need to not talk. He said he wasn't sure. I knew right then what to do. I am pretty introverted, and as a child, I didn't talk for years. I rarely spoke until I was about 13 years old. Got lots of notes from teachers about how quiet I was. I would answer questions when directly asked, but rarely spoke otherwise. So my malicious compliance in this situation was easy for me. I just stopped talking, except when asked a question. I made a point of smiling, showing I was listening, nodding agreement, etc. I was extremely polite and agreeable. Pretty soon, some big issues came up that I had specific knowledge about. I knew how to solve them, but no one else asked. A huge conflict came up between two of our labs because one group wanted it one way and the other group had a different opinion. They fought and fought. People were having secret meetings in their offices to try to win, and when they finally arrived at the action they chose, it was wrong. In fact, both groups were wrong, and the whole experiment failed. It's important to know no one was hurt, no property damage or anything like that, just a lot of wasted time and expense on materials. But I never said a word. This went on for three weeks. The lab's budget had to be revised, they had to cut travel expenses, which I was okay with because I didn't want to travel anyway. So no conferences for anyone. This is a big deal for a lot of researchers because it's how we gain notoriety to be able to get grants, among other things. Finally, a colleague asked me why I hadn't spoken for so long, why I was so quiet. 
was something wrong. I explained about being told others perceived me as contemptuous. She had the same expression I did when I was told. She said she didn't believe anyone had said that about me. I honestly was surprised again because I believed our boss. Then she asked me what I thought about the experiment design and why it was failing. I told her about the solution I believed would work, which was actually surprisingly simple. She recognized it had a good chance of succeeding and asked me to share the idea at the next department meeting. At that meeting, she asked me again in front of everyone and I repeated what I told her. Several people asked why I hadn't spoken up sooner. I explained I had been given feedback that indicated I caused others to feel uncomfortable. The whole table of colleagues also looked stunned at me. I said I was committed to not causing such bad feelings and couldn't figure out how to communicate because the feedback didn't give me any specific guidance. Everyone looked at the director at that point and he said we shouldn't discuss personnel issues. Ha. <laughs> It was my issue, so I said, if anyone here perceives me as contemptuous and said as much to our boss, that's the reason I haven't been talking. If you don't feel that way about me, let me know and I will stop being silent. Someone else said we needed to hold a vote so there wouldn't be any more confusion or talking behind anyone's back. They voted 100% for me to talk normally and that they didn't agree that I was ever contemptuous. That director slowly stopped coming to work, month by month after this episode, until he was only showing up one day a week. Finally, he took a lab position elsewhere and one of my colleagues was promoted to director. And the experiment was a success. The next year, I got a grant to keep the research going and paid for two people to be able to travel to the related conference to present our findings. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Glenn Marshall. It says, Whenever I had a performance review with any negative stuff, I always asked for specifics. Most often, there was none, and the source was confidential. My consistent response was that I could not address something that was vague and unattributed, and, strangely enough, the next review had nothing about it. One time, my review was ghostwritten by a manager because my boss, the VP, delegated it. The actual writer got many things wrong, both positive and negative. I escalated it to HR. My boss rescinded the review and disciplined the writer. Later on, when I managed people, I learned from this and made sure my employees' reviews were honest, specific, and actionable to reinforce positives and address negatives. OP responded to this comment and said, That's such a great example you have given of learning from a negative experience to make a positive out of it. You rose above it and helped make a better workplace for others. Congrats to you. I have the same goal as a leader myself. I give negative feedback with enough detail the employee knows exactly what is expected. Now, I've managed a few different places myself and one of the tactics that I used if I ever had to give constructive criticism to an employee, is that I would sandwich it on either side with something good they were doing. So I'd start off with congratulating them on something or saying they did a really good job at this, then I'd go into the constructive criticism. Well, you could do this a little bit better and here's how. And then after that, I would finish it off with a feel good and I really like the way you did this. Getting back to the story here though, I think we need more information because it seems like the director had some kind of vendetta towards OP, but we don't know why, so that was kind of odd. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Tango Tango 112 I didn't have to work overtime? Okay, roger that. Let's jump right in. I am a mariner. My position on the ship is mate. Below me are my deckhands who are responsible for the labor work like painting, grinding, maintenance, line handling, cargo ops, etc. Above me is the chief mate, second in command, and the captain, in charge of everyone and the responsible individual for the entire ship. We are officers and we do the planning for navigation, ship handling, training, payroll, etc. I work for a private company that pays me by a day rate, which is a 12-hour workday. I work one month on and one month off. Like most industries, we are undermanned, can't hire enough to fill all positions. Now, this ship I work on is even harder to crew up. 
mainly because of the captain. He's got a notorious reputation for being a jerk, so people find all sorts of ways not to come to this boat, and if they do, they only work one tour and never come back. I joined this ship back in May, and for the last seven months, it's been kinda hell working for this captain. He's a narcissist, condescends everyone, insults everyone, works us like slaves, never thanks us, just an all-around class act. You know these types of bosses, they never let up. They push you to the limit and just makes you hate work and life. With that said, I've been working 15, sometimes 18 hours a day because we're shorthanded. I'm doing all sorts of work that's not in my job description. I had to do cargo ops, handling mooring lines, maintenance, all in addition to my mate duties. I'm a very hard worker, a team player, and never say no to work. The thing is, we don't get paid for any more than 12 hours of work a day, so all those extra hours I worked are unpaid. It burns me, and I freaking hate it, but like I said, I'm a team player. I want to make sure it's safe for my guys, the operations get completed, and clients stay happy, so I do what is asked of me. I'm also the cook. We don't have an official cook on board because this is considered a small crew and small ship. I was cooking lunch every day for my crew and many dinners too. Generally, you're on your own for breakfast and dinner. I was so good at my job that the captain and the chief mate pass their duties on to me so they can just sit back and relax. Chief mates and captains have a lot of paperwork to do, but I was handling that for them too up until this point. Well, one day, I'm just completely burnt out with these 15 to 18 hour days. I get into a discussion about how the captain and company is stealing my wages because I'm working more than 12 hours a day. I asked him if I could show up to watch an hour later than my scheduled duty. The engine department does this when they require their folks to work overtime the day before. I worked a swing shift, which overlaps both the captain and the chief mate, so it's not unheard of or uncommon to let guys show up late, especially if they worked more than 12 hours the previous day. Well, once I asked to sleep in an extra hour, all heck broke loose with him insulting me, calling me names, being racist, nobody wants to work anymore, blah blah blah, just nasty inappropriate behavior that shouldn't happen, but happens all the time in this industry. He then finishes the verbal beatdown with a crap-eating grin, you know mate, you never had to work overtime, you could have just said no. I was steaming at this point, but I just replied with, okay, roger that. I called it a day and went to bed. Cue malicious compliance. The next day, I'm already on watch and he comes to work and asks me what's for lunch. Nothing, I'm not cooking today. Did you pull out anything from the freezer at least? Nope. So nobody had any real food for lunch. They all made sandwiches and ate chips instead. Later that day, hey, I need you to go finish painting the rescue boat. The guys are busy with other projects and I want this done today. Well, Captain, since it's not in my job description, I respectfully decline. We get into a little argument, but he concedes. The very next day, he pulls the same thing. What's for lunch? Nothing. What do we have that we can cook real fast? I don't know, Captain. I didn't check. Cooking isn't my job, remember? So I don't plan on doing it. He rushes to cook some whole chickens in an hour, and they came out raw and really ticked off the crew. Nobody touched his food. This routine lasted a whole week until it was the end of my tour and I got to go home. I returned to duty a month later, and he thought I would forget or let it slide. I indeed did not forget or let it slide. For the next entire month-long tour, the captain had to do the cooking because the chief mate and I refused to do it and he complained because he had to wake up early and prep food. I was already doing all that when I was cooking. I just didn't complain. I enjoy cooking, but I was willing to die on this hill. I wasn't letting go. I refused to let him win this battle. I did not cook one meal. To be petty, I made myself delicious food, did not share it. I refused any work that wasn't in my job description. What's he gonna do? Write me up on disciplinary for not doing someone else's job that isn't mine? Or for not working past 12 hours? Not happening. 
understand at this point, I was physically tired, burned out, mentally drained from doing everybody's job and taking crap from him. I asked for a transfer to another ship but got denied, so I'm still stuck on the ship with this captain, but now he knows where I stand, and I haven't cooked or done extra duty since. And that's what you get for taking advantage of a good worker and always insulting me. OP added an edit down at the bottom of the story. It says, I forgot to add that one of the reasons for not getting a transfer is because nobody is easily willing to come here and work with this guy. One day during that hitch, I came up to the bridge and overheard him talking to the assignment manager about keeping me here permanently because he's a good mate, he's prior military, and he can cook, blah blah blah. I was supposed to be a floater, filling in positions on different boats as needed, which is what I like. Well, that worked out well. Jumping down to the comment section below this one, there's one from a user called Batman Handler. It quotes OP saying, I'm a very hard worker, a team player, and never say no to work. <laughs> they said, found your problem. OP responded and said, in my experience, the reward for good work is more work. I learn slow. There's another comment down below from a user called Random Person of the Day. It says, Love how you basically told your captain to F right off, and he had no choice but to comply. It's not like it was your job in the first place. Captain F'd around and found out. Can you keep applying for a transfer until they finally concede? Or is it something you got denied and you're stuck with it unless you quit type of thing? OP responded to this one and said, Occasionally, there's openings on other ships that get posted looking for certain positions. For now, I just keep asking my assignment manager for new boats, but he says my position has all been crewed up permanent rotations. But rumor has it Captain is being assigned to an overseas ship soon, which is to his benefit and mine. The whole ship would benefit actually. We have a good crew except for this Captain. He literally sucks the soul out of you, and I do this mental gymnastics one month at a time. Well, OP, if you happen to stay on this boat once that captain is gone, you really need to think about not doing all that extra stuff again, or at least a very small portion of it, but make sure you're staying within your hours, and make sure they know that you're going outside of your duties, and you could stop doing this at any time. Don't let people take advantage of you. That happens way too much in the working world. Whether you're on a boat or in a building somewhere, it's the same. The people higher up want to get as much work out of you as possible for the lowest wage possible. That's just how it works. Our next story today comes to us from Miraculous Ladybug 93. Cancel the service? You bet. Let's jump right in. I work in roadside assistance as a third party for a lot of insurance companies. Like most customer service jobs, we get a heck of a lot of abuse. But the most of it comes from long wait times and or not being fully covered. This happens often, but I very rarely am in the position where I get to see the fallout. Recently, I had a woman call in. She was completely pleasant, but in a huge rush. So she was a little snippy. No worries, I get it. But then it comes to letting her know that she is not covered for assistance and she has a huge out-of-pocket expense. She whines about the fact that she knows she has roadside, then that she supposedly set up the service earlier, so not only am I trying to charge her, but it's taking too long, and therefore the price should be waived. Finally, she gives up and tells me I'm useless and says, just cancel it, and hangs up. Being the good rep that I am, I call her back to confirm the disconnect was intentional. She picks up, then hangs up immediately, then sends me to voicemail on follow-up calls. So as instructed, I cancel the job request. I should note, intake doesn't take long, but it's annoying to go over, and if the customer doesn't know their exact location, like being on a freeway, it can take some time. A few hours later, I get a new call from an angry customer wondering where her service is at. I apologize for the frustration, ask for her reference number, and inform her that unfortunately, there isn't any service in the system. She starts going off. I do my best to calm her down and extract the needed information. Halfway through the call, I realize it's the same angry pants woman as before. When we start going over location, I remember the drop-off location and she gets excited and says, Oh, you found my service? Is the driver on the way? It's ridiculous that it's taking this long. 
you should get this prioritized or expedited. To which I reply in my nicest CSR voice, no ma'am, your service isn't in the system. I remember when we spoke earlier, as you requested, I cancelled the job at that time. So it's only getting open now and the amount will be this. That's more than it was earlier. Yes, the pricing changes throughout our day to continuously match the market, stay competitive, and incentive drivers to continue taking jobs at unpopular times. She was silent. Also, we have longer ETAs at this time, so you will want to get this payment taken care of ASAP so we can find a service provider to avoid a longer wait. I can send a text message to you to complete payment. She stutters, but, but I never told you to cancel it before. Starting to lose patience. Ma'am, our calls are recorded. I notate obsessively, and I called you back multiple times trying to confirm. I want to speak to your supervisor. Ranting to make me scared. No problem. One moment. It looks like there is currently a 20 minute wait for a supervisor. I'm happy to wait with you. Fine then. Get my service started. Certainly. I'll send the text for payment. She finally broke down and paid it and gave up waiting for a supervisor. She swore up and down that she was going to report me. Either way, I felt vindicated with my tiny bit of malicious compliance. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Motor1 is stopping. It quotes OP when they said, I'm happy to wait with you. They said, that would be awesome. Both of you sitting on the phone hating each other and saying nothing while waiting for the supervisor to enter the fray and get completely blindsided by the fury that has already erupted. OP responded to this one and said, Oh, it's always my favorite. We don't have supervisor callbacks until the service is completed. So at least once a week, I get paid to scroll Reddit or a webtoon while listening to the muffled ranting of an angry customer stuck on the side of the road. Well, this was a very interesting story for me because my last job, literally right before I became KCC, was as a tow truck driver, and I was the one who went to those people on the side of the road who had been there for a bunch of hours, but I had literally just gotten that call about 20 minutes before. So I would walk into a crap storm of vitriol, but that was just the way it went. So it was really interesting for me to read this story and get some insight into another part of the job, because these were the people who put the notes on the calls that I had to go to that said that the customer was here, but they were actually 10 kilometers further up the road. Yeah, that happens. This next story comes to us from Connect Basket 2698 You must work the weekend. Let's jump right in. I was an IT contractor for a company doing a large new project. There were about 30 people writing code. We were allowed as much overtime as we were willing to work, and I could use the money. I was working 12 hours, 5 days a week. On the weekends, I would go racing, usually out of state. It was common on Thursday to get called into a meeting, saying we needed to work 8 hours Saturday, 4 on Sunday. Most people would have 52 hours in total. I would do it if available, putting me at 72 or 76, since 4 hours is stupid. Other times, I would point out I would already be at 60 and had plans. I was given an exception the first couple of times. Then, I was told I was not being a team player. So, I clarify, if I work 12 hours between 5pm Friday and 9am Monday, is that good? Yes, well, okay then. I left the office at 9pm on Friday, 4 of the 12 down. The race trailer was already loaded up and ready to go. I headed out in the morning for a 4 hour drive. After the race, I headed back. Since I was driving near the office and the parking lot was empty, I pulled in trailer and all around 3am. I figured just badging in wasn't enough to demonstrate compliance. I sent an email out to the group with every task I completed. I completed everything I had been assigned. There was a whiteboard with unassigned tasks. I sent an email that I was pulling a task, then another when completed. I had my full hours in at 11am. I was being a smart butt, however, I didn't really expect the manager to get as annoyed about it as he did. A bit later, my contract was cut by that manager for my abrasive personality. The fallout seems to have been against me, but not in the end. My contract was cut. 
I was told on a Thursday morning and given the next three full weeks notice. By Thursday afternoon, I had a job interview scheduled for Monday. By Monday afternoon, I had a couple more scheduled. I started a new position with no gap. That is pretty much the malicious compliance. Below is the fallout from the retaliation. The manager blamed the abrasive personality comment on the business. They are the people asking for and defining the project. I only worked with one. During my notice, I was working with her. I said something about someone else having to do the next phase. She says, yeah, that sucks. After giving cat butt face, I tell her that I was told the business wanted me gone. Since she was the only business I dealt with, wavy hand motion. She just got a pissed look and stormed off. Her anger went up the organizational tree and back down my branch. Manager was told, I want OP on this project, deal with it. I had multiple people, HR, managers, peers, etc. ask me if I wanted to stay. They would have to make the crap hit the fan to do so. They didn't want to do that if I was leaving anyway. I said I already had accepted an offer. I just wished he had to be the one to ask me to stay. He was made to ask me if I could extend the notice period to provide training sessions on my techniques. Uh, so you want my productivity, just not me? Well, yeah. No, I am already scheduled to start a new position. During my notice, 12 people found new positions and gave their notice. The attitude was that if the company was willing to cut me, they could cut anyone at any time. They would rather leave on their own terms. That was not a problem for coders at that particular point in time. I was still working 60 hours a week during my notice period. On my last day, when leaving, the only person still there was that manager's boss. When I said bye, he said he had meant to talk to me before I left. I sat down and talked. I said, you must be wondering why I would be working late on my last day. I wanted the section of software I was on to be working before I left, so no one could blame me for it not getting done. I said I was the only one left in the last few months who was working on it. All tests had passed that day. Another section with similar work has six people working on it and is not done. He began to question the manager's decision making. He thanked me and said he may reach out in the future. A couple months later, someone reached out to me to see if I would come back. The manager's contract was cut, as were the other three people from his contract house. An employee who was buddies with the manager was moved off the project. Apparently, since the manager was also a contractor, he could not technically cut my contract. It was done by this employee. I didn't go back as my new abrasive personality manager and I got along great. It definitely sounds like that company learned if they're willing to get rid of one of their good top performers, well, that's going to make everybody else wary about their job and maybe not wanting to work there anymore. In OP's case though, if they were a contractor yet the business was dictating their hours, it sounds like the business just wanted them to be contractors to maybe get around some tax laws because if they were dictating the hours like that, that kind of makes you an employee. I don't know what the tax implications are there, but there's definitely something. I'm sure somebody smarter than me will comment on it down below, and I'm really interested to see how that works. All right, our first story today comes to us from Competitive Chapter 4. Can't throw away a small box because it'll fill up the trash can. Fine, I'll just clean my truck out. Let's jump right in. For a little context, I'm a construction worker with my own company truck. As far as from what I have seen in my area, most people with company trucks have this thing where the front two seats always stay very clean, aside from dirt that comes from working in my field of work. The back seats, however, are a different story. It is amazing how much trash gets thrown back there, whether it be water bottles, snack wrappers, food wrappers, etc. My company has a contract with a local detailer that comes and washes and vacuums all company trucks bi-weekly to keep the appearance up. We are just responsible for removing all large trash so they don't have to do too much work. Usually, we just throw out everything at the dumpster at the shop before the detailer goes in and works his magic. Anyways, on to the story. So today, I had just finished up a service call and was about to go on my lunch break. 
I had stopped at a local gas station near downtown Austin to pour gas right before I headed off to get some tacos. As I'm pouring gas, I look in the back of my tailgate and realized I forgot to throw away at the job site and didn't want to run the risk of it flying out and possibly causing an accident. So naturally, I decide to take it out, break the box down, and toss it in the trash can at the pump. Now, the box itself wasn't too big, about the size of a shoebox, and once broken down, it was probably about a quarter of that size. As I took the broken down box and placed it in the trash, one of the ladies who worked at the gas station came out furious, saying I wasn't allowed to throw away that box. She claimed the trash was only for smaller items and we weren't allowed to throw away larger things. I was really confused and told her that it really wasn't all that big and I didn't see an issue. She then argued that the cardboard can unravel and fill up the bin and then she would have to replace the bags. I didn't feel like arguing, so I just obliged and took out the box and placed it back in the tailgate. She thanked me for not being so difficult and was about to go into the gas station before I stopped her and asked, so then what can I throw away in the trash? She replied with anything like water bottles, taco bags, wrappers, etc. Now cue the malicious compliance. After she said that, I thanked her for letting me know and proceeded to open the back door to my truck and she got a hold of all the mess. I then proceeded to take out small loads of empty water bottles, taco bags, etc. It is truly amazing how much trash builds up in these construction trucks. Unless one had been recently cleaned out, I have never seen one with little to no mess. I think I'm pretty good at tossing the stuff out of my truck, but every two weeks when I submit my truck for cleaning, it always baffles me with how much mess is in there. I then proceed to stuff the trash can with trash and fill it up. Now, granted these trash cans already had trash in them, and weren't all that big, and I didn't really press down the trash to make more fit. I then proceed to move to the next trash can and started filling that one up, all while looking at her with the biggest smirk on my face. She then proceeded to tell me that I can't be throwing out that much stuff, cause it's only meant for small things that I bought from the store. I then proceeded to show her that almost all this stuff can be bought at the store she was working at. She then screams at me saying that there's no way I bought everything there and that I probably got some from other places as well. I then pulled out my company gas card that was from her gas station and told her that this was the only gas station that I'm allowed to use while in this vehicle. So yes, I come to this store a lot since it's right by my job and most of this other than the taco wrappers come from here. She then proceeded to call me a butthole and a few other names as she stormed off into the store. I just sat there with such a huge feeling of accomplishment knowing that I dealt with that Karen accordingly. If you would have just let me throw out the small box, you wouldn't have to come out and replace the trash bags right now and could be sitting inside on your phone. But now, you gotta come out and do the job you're getting paid to do. It must suck to actually have to do what you are hired to do all because you thought some small pieces of cardboard would fill up one little trash can. Little words of advice, next time, mind your own business. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one that got a bunch of awards. It's from a user called rjack151. It says, to be fair, you did need to make room for the box in the back seat area to prevent it from falling off the truck. <laughs> OP responded to this comment and said, I think no comment will beat this one. If I had an award, I would give it to you, my good man. Well, I don't think OP had to worry about giving them an award for that comment, considering at the time of recording there's 57 awards on that particular comment. It was pretty good, to be honest. I think if you strip this one right down to the core issue, it's when she said that then she would have to replace the bags. And that's exactly it. It sounds to me like she just didn't want to do work. This is kind of the same thing that I try to explain to my kids. If you're going to argue with me for 10 minutes over something that would take you 30 seconds to a minute to do, well, was it really worth the time to argue? One last point to make is that the trash cans are really there as a point of convenience for the customer. Because, you know, it's a gas station, usually attached to a convenience store, 
They're not there just for things you buy from that store that makes absolutely no sense. It's not like OP was a serial offender that was dropping off garbage there every single day, filling up the garbage cans every single day. It sounds like this was a one-time thing. So let's just chalk this up to the laziness of the person working in the store. This next story comes to us from xgrunt24. If I don't like it, I can find another job? Okay, let's jump right in. I think this qualifies. I worked at a small shop serving an electrical apprenticeship. Myself and the shop manager had a few run-ins and I assume he disliked me as much as I disliked him. I had refused to do a job and told him he didn't pay me enough. It was at the stockyards and I was expected to put on a set of waders, crawl down into a rat fat reclamation tank and replace a submersible pump. Wasn't going to happen. Another time he wanted me to lie to a customer to make an issue they were having sound like it wasn't our fault. I refused and told him if he wanted to lie about it, he was going to have to drive out to the job site and do it himself. He told me to keep my mouth shut and did come out. I think the only reason he didn't fire me was I was by far one of the most efficient and versatile employees. This fact had me questioning how much I was getting out of this apprenticeship and was passively looking around for another shop to apprentice at. My wage scale was structured and I got regular raises, bringing me closer to journeyman's level over my time as an apprentice. So I had to find someone that would sign up to complete my apprenticeship as well as want to hire me. One of our better journeymen had gone to another shop and had introduced me to the owners. We had talked about what it would take to get me to move. Things were progressing but nothing committed to at that point. Cue the malicious compliance. It's my evaluation and raise time. My manager calls me up to the conference room and explains that due to my performance and the shop being in a slow period, he was not going to give me the 25 cents an hour raise as my contract said, but was going to give me a dollar more an hour once I became a journeyman. We argued and I told him if I can't trust you for a quarter, why would I believe the dollar? The argument ended in him telling me, if you don't like it, you can always quit. Oh, really? I picked up the conference room phone on the table in front of us and called the shop I had been talking with. I asked the owner if I brought my tools over today, would I have a job? After a quick and uncomfortable discussion with his partner, he said yes. I informed my manager I resigned effective now. I loaded my tools up, punched out, and went straight to work that afternoon. OP added an edit down at the bottom and it says, well, now I know what rest in peace my inbox means. It figures that my single largest post or comment is one where I am a complete butthole. My wife and daughter are laughing and apparently find that fitting. I would like to state a couple of things. One, I was only a couple years out of the Marine Corps and was young and cocky. Two, I was still adjusting to civilian life. 3. 0 out of 10. Do not recommend this course of action. 4. Yes, it was a breach of contract, but I left before I lost anything, so didn't feel it was a reasonable thing to sue over. I agree with OP here. A little bit of trust goes a very long way, and there was no trust in this situation. And they're completely right. If they weren't going to give them the quarter, why would they believe they were going to give them a dollar an hour later on? That just doesn't seem to add up. I do like that at the end of this one, OP said that this was not the way to do things because, seriously, that other job really wasn't lined up yet. And you could tell from the awkward conversation that was had on the phone when he called them and they had to discuss whether they wanted to give him a job or not. That could have gone south very quickly and then we wouldn't be reading about it in malicious compliance. So in the end, what I got out of this one is OP made a very dumb decision but came out on top, so good work nonetheless. This next story comes to us from Hayden2013. Not a team player? Okay, let's jump right in. Some required background. I worked for a university police department. The university requires employees to purchase a parking pass decal to park on campus. The police department is set a little bit off of the main campus and we got away for years without needing to buy parking passes. One year, our police administration decided that we would no longer be exempt and had the parking services office put up a decal pass required sign for our lot. 
They told us that we must have decals to park there or we would be ticketed. Another officer and myself decided to start parking on the public street next to the department, which allowed us to avoid buying parking passes. This did not sit well with the department, and we both ended up in the chief's office for a meeting. The chief told us that, I'm not telling you you won't be eligible for promotion, but when we're looking for people to promote to sergeant, we need team players. He made it clear that he did not like that we were not purchasing parking passes, even though we were complying with the policy and not parking on campus without a pass. The malicious compliance. We had a sergeant who loved to go out of his way to find things that others were doing wrong. He would nitpick the smallest things trying to get one over on people. I love reading and would read policies and stuff in my free time, so I was well versed in how to use them to my advantage. I came up with a plan to get one over on the department using Sergeant Nitpick. On a week I knew Sergeant Nitpick would see, I went to the parking office and purchased a temporary parking pass. The normal decals would be placed on the rear window, while the temporary pass is a hang tag that goes on the rearview mirror. The campus parking policy stated, if you did not have a decal as an employee, you could purchase a temporary pass once per year for up to two weeks at $4 per day. I purchased the temporary pass for one week, Monday to Friday, which was the best $20 I've spent. I worked night shift and Sergeant Nitpick worked day shift at the time. On Monday night, I parked in the lot with my new temporary decal, knowing that Sergeant Nitpick would see my car in the lot on Tuesday morning. When I came into work Tuesday night, I expected to get a call into my sergeant's office and spoken to. It didn't happen. By the end of my shift on Tuesday, I began to wonder if my plan had failed. On Wednesday though, it happened. I get called into my sergeant's office and he has an email from the captain. The captain stated that someone had noticed that I was parking in the lot without a decal and I needed to get a decal if I was going to park in the lot. He also intimated that they noticed the hang tag and suggested that I had somehow gotten it nefariously. I had the biggest grin on my face and my sergeant looked very confused. I explained the parking policy that I had paid $20 for my temporary pass, that it was good through Friday, and I would stop parking in the lot after it expired. He started laughing and said he would take care of it. The next morning when I saw Sergeant Nitpick, I said good morning as I usually do. He would not speak to me. He did not end up speaking to me for about two weeks. I'm guessing he got an earful from the captain for the embarrassment he caused. Treat people better. OP doesn't state what country or state or province that they're in, but if it was a single party consent state, then they should have been recording that meeting in their pocket while they were in with the chief. Because that one line that the chief said, I'm not telling you you won't be eligible for promotion, but when we're looking for people to promote to sergeant, we need team players. Uh, yeah, that could have gotten them in a boatload of trouble. Another point on this one, and I'm not completely sure this is how it works, but if OP works for the campus and the campus is charging them parking to come to work, isn't that being charged to come to work? Shouldn't the campus be covering that expense for OP because, well, you know, they work there? I'm just not up on the laws on this kind of thing, so if you know how this works, by all means, comment down below and let me know. This next story comes to us from Pickles McWaffle 1. I can't prop the door open? Alrighty then. Let's jump right in. Been sitting on this story for a few months now. I work for a small moving company in my city. We move furniture and decor to many different places throughout the city. We got a call about moving a large load of bookshelves to a rather large industrial building. We loaded up two 18-foot box trucks full of shelves and were ready to move. When we arrived at the building, we pulled around to the loading dock and began offloading the shelves. As we were bringing stuff off the truck, I went to building security to open the door. There had been a recent string of shootings in our area and everyone was locking all the doors. They handed me a doorstop and told me I could prop the door open since we have a large load. So I propped open the door and we got going. We no more than had the first pallet off the truck when the building's maintenance manager came running towards us. 
He screamed at us. What are you doing? You cannot have that door propped open. Now, this man looked like he was somewhere between the ages of 76 and 105. He was as red as I've ever seen anyone. I calmly told him that security gave me a doorstop and told me since we have such a large load, we could keep the door propped open. Of course, he wasn't having it. I don't care what security told you, you cannot have this door propped open. At this point, my Native American temper got the better of me. I replied, yes sir. I walked over to the door and picked up the doorstop. I walked back to security and explained the situation. They rolled their eyes and explained that this crotchety old fossil is always causing problems all over the building. They told me I could still prop the door open, but now I was mad and feeling petty. He doesn't want us to prop the door open? Alrighty then. There was a buzzer outside of the door, so I buzzed security asking them if they could open the door. Well, guess whose office was right by said door, and thus, guess who security called to open the door and let us in? That's right, Fossil Man that was two days older than dirt. He opened the door and let us in. We made our delivery and came back to grab another pallet. I again buzzed security and they again asked Fossil Man to let us in. This happened twice more before he stopped me and said, you know, if you wanted to keep that door open, you can since you have such a big load. I replied with the biggest smile on my face, oh no sir, this door cannot be propped open. I wouldn't want to upset anyone by doing that. He looked at me with a look on his face that was somewhere between murderous and the realization that he had made a huge mistake. 18 pallets later, we had the load delivered, and every single time, guess who had to let us in? It took us a little over two hours to get everything finished. The last pallet we delivered, I poked my head into Fossil Man's office and said, thank you so much for your help. I'm pretty sure he popped a blood vessel. Alright, OP, I can see how you got your malicious compliance, but let's be honest here. The best person in this story was the security guard who made sure that the consequences landed square on the idiot who created the problem in the first place. That was extremely well done. I'm also a very big fan of throwing it right back in his face when he said that you could prop the door open because it was inconveniencing him. I think I would have done the same thing in that situation, OP. Looked him right back in the eyes and said, We have to follow the rules. You said so yourself. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Lucy Ha. Boss wants to cut off all employees and workers from their email access over the weekend, but doesn't understand the consequences. Let's jump right in. Hello everyone, this is my first post here and wanted to share my greatest work story. My native language isn't English, so please excuse when my grammar is a bit simple. The story starts with me and my company. I'm a 30-year-old businesswoman who works in an IT service in a bank space. I'm the girl for everything basically, but I'm a specialist for first-level support, administration, and backup, sometimes even networking. Even though I'm not head of my IT department, I basically had all the responsibilities of them but unfortunately my pay grade doesn't reflect that at all. I think of my boss of my IT department as kind of lazy if not incompetent. He even brags about getting so much money for basically doing nothing. I have a 40 hour week, but since the whole IT department is my responsibility, I need to keep track of the servers and maybe problems that can occur 24 seven. This is mostly done via emails. When the server status gives out a warning or a failure, I will get notified, and then I'm fixing the problem over remote desktop or going to the company itself, even in my free time. I wouldn't mind this, but I'm not getting paid for this, but on the other hand, I'm getting punished when something is going wrong. My boss's boss wasn't that much better. Since it was a fancy bank, everyone should be in a suit the whole time to let it look professional, best with a skirt and high heels. Only problem is, when you work in the first level support, you need to do a lot of behind the scenes work. Like slipping under the desk to do or repair cable management, doing work on the server rack, and doing lots of other activities that makes you dirty. You can imagine that this wore out my business clothes really, really fast. And not only that, they were so impractical and really made my work harder. 
so I changed my clothes to a comfy hoodie and work pants to fit the work I'm doing a bit better. When my boss saw me, he was furious, demanded I can't look like a poor hobo inside his bank. I told him that I demand work clothes for both occasions because they are expensive and get worn out quickly. He refused and I wasn't really happy about this. So this, so much for the introduction. Someday, my boss's boss, head of the whole company, called me. He had a plan. He wanted to create quiet hours, means he didn't want his employees working on weekends to let them rest properly. At first glance, you could say, hey, that's a nice idea. Yeah, no, he just didn't like to pay them for overwork because he got in some legal trouble with overwork paying in general. Not only that, some employees have strict deadlines and need the extra time to get work done. To actively ensure nobody can work over the weekend, he wanted the following. Please make sure no one can access their emails and remote desktop over the weekend. No exceptions. Since we had a ticket system and been able to attach emails to tickets, I asked him to write an official work task. This has two reasons. First, I like everything documented. Second, I have something to protect and secure myself if the task I was given is incorrect. And it's exactly this that saved me. So I was in my office desk again, thinking how to get the task done and what implication it will have. And then it was clear to me what it meant. The email came from my boss with the task and indeed he wrote, for everyone, no exceptions. I was thinking to myself, should I write them the implications it would have? After thinking, I thought of how I'm treated as a worker, and I decided against it. I was working immediately at this task and made an automated process to block every access to emails after Friday 6 p.m. to Monday 6 a.m. Weekend came, and it was Saturday, and I was calm and relaxed because if you've not noticed by now, by cutting down everyone's emails means, of course, that I don't receive any updates on the servers. I can't possibly work on it because my remote access is also cut, of course. If you think you could forward your work email address to your private address, no, I can't because we have a very strict data protection. Nothing is allowed to go out. I'm happy. It's still Saturday, middle of the day. I'm cooking myself and my husband a nice meal and my telephone rings. It's my boss's boss. He talks with a stressed voice and told me that he can't access his emails. I needed a second to process this, but I responded, that doesn't surprise me at all, since you ordered me to cut everyone's email access without exceptions. He was angry, very angry, and told me that this obviously doesn't count for him. I told him that he specifically told me that there are no exceptions, and he stated everyone. He then argued that this wasn't how he phrased it, so I reread him his own email. After that, he was silent for a moment. He noticed his flaw in his logic. I broke the silence and asked him, Sir, if you still want access to your emails on the weekend, that's no problem. Please send me a request per email and I will work on it first thing on Monday. A bit angry again, he replied that he wants to have it done immediately. And I calmly explained to him that I can't do this since my remote access is also blocked like he ordered. He hung up. 10 minutes later, he calls me again. He asks me calmly if I can fix the problem right now when he pays me for my overwork. He also wants me to be available at any time, means I should receive my emails and be able to remote work, and that this will raise my pay grade by a lot. I thought that this is the perfect opportunity. I agree to that condition and pay raise, but only when my coworkers and I finally get work clothes. He agreed. Since then, my work situation drastically improved, and mostly only because I maliciously complied, well aware of the consequences of the given task. Thanks for reading. OP added a couple of edits down at the bottom of the story. The first one says, edit, thank you so much for all your comments and love. I'm glad you liked it. Edit number two says, I want to add something here to the four types of comments. To the people with positive comments and their own stories, thank you so much. I had no idea this would blow up this much. To the people who complain about my English, yes, I'm German, not a native speaker. 
I'm giving my best here, and I'm trying to improve on it every day, that's all I can do. To the people with hateful comments, if you don't like it, that's totally fine. But there's no need of sharing insults, really. In my honest opinion, it was a valuable lesson for my boss to let them have a well-thought concept before giving the official task. To the people who don't believe and say it's BS, I'm not here to convince you. If I can reach even one person to empower them to improve their work condition, then that's a complete win in my eyes. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Broken Soul. It says, Heh, if you're not being paid for being on call, why answer the phone in the first place? It can wait till Monday. OP responded to this comment and said, you are definitely not wrong here. When I received the call, I was fully aware what he probably would say. And I couldn't stand the curiosity. I kind of agree with the commenter here that OP shouldn't have answered their phone. But in answering their phone, they made the boss realize just how valuable they were, and they were able to further their position in the company. So, I think OP did a really good job. In fact, they're a pretty good negotiator in my eyes. What I really love about this though is that OP didn't just think about themselves, they got work clothes for their colleagues as well. And that right there makes OP a really great person. This next story comes to us from The Breakup 2013. Short me $70,000 in violation of our written agreement? It'll cost you $1.8 million. Let's jump right in. Disclaimer, the names and some of the situations have been changed to protect the identities, but the dollars and general nature of the situation is completely true. Background, a year out of school in the early 1990s, I procured a job as a business analyst for a large, family-owned tech company. This business was located in the booming heart of technology at the time, and was very profitable. As tech took off over the next decade, the company thrived and remained family-owned. What was a rich family and company became exceedingly wealthy with a valuation and net worth in the high 9, low 10 figures. The family that owned it was quite neurotic, very moody, and had a reputation as very ruthless, greedy, when it came to financing, deal-making, employees, etc. I truly believe this is what held them back from ultimately becoming a household name as a company. As I progressed in the company, I gained more and more face time with the owners. I worked on some projects directly with ownership that really paid off, and gained me even greater access to their inner circle. Now, like a lot of people at the time, and particularly those who worked in tech, I was heavily invested in tech stocks. I discussed some of my investments and gains with ownership as casual conversation, though investing had nothing to do with my role in the company. That is, until one day in late 1999, when the owner came to me and asked me if I would invest some of his personal money. He wanted me to take big risks to see if they would pay off using $1 million of his personal money. I was a bit hesitant, but still being in my late 20s and wanting to prove myself, I said I would. I asked for a written agreement where they acknowledged this wasn't my role in the company, was a personal matter between the owner and me, and to document my compensation for this side arrangement, 20% of all profits. Around this same time, and by working in the industry, I started to notice the weakness associated with a lot of tech companies. They just weren't living up to their hype and stock price, and some seemed like they were starting to run out of money. I had no inside information, just a strong sense of which companies were struggling based on my work in the business. Based on this sense, I started using both my money and the owner's money to short tech companies just after the new year in 2000. For anyone unfamiliar with shorting, this means if the value of a stock decreases, the value of the investment increases. I had a few long positions, but my overall position was very short. Since the owner wanted big risk and big reward, I used his money and obtained leverage or margin from the financial institution where I maintained both his and my trading accounts. The accounts were separate, but both under my name. Again, I documented this and gained consent. Well, both my account and his suffered some moderate losses in the first two months of 2000 before the bubble began to burst and both accounts, but his in particular, began to skyrocket. Ownership's pettiness. 
In June, the company began to suffer a downturn. We were still profitable, but since we provided tech services and products, we were not immune to weakness in the broader market. I had not informed the owner of my short strategy. He came to me one day and asked how his money was doing, saying he suspected it was way down like the general market. To his surprise, I informed him that while we still had some money tied up in options, puts and shorts, but based on the positions I had closed, there was $1.35 million in cash sitting in the account that belonged to him. Again, I still had a bunch of open positions which, if memory serves, were worth about a million on that date. But the positions I had closed had yielded $1.35 million in cash just sitting in his account, which was in my name. The owner, either through ignorance or lack of attention, said, Great! $1.35 million? Fantastic work in this down market. Will you please wire it to me? I responded that I would, but would be taking my 20% of the $350,000 profit, or $70,000, before wiring him the $280,000. I also reminded him I still had open positions that had yet to pay off or close, but I didn't state the amount. He once again appeared not to understand or comprehend the open position statement, but instead totally focused on and became incensed about my rightful claim for $70,000. He went on and on about how times were tough. I should be grateful for a job, particularly at my young age, and the entire $350,000 was necessary for him and the company. I knew this wasn't true based on my position within the company. Worse, this was my first time personally experiencing the greed and corrupt nature that served as the basis for ownership's reputation. The revenge. Now comes the revenge, since after two separate conversations, the owner didn't seem to grasp that the open positions would yield at least some income and thus additional profit, I decided not to mention it again. I sent him back the entire 1.35 million and continue to manage the open positions to the best of my ability. And here's the kicker, the owner never brought it up again. He seemed to think the 1.35 million payment was the entire value of the account, and never understood or remembered that open positions still existed. He never asked for records, tax documents, or any kind of audit or financials. Given the fact that he was dishonest with me, I didn't feel the need to disabuse him of that notion. Ultimately, after a bit more net gain, I covered all of the shorts and exercised all of the options, puts in this case, for an additional 1.8 million. I worked for the company for three more years and owner never asked about it during my tenure, after I gave notice or since. I know it's a bit crass and even shady AF, but given his dishonesty with me over the $70,000, I felt justified in keeping the additional 1.8 million. I paid taxes on the gain, long-term capital gains, and went on my way with a fantastic nest egg. Nobody has asked about it since, and I have only told the story to a few people, and even then only after the statute of limitations passed. The final ironic cherry on top of this Sunday is that during my remaining three years, I gained greater influence with the ownership in position within the company because they considered me loyal for giving the $1.35 million back and not making too much of a stink about the $70,000 profit. Little did they know, I got the better of them. The company eventually folded due to family disputes, but my understanding is that ownership walked away in a very good financial position. They likely could have been a much better and greater company had they not practiced the same dishonesty that they showed me with their vendors, clients, and employees. Thanks for reading, and I hope you enjoyed. Now, OP did post this story about two years ago in the Malicious Compliance subreddit. It was posted again recently because OP added the extremely short update at the top that says, Update, the original post is below. Only this update paragraph is new. There have been no negative consequences from the below, and no consequences other than a few people DMing me with incorrect guesses. In fact, the remaining family members have reached out a time or two about some consulting work. They have no clue. Okay, so have we not learned yet that you don't screw over the people in IT, and you definitely don't screw over the people 
who are managing your money for you, especially if you're not financially literate enough to know what they're actually doing with your money. Now that I've had a chance to read this story for the second time, a few things come to mind. So that original profit, that $350,000, OP wired that all back to the boss. But did OP not pay any capital gains on that? Because it was in his name, so technically he'd have to pay the tax on that himself. But there's no mention of that at all in the story. Putting that aside, this story is a huge example of how people who already have money can make a lot more money by investing and whatnot. It's a lot easier for them to increase their position. Whereas somebody in OP's case, well, they weren't going to make anywhere near as much. So on the hypothetical assumption that the story is true, OP did a wonderful job of increasing their own position by using the money of somebody who was already wealthy. The statute of limitations is passed and OP is in the clear. Well done. All right, our first story today comes to us from Rye on the Rocks. You want me to make a patient stay late so you can skip work during the snow and you refuse to stay late? Fine, now you have to stay late every day. Let's jump right in. Once upon a time, I worked in a research hospital coordinating drug studies. This one's going to go against the grain of some of the stories here. When you work in healthcare, following the written laws and rules to the letter is of the utmost importance. We run into trouble when people begin inventing their own rules and playing by them. The hardest part of my job was convincing other departments to also do their jobs. And sometimes, it was like pulling teeth asking people to perform their duties even at a basic level. Ask a nurse to draw a basic 4-tube blood kit, you got an eye roll. Ask the pharmacy to stay 5 minutes past the end of the workday, nope, they couldn't do that, they were out at 4.30. That second scenario is the important one for the purposes of this story. That department refuses to stay late. I could understand why they'd feel that way and strive to maintain as steady a schedule as possible. But in the world of sick and dying people, sometimes things came up. Mind you, I regularly had to stay an hour or two past the end of my shift to take care of problems and data entry. We could get overtime pay or flex our schedules pretty easily, at least in my department. This hospital was in a very snowy metropolitan area. And one time years ago, we were projected to get a massive blizzard. Every one of us, the nurses, the physicians, the pharmacists, and the coordinators were essential employees, or whatever they called it before COVID popularized the term, and had to come in regardless of the weather. So every one of us should have been planning to be there the next day, even if the weather was awful. We had to call in sick if we missed work for weather reasons. The afternoon before the storm was due to begin, we had a patient in clinic. Typically, patients on this particular research study got a doctor's appointment and then treatment immediately after. However, this individual had a job that made him prefer getting his clinic visit done in the afternoon and his treatment early the next morning. It was unusual, but it wasn't hard to accommodate him. While most of us had accepted our fate of driving in the snow the next morning, the investigational drug department was especially not too excited about the prospect of having to come in during the blizzard. So at 3.30, an hour before the pharmacy closes, they send me a Slack message and ask us what the possibility of doing this patient's treatment today might be so they don't have to come in for it tomorrow. Really? You're asking us now? This was on your docket all day. Anyhow, I begrudgingly went to find the patient in the waiting room and ask. He wasn't thrilled, but says he'll do it if he has to. I let the pharmacy know. Then they asked me what the status of the patient was. Clinic was running behind as usual, and we hadn't cleared the patient for treatment yet. The investigational pharmacy needed at least 20 minutes to prep the drugs needed, so they told us we had until 4 p.m. to get them the signed order. The process for getting a drug order filled involved getting a signed order from a doctor after a patient has been cleared to get a drug, walking it outside across the street to the pharmacy, handing the signed prescription to a pharmacist, waiting for the drug, walking it back to the patient in the first building. This was absolutely not going to happen in 12 minutes. At 4.01, pharmacy sent me a very rude Slack message indicating that I basically missed my window to get the patient in today and I should do a better job next time. 
As coordinator, you get blamed for absolutely everything, even if it was the fault of a doctor who was bad at time management. Their message said something along the lines of, if you don't come up and give a pharmacist the order by 405, there's nothing we can do for your patient. In the future, you should get the order signed and over to us ahead of time so we can prep it. Ahead of time in this case meant that a patient would be prescribed a drug but wasn't yet cleared by a doctor to receive that drug. In my training, the pharmacy director told us we were never ever supposed to do this. It was a humongous no-no and would be grounds for a massive lawsuit if anything went wrong. You absolutely don't prep a drug unless the patient receiving it is cleared for treatment by a physician. I really liked the pharmacy director, and I messaged her regularly with questions about drugs patients might be considering while on study, but she wasn't super involved in the day-to-day -day of the pharmacy workers and tended to focus on bigger picture tasks, hence why her employees were inventing their own rules and demands. Hmm, so I'm supposed to get this patient in today, right now, eh? Alright, if you insist. So I got the order signed by the physician ahead of seeing the patient. They didn't really give a crap. Next step, in the words of the person who messaged me, was to take it to a pharmacist, eh? You said I had to take it to a pharmacist by 405, right? What if, instead of walking it directly to the pharmacy, I took it directly to the pharmacy director? She was still a pharmacist and could do everything the folks in the investigational drug dispensary could do. I told her that we hadn't cleared this patient but I had been urged by pharmacy to dispense the drug anyhow so that the patient wouldn't have to come in tomorrow for their treatment. She looked puzzled and asked if the patient was rescheduled while in clinic. I told her no, this was at the request of the pharmacy staff so they wouldn't have to come in during a snowstorm. I showed her the message her employee had sent me. Pharmacy director was unhappy with this and said someone would just have to stay late if this was the plan. I referred her to the Slack message that said I had missed my window because they didn't plan to stay late. Director was livid and told me that she personally was going to stay late to make sure this went through. We went to the pharmacy from her office and she intended to scold this employee, but of course, everyone was gone. So the two of us went and got the drug at 4.35 and I got it back to the patient. I got a call from him a week later indicating that he actually preferred getting Thursday afternoon treatment instead of having it on Friday morning and wanted to keep that schedule going forward. I relayed this to the head of the pharmacy. I expressed uncertainty with how we'd handle this and she said she'd get back with me. We all got an email a few days later saying that the investigational drug department would now be staying open until 530 and one person would be staying late every day, rotating every day, so that someone could cover late drug orders. But I knew she only had three pharmacists, and they were all salaried, not hourly, which meant some of them would be covering more than one late hour a week. I went to get this patient's next dose of drugs a few weeks later, at about 4.45. The same woman who'd asked me to break the rules was working. I asked how she was doing, and she told me she was having to work three 4.30 to 5.30s a week, presumably because she tried to act unethically a few weeks prior. She handed me the pill bottle and slammed the window in my face. And to think, if the pharmacist would have just shut up and done their jobs like they were supposed to and come in during one snowstorm, they'd still be able to leave at 4.30 every day. If you work in healthcare or health research, don't make your own rules, kids. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, we have one from a user called Stabmaster. Ooh. Not everyone can get flex time, and some people get nothing but crap for staying even one minute into OT. Plus, if it's anything like some of the places I've worked for, staying five minutes once means that everyone tries to get you to keep doing that, then 10, then 15, etc. That said, the way they handled that, especially the berating you for something that, per their own policies, was straight up not allowed, was especially crap to the bull level. If you're there until 4.30, then don't be angry if you have things that keep coming in until then. Especially don't be rude to people that have the full ability to go over your head and get you called out for when you are blatantly breaking a rule. Entitlement blinds everyone eventually, I guess. OP replied to this comment and said, and that's the thing. I feel for these people and agree that their time should be respected. But this is going to keep happening, so something needs to be put in place on their end. Patients can't just not get a drug because they can't get their act together. 
OP, I think you mentioned in your post that you get flex and overtime, but the pharmacist didn't, so why would they want to work extra time for free? I'm not quite understanding that part of the story. Yes, I know you need to get the drugs to them, but somebody higher up isn't paying them to be there for that extra time. In a lot of industries and not just pharmacy work, there's always going to be quote-unquote emergencies or late orders, and honestly, I can see their point of view in just wanting to close down when their time is done and leave. Let's open this up to comments though. Everybody who's listening to this right now, if you could comment down below and let me know what you think. Do you think that the pharmacist should have been guilted into staying later, or that OP took the right route in making them all have to stay later, regardless of whether they want to or not? Our next story today comes to us from No Language 7256 Unsuitable. Let's jump right in. Some background. I'm in Australia, I'm currently a 32-year-old male, and this occurred this year. I used to do admin work in defense, and during that time, I got rather qualified and experienced specifically in people management and training people. I then left the uniform for various reasons, including depression caused by my time there. I got a new job and intentionally got a position way below my capabilities so I could focus on my mental health while still working. It was a hotline for a government assistance program. This position was good for about four years. Over that time, I started using some of my skills more and built up my confidence again, I also was acting in higher positions almost the entire time. Initiating incident. So after all the COVID lockdowns finally finished, there was a permanent spot in a higher position available. By this time, I was the longest serving person remaining in the team, and I was the most qualified. I knew they planned on getting the incumbent to do two roles, both of which I knew thoroughly went through the interview process, answered all the questions, explained how I could do the role immediately without training, etc. Had to wait a few weeks to find out the result, since it's still government and they don't do these things super fast. Then I got told that I was found not suitable. I was floored. I asked for an explanation, and all I was told was, it was a very competitive round. When I asked what I could have done to be more competitive, I got the same answer. To make things worse, they asked me to train the guy who got the role. Immediately, I brought up the duty statement, which had the list of tasks for my role. Remember, it's super easy, basically, just answer the phone and reply to emails. I also got out the public service level expectations and highlighted the appropriate bits for my level. Cue malicious compliance. Since I wasn't suitable to work at higher levels, I immediately stopped all work that wasn't at my level or in my job description. To say this put a dent into the extra work I was doing would be an understatement. I used to help out management with sorting out interpersonal disputes. I used to run a bunch of reports to find and sort out work that was missed. And I used to help the other teams do their work. So at this point, my days became super easy. I would do about 10% of what I used to as that 10% was my actual job. The training I was doing was directing the guy to the procedures, and if he had questions, directing him to ask his supervisor. It was about a week of this before management noticed the training wasn't very in-depth. One by one, they asked me what was going on. Our structure had six supervisors at that time. Each and every time, I said the same thing. Unfortunately, I was found unsuitable for the role, so I can't teach someone how to do it. To say they were pissed would also be an understatement, but they tried to stay professional. They then started questioning why I stopped doing all the extra work that I had been doing for years. I directed their attention to my duty statement and asked where it lists that work. They said the extra duties as directed. I then asked how that aligns with the level expectations, which are surprisingly clear and helpful. At this point, most stopped trying. During all this sudden free time I had, I started to search for a new job. It only took two weeks to go for interviews, be found suitable, and get a new job. Apparently, I'm incredibly competitive at this level. Who knew? The fallout. The new job is significantly easier, at the level I was unsuitable for, and gives me much more money than they were offering. Additionally, I have kept in touch with some people there, the management are floundering as interpersonal problems are cropping up, 
the team can't keep up with the workload, and at least three more people have gotten new jobs, with at least two looking for other employment, leaving one person left in the hotline team that will know what they're doing. It's a shame, really, because I like that program and probably would have stayed for a long time. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Not So Chi Couple. It says, I've heard this before. Management sees someone doing great at their job and don't want to promote them out of it because they would lose a valuable person in that position. What they always forget is that if they decide someone is that important, you have to keep them happy. Raises, title changes, accolades, try something. It isn't that hard. OP responded to this comment and said, the worst part is that the higher position was still in the same team doing one of the roles I had been acting in for the previous four years. My actual role was more of a demotion at that point. OP, what you did was perfect. Sometimes management needs to be taught a lesson that if they don't promote you, then all the extra things you're doing that aren't in your job description just aren't going to be done and they're going to realize how valuable you are to the company. The other option you have is to pack your bags and move on, which is exactly what you did. So I think this was the best outcome you could have hoped for. You got into a better position for better pay at a different company doing exactly what you want to do. Well done, OP. Our last story today comes to us from Nutella Zamboni. <laughs> Dress code violation A. I'll follow it to the letter then. Let's jump right in. Someone suggested I make this a topic and post of its own, so... My all-male high school had a business professional dress code, and it was the early 90s, so there were a lot of options as far as color, style, fit, etc. I got a detention for not wearing a belt, but my dress pants had a built-in belt made of the same fabric as the pants. The disciplinarian wouldn't budge because the dress code said belt had to be leather, so off to detention I went. Cue me thinking of how to maliciously comply. And my grandfather was a master tailor who would do anything for me. I went to big and tall clearance section and bought the ugliest, loudest, and biggest rayon shirt and pants I could find. My grandfather darted the shirt in as many places as he could. He took in the pants so much the pockets touched the center back seam. Put three inch cuffs on them, pleats on the back, and tapered the ankles to 8 inches with a huge break. When he was done, he had me try it on and gave me an orange leather belt to go with them. I can't even begin to tell you how many neon colors were on the shirt, pants were a muted olive green orange belt, hideous multicolored argyle socks, white patent leather slip-on dress shoe, and since it was winter, I paired it with a 70s chocolate brown pleather trench coat. I went to school strutting like a peacock. Disciplinarian takes one look at me and tells me to get in his office. While in his office, he asks me if I think the dress code is a joke, to which I tell him, absolutely not. I don't want to get in more trouble for violating it, which is why I'm in dress code. He looks like he's about to flip his crap when he realizes, because he knows the book like the back of his hand, that the dress code says, all clothes must be properly fitted and tailored. Dress pants or khaki style pants. Shirts can be long sleeve or short with a collar. Dress socks to be worn at all times. Dress shoes or boat shoes. And a leather belt must always be worn. There's more, but it applies to turtlenecks, jackets, blazers, and sweaters. He's looking at me with his eyes twitching and asks me if I know how ridiculous I look. I told him that I think I look awesome and I have a well-tailored fitting outfit with a leather belt, dress socks, and shoes. He says, but you don't come close to matching. I ask him where it says we have to match in the dress code. He tells me to get the F out of his sight. <laughs> Down in the comment section of this one, there's one from a user called Cayman718. It says, I hope he understood that your colorful outfit was the result of his enforcing the leather belt aspect of the dress code to the letter instead of accepting the belt that was part of your original pants. OP replied to this comment and said, he did. He and I got along famously for four years, and he got a kick out of how much I would stretch the limits of things. Another example is our hair couldn't touch our collar. I slicked my hair back so you really couldn't tell how long it was, but it all got to a point where it was below my collar. He reminded me that my hair was touching my collar, and I told him I would fix it as soon as I could. 
so I got a really tight perm and I look like Be Real from Cypress Hill when he had a fro. All right, our first story today comes to us from Emperor Buttman. <laughs> we don't care how understaffed you are, every customer must get priority service. Let's jump right in. This was a while ago before I managed to claw my way out of the hotel industry. Used to work in a hotel with about a thousand rooms. All employees were being cross-trained when I came on board, which essentially meant rather than hiring enough people, every idle five minutes was to be spent helping one of the other drowning departments. Most of my time was either dedicated to service or reception, but we got plenty of housekeeping and tech department odd jobs thrown our way too. This was pretty normal since tech were by far the smallest department, around three people for 1,000 cheaply constructed rooms, and housekeeping was also tiny for the impossible amount of work they had to do. So what duties could be expected in reception? Replace door batteries, light bulbs, unclogged drains, restock tea and coffee, coffee makers, kettles, hair dryers, TP, anything guests were missing or ran out of after they checked in. Room service for any COVID isolation cases, ticket stubbing for events, manning the bar, garage duties, there was a whole rental thing going on and property return rentals were a rarity. Anything else that was flung at us with the label urgent, like room tours and occasionally even making our own staff lunches. Ignoring our repeated request to cut down the number of available rooms until we had enough staff to actually provide the service we advertised, management also informed us we were there to placate the after-sales cases. Disgruntled customers rightly pissed off that they didn't get what they're promised. So after months of going by the book, I finally found myself a comfortable little loophole. Any tech or housekeeping issue was obviously higher priority than reception, since for example, not having toilet paper or working lights, drains, and doors was an unacceptable condition for guests. So waiting two hours to be checked in or book breakfast was preferable by far. Having two to three receptionists on shift to man three phones, email, scanners and printers for guest registrations, yeah, we still had one foot in the 90s, and troubleshoot reservations, one of us would be on the desk checking people in. If another was available, they'd be on digital responses, just taking one call after another while working through emails, and I would take every single tech and housekeeping job that came. If any of us received complaints, we'd explain the situation. I'm sorry, but there's currently an emergency, insert technical HSK issue here, that will have to take priority. If you'd be so kind as to wait in line until my colleague comes back, he'll see to you upon his return. I'm pretty resilient when I don't give an F anymore, so I told them to put any difficult guests in my line too, unless their problem was high priority. Whenever I got back, I'd have 30 minutes to 2 hours to work through the line before the next thing would come up and I'd apologetically leave. When they demanded an explanation or just started yelling, I'd simply explain our duties and say I fully agree that this is not a comfortable condition for guests to be in. And they in turn would agree that providing toilet paper and other essentials needed to come first. Naturally, wanting to provide all customers with the tools to improve their future experience, I always rounded off these kinds of conversations with a warm thank you and an if you can think of any suggestions that might improve yours and other guests' future experiences here, please let us know on TripAdvisor. Feedback, of any nature, is always valuable to us. Reviews came flooding in that were either talking about a massive dip in quality or how understaffed and poorly managed the place was. But funnily enough, I never heard one bad word against the staff. Management didn't make a big change to the hiring policy, so I eventually left. But last I heard, almost everyone had quit not long after I did, and the place has since rebranded, presumably to get away from the rating that dropped a couple stars. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, there's one from a user called Indigo0331 that I completely agree with. It says, if every customer is getting priority service, no customer is getting priority service. Another way to look at this is if management says that every single thing is a priority, the employees are gonna look at it and be completely overwhelmed not knowing what to do first. There should be a clear cut set of priority tasks that take place before other tasks. It's like if you're trying to put on your socks and shoes. You can't put on your socks and shoes at the same time. Socks must go on before shoes, but in an emergency, you can don your shoes and forego your socks. Thus, socks are not a top priority task. 
but they are nevertheless a task that should be performed, and they must be done before the shoes, unless you're hellbent on effing up royally. Our next story today comes to us from a shellfish lover. All of this over a couple of envelopes? Let's jump right in. I caught COVID early due to the work I do. Unfortunately, that meant that what little help would come for others during the lockdowns and such didn't happen. I had been ready to move before, but the job fell through and my old boss was great letting me come back, go to a full work from home setup and checking in when needed. Still, a lot of stuff fell to the wayside. Unfortunately, due to my hobbies, I ran afoul of a postal worker. I collect and trade cards, mostly magic stuff. As such, I get a lot of packages and had developed rapport with my previous mail carrier about all of the weird towns and even out of the way countries I would sometimes receive a package from. When I got sick, Manuel would bring my mail to me and we commiserated a lot. Manuel was a good dude, an immigrant who made his way, raised three lovely boys and got into the USPS and stayed to retirement. Then came Sandra. Sandra was the epitome of the type of personality I hated in that city. Loud and proud about being ignorant, but pushy whenever proven wrong. When I realized I hadn't received my mail for a week, I checked in with the post office. Manuel and I had been informal, so paperwork would take weeks to file. Until then, I got someone to help out, but Sandra had already emptied my box and marked it for pickup. Pickup I couldn't do. When I finally got my stuff, a lot of trades that had arrived were now missing. I put it down for theft, but Sandra was the type to just be negligent. She had the look of that middle school teacher who would swear down is up and fail you for daring to look like her ex-husband. It took a lot of haranguing, but I got the approval for direct delivery in my little community. Put up my box on my door and then got a knock on the door. Smug Sandra, her handout with three letters. This one had to be manually run, that cost 35 cents. Now, I'd received and sent hundreds, maybe thousands of pieces of cardboard crack from this address over the years. I had a manual run twice, and it wouldn't be a big deal, but after months of not going out, no cash for COD. I tried being nice, understanding, but Sandra would give no quarter. So I wheeled myself to dig up two quarters in my junk drawer, and came back to Sandra looking carony at my neighbor Bill. Maybe she thought he was the wrong color tone for the neighborhood. I gave her the two quarters, and she accosted me for another five minutes about how she doesn't carry change. How dare I expect? I was just about done. Then she asked what was in the package. Oh, just some card game stuff. I never knew adults played that crap. I can take stupidity, rigidity to rules. Hell, I'll take someone having a bad day. But mocking my cardboard? Nah. I asked if maybe I could give over a bill. She could write a receipt. I knew that businesses had that sort of thing. She said I'd have to come in, and I couldn't at that time, as I was solo without a handy van. No electronic option to open an account either. Okay, that's fine. I'll call someone, get them to bring some quarter rolls, do a Venmo with them, and we're good. Then five more trades failed to come in, and the note on the door was that she missed me. My work from home stuff was set up in the next room, and I had a doorbell. When I finally asked, she said she had no time to deal with me as she was busy. So I decided to make time. I called my boss and asked if he could cover me for $5 in pennies. I reached out to one of my common trade pals and asked for very specific trades, and waited. About a week later, Sandra came to me with a whole parcel of manually sorted mail all from the same address, 10 envelopes, and I had seven rolls of pennies that I cracked open and counted, slipping a few times while in the rain. During that time, I explained all of the fun postal regulations I had learned about, my interest in bricks, and how with priority mail, I can use the post office to send my collection, that you can secure a tag on any number of difficult to maneuver, yet sturdy enough to get through the post items. A dozen or more small inconveniences I had found that, given my condition and pettiness, would ruin a day. I forgot my count a few times, wouldn't want to shortchange the poor carrier, right? We spent about an hour, me taking up the one spot of dry real estate near my door. I would have invited her in, but regulations, am I right? I'm such a stickler for the rules. 
After that event, my malicious compliance was rewarded with a call from the local post office, explaining that I would be alright moving forward, and my address was noted. I offered to pay the fees, I could afford the occasional 35 cents for my hobby, they declined, and I never saw Sandra again. I moved shortly after, keeping the work from home job but wanting to be closer to family. And now, my new carrier is aces with my needs. I have my mailbox right on my door, glorious. In the comment section for this one, there was a lot of people saying things like, you can mail up to 70 pounds in a flat rate priority box, and then this postie has to carry that, and you can just deny it when it comes up to the door, so they have to continue to take it with them. Now, that wouldn't work where I live because any parcels are delivered by a van that drives up and down the road and just does parcels. They're not actually carried by the mail carriers. So I'd like to know from you guys, in the areas that you live in, do your mail carriers deliver parcels as well? Or are they delivered by a specific person driving around your neighborhood? Or do you have to go to the post office to actually pick them up? Because I know some rural areas act that way. Yeah, I don't really understand the postie in this case. I mean, I sell baseball and football and hockey cards myself online. <laughs> Check out my eBay link in the description down below, by the way. Buy some stuff. I need it gone. Um, and the posties have no problem delivering things to my house at any time. Sometimes that can be 15 packages coming in at the same time. Never had a problem. So I don't really get that. Our next story today comes to us from Viva Ibiza. Restaurant only gives discount on phone orders? Okay then, let's jump right in. I only live 5 minutes walk away from a local pizza place, so I went in and ordered direct to take away. I didn't call ahead as I didn't see much point as I lived so close and I didn't mind the extra couple of minutes. While there, I saw they were doing a special offer, 10% discount if you mentioned their promotion over the phone and then went in to collect takeaway. I know I haven't called in first, but now I know you do a discount if you do, and to save us both the hassle of me calling you right now, and for the fact I know the promotion exists, can I still get the 10% off anyway? No, it's for telephone orders only. Sure, I get that, but I could literally just call you right now from my mobile, and you'd give me the discount, but that'd be a bit weird to make me do that, so can I just get it anyway? No, it's for telephone orders only. This job's worth attitude pissed me off, so I was literally about to just forget about buying anything from there and go somewhere else, but as I got outside, I figured that no, I'd just stand outside and call the number on their door and order a pizza that way to get my discount. The phone rang, and the same guy picked it up. Can I order a pizza to collect with 10% discount please? He recognizes my voice, obviously as it's just been 15 seconds since we were speaking inside. He looks outside at me, I smile and wave. He looks pissed off that he has to give me my discount now. He takes my order and says it will be 10 minutes. During the next 10 minutes while waiting for my discounted pizza, someone else is about to come in the restaurant to order a takeout. I ask them if they have phoned ahead for the discount or not. They didn't realize that was a thing. No problem buddy, I'll do it for you. What do you want? I call the same number again, same guy answers and hears my voice again and looks straight at me again. I smile and wave again and proceed to order this random stranger's pizza order for them whilst maintaining eye contact with him. My friend would also like the 10% telephone discount. He looks like he's going to pop a blood vessel but has no choice but to accept it. After all, I didn't enforce the rules, he did. A week later, the telephone order discount is cancelled completely and it's simply given if you have a menu and there are menus in the entrance anyway, so you'd be crazy not to see it and use it. OP added an edit onto this story It says, well, that blew up, answering a few of the main questions here. This happened a while ago, so the promotion wasn't to do with Google Ads, or tracking info, or storing numbers, etc. It was just a badly executed promo that forced you to call to the very person stood in front of you already taking your order anyway if you wanted the discount. No, not been waiting 15 years to tell this story like I'm some sort of legend and my life peaked at that moment. I read something else on Reddit yesterday and I was like, oh yeah, I remember something like that happening to me and I've never posted in malicious compliance before, so why not share? The guy behind the counter wasn't a kid with management breathing down his neck. He may have even been the owner or manager for all I know, 
it was a small place and not a chain. And if it wasn't just him there doing everything, then it was only him and the chef. So making me call him on the phone in front of him was him enforcing the stupid rule. I just complied with it. I agree, I risked a spat on pizza. I don't suggest pissing people off who make your food. It was not something I was thinking of at that time though. OP, I think you missed a golden opportunity. I would have pulled my phone out while standing at the counter and would have made that phone call standing right in front of that person. And then when they tried to talk to me directly, I would shush them and tell them I'm on the phone. Then I'd go back to my phone and say, sorry about that. This idiot keeps on interrupting me. Now I'd like to order a pizza with a 10% discount, please. Bonus points for dragging out even further and paying over the phone, but having to rummage around through your wallet to find the card for a couple of moments before reading it out to them directly in front of them inside the store. Oh, come on. There were so many things you could have done here, OP. Our last story today comes to us from Pedantic Dullard. You want a smile policy? Let's make sure we're in compliance. Let's jump right in. Making my own post about this after being inspired by a previous post and prompted to do so by others. I worked at a casino years back as a slot host. We helped people with their machines, answered questions, paid jackpots, and were a huge customer impact point. It was really a fun job, despite the awful customers, and many years later, I'm still friends with my old coworkers. One day, management had the bright idea to mandate smiling, even if we weren't physically interacting with customers. Surveillance had been engaged to photograph and report incidences of employees not smiling. We could be written up or even terminated if we had sufficient repeat offenses of failing to smile. During normal business, we would radio surveillance to report tips or found money, any cash that wasn't staying with the casino or when we access the secure machine base for coins, pre-automated tickets, or a select few other reasons. We started calling them on the radio to verify a smile or report a potential violation of the new smiling policy. We would warn the coworker first, that way they could have a huge fake smile ready for the camera. Uh, slots to the eagle, can you verify a potential violation of the smile policy? There's a group of three standing near slot bank location, I can't see smiles from my location. The potential violation had to be recorded, the picture printed, and signed by managers. The policy ended after a few weeks. Surveillance complained to the gaming board that they couldn't enforce the new policy and protect the casino's assets. An eye in the sky buddy said off the record, they had been buried in dozens of smile violations each shift and it actually affected the property security. Managers couldn't do anything to us either to stop us from reporting it. It was specifically written it was an expectation of our job to report suspected department and property policy violations for documentation and investigation. Because they'd made it a written policy, if they told us to stop calling surveillance, they'd be asking us to violate policy, which would then warrant an investigation. Jumping down to the comments on this one, there's one from a user called Mr. Hodge 2. It says, mandatory team building trip to see the movie Smile. OP responded to this one and said, oh no, for that, managers came up with something else. Not kidding, in our pre-shift stand up for a little while, they made us play Hot Potato and the telephone passed the phrase game. I refused to play Hot Potato. On the grounds, I had graduated elementary school and didn't want to be treated like a child. I played telephone because we completely mangled it, much to our own delight. On a serious note, we didn't need team building BS like that. We were all great friends already. We'd go to the bars together after work. We'd go to worlds of fun. We were very much close friends. I had to work on my last Christmas there. I wasn't sad because I truly was spending it with people I loved and, almost 20 years later, still consider some of my closest friends. Oh, that is the one thing I absolutely hate about big companies, is these quote-unquote team-building events. They even bust us off to one at one point, and we had to sit down in this group of people, people from other stories that we didn't even know. But yet we had to do a team-building event where we were doing things with these other teams, with people we don't know and will never be working with, because that makes a whole lot of sense. You know somebody in the corporate office is patting themselves on the back for putting that policy into place because it's going to bring people together and everything's going to run more efficiently. 
Meanwhile, the employees are sitting back and going, wow, whoever came up with this is a butthole. All right, our first story today comes to us from IT Co-op, Maternity Wear. Let's jump right in. This happened several years ago. After onboarding a new job, I was told I could hire an assistant. The HR director, Kelly, handed me a stack of resumes, told me about a friend's daughter, and bumped Kat to the top of my interview list. Kat passed the tech test with high scores and interviewed well, so I hired her. Kat showed up to work on time, had a good attitude, performed well on assignments, and was generally a pleasant person all around. After probation, Kat was excited to tell me that her last raise was enough to get an apartment with her boyfriend. It was a couple months after her raise I started to notice Kelly spending an inordinate amount of time talking to Kat. The combo sounded personal and cordial, and Kelly was friends with Kat's mom, so I didn't think much about it. Until one day, Kelly barges in my office. Did you know Kat moved into an apartment with her boyfriend? I might have heard something about that. Well, Kat is pregnant and her mom is devastated and proceeds to fill me in on the details on Kat's personal life. Uncomfortably, I interrupt, acting like I have a lot going on. This really isn't any of my business. If there's something related to Kat's performance that we need to discuss, please fill me in. But as for me, Kat's doing a great job. A few months pass. Kat's baby bump is starting to show. Kelly is again in my office. Kat is not in compliance with the dress code. Last staff meeting, Kelly handed out a dress code policy with a collage of various women's shoes and dresses and suits, presumably cut from fashion magazines, to assist us in determining what was acceptable from what was not. I picked up the policy and the clip art sheets with a stare reminiscent of Jack Nicholson's I'm of a mind to make some Mookie Batman Joker scene. Is she wearing something in the not allowed clippings as I began to spread the clip art around my desk? She isn't wearing maternity clothes, as Kelly points to the bullet about maternity clothes in the policy. Well, the policy clearly says maternity wear is allowed, Kat is clearly pregnant, and she's wearing clothes, so... You know what I mean when I say maternity clothes, clothes from a maternity store. I told Kelly that I would talk to Kat, which I did. Kat filled me in that there was some drama with her mom not liking her boyfriend, that Kelly is involved, etc, etc. I just told her to read the policy and be sure she complies, and no matter what, to trust me. I had her back. The next day, Kelly is in my office telling me that Kat is again not in compliance with the dress code. At this point, Kelly knows I'm getting frustrated. Okay, I'll talk to her again. This time, I want you present because I'm going to give her a formal warning and assign remedial training. I bring Kat into my office with Kelly present and formally read off my prepared statement making it clear that it will go into her permanent file. Kat, you were given a verbal warning yesterday to comply with this dress code. Because it is not clear to me what is or is not a violation of this policy, you are to report to the HR office 10 minutes early every morning for the next two weeks for dress code inspection. Report to me if HR finds your dress unfit. If you are found to be in violation of this policy and are unable to correct your dress before the start of the workday, your employment will be terminated. By the time I'm finished, Kat is tearing up and Kelly is staring at the floor, speechless. I dismiss Kat. I hope that this is the last I hear about this because if I do, I'll fire her as Kelly, speechless, walks out of my office. I told Kat not to worry about any of this. We have them where we want them. So, for a week, Kat reported to me that her clothes were fine per HR inspection. At the beginning of the second week, she was chuckling. Kelly told me that I looked very nice today. Attitudes began to change, and everyone was smiling. I got called to the red carpet by Jim, the CEO. He tried to keep a straight face as he recited what he heard was going on, and asked me to cut the remedial training short because it was embarrassing the HR staff. Straight-faced, I said, well, Jim, if I stop the remedial training, I'll have to fire Kat. Company policy clearly states that failure to complete a formal remediation plan is immediate termination. It is very clear. There is zero tolerance. You can't fire a pregnant woman for what she wears. I'm asking, no, I'm telling you to stop. Stop following company policy? Laughing, he concedes. Okay, I am rescinding that ridiculous dress code policy effective immediately. 
So let me get this straight. Kelly was going around sharing an employee's personal information with another person in the workplace. Liability, holy crap. Okay, and I know there's stores that specifically sell quote unquote maternity clothes, but isn't maternity clothes just clothes that somebody who is pregnant wears regardless of where they get them from? OP, you're honestly a really good person. Somebody who's willing to stand up to the boss above you and be a very good boss yourself at the same time. Kat is honestly very lucky to have you as a supervisor. Our next story today comes to us from Embilalik. If you don't agree with me, leave right now. Let's jump right in. Here I am again, folks, with another professional malicious compliance. In June of 2021, I joined a tech startup, Last Mile Grocery and Food Delivery app, as a financial controller. I was told my task is to bring the gross profits into black within a year and before next round of investment and fundraising. The senior team comprised of me, group CFO, COO, and head of grocery. The CEO was stationed outside in another country. The CEO comes to the country within a month of my joining, but does not bother to meet me. I say, okay, no problem. Keep your head down and do what you are tasked with. Within two months, I have the grips on operations and financials, and I have laid down my plan with the group CFO, and he agrees to it. I make some changes in my team, and I get to working on fixing things. During October, one of our competitors raises $85 million in investment, and our CEO is irked. He comes again and starts an impromptu investment round. The conditions are better than before, so we get an offer of $50 million because our overall plan was a lot smaller and realistic than our competitor. The CEO rejects the offer. He needs an offer of at least $100 million to beat the competitor. Luckily, we got offered $200 million, but the CEO refuses, citing this is greater than what I need, and goes back without accepting anything. Come February, Group CFO suddenly quits, but I knew he quit since our funds were depleting rapidly and the economic conditions in the country and globally were getting worse. I have an emergency meeting with the COO and grocery head and tell them that we need to rationalize our expenses further, and this is the plan, according to which we will be profitable by June 2022. They agree to it and I get to work with my team. The CEO again does not talk to me, and the CFO post remains vacant despite me being next in line and eligible for it. Come March 2022, my plan is on track, and we are expecting profitability a month earlier in May 2022. I plan to take a week-long vacation and travel abroad with my spouse. In the third day of vacations, I get a text from COO that I need to come back as something has happened. I tell him I'll come back as planned and not to worry. I come back and find out that the supply chain team made an error and bought inventory $30 million more than planned for the festive season coming up in May. In my absence, the grocery head gave the go-ahead without consulting me, and the error was only identified once the vendor started fulfilling the order. This has shook our overall plan, and our cash funds are at bottom. Mr. CEO comes to know about this. I was the one to inform him, and he immediately comes down and started literally abusing me and other members of the team verbally. This is his first ever face-to-face -face meeting with me. I was quite taken aback by his rudeness and hurt as he put all blame on me, saying I am the CFO, when I was never appointed as such, so no payments or purchases were approved by me. They were being approved by COO and the head of grocery. This verbal abuse goes on for about a week during which I had broken down twice in front of my wife as I had never faced such horse crap before in my career and I had worked really hard to bring the company where it was at that point. The CEO warns us that whoever is found guilty of negligence will be fired on the spot. This is where the malicious compliance begins. I prepare detailed documents pointing out my plan and who approved the extra purchase and how I was consulted only after the error has occurred. I even prepared a plan to sell off the excess inventory and bring the money back in the fold. I try to reach him to explain, but he brushes me off every time saying, you cannot be right. After seven days, the CEO calls us in office on a weekend. I arrive and head of grocery is there. They're arguing and it is getting heated up. 
it gets so heated up that the head of grocery shouts back and leaves, citing that he quits. As soon as he leaves, the CEO pounded his fist on the table and shouted, If you don't agree with me, leave right now. Only I know how to run this company, and if you think I cannot work without you, think again. The moment I heard these words spewing out of his mouth, I switched to autopilot. I type in my resignation, email him right there, get up and say to him, please check your email, my notice starts now. I leave the building before he could respond. Immediately, I call up one of my ex-bosses and mentors and tell him I need to meet him. We meet. Within a week, we plan to start our own consultancy firm and six months from then, our firm has started to grow. We're working on our startup, setting up another business and managing top tier clients. Then I get a message from that CEO through the COO after a few months of my leaving. Hey, we need your help managing the books and finances. Our position is really bad. I simply say the CEO won't agree with what I have to do to fix the company and I don't work with clients who don't agree with me. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Yerson Black. It says, I just wonder how the CEO got to that position with his attitude and mindset. Is or was he some sort of trust fund millionaire? OP held on longer than I would have. I think I would have noped out when the CEO insisted on a certain dollar value of investment. That wasn't business, that was pecker measuring. OP responded to this one and said, you guessed it, he's a big shot hedge fund manager in New York with millions to his name. The sad thing here is that OP put in a lot of time to try and bring the company back from the brink. You know, time, money, effort, sanity, all of that was wasted. At least in OP's new company and being a consultant, they can make all the decisions themselves, do things the way they want to do it, and run their company the way it should be run. Our next story today comes to us from HQX Senberg. Only authorized personnel? Let's jump right in. Background. I work for a kind of ISP doing in-house testing of systems to design new solutions for customers. This sometimes requires an active internet connection, which had to be activated by our airtime department as it could be quite expensive in theory. Only the accounting part is done by the airtime department. The actual activations is something we can do ourselves, but not allowed to do so without airtime consent. Previously, I had merely asked our local airtime team to activate a system for the duration of the test, then deactivate again once the test was completed. And this is where our story begins. A change from upper management meant that our local airtime department got cancelled, and all its functions were moved back to HQ in another country. This worked out okay for a short time, until someone in management brought in a new boss for the company's airtime department. Meet Power Boss, a new boss with little insight in how operations work, but with extreme desire to make sure every little rule is followed to the letter does not matter if it makes sense or not. I quickly started to get a massive dislike towards this boss. We have all sorts of little conflicts. Example 1. I file a request to have a system activated within the current week as we have a major, one of the biggest companies in the world, customer, coming by to see the systems late in the following week. It takes time for the database to fill up once the system is activated so it's important this is done in good time to allow for this. I hear nothing during the week, but assume all is okay. Until Monday morning, where I found out the system is not activated. For data to fill up, only airtime can do this portion of the activation. I call the airtime department and ask what is going on, why it has not been activated. Powerboss decided to take the activation out of the standard queue to show it to the team for an internal training how to do activations. I am of course furious at this point. Why they have not called me or informed me about this is a major problem. I insist they do this now. Powerboss informs me that it is his decision and he is okay with this. At this time, I kind of lose it and inform him politely but firmly that he has one job, and that is to ensure that systems get activated, and he best do that job. If not, I will have to take it to his superiors in order for the system to be activated ASAP, so it can be ready for presentation with the potential customer. 
system gets activated during that day. But the following day, I learned from one of the upper management bosses that Power Boss had reached out to HR and threatened to file a personal harassment case against me. HR denied this though, as they saw no reason for it. I'm like, WTF? A harassment case over asking someone to do their job? Cue example two and the malicious compliance. I need an urgent activation of a system. And for this, we, with the new system, have to file activation reports with all details. Quite tedious for something purely internal and temporary. Nonetheless, I do this and send it over. It gets rejected by PowerBoss because it has not been signed by one of the VPs who are the only ones authorized to activate a system for a customer with a write-off in the thousands of US dollars. Though it is kind of a theoretical thing as the internal cost is virtually nothing. I try to argue that it is quite a lot of work to chase down a VP for a signature when it is a very limited time and purely internal. PowerBoss denies this and says very firmly, only people on the list in the bottom of the activation form are allowed to approve this. Your name is not on this list, so you cannot approve. Talk to a VP. <sighs> it takes time, but I chase down a VP in another country and get him to sign the document and get the system activated. A couple of weeks later, PowerBoss is in our new call center in Asia, out to do a demonstration on how the systems work and what it looks like in real time. Turns out that PowerBoss needs a system activated and calls in and requests this. By some stroke of absolute luck, I pick up the phone. Hello, I need System XX activated. Do you have a signed activation form? I don't need one. I am telling you to activate the system. According to yourself, all activations must have an activation form. Fine, I'm sending it in now. I do not see any signature on this form. It needs to be approved by a VP but I am head of airtime. This is me writing these forms. I decide who can approve and who cannot. Your name is not listed on the form as one of the people who are allowed to approve. Clearly that's a mistake on the form, just activate. Only authorized personnel can do this. Your name is not on the list. Fine, then hangs up. My gosh, it felt good. PowerBoss obviously complained to one of the VPs about this, but they merely shrugged and said that he himself had made the rules and the documents, that I was merely following the rules that he himself had set. Hilarious. OP added an edit onto the bottom of the story. It says, edit, it has been five to six years since that incident. I have been promoted. So the amount of interactions I have with PowerBoss is extremely limited. When he does write to me requesting whatever, I simply ignore all his emails. I have made it a thing to never respond to any email he sends out. Or if I do respond, I remove him from the trail. This seems to have worked quite well as I have zero conflicts with him. Jumping to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Kaylane. It says, I approve of the edit to include more information that was given in a comment reply to someone. And it's also a delicious piece of malicious compliance. I can understand that rules are rules and I'm mostly very stringent with regards to them myself. But I also know that sometimes it's a lot more efficient to be able to go outside the rules to get some temporary work done. OP responded to this comment and said, this is very true. Sometimes rules must be rules, but also stop and think sometimes, why are the rules in place? And does it always make sense? Does the rule help my workplace function better? Just not in my silo, but the company as a whole, I think many rules should be considered in a holistic view and not just from an individual department's point of view. Could improve work efficiency in many companies. In the same company when I was fresh and just hired, we attended a meeting with the CEO at the time who was explaining new procedures. I politely asked if the new procedures were a good thing as while it certainly did provide better workflow for tech department, it would create a massive workload for the accounting team. CEO response, why do you care? It's not your department. That totally miffed me. Yeah, I don't understand that one myself because if something gets backed up in one department, it causes a backup in another related department, which sooner or later is going to back up and cause some trouble for that CEO. Let's be honest here though, the majority of us listening to this don't have the, um, berries <laughs> to actually stand up to somebody higher up in a company. I think that's one of the reasons why we like these stories so much. 
because they go over the things that we would love to do, but would never actually do ourselves. Great work to all of the OPs. All right, our first story today comes to us from FewOil7196. Don't want to total my late model car? Okay, I warned you. Let's jump right in. Two years ago, I hit a warthog-sized raccoon on my way home from work. I was driving an 09 Suzuki SX4 hatchback. The raccoon did a good bit of body damage to the front bumper and wheel well. The estimate to repair it was $2,200. I giggled at the adjuster when he said the insurance company was approving the repair instead of totaling the car. He insisted it was worth just under $5,000 so it should be fixed. I told him that having owned the car for a decade, it's a pain in the butt to get some parts since Suzuki closed their US business. He insisted. Insurance provided a rental, it ran $800 a week. So four weeks go by, the car isn't repaired. The shop can't find a wheel well to finish the job. Adjuster calls a bit mad at me that I wasn't pressuring the body shop. I reminded him that I have insurance to make me whole and that's not my job. The repairs were a bit more expensive than anticipated. $2,500 repair plus COVID cleaning fee $200 equals $2,700 plus $3,200 for the rental. They had now spent more than the alleged value of the car. So no, the adjuster insists the car is drivable without the wheel well while he finds the part. I offered that was a stupid idea and it's there to protect the engine compartment. He insists, okay. I drive it. My work is 30 miles away. I drove it through a snowstorm. With no wheel well, the snow was thrown into the engine compartment. Immediately in front of the affected wheel is the battery, fuses, and computer. They were all absolutely caked in snow, salt, and ice. Now all the dash lights are going off randomly and the car is shutting itself off. I called the adjuster and told him that driving without the wheel well has likely ruined the computer, fuse box, and battery. I asked which shop has a contract with them to fix these issues. Big sigh on the other end, pregnant pause, well, I think we've spent enough on this car. We'll just total you out. It's probably only worth 2K, so that's what we'll pay you. <laughs> no, you said just under 5K? That's what I want. They wrote me a check for $4,700. All in, I figure they spent about $10,000 on a vehicle worth, at best, $5,000. I would have accepted $3,000 or less if they offered it originally. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Lord Adamosk. It says, I'm an insurance adjuster for a major company. What sort of rinky-dink operation was your company running that they tried to strong arm you into driving an unfinished car? I'm extremely aware of the supply chain issues, getting parts, even for new vehicles, but still. I think the part of this that gets me the most is that the insurance company was trying to get OP to keep on top of the repair shop, like, isn't that exactly your job insurance company? What are you doing over there anyway? And then, in the end, they tried to offer you a lot less than they originally said the vehicle was worth? OP, that company sounds like a gigantic scam. I think it's time to go with somebody else. Our next story today comes to us from Daft Boy Dim. <laughs> company saves cost by taking away company cars. Let's jump right in. About six years ago, I worked for a power supply company in the UK. I worked in a small project team that coordinated all the company's major infrastructure projects and the role required travel to meetings all over the country. We'd average around 800 miles a week in company miles over the year, depending on the time of year and location of projects, etc. Someone in the finance department had reviewed our expense claims and calculated that over one quarter, we'd not covered the required number of company miles to meet the company's policy on company cars for that one quarter without looking at any other data. We lost our company car entitlement and the company told us we had to return them to the fleet company at the end of their leases. Malicious compliance activated. As we were project engineers, we had a very particular set of skills for knowing how to follow rules to the letter and how to do so in a manner that benefited the company or project or individuals. Usually, if it benefited the company, it benefited all involved. This was not one of those occasions. We pay benefit tax on our company cars in the UK. The rules around this change as and when the government feels like it. My team had all carefully chosen our cars to be zero cost to ourselves 
by choosing cars that were below the allowance of 300 pounds a month, so the remaining allowance covered the tax obligation. We'd all be screwed by the benefit in kind tax changes that year, and we're now paying tax. So for starters, we reviewed the company car policy and found the company had no way of stopping us handing our cars back with immediate effect, whilst the company was still responsible for the leases. So we all made arrangements for personal cars and handed our keys over at the next team meeting. We'd also reviewed the company travel policy. We started using hire cars and trains for traveling. Trains and hire cars in the UK are not cheap, as none of us were willing to use our personal cars and claim the 50 pence per mile. Usually, we'd work a long day and book a bit of overtime or loo time to drive to and from meetings without staying over as we would prefer to be at home even if it meant getting home late. That stopped with immediate effect. We'd only work the mandated seven and a half hour day and then stop to book a hotel and take full advantage of the 25 pound food and drink allowance for dinner. Then work from home the following day as we'd been away from home the previous day as per the policy. After about eight weeks, we were called into a meeting with our line manager and department manager about our expenses. Our expenses for the first month after the cars had been returned were more than they were for the previous 12 months combined. Our line manager agreed that our expenses were in line with the policy, otherwise he wouldn't have signed off on them. The department manager told us we were getting company cars back and he expected the expenses to return to previous levels. We declined the offer of company cars and let management know we'd be adhering to the travel policy to the letter. There was another really short similar story in the comment section for this one from a user called LC Anderton. It says, As a service engineer, a company car was part of my employment contract. When the managing director decided that only company executives were allowed to have cars, I was told I'd have to give mine up. I said sure, but it's part of my salary package, so you're going to have to compensate me. They offered me something laughable like 300 pounds. I took it back to the managing director and said, this effectively constitutes a pay cut, which he couldn't do. I'd costed it out that with paying tax on the benefit, it was worth roughly $3,000 a year, plus it worked out I got about two months worth of free fuel. So I said, when you're ready to make a serious offer, we'll talk, and I'm looking for £5,000. They offered me £3,500, which I took, which of course they forgot took up my company pension contributions too. And the first time I had to go visit a client, you want me to use my car? Oh, no thank you. Not insured for business use, and I don't want to put that much wear and tear on it. So it meant a higher car every single time I had to go visit a site, which ultimately got charged to the clients who really weren't happy about it. There's some kind of saying that goes along with this. I can't remember it exactly, but it's something like stepping over dollars to collect all the cents. I mean, these are really just examples of companies that don't do a risk analysis before making a huge policy change. My guess is the people making these changes weren't there in the first place when the company cars were put into place, because if they were, they would have seen why they were given company cars in the first place, likely to save some money on travel expenses, and then they wouldn't have made a change, because they would have known that it would have been dumb. Our next story today comes to us from Impressive Pepper 785 Want revenge by paying in pennies? Here, let me count those for you. Let's jump right in. Ages ago, I worked a frontline job at City Hall, registering cars and dogs and collecting money for parking tickets, property taxes, and the like. So a basic entry-level municipal finance grunt, bottom of the food chain, nowhere close to being the one making the ordinances or rules, etc. Grunt. This was before the days of taking credit cards and debit cards for such payment, before smartphones, before the online banking world really began, ages ago. Paper, paper, paper. The city's ordinance on tax interest stated that the interest would accrue daily against any past due tax bill at a rate of blah blah percent per annum. Property taxes were due quarterly. Many people would come in to pay cash on the tax due date. Many, many more would remit their payments by checks through the mail. We kept extremely thorough paper records of all payments received through the mail, retaining their remittance stub, the envelope bearing the postmark, which was the date we would use to calculate any interest if it arrived past the due date. If the postmark was before or on the due date, no interest was charged. These were batched daily by each clerk, filed by date in our vault so anyone who needed to could find any receipt or remittance fairly quickly. 
We needed to often, as did the city auditor. Anyway, business as usual, and the few days following the tax due, we would always get a few stragglers through the mail, and the daily interest would have started adding up. Not by a lot, for most homeowners, this would amount to just a few cents a day. We would send them a receipt in the mail with a note that they have a small balance now due to accrued interest, but we would hold it at the amount for 10 days. Most people would just send another check, some would ignore it, and others would come in to pay in person. Finally, the stars aligned and I got one, a real peach of a gentleman who was extremely disgruntled that he got a bill in the mail for this gosh darn interest BS, which he slapped down on the counter inches from my face. He then slammed a repurposed melatonin bottle full of pennies down on the top of the paper and said, I hope whoever sent me this gosh darn bill has to count these gosh darn pennies at top volume for all of City Hall to hear. I could tell already that it was mine. I saw my initials on the receipt when he slapped it down. Q malicious compliance. I smiled as big as I could, said I would find out who had processed it and took his receipt to the vault. I didn't even give him enough time to react. I just got up and went to the vault while cheerfully saying it'll just be a minute before disappearing from his sight. I found the paperwork, including his two days late postmarked envelope. Then I sat down at my desk, took the melatonin bottle, looked him in the eye and said, you're in luck today, sir. I'm the one who sent this balance due to you, so I will be able to count these pennies for you. And I did. I counted all 39 of those gosh darn pennies, and I counted them one by one very, very thoroughly. It took him about 20 minutes to pay his 39 cent bill from the minute that bottle hit the counter to the end of it. I was extremely pleasant and cordial and smiling at him the entire time. It was just fun at that point, so I kept pouring it on, just so sweet. His face was practically purple by the end, and as he slunk out the door, without the smug satisfaction he was expecting when he slammed that melatonin bottle on my counter, I said, have a great rest of your day, weather's beautiful, and it was. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, there's one from a user called Dorkat. <laughs> Love that name. It says, I hope that after counting all the pennies, you counted them again just to be sure, as a good and diligent public servant should, of course. I honestly think there's many ways that OP could have messed around with this person at their counter. When they went into the back, they should have gotten one of their coworkers and said, okay, I'm going to count out these pennies in front of this customer, but when I get about three quarters of the way through, I want you to come out and interrupt me so that I lose my place and have to start counting them again. And then once I'm done, I'm going to tell the guy that I have to have somebody verify it because it's a cash payment and then have you come back out and count out the pennies one by one too. Uh, that's just a couple of the things they could have done, but it would have been so nice to see this one dragged out just a little bit more. Our next story today comes to us from Princesco. Want me to spell your name correctly? Fair game. Let's jump right in. This story took place quite a while ago, but something reminded me of it and I thought I'd share. I was working remotely in a company with coworkers from all over the world, and the culture there was actually quite nice. I really enjoyed everyone I got in contact with, and in all my time there, I'd never experienced any bad blood between anyone. To put simply, everyone was very understanding of each other and open-minded. Enter a guy who I'll call Jose for simplicity. You see, Jose had a special character in his name, something that I'd noticed but never really addressed because why would I? When emailing him, tagging him in different places, etc., his name obviously didn't carry that special character, but he still used it on our messaging platform. One day, I needed to send him a private message, and I started off with a simple, Hey Jose! He did mention that he'd like me to spell his name correctly, and I honestly thought it was all in good fun, but I explained that I'd never used that character before in writing, my keyboard wasn't set up for it, etc. I thought that was the end of that, but apparently no. I wasn't immediately pulled aside by a higher up, but during a one-to-one -one meeting later on, I was told I should be mindful of people's names. I could tell that the person delivering this news wasn't thrilled about it, but the issue had been escalated nonetheless, so they had to remind me. I thought nothing of it since I had very little to do with Jose anyway. But lo and behold, a couple of months later, I had to message him again, this time in a group setting. After a little back and forth, I thanked everyone individually for their input, 
and because I'd forgotten about the name incident before, I simply said, thank you, Jose. You can imagine that during my next one-to-one, -one, this issue was brought up again. This time, I was a little miffed, but I said, you know what, you're right, I'm clearly in the wrong here. Q malicious compliance. You see, my name also has a special character, but it's not a frequently seen one since I'm from an Eastern European country. Safe to say that nobody else in the company even knew of his existence. I'd also assured people that they can call me by my English name, which is much easier to pronounce. Well, not anymore. During that same one-on-one, -on -one, I told my higher-up that I now expect everyone to call me by my correct name, special character, and all. Would you be surprised if I told you that Jose was one of the first to complain that my special character isn't easily accessible on his keyboards? He actually had the audacity to contact me privately to complain that his name was a special case, since it's more widely used, and the special character is well known, whereas mine isn't and I shouldn't feel special about it. To make matters worse, the next times I had to write down his name, and I made sure I did it often, I didn't actually type it down, and instead copied and pasted it from Google, and it would always, without fail, paste the Wikipedia article about his name too. So my messages look clunky as all heck. Nobody judged me for it, and Jose avoided me like the plague whenever he could. Trouble was, he needed me more than I needed him. So he was forced to suffer by writing out my name properly far, far more often than I guess he expected. OP added a couple of edits at the bottom. One says, edit cause someone mentioned my name might actually be relevant to the story. It's Stefania. Edit number two, I'd also like to point out that me and Jose were not the only people with special characters in our names. During calls, we all took great care of pronouncing everyone's names as they wanted us to. But in writing, everyone was lax. OP added one final update, it says, hopefully final edit. I appreciate everyone giving me tips on how to write all these special characters. A lot of people have brought up tips on how to write several special characters. Some work, some don't on my keyboard, or I end up with completely different results. So I'll do a bit more digging. I've also since saved his name in my directory, so it always auto corrects to the correct spelling. Thanks for those tips as well. That's absolutely one thing I was thinking of right when they said they had a coworker with a special character in their name, that you can set up your autocorrect on your phone to automatically correct that name and put in that special character. That's a really easy fix. In fact, you can actually do that on the computer as well. It's a little more difficult, but the option is still there. This is actually something that intrigued me recently because I've been trying to sell a bunch of baseball cards online, and I'll link my eBay down below if anybody wants to check that out. <laughs> please buy them. Um, but the baseball players, a lot of them have special characters in their names, and you see these on their baseball cards themselves, even with some of the hockey players as well. But when you bring up any of the price guides or the sales on eBay, all of those special characters are gone because most people don't know how to search for them by those special characters. So this being said, if entire sports leagues of people with interesting special characters in their names don't care about those special characters being in their names on the price guides or card lists, well, that leads me to believe that OP's coworker is just trying to be a pain in the butt about that special character in their name, especially if they know it's really not that easy to do that on a regular standard keyboard. All right, our first story today comes to us from egrant03. Can't remove the charge? Well, I'll just use it then. Let's jump right in. In the early 2000s, when I first moved out on my own, I rented from a complex that charged you for assigned parking. It was an upcharge of $25 a month. If you didn't get assigned parking, you would have to fight for a space on the street. My apartment was in the back of the complex, and I was getting over a recent knee and ankle injury, so I opted for paid parking that was relatively close to my front door. My car was a junker, three years older than I am, but it ran semi-okay and the heater worked. As a newly minted adult, I was happy to have it. About three months into my lease, my car went to the great scrap heap in the sky. I had gotten used to the local transit system and discovered a nearby store would drop off groceries for me. This was long before Walmart and other stores started doing it, so it was cheaper than figuring a month's supplies on the bus. So I opted not to replace the car and utilize the bus pass my work reimbursed me for. I went to my leasing office and told them I no longer needed the space, and would you please remove the extra charge from my bill? The manager at the desk was new and had never been asked that before. She promised to look into it and let me know. 
I was naive and figured it would be gone come next month. Nope, it was still there. I paid all but the parking space and called up the complex. Same girl. She said she was awaiting word from higher-ups and offered me a credit for the charge as a one-time courtesy. I reminded her that I no longer owned a car. I hadn't just changed my mind. I told her that the space had been empty for close to a month now and that I won't be utilizing it. She said she understood loud and clear and would get it sorted by next month. Three days before rent was due, she finally got back to me. Apparently, it was in my lease and couldn't be removed without breaking the lease and signing a new one. Even if I didn't move out, the lease breaking and initiation fees would be charged to me, and my rent would go up to the new current market value. This would be over $1,000, so not an option for someone freshly on their own. I kept the parking space on the lease. Three weeks later, I was reviewing my lease to get the phone number for maintenance and noticed the clause for the parking space. Essentially, I could park a motorcycle, scooter such as a Vespa, a car, a truck, an SUV, or a trailer in the space. Gears were turning. For me to be in compliance, I had to have wheels on anything parked in my space. So I went to my local version of Craigslist and found a wheeled container similar to a shipping container. It wasn't cheap, but it was worth every cent. The complex offered storage sheds at an upcharge too. Being fresh out of high school, I didn't have much to store. My neighbor, though, did. I threw a lock on the unit and offered it to my neighbor for half the cost of a shed, $35 a month. He was able to move his stuff out of his storage unit where he was paying over $100 a month, and the container was available 24-7, 365. He was happy for the arrangement and paid several months in advance. The complex put several tow stickers for out of compliance on the trailer, but I called the tow company and faxed them a copy of the lease where it says trailers are allowed. The container was registered with the county as a utility trailer, so there's nothing they could do. They tried to fine me for improper parking, but again, I had proof I was within my rights. They even offered to remove the charge for parking on my lease if I would relocate the container. With what my neighbor was paying, I could cover my water bill every month, so I declined. I stayed 18 months and sold the trailer to my neighbor when I moved out. He had to rent a car to relocate it to his assigned space, but he said it was worth the couple hundred he paid. He ended up saving over $1,000 a year renting from me. Other neighbors even started bringing in their own containers too, even if it meant getting a second space. Sheds were being vacated at such a large volume, the complex tried to give them away at six months free. Few took them up on it. The complex amended the new leases to exclude trailers, but could do nothing about those that already had them in the spot. Instead of moving out and giving notice, renters would reassign their lease to new people so they could be grandfathered into the trailer clause. I drove by the facility two years or so after I moved out, going to a friend's for Thanksgiving. The complex had been sold to a new owner and changed their name. But wouldn't you know, there were still about a dozen wheeled shipping containers parked in the lot. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Aviitis. It says, That, my friend, is a job well done. Not only have you given them the triple middle finger, you've also helped out a ton of people over several rental generations. You may and should be happy for the way you dealt with this and for all the people that have benefited rightly from your actions. One really fun thing to think about with this one is that if the complex had had it towed, they would have been completely on the hook for the tow, the storage fees, and getting it back to you, all because it was in the lease. I absolutely love that when they figured out what you were doing, they'd said that they could finally remove that charge from your lease, like they couldn't do it in the first place, but now that you're inconveniencing them, they can? How does that work? Our next story today comes to us from Toffee Caked. Tell the driver he's terrible? Yes, of course. Let's jump right in. Reminded of this by another post here of family members working at the same place. Many years ago, other half and I worked at the same company, but in completely different departments. Other half worked in sales as a salesman and driver, taking out products on his own local route. There was 13 other local routes in that department, fresh product delivered daily. The customer base on my other half's department is small businesses, corner shops, sandwich shops, takeouts, eateries, that kind of thing. These small customers would have orders ranging from $10 to $50 at a time. 
I worked in the offices, predominantly working with the distant national and international customers, very large businesses in the food industry that most people have certainly heard of for frozen product delivery. Their orders were in the range of $80,000 to $100,000 per month, ordering pallets over pallets of product. I managed their orders and the accounts, doing the aged debt collecting on those. One thing I learned at this place that has stayed true at every other job I've had, the small fry customers are the ones that complain the most and the loudest. Due to the nature of the job, I had to take phone calls, a mixture of the large customers haggling to pay their debts later, sprinkled with the local corner shops calling to complain. Took a call one morning from Karen, of course, complaining that her delivery was short, the driver is horrible, and a piece of work and should be fired. She's always having the same problem with this driver, he's never on time, he's surly, he's rude, and that I should tell the driver to buck his ideas up or they are never ordering product from us again. She made some choice words about the driver, screaming, swearing, the whole nine yards. I asked the business name and the business location. The location by the area tells me which route they are on before I even look up their account. Once I have the business name, I already recognize them as a problem customer. They have actually been moved from one neighboring route to another to another due to issues. Read, many sales drivers refusing to have anything more to do with them. Karen continues to rant while I do due diligence to look up their account. So what are you going to do about it? I want the driver reprimanded immediately. My order was short of this product and that product. He was late. He wouldn't comp or refund the missing products. He's a C and an F, blah, 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 blah. Well, I'm super sorry about that. Let me fix this for you. I see your order on my screen here, and I also see your handwritten faxed order that was scanned in. Those products aren't on your order, I'm afraid. The driver can't credit items that were not ordered. Yes, I did. I want compensation and the driver fired. I see. Let me dig into this a little further. Right. I see there has been a lot of credits in your account already. Also, lining up your orders that didn't include those credited products in the past? That's rather odd. Important to note, it was normal for the local drivers to sometimes put in credits to keep the smaller customers quiet and on board. Sometimes production issues happen, ordered products are short or not available that day. The business had a whole philosophy that the customer was always right and to keep them happy. I was in the business for debt collecting, completely opposite to that, and had the power to place customers on hold, they got nothing, until they paid up. I noticed that this customer hasn't paid their bill for over six weeks. They now fall under my remit. Your driver's lying. I know what I've ordered. Your drivers are always doing this, and he was a rude F. I want the driver reprimanded and fired, or I'm never ordering again. Given that they had been a problem account for quite some time, I decide to comply. You know, I'll follow this up for you. I can't speak to the driver right now as they're out delivering, but I will reprimand the driver tonight over dinner at home. Karen was silent at first. Wait, what? My other half is six foot two, built like a brick house. He isn't a doormat, but he's also the most chill and least rude person I have ever known. We take this very seriously and don't wish to lose your business. We're very sorry to hear you're unsatisfied, and I do see you've had similar problems in the past. Unfortunately, I don't have the authority to fire my other half, but here's what I can do. As your account is now in aged debt, I will place your deliveries on hold, and I promise you won't see that driver until the account is fully audited and paid in full. He's your husband? I don't think we need to go that far. He is, but that isn't relevant. I insist we look into your complaint and take it seriously. I'll order a personal audit of your account as all these credits for product not included in your past orders is concerning. I'll get this all straightened out for you. If you decide to take your business elsewhere after the audit is complete and the account settled, we'll be sorry to see you go, but completely understand your stance if we can't find a resolution. Karen splutters, mumbles that it's all okay, she was having a bad day and it's not all that bad. I know, don't worry, let me audit this and get you a final correct total, and the driver won't bother you again until the account is square and you're happy with the service. Aftermath, customer's aged bill came in at $150 more for items that were credited to keep them happy and quiet, when she insisted to complain that they were not getting product they did not order in the first place, and tried to make out my other half was terrible at his job. 
they didn't get any orders till the account was paid in full, and customer never made a peep again. Husband continued to deliver to them after the audit and settling the bill, and always walked in there with a big smile. Moral of the story, be, be careful who you lie and complain to, because that's going to bite you in the butt one day. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, there's one from a user called Quahog News. It says, I can't remember who said it, but I love the quote, the squeaky wheel doesn't always get the grease, sometimes it gets replaced. I think it applies here pretty well, laugh out loud. This has to be every delivery driver's dream come true. I do hope the story spread company-wide and became a legend. OP responded to this one and said, Those drivers in that department that had dealt with the customer previously took great pleasure in the fact I handed the customer's butt to them. Husband and I remember this moment fondly when we reminisce about the time we worked at the same place. And husband does get a proud, crap-eating grin that wifey stuck up for him. You know, at the end of this story, I kind of got disappointed because, well, they're still delivering to this customer in the end. I felt like they should have been cut off. But I want to know, was that just me? Should the customer have been cut off altogether in this case? Because they were obviously trying to fraud the company? Or should they just be given another chance like OP said and continue deliveries in the future? Comment what you think down below. Our next story today comes to us from Particular Tax 3579. Corporate said so. Let's jump right in. Someone posted a pizza story and it's sending me back, so here's a good one from me to you. I used to sling pizza, and I had this one couple who would regularly come in and order a specialty pizza. Think meat lovers, but with three times the amount of toppings. Like extra, extra everything. Plus, they would add extra, extra of other toppings that weren't originally on that pizza, like olives and onions. So, of course, this meant it never cooked thoroughly, even after sending it through the oven twice. Every single time they would complain about the pizza being too burnt on the edges and not cooked enough, and it took too long and they also wanted more of the toppings. I tried repeatedly to explain to them that every extra topping you add makes the portion size of all the toppings go down. I don't even understand why we were allowed to add so many toppings on at the register. Anyways, about the fifth or sixth time I replaced the pizza for them, because they kept complaining to corporate and received credit, the man came in again and said they spoke to corporate, and corporate wants me to make the pizza the way they want it. I knew that wasn't true. There really wasn't a corporate customers could call, just a call center, and those people did not care. But I decided I'd do exactly what they asked but made sure to explain to them that if I made it their way and it didn't turn out well, they wouldn't be getting any more remakes. I took the order and made it as they were expecting, kind of. I put full portions of each topping on that monster. To say that pizza was an effing mountain is an understatement. It didn't even fit in the oven. I had to take toppings off. <laughs> I did feel a little bad at this point knowing full well they paid, with the store credit, over $40 for this one pizza and there was no way it would ever properly cook. So I did give it two runs through the oven, but that still didn't help. It was pan to pan toppings, so getting out of the pan sucked and I just put and cut it right in the box so the toppings wouldn't fall everywhere. After I cut it, the slices disappeared under the toppings and you couldn't even see crust, so it just looked like a giant pile of trash toppings dumped in a box. I couldn't even close it. I brought it to the customer, and he started to lose it on me saying it took too long, and it looked like a mess and he wanted another credit. I pulled out his receipt and asked which part wasn't up to par. He said it didn't look cooked, and I reminded him how I warned him of that with this amount of toppings and I would have cooked it longer if he hadn't been complaining about time. I also showed him the at-home cooking time and temps on the box. I showed him the crust underneath and went through all the toppings and extras. Everything was accounted for as he asked for it, so I told him I'd let management and corporate know that it was made to his liking. Never saw them again. Down in the comment section for this one, there's one from a user called Bratling. It says, Dude, don't feel bad. These people were exploiting the system to get free pizzas from your store. Five times. That's not just being slow to learn. They kept at it until you called their bluff. And then, they went to screw with other stores instead of yours. Great story. I'm glad this turned out okay for OP and that the customer never come back, 
but I think another way they could have dealt with this would have been to refuse to put that one together altogether and say, I'm sorry, I've told you how that's going to turn out. I probably can't even safely get that into a box without getting it all over the place, and it's just not going to be fully cooked. We can't do that. What else can I get for you? Unfortunately, with this type of person, I think that probably would have just escalated the situation even further. So I guess OP did the right thing anyway. All right, our first story today comes to us from FML, it's SML. <laughs> Angry director gets her comeuppance in four gradual actions. Let's jump right in. Several years ago, I used to work at an agency that hired us out as short-term temporary workers and contractors. These jobs pretty much consisted of stuff that company employees couldn't be bothered to do, and so got someone in to sort it out. It wasn't great, but I had to make ends meet. Anyway, one of these jobs was for 150 hours at five weeks of office administration. There wasn't much more information to go on, but a job's a job. The office turned out to be quite a small, stuffy little building at the back of an industrial estate. I was told to report to Beryl. When I turned up, I was met by a rather grumpy looking old lady having a cigarette by the front door. This was Beryl. Beryl didn't even say hello or ask me my name, but showed me in, pointed at an enormous pile of boxes full of paperwork saying, This all needs to be scanned in. There are two scanners connected to a computer there. Off you go. Let someone know if you need help. So off I went. That pile of boxes was to be my job for the next month and a bit. Joy. The office was predominantly young men, with Beryl being the only other woman. She was in her late 50s and spent more time smoking than working, and without being rude, clearly didn't look after herself. It was quite flattering to have a bunch of these guys pop by my workstation for a chat occasionally. After a few days of scanning, Beryl visited my cubicle. She wasn't happy that I spent too much time talking and not enough time working. I was confused. While I didn't have any metrics or targets, I was pretty consistently working through this mountain of paperwork. I got the impression that Beryl didn't like the attention I was getting. I pointed out to her that I haven't left my desk, apart from to go to the toilet. If someone's over here to talk to me, then that's fine, as I can talk and scan at the same time, like I'm doing right now. She wasn't happy and turned away, calling out, just do your job, as she left. Some of the other guys had heard this and they popped by my desk later and said not to worry. They'd had agency staff before, and Beryl always hated it if a young woman arrived because she was grumpy and jealous, not my words. In fact, a few years ago, one young woman had left the office in tears because Beryl had tore her a new one for going to lunch with some of the other guys. Naturally, this annoyed me, particularly because Beryl thought she could bully and disrespect agency staff. And I certainly wasn't going to leave the job because of an angry bee. Malicious compliance number one. For the rest of my time there, I made sure to get dressed up. Makeup, curls, a midi office dress, stiletto heels. When Beryl saw me clicking my way down the office the next day, fully dressed up just to scan some paperwork, she scowled at me but didn't say anything. The next week, Beryl took some time out of her busy smoking schedule to visit me in my cubicle. The second time she'd done so since I started. Some of the paperwork I was scanning in had been stapled together, so I'd asked someone in the office for a staple remover and a stapler. I used to pull out the staple, scan the document, rename it on the computer, then restaple it and put back in the box. I was just pulling a staple out when Beryl walked by. Beryl's first words to me were, What are you doing? I replied that this document was stapled, and if I put it in the machine, it'd jam. She raised her voice slightly and said, Nobody told you to do that. Just scan each page in separately. Leave the papers alone. I could almost hear her eye roll as she walked away. Malicious compliance number two. So I did. Scanned everything with staples just folded over and then created folders called document 123 and each scan went in as 123page1.pdf, 123page2.pdf. You get the idea. This slowed me down a lot, but hey, it's what I was asked to do. At some point, Beryl walked by and saw me flipping pages like that. I'd put my hair in a bun and taken my heels off, and she smirked. She thought she'd flustered me, and that I didn't see her reaction. Don't worry, Beryl, you didn't, and I did. 
The paperwork I was scanning in was boxed up as newest first. So as I got to some of the older papers, these had been moved around a couple of times and were slightly scrunched up or folded or similar. A jam scanner wasn't an issue, it had happened a handful of times before, but as I got to the older papers, the jams became more frequent. It was easy to sort through, just open the back door of the scanner, roll out the paper, cancel the job and redo it. At this point, I'd gone back to unstapling and restapling because Beryl had given me some space thinking she'd broken me, and I just wanted to get the job done so I could leave. Beryl walked in one day. This would have been my fourth week there. She saw me unjamming the scanner and flipped her top. She yelled, SML, what are you doing? At this point, all heads in the office turned to where we were. I calmly told her, the scanner's jammed, I'm just pulling the paper out so I can rescan it. Shouldn't take more than a few minutes. She continued yelling, at no point were you instructed to perform IT repairs. We have someone for that. Stop what you're doing and get someone to help you. I asked you this when you started, why can't you follow simple instructions? It took a lot of patience not to argue back with her, which I thought was what she wanted. But I said, okay, fine, can I speak to the IT guy to sort this out? I couldn't have choreographed her response better. I then knew that she did want me to argue so she could kick me out because she hesitated and said, um, well, the IT guy is off for the rest of the week. This was a Thursday. Um, use the other scanner. If you jam it, let me know and stormed off. Malicious compliance number three. I knew her diary and knew she was off the next day, Friday. I carried on with the one scanner, making sure it didn't jam that day, and waited until the next morning. Coincidentally, the scanner jammed on the first piece of paper I fed into it. Who'd have thought? Obviously, I rang Beryl. She didn't answer her phone, and as she wasn't in the office, I spent the day sat around without much to do. Whilst talking to the guys in the office, I learned that the company had been bought by a much larger IT firm, and they just wanted the rights to the proprietary software that they had developed. It also turned out that the CEO of the small company basically paid himself into retirement and appointed Beryl as the director. Beryl knew that her days were numbered, so she was even more bitter to the staff. The guys working there had been committed various levels of careers within the new IT firm, which they were happy with. As I was told, 120,000 employees, 30 dev roles are easy to find, one director role is not. Anyway, when we returned on Monday, you could almost see the vein in her neck throbbing. She wasted an entire day of whatever her company paid my agency because little old me wasn't trusted to fix a paper jam. I used to get in a little later than the rest of the staff. Agency perks, woo! But when I got in, she'd had the IT champion perform the skilled job of opening a scanner and pulling a piece of paper out. She didn't even look at me when she said, scanners are fixed, get on with your job and don't mess around. At this point, you may be thinking, SML, this is a lot of text for some pretty trivial malicious compliance. Well, you'll like the final part. My last week there coincided with a new contract that the company had been given by their new owners. I assume it was some sort of litmus test. Whilst I don't pretend to understand what it was, the job involved a lot of scanning documents that had been handwritten. Hooray, more boxes. At the same time, a few of the guys who worked there were going on a visit to the new parent company, which were based in the USA, I live in the UK. The IT champion was one of these guys who went. When the boxes were delivered to my cubicle, Beryl popped in and said, these take priority, all of what I said to you is more important than ever. Do not mess around, otherwise you're out the door. Am I clear? Yes, ma'am. The paperwork delivered was from the USA. Our paper sizes are different. The first piece of paper I fed into the scanner jammed it. A safety lock because it expected A4 and got US letter instead. I jammed both scanners. Beryl, not being one to turn down a free trip to America, had gone with them. I rang her at 11 a.m. UK time, which was 5 a.m. their time. She picked up and was not impressed. I felt sorry for the folks adjacent to her hotel room when she screamed down the phone, you've done what? How? Why? I told her about the USA paperwork. Can you not fix it? Final malicious compliance. No, you've told me many times that I can't fix these machines. What's the business continuity plan? 
Side note, my brother told me that phrase and he still doesn't quite understand why I turned up to his house a bit later with a few pizzas and a box of beer. Beryl had no idea what to do. She was clearly flustered. Can you just do what you can? We need this done. What would you want me to do? Can you fix the scanners because this is really important? I'm sorry, you told me I can't do that. I need simple instructions to work with. Just fix it. I'd be happy to show an IT specialist where the scanners are if you can get them here to fix hang up tone. Well, that's that then. I spend the rest of the week chatting to my colleagues, updating my CV, and applying for jobs. Nobody turned up to fix the scanners. When my final week finished, I said bye to the guys I'd worked with, wished them luck, and left with none of the critical paperwork scanned in. When Beryl got back from her business trip, I learned that she'd spent one day at the parent company and left it to the other guys. When the crap hit the fan because nothing was being delivered, they wondered where she was. This was day two into the five-day business trip. She was at a spa, phone switched off. She flew out early on day five without seeing any of her colleagues or the parent company. I kept in touch with a few of the guys afterwards. After this, the dev guys were transferred contracts to the larger IT firm. They all got a very small salary increase, but were also able to work from home. This was pre-COVID, so it was a bit of a rarity back then. Beryl, meanwhile, didn't fare so well. She was initially offered redundancy, paid, including pension deals, but when someone complained that she'd not been present for the meetings, which I think was their IT champion, they found out she'd been sightseeing, shopping, tanning, and getting her hair done on company time. She ended up being fired. No bonus, no pension, nothing. I quit the agency not long afterwards, and after one or two moves, ended up in a job I'm very happy with. The agency were none the wiser about any of this, they just wanted their money, and aside from one initial checkup call, left me to it. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Harry Monk. It says, She'd have got her pension when she reached the right age though, surely. In the UK, they don't just get to fire you and steal your pension. It's part of her compensation. This was responded to by another user called Pixeltash. It says, Guessing she would have got early retirement and started getting her company pension early? This is what she lost because she didn't work to pension age and didn't get early retirement, she would have lost a big old chunk of her company pension. She would still get her state pension and whatever private company pension she had paid into when she turned 65. I think that commenter missed that this was in the UK, but that's okay because it's probably the same over there as well. From what I've heard about labor laws over in the UK and how that all works, it's a lot better than it is over here in Canada and the USA. Over here, they really have us over a barrel. <laughs> Our next story today comes to us from X Wall Street Guy. I cost Bank of America $8,000 legally. Let's jump right in. A bit of context, I've been in the mortgage and related businesses for over 30 years. I know it very well. I've never liked Bank of America, especially their servicing division. This story happened a few years ago. I just found out about this group. I refinanced my mortgage through a mortgage broker and, to my aggravation, they sold the servicing rights to Bank of America. The entity that owns your loan is usually different than the one that you pay to service the loan. I was miffed. I estimated that a Bank of America paid $5,000 to service my loan, as most folks at the time expect loans to stay on the books at least three years. Another little fact, mortgage services are paid 0.25% fixed, 0.375% adjustable of your outstanding loan balance per year. It comes out of the interest you pay to the bank. If you want to know how much your servicer got any particular month, use the formula service pay equals current loan balance times 0.25% over 12. About two months after the servicing switched, Bank of America announced they'd be charging a $5 fee for the convenience to pay the mortgage online. Truly an unwarranted money grab. I'm blessed that I can put a little extra towards my mortgage payment every month. So the following month, I took out my mortgage payment plus $400 in quarters from my local bank. I then went to my local Bank of America branch and handed them my mortgage payment in quarters and repayment stub. I asked for a receipt of payment. I overpaid my mortgage to reduce the current balance and thereby reducing Bank of America's fees. The nice branch manager said, you can write a check, you don't have to pay on coins. 
I said I could, but I would charge a $9.50 convenience fee for the stamp, my check, and ink used. The branch manager actually laughed and said, okay. They counted the money, and I got my receipt. Next month, the charge was still there. So I went to another local Bank of America branch, which had gotten bad reviews on Yelp due to a hostile bank manager. I did the same thing. The branch manager said, write a check, we don't accept quarters. I said, shall I call the local state's banking commissioner, the Consumer Financial Protection Board, and the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, the US top bank regulator, and say you won't accept legal tender? I asked to talk to the district manager. I was making a stink. After about 20 minutes, he grudgingly had the staff count the quarters, and I got a receipt. I told the manager that I would be bringing dimes next time. The next month, I brought dimes. He accepted them but glared at me the whole time. After that payment, Bank of America rescinded their convenience fee. The month after that, I refinanced my mortgage at a lower rate. Bank of America only got roughly six months of fees for servicing they expected to last three years at a minimum. Five years to be profitable. One of my proudest malicious compliance moments. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Mayday Voter 11. It says, Someone in the mortgage industry once told me that the big banks like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, etc. hate their mortgage business, but they don't want to get rid of it, so they take their frustration out on the borrower. Not sure if that's actually true, but every mortgage horror story I've heard like this involved a big bank like Bank of America or Wells Fargo. OP responded to this one and said, Hate is too strong a word, but it is a burden for them. Now, most mortgages are serviced by non-bank servicers like New Residential, Mr. Cooper, Freedom Mortgage, and etc. Should mortgages have a serious increase in delinquencies, these companies go down, and oh boy, that'll be a mess for the US economy. So, going back to OP paying in coins because I'm really not up on all this mortgage talk, but up here in Canada, you can't actually do that. So, there are laws here on how many coins you can pay with of any specific denomination. Now, that being said, if you walked into a bank here and said, I want to pay my mortgage with all of these coins, they could say, I'm sorry, I can only take so many of them. But if you walked into the bank and said, hi, I'd like to make a deposit of all these coins to my account, well, there's nothing they could do about that. Just something I thought I'd pass on to my Canadian listeners because you never know when you're going to need it. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Handcan44. Mandatory overtime. Let's jump right in. I just found this sub and thought I'd share my story. A few years back, I was working for a work truck manufacturing company. I really enjoyed the work I was doing, and I was good at it. Unfortunately, this place had, and still does have, a reputation as a revolving door, due to the disposable view they have of their techs. We were referred to as a heartbeat and tools at one point by the GM. The turnover led to a severe imbalance in experienced versus inexperienced workforce, and it was compounded by their answer to production slowdowns. They fired the bottom 20% every winter and would hire new techs with zero experience and mandatory overtime every summer. The latter is the point of my story. I have always stood by the adage, I work to live, I don't live to work, meaning I don't care for overtime. I budgeted my life to be able to turn down overtime when offered. I'm a team player and will always do my part when needed. However, this pattern of seasonal forced overtime was starting to wear thin. At one point, the company was bought out by a larger corporation, and some of our HR policies changed. One change was overtime being calculated on a daily basis instead of weekly. Another change was having 10 unpaid personal days with no reason or notice required to use them. Of course, the average underpaid tech living paycheck to paycheck would never use an unpaid personal day. The company knew that and it was strictly for PR. They could claim that employees had personal days even though they never intended for us to use them. It didn't take long for me to realize that with a forced 9.5 hour day, if they worked us 10 they would be required to give us another paid break, and overtime calculated daily, I could call in on Fridays and use my unpaid personal day but still come out ahead. 32 regular hours plus 6 overtime hours equals the equivalent of 41 regular hours. 
I decided I had enough and I was going to enjoy 10 three-day weekends for my summer. After my third Friday off, I was called into my manager's office. My manager, his manager, and the HR director were waiting for me. I was confronted about taking three Fridays off in a row, and they demanded an explanation or excuse as to why I was taking them off. I calmly referred to our employee handbook, which explains that no excuse or reason is required for personal days. They asked how I could afford to use these unpaid personal days. I had nothing to hide, so I explained the math, much to their surprise. I was then lectured by management, who told me I was abusing the system and I needed to stop or else. The HR director immediately corrected them and told management there was nothing they could do because I was not breaking any rules. At that point, I was pretty heated. I told them, I'm one of your top performers and I know it. If I am disciplined or fired, I will assume it's because of this meeting and I will seek legal counsel. I have not broken any rules and you should be grateful I haven't pointed out this loophole to the other technicians. I got one more Friday off before mandatory overtime was discontinued. I found out later that the general manager was reprimanded when he tried taking the issue to corporate. They found out he was forcing OT, which was against the corporate policy. The following year, the 10 unpaid days were turned into two extra vacation days. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Maximum Dealer 6208 It says, Why would you tell them the math? You don't have to explain your day off, nor do you have to explain how you pay your bills. Now, you no longer get three-day weekends, silly. Another user responded to this comment named Pineapple Logical 5654 It says, Absolutely. I once had a supervisor who loved to remind me that I couldn't afford to lose my job because I just bought a car. I knew my car was paid for. I also knew she'd find something else to pick on if I told her, so I just nodded along and let her think she had something over me. Don't feed them. Did anybody else hear that management team shoot themselves in the foot because they said, how can you afford to take that day off? Well, management, does that mean that you know you're paying them the bare minimum to get by? Because it sure sounds to me like that's your plan. But OP, what's been commented here is absolutely true. They have no right to know what you use your days for, especially since they put that in their handbook, and they have no right to know what you spend your money on or what your financial situation is. So screw them. Our next story today comes to us from Black Hat Ran. Want access to all employee emails? Enjoy your smoking device then. Let's jump right in. Hello Reddit, this is my first time posting on this sub, and English is not my first language, so I apologize in advance if I write something confusing. This was not that big of a deal, but even after years, I still find it funny. This happened years back when I was working as an IT for a relatively large engineering company, around five to six branches in our place. It was a great workplace. This was a family-owned business, and since it was funded using the father's, let's call him Dick, money, he was given the VIP privilege. Basically, everything he requests should be done without consideration, even if it Fs up the process, yada yada. Everyone in the office and most of the people on the other sites, people get transferred to other sites for managerial positions or to fill up any vacant positions frequently, knows this and would constantly talk about him and his unrealistic demands. Like one time, he requested to have access to all user emails since he fears sabotage from resigning and terminated employees and wants their login info to be sent to him on an Excel sheet. This was declined, of course. Dick is also known for being an alcoholic, drinking as early as 4 a.m. inside his office, and would lash out at anybody when drunk. The IT guys were the common target for his lashing out, since it's unavoidable that employees experience issues with their devices and would tell us that, this should not be happening, why are we even paying you for this? I was on the middle of my 30 day notice when we received an email from Dick, asking for all shared emails to be delegated to him, aside from those whom he already has access, all 12 of them. In case you're not familiar with Outlook, emails are stored locally in a file inside your device. More accounts you have access to equals more storage space consumed. Even when there's a max storage space of 50 gigabytes for these files, you can alter the maximum up to 300 gigabytes, but we never do this. Well, we did it once for him. 
Our team has gone to the lengths of convincing him not to do it since it would consume a F-ton amount of space on his device, and we could delegate to him the emails he needs at the moment instead. Then delegate some more later if a need arises. Basically saying his request is unnecessary, but nah, he wants them now, he wants them fast, and he wants them stored inside since he wants to look at the emails even without the internet on. Since we realized there was no convincing dick about the risk, malicious compliance knocked on the door, asked to be let in, and crapped on the floor. All shared folders were delegated to him, having around 20 to 30 gigabytes of emails and attachments each, configured to automatically download and be saved locally. The next day we got a request to procure another laptop for Dick. Turns out, while the emails were syncing, it got to a point where his storage was bottoming up. The device was starting to freeze a lot, and whenever he tries to delete other files just to make up available space, it would get replaced by all the emails that were being synced in. He got so frustrated that he punched a hole in the screen. It's to say we were asked to revert what we did the day prior and set up his new device, very nice event, before I left the company. Okay, first of all, I need to go back to this line, and I'm not going to censor it this time, so maybe turn your volume down, where OP said, malicious compliance knocked on the door, asked to be let in, and shat on the floor. That is one of the best sentences I've ever read in malicious compliance, bar none. Well done, OP. In the comment section for this one, there's one from a user called M the Strange. It says, I don't know why, but malicious compliance stories from IT are always so good. OP responded to this comment and said, It's one of the underappreciated parts in a business, and most of the time, people make absurd requests, but underestimate the consequences. Stepping back and looking at this one from the outside, how the heck does management not listen to IT when they recommend something they should be doing? That's what these people are paid for, to make sure that all of your electronic stuff works properly. But you're not going to listen to what they say about something electronic? Um, that's just dumb. Our next story today comes to us from Mummy Longlegs. You're mad that I shaved my head? Alright, I'll make sure to never shave again. Let's jump right in. Hey y'all, little disclaimer, this is my first ever post on this site, so I apologize if my formatting is a bit off. I'm not much of a writer, let alone a super duper dramatic revenge plot one. <laughs> Earlier last year, my family decided to throw me a surprise Sweet 16 party, which all of our extended family members were invited to. Among those invited was my aunt, who we'll call Carol, who is known in our family to be super conservative. Unlike her husband, who tends to be more open-minded than her, though to be quite frank, the bar was on the floor. Since it was my sweet 16, I decided to try out something new in regards to my appearance I've always wanted to do, but never quite got the chance to. That being, shaving my head. Little note, my aunt has always admired and complimented my long hair, mostly due to the fact that it heavily resembled the way she wore her hair when she first met my uncle in the 70s. So you can only imagine the expression on her face when she saw me walk into the room with a buzz cut. And so, over the course of the party, while I got many weird looks from my more conservative family members, none were as fierce as my aunt's. She continuously made passive-aggressive remarks in regards to my new hair, or rather, lack thereof. I tried my best to laugh them off, but with the thing she was saying slowly getting a lot lighter on the passive part, and a lot heavier on the aggressive bit, it kept getting harder to do so. When my birthday party eventually came to a close, as we were all saying our goodbyes, instead of bidding farewell like everyone else, Carol, now with her composure nowhere near in sight, starts berating both me and my parents for letting me shave my oh-so-precious hair off, saying how a woman like me should never even as much as hold a razor anywhere near her hair. Q, malicious compliance. It took me all my willpower not to lash back out at her, but I somehow managed to hold myself back. And in the middle of her yelling, it's like a light bulb lit up in my head. And so, taking her advice, I swore to not shave any of my body hair until at least the next time I saw her, which was not long since Thanksgiving is not too far away. And with that, the next three to four months, were not only a delight not having to worry about shaving, but also strangely cathartic. 
I did everything in my power to make my leg and arm hair grow faster. You could name any method for hair growth, and I guarantee I have tried it. When Thanksgiving finally rolled around the corner, I made sure to pick out some clothes that revealed most of my arms and legs to piss her off even more. As I came up to meet Carol, the expression that washed up on her face can only be described as an unholy mix of both disgusted and horrified. Before I could even get within two feet of her, she quickly rushed to the bathroom with her hands over her mouth. After what seemed like an eternity of painfully fake retching sounds, she finally exited the bathroom and started loudly screaming at me about how I look like a man and how me letting myself go had literally made her sick to her stomach, also making sure to compare me to big hairy animals while she was at it. Slowly, a crowd formed around us. Embarrassed by his wife, my uncle forcefully dragged Carol away by her hand and out the door as everyone in the room froze up a bit. Since then, my uncle has profusely apologized to me and my aunt has insisted on not appearing at any family gatherings if I was there. And in the not-so-off chance Cousin L happens to be reading this, I'm so sorry you have such crappy parents, girl. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, we have one from a user called HMS Slardy Bartfast. It says, Have you started taking pictures to send to relatives? Nice pictures of you in shorts, telling them how much better you feel about yourself, taking your aunt's advice, how liberating it is not basing your self-worth on the opinions of others, and that you'd encourage them to thank your aunt for pointing out how shallow it would be to base your entire worldview around how others see you. I really don't understand why this aunt cares what OP looks like. I mean, it doesn't have any bearing on the aunt's life at all. Like, is the aunt taking them out with them wherever they go? Are their friends looking at them and going, Oh my gosh, what have you done? You're a horrible person because you're walking around with that one who shaved all their hair off. Oh my gosh. Um, OP, one more thing to double check here though. Are you sure your aunt's name is Carol? Because I have a feeling her name was actually Karen. Our next story today comes to us from Careless Series 1596. Don't want to be asked for anything more? Okay, no problem. Let's jump right in. So, a few years ago, I worked as an administrator of a finance company. It was my job to create contract documents and ensure everything was secure and legit, especially as in the case I'm about to describe, when we are purchasing from a private seller, not an established storefront could even be a guy off of Kijiji. So one day I'm asked to email a new private seller about something our client is purchasing from him. I sent my standard email noting all the things we need from this private seller. Let's call him Bob. Bob called me shortly after receiving the email and was super slimy on the phone. He was being flirty and kept saying he wanted to meet for coffee and discuss me working for them instead after one standard email. I got a bad feeling about this guy, like he was trying to get away with something. So I made a mental note to really watch what he sent in. Over the course of the next few days, he sent in everything except what I asked for. He was getting ruder every time we spoke or emailed, and was calling our client, telling them how we were the worst company he could have chosen to deal with. He said he has the right to not supply the info we're looking for. And of course, that's true, but that cancels the sale, which he didn't want. So one morning he finally sends me the document I was waiting for. Within his email to me, Bob made it very clear that we were ridiculous and this is the last thing he is providing us, so don't even bother asking. I opened it up and it was clearly fraudulent. Anyone at my office would have said the same thing, and there is no way we were going to accept it. After discussing with my sales guy, I responded to the email and said, Hi Bob, thank you for sending this over. However, as it's been clearly edited in a fraudulent way, we cannot accept it. You mentioned in your email that we shouldn't ask for anything else, so I won't. We have spoken to our mutual client and have agreed to cancel this transaction and won't be speaking to you further. Have a great day. He ended up calling both our mutual client and the sales guy in a panic wanting to backtrack and get the sale done and would provide what we need. Obviously, we blacklisted this guy and never did business with him again. In the comment section for this one, there's one from a user called Stinky Feet 205 
it says, that's the typical scammer MO. They try to scare and bully people into doing what they want, legal or not. Good for you for giving him the boot. This was responded to by another user called NYVN. It says, he deliberately drug out the process in the hopes that they would be in a time crunch and rush, missing that the document had issues. Kinda makes you wonder how many times Bob has actually gotten away with this, not with this company maybe, but with many, many other companies, because it seems like Bob knows what he's doing and he's been able to get his way in the past, been able to sneak things by on companies and make bank on of it by doing fraudulent sales. Hmm. I'd say in this case, it might be worth it for OP to make a couple of phone calls to other similar companies and see if they've ever dealt with this person because it might take more than just OP's company to take this person down. All right, our first story today comes to us from Lady Blade War Angel. My cousin thought she was being so clever. It did not work out for her. Let's jump right in. So here's a malicious compliance story that made my family laugh for years and still does. A good few years back, I was about 24 to 25 years old. I went to Cyprus with my grandparents to visit relatives. My grandparents originally came from there and moved to the UK when they were like 16. My cousin, 14 female, also came along. Now, it's important to mention that we're Greek Cypriots. Certain things are expected when we visit relatives, such as helping out with things if we can and offering our help for whatever our host might be doing. It's also worth mentioning that I have a sight problem but I'm extremely independent in spite of it. So we were visiting relatives and every time I offered to help out, either taking dishes into the kitchen, bringing them out of the kitchen, washing up, even getting a glass of water, I kept being told to sit down, they could handle it. I didn't understand why as I'm perfectly capable. I thought it might be to do with my eyes. One day we were visiting a great auntie of ours who owns a little summer home by the sea, not too far from where we were staying. Now, when we visit this auntie, I always go swimming. She's literally not even a couple minutes away from the sea. Now, as I went to offer my help to my great aunt, I hear my 14-year-old cousin talking to her in Greek. Another important note, I can't string together a sentence in Greek. My father is English and had something against us speaking Greek. But although I'm not a fluent speaker, I can read, write, and understand Greek. My family doesn't know this. They assume that because I'm not a fluent speaker, that they can basically hide their conversations between other people. My cousin was telling my great aunt how clumsy I am, how stupid I am, how I'm a little soft in the head. She was saying it in Greek. She thought I couldn't understand her, but I knew exactly what she was saying. Even if I couldn't string sentences together myself, I knew what she was saying about me. I added two and two together and realized my cousin was very obviously telling all my relatives this. She did it because she thought she'd get praised if she helped bring out the food without me. I was angry, but I knew the perfect revenge. We ate lunch and after we were finished eating, my great aunt asked my cousin for her help to take the dishes in and do the washing up, as she'd been on her feet most of the morning preparing the food. My cousin looked at me, knowing my great aunt couldn't speak English and said, Hey OP, auntie needs help taking the plates in and doing the washing up because now she was bored and expected to run off to the beach and leave me doing the hard work of cleaning up after. So I looked at her and said, but I'm too stupid and clumsy and soft in the head to help auntie out. Besides, she asked for your help, not mine. She went pale, realizing I knew what she'd said, but she doubled down. I helped bring everything out. You could help take it all in. I laughed at her, picked up the book I'd brought with me and got up from the table, grabbed the towel I brought with me and went to walk off. My cousin started whining to my grandparents that I wasn't helping her. My grandmother looked at her and said, you made your bed, now you lie in it. Your cousin caught you lying about her and now she can go to the beach while you help your aunt. My cousin went completely white then. So I went to the beach, swam for 30 minutes, then chilled out on a deck chair reading my book under the shade of a nice umbrella. By the time my grandparents called to me that we were heading home, my cousin had spent all of it helping to wash up and dry things and put them away. She hadn't gotten to be lazy and go to the beach to enjoy the sea. I could have helped her. I simply decided that I wouldn't, as she never earned my help. Since then, every time we went to a relative's home and she was asked to help, 
I watched with a smirk on my face. To this day, I'm 37 this year, I still won't help her. She made out I was incapable to people, so now she suffers the consequences. It's the malicious compliance that keeps on giving to me. OP added an edit onto this one at the bottom. It says answers to some common questions. One, I was born with congenital cataracts and I'm 85% blind. Two, this didn't actually start out as something to carry on for years. I don't actually carry it on myself either. It started out as a consequences for her actions type of lesson. The family picked it up because she wouldn't admit to the lie and no one liked her lying. They don't actually make her do extra chores when I'm not there as the whole thing started because she said I was incapable. So the family basically told her she had to help her incapable cousin. 3. The family carried it on until this point because she refuses to admit to the lie. To this day, over a decade later, she still says that I'm incapable, clumsy, soft in the head to any relatives that will listen. She's now a full-grown adult who refuses to let go of the lie, so the family has kept up her narrative because she won't let it go. 4. Some people have asked if my grandmother knew what was going on before I confronted my cousin. She did not. After I caught her lying about me and used her words against her, my grandmother straight away asked my great aunt in front of us both if my cousin had said that. My great aunt confirmed it as she didn't know my cousin was actually lying. I'd already put two and two together and realized this was probably what my cousin had been doing with everyone we visited. My grandmother was one of 10 siblings that made it to adulthood and my grandfather was one of six siblings that made it to adulthood. We visited a lot of relatives. So once my grandmother found out my cousin had done this at my great aunt's, my grandmother dug around and found out what I'd already guessed. When my grandmother asked exactly why she thought it was okay to do this, she doubled down and basically claimed it was true. So my grandmother told our relatives that this was absolutely not true. She also told them that as my cousin refused to admit to the lie, that they should treat her as the only capable one when I was there. If she wants to lie about her family, my grandmother asked they act towards her as if the lie were true. If I was incapable, then I couldn't possibly help out. But my cousin was not incapable. She'd be required to do the stuff they'd normally ask of me. Don't get me wrong, she wasn't asked to do anything like cleaning hunted kills, paving driveways, or herding cattle. She was asked to wash dishes, carry dishes in and out of the kitchen, drying and putting away clean dishes. Simple things asked of anyone. They just made a point of only asking her when I was there because of her refusal to admit to the lie. She's 24 or 25 years old now with her own place, but she still goes around telling people the same lie about me. My grandparents didn't know about it until I confronted her with it. They just made a reactionary choice when they found out what she was doing. Wow, OP's cousin must be swimming in a sea of regret. She might still be salty about it all these years later. She's probably cried an ocean of tears, and the tide certainly turned in OP's favor. If you think about it though, she didn't have to be such a beach about it. She could have just clammed up and been okay. But the fact that she still lied is kind of fishy to me. In fact, she sounds like she could be quite crabby. Our next story today comes to us from Nilanute4283. They must be my leaves on my curb, as you wish. Let's jump right in. The leaf collection company for my neighborhood has absurdly strict rules about where leaves must be for pickup. I live at the end of a cul-de-sac, so my curb is curved and pretty short, about 30 feet, 9 meters long. My property is wedge-shaped, so my backyard is quite long, 200 feet or 60 meters and has 40 to 50 oak trees. I also have two sugar maples in my front yard. So leaves, lots of leaves. Pickup rules state leaves must be within five feet of the curb, but on the road. They must also be at least 15 feet from a mailbox because subscriptions for leaf pickup are by individual homeowner. Neighbors are not allowed to combine leaves and cannot buy a group subscription. Subscribers must only put their leaves from the current year out for pickup. Pickup trucks use GPS to identify homes who have signed up and ignore leaves in front of homes that did not sign up. Because I have so many leaves and so little curb, only 15 feet of available curb due to the required distance from a mailbox, 
I called the leaf collection company and asked to put the leaves along a longer curb I share with my neighbor. No problem, they said. Great. The truck came through and picked up a fraction of the pile and left the rest of the pile the driver decided was in front of my neighbor's property. I called the company back and a different person said, those are the rules. I'll just have to figure it out. Fine, now it's on. I have 15 feet of width and 5 feet of depth. There is, however, no limit on height. I moved the remaining leaves to my available curb space. I collected the rest of my leaves and added them to the pile. I spoke with my neighbors and acquired the rights to their leaves by paying them $1 each. Now they are all my leaves. I shoveled and swept the leaves off the streets. They went into the pile. I collected the purchased leaves from the neighbors. They went on the pile. Leaves continued to fall, so I kept adding them. It was a lot of work, but the pile was over 12 feet tall. I spent a ton of time using a snow shovel to fling the leaves to the top of the pile that was more than 5 feet above my head. Neighborhood residents stopped to gape at the epic leaf mound. I am happy to battle willful ignorance with malicious compliance. I reminded myself of this every time I spent another hour tending to the obscenity on my curb. The truck came today. The pile dwarfed the truck. They had to drive away and dump leaves, then come back and reload twice. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Lyle Ratcher. It says, The child in me just wanted to jump into your pile of leaves. OP responded to this one and said, It's normally quite the temptation, but... 1. There is an unknown quantity of dog poop mixed in with the leaves since it's virtually impossible to find the poop among the leaves before collecting them. And 2. Even my 15-year-old son admitted that he wasn't sure he could get out of that pile if he jumped into it and said leaf suffocation sounded like a terrible way to die. Yeah, OP, I think your son's right. Sometimes it's better just to leaf the pile alone. Then you get to sit back and watch the collectors rake in their dose of karma. Have to be honest though, this is the first time I've ever heard about a subscription service for your leaf pickup in a neighborhood. That's kind of odd to me. I mean, here, the city actually has a couple of days that they come around and they'll pick up any bags or whatnot that are on the curb with all of your garden waste, or you can pack it up and take it yourself to a local depot and drop it off. One more thing to mention, really love how you went the legal route and bought your neighbor's leaves. That was the icing on the cake. Our next story today comes to us from OKFishing6604. Free pumpkin pies for everyone. Let's jump right in. This is a story from many years ago when grocery stores were closed on Christmas and Thanksgiving. I worked for a small chain of grocery stores in the mid-Atlantic in the deli. Santoni shout out! A day before Thanksgiving, the bakery manager asked if anybody from our department would be willing to stay and work all night, just baking pumpkin pies for orders. We were open the day before Thanksgiving till 4, then closed Thanksgiving. I volunteered as I was a college student on Thanksgiving break. I came to work that night and was left a note about temps, timing, and packaging, but no numbers or quantities. This made me nervous, so I called the manager at home and said, How many pies do you want me to bake? She told me to keep baking until she came in. And I questioned that, asking how many pies exactly do you want me to make? She, obviously irritated, told me that I didn't need to worry about how many, just keep cooking until she came in at 5. Okay. Q malicious compliance. I loaded a six-wheeler cart with frozen pies, put them on trays, and started baking. As the pies were baking, I prepped racks ahead of time and folded boxes while pies cooled. I was a logistical savant. Everything went perfectly, and I was a machine operating at optimal efficiency. By the time she came in at five, I had cooked every pumpkin pie in her freezer. She lost her crap. What the hell is going on? What am I supposed to do with all these pies? You cooked over 400 pies, and I only have orders for 100? The store manager, hearing the commotion, came over and asked what was going on. She said, she cooked every pie we have in the store, even the Christmas ones. What am I supposed to do with all these pies? He asked, why did you cook all the pies? And I told him, she told me to. He asked her if that was true, and she said, No, well, I told her to keep cooking till I got here, but nobody's ever cooked that many before. 
I didn't even think it would be close. Then this is on you, he replied and walked away. The best part was that since we were closed the next day, the employees were allowed to take all the leftover bakery items home with them. I took home 10 pumpkin pies and multiple bags of bread and rolls. Every other employee in the store was very, very grateful. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Nilanoot4283. It says, my favorite part of this is the legitimate innocence of your compliance. OP responded to this one and said, if she had just been more clear, I was worried that I wouldn't make enough, so I just kept pushing myself. <laughs> this honestly doesn't make any sense to me. She knew the number was 100, come on. There was no reason for her not to say it. A simple, I doubt you'll get that far, but stop if you reach 100, probably would have sufficed. You know what though, OP? You got free pumpkin pie out of this and you didn't get in trouble, so I'd say that was an absolute win in my books. Our last story today comes to us from one of your favorites, Ancient Educator 76. Oh, you're gonna replace what I ate. Let's jump right in. So here we go again at Mendy's drive through This one started in the drive through then ended in our lobby. I got to witness my manager, we'll call him Bruce, being petty AF. Straight sassy. A customer orders one of our smaller burger meals, including one of our smaller patties, to eventually eat in the lobby. The junior bacon cheeseburger comes with a small, hot, two ounce patty, cold cheese, cold lettuce, hot bacon, cold tomato, cold mayo. See where I might be going with this? The repeat customer definitely didn't. It's crucial to eat this burger within a couple minutes of receiving to really enjoy the burger. So anyway, we hand out the bag of goodies. Then we see him 10 minutes later walk in the lobby with the bag in his hand open, losing all that crucial temperature. He sits down. What happens next is something I could only describe as, a la Tom Segura, weird crap. I mean, for like the 1930s, it would have been normal, but this dude whips out a newspaper from seemingly nowhere. Like seriously, he was only holding a paper bag saying Mendy's flaps it open like he's in the movies, finagles a monocle out of his shirt pocket, actually uses it, and about 10 minutes later, he takes a bite out of his now room temperature burger. Yes, we all watched. Like, there were customers galore in the drive-thru, but this was a sight to see. I then returned to my duties. About a picosecond later, time flies, steampunk stew approaches the counter with the fervor of a kid asking us for a free toy with a more than half eaten burger in tow. This man was cold, man. The dichotomy of his talking with a mouthful of food while being dressed to the nines paralleled how his burger was supposed to taste, hot and cold. And he was talking to Bruce, so he meant man, just to add to the schleppiness of his overall vibe. Bruce asked him at the risk of getting further pummeled by chunks of drippy chunks of mouth meat to repeat himself. He stood there chewing for an awkwardly long amount of time. The meat, it's flunkin' cold. Bruce begins to mend explain that the smaller burgers, even at their very hottest, rapidly react with the very cold lettuce, mayo, and tomato. You ordered the burger an hour ago. If you don't plan on eating it right away, we can always... Stu interrupted to shout, I can't eat this crap. Sir, you're eating it right now. Oh, you're gonna replace what I ate. I have my rights. I know how it is. Bruce started to reply, but you ate. Then he had a malicious compliance epiphany. Okay, we'll replace what you ate. I was very excited to hear this, so best believed I turned to see what he was up to. I was so excited. Usually it's me who commits some malicious compliance, and Bruce is the chill one. But not this time. You see, Bruce is a true neat freak. We're like the odd couple, and evidently being spit on made Bruce very malicious, Bruce style. I couldn't wait to see what he was about to do. I first knew he was up to churlishness when he insisted on taking the heavily patchoulied man's burger back. Oh, it was glorious. Never before had he looked so handsome, so debonair, as when he double gloved to take this man's burger put it on a wrapper, and assembled an identical burger which he cut perfectly to match the other 40% of the burger that Stu hasn't eaten. 
he nuked the old burger to kill any steampunk mitochlorians left hanging around, and reassembled his burger puzzle and wrapped it like it was new. He handed it to Stu, and you better believe we all waited to see the aftermath. Homeboy opened the burger right there, and with a look of disgust yelled, Are you effing kidding me? He threw the burger at the wall and ran out, swearing that he'll yelp us until we close. I'm so proud of Bruce, though I know he's ashamed. Down in the comment section for this one, OP was called out a couple of times on the timeline for this story, because they said that the person went through the drive-thru, 10 minutes later came in to sit down, and 10 minutes later took a bite and then came up to the counter, but then the manager says something about him having it for an hour. I can tell you firsthand from working in fast food that sometimes only 15 minutes will go by and it'll feel like a friggin' hour. Let's be honest here though, if you're somebody who frequents Mendy's, you know that their vegetables and their lettuce is extremely cold and you need to eat that burger within the first couple of minutes, otherwise it's just not going to be right. So in this story, regardless of whether it was 20 minutes or an hour, that burger was not going to be right, but it was completely the customer's fault. I think the only thing that could have made this better would have been if Bruce took a bite out of the new burger and then jammed it together with the customer's leftovers to create one full burger. That would have been real malicious compliance but it probably would have gotten him fired too. All right, our first story today comes to us from Throw It All Away 2364. The credit for my work costs $5,500. Let's jump right in. I'm going to be very vague to not bog this down with jargon. I work in a fairly prestigious biology lab on the East Coast where we study various pathogens, and for one project, I was trying to isolate a certain bacteria from samples containing a wide array of species in order to infect mice with the strain under various conditions. While doing research to see if there were mediums that were selective for the target bacteria, or if there were antibiotics that my target was resistant against that would kill everything else, I ended up with various ways to isolate the bacteria, using a process I thought of myself to test the efficacy of each isolation method. Before starting my experiment, I ran it by my coworker who is a seasoned immunologist of 10 years, let's call him Dan, who trained me in working with bacteria when I started the job. I'll probably rant about Dan in another post. He thinks it's great and gives it the green light, and for the next two months I'm running the experiments, calling biotech pharma companies for quotes on their products that I'm using to isolate the bacteria and end up with a big spreadsheet that contained both the efficacy and the cost-benefit analyses of all the methods I came up with or found. I show my results to Dan and he's ecstatic, although he mentions that it's likely going to be a while before we use the data and make a decision on the isolation method due to us waiting on samples to come in. I send this spreadsheet along to my PI anyway, head scientist at a lab, and shift my time to other projects I'm working on. Another couple months go by, and after not hearing anything from Dan about patient samples, another coworker comes up to me and asks me where I could find a set of certain plates to isolate the target bacteria from. I'm confused and ask him why he's looking for those, because based on my experiments, the plates he wanted were the least efficient and most expensive way to select the bacteria we were looking for. Not to mention that I had no idea that we had ordered any more than the 10 plates I used to run my experiment. He argued me and said that Dan's research said otherwise. That confused me even more and when I asked him to show me what he was talking about, he proceeded to show me my own spreadsheet where he quickly realized that he had been misled and said that Dan must have made an error in the spreadsheet. I told him that I was the one who ran the experiments and got the results and if Dan ordered the bad plates, then he had just wasted the lab's money. The other coworker said I probably told Dan to order the wrong plates but when I said I had no idea plates were being ordered at all, all he had to say to that was, oh, that's weird. Sure enough, later that day, I look inside our cold room and see several boxes, roughly $5.5 thousand dollars worth of the expensive and inefficient plates, and I confront Dan about it. I asked Dan why he ordered so many plates, and if he had been telling other people that he had done the experiments. He laughs a little before asking if I even read the spreadsheet that I made and states that the plates he ordered were the best based on my criteria and that because he taught me how to work with bacteria, I was piggybacking his methods 
and that him validating my experiment before running it was tantamount to him doing the work. He told me not to worry about it anymore, and that he would be presenting the data to the PI because he had already prepared a slideshow and everything for it. I wanted to open up the spreadsheet and tell him that he had just wasted a lot of money, but he was so condescending and sure of himself about having ownership of my work that all I said was, okay, before returning to my bench. Later that week, we have our lab meeting where Dan is presenting his work to the whole lab and states that we can finally move ahead with isolating the target bacteria from patient samples. Sure enough, my spreadsheet is on the TV used as our projector, and my PI asks when we could expect the materials used in the most efficient isolation method to arrive. Dan corrects the PI, stating that the bad plates were the best, and very proudly stated that the plates had already arrived. I then interjected very bluntly saying that the plates he ordered would recover over 90% less of the bacteria than the method my PI had picked from the spreadsheet. Dan fell silent, face going shades of red, before he stumbled through a justification of ordering the bad plates, how in the long run we'd save money by not ordering the materials needed to do the method my PI wanted, only for my PI to chime in, stating it was absolutely worth it if it meant a tenfold increase in recovery, and that we shouldn't be wasting samples, time, and money on bad plates. Dan very quickly blurted out that it was my spreadsheet, and that there must have been a miscommunication between us before ordering the plates before he quickly sat down. And all I said was that I was not told by anyone that anything off my spreadsheet was being ordered. My PI asked Dan if he submitted the data to me before I sent it to him, and Dan sheepishly admitted that I was the one who ran the experiments and compiled everything. So he must have misread my data and ordered the wrong materials, and was about to suggest that I possibly misspoke when showing him my data the first time before my PI cut him off to move on to the next lab topic. The rest of the meeting, he was red, glaring at me out of the corner of his eye. After the lab meeting, Dan pulled me aside and asked me why I didn't tell him that he ordered the bad plates. I told him that since it was his research, he should have known what method gave the best results since he would have calculated the yield of each method when doing the experiments, and that if he wanted my input, he should have told me before he ordered them. I went to the PI and cleared up the confusion, putting in the right order for the materials needed to best isolate the target bacteria from our samples and making sure he knew I had no idea that my data was being acted upon in case Dan went behind my back to somehow throw me under the bus. Needless to say, we communicated far less after that whole ordeal and I quickly found other people in the lab to work with. I later found out that he had been taking credit for all the work I did ever since starting in the lab. And while it frustrates me to still have to tell people every now and then, that I made the figures or did the experiments that Dan had told them about when my data comes up, more people have come to me to discuss their projects and ask for my help since Dan was exposed, and I find solace in the memory of his red, twisted face looking like it was going to explode in front of everyone, barely able to make out a word to cover his butt. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called AccomplishSir5178. It says, so he stole your work, blamed you for a mistake, admitted it was your research, and was shamed in front of everyone? Priceless. This honestly sounds to me like any kind of research or academia facility because this is just how it goes, unfortunately. Most people won't step up and say, hey, that was my work, and sometimes if you even look into your work contract, you might find out that you just don't have the ability to take credit for that work, and it goes to the person heading up the department. I'm glad OP was able to get the recognition that they needed, but I have a feeling this is going to happen again. Our next story today comes to us from Canadian Cosmic Entity. Shut the F up, get in the truck, and do what you're told? You got it. Let's jump right in. So, I live in a pretty small city by American standards in Canada, 250,000 people. People joke that it's a giant small town and it's hard to go somewhere without knowing someone who either knows you or heard of you. I run a small contracting business that maintains properties for seniors. Think grass mowing, tree trimming, etc. In the winter, there isn't a lot going on, so I lay off the summer crew and usually bounce around to different companies to help them with their snow removal. 
I hold a CDL as well as equipment operator license, among others, so most of the larger companies know me and are more than happy to have me around. Over the weekend, I was called by the biggest company in my city to help with hauling snow to the city snow dump, a gravy job, and lots of hours. I had never worked with their crew, but quickly got along with everyone but the company Grump, which was expected. Of course, the company Grump is the one working on the weekend loading trucks. After the first location, he gave me some cash to get us coffee. I meet him at the next location and hand him his drink. He takes a drink and noticed it's wrong. He gets out of the bobcat and throws the full extra large coffee into the distance, getting caught by the wind, spraying me with liquid, all while cursing me out. I decided to let it go. Everyone has been working long hours and well, some people in construction are just giant man children. I offered to grab him another coffee and he declined. I went back to my truck to drink my coffee and talk to the other driver in my truck when the operator comes over to our truck to be at us about his coffee, after I offered to get him another. Shortly after I realized I had his change in my pocket. Knowing this guy, I better return it. I walk over to the Bobcat to give him his money and let him know if he did that again, there would be problems. We had a few words before he told me to shut the F up, get back in my truck, and do what I was told. And if I did, stuff like that wouldn't happen. So I did. I went back to my truck and did as I was told. Little did the operator know, he's been on thin ice, and I was told by his boss to let him know if we had any problems with him. Furious, I jumped in my truck, called his boss, and went home. Not even 20 minutes later, I get a call from his boss, telling me they fired him and begging me to come back. Moral of the story is treat each other with respect, especially in the workplace. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Masik Keel. It says, I know that type, gets warned a dozen times, but when it happens, they're totally surprised. OP responded to this comment and said, yep, this guy is nearly 50 apparently. This was done on government property too. And if I complained to the customer, I would never do that. They could lose the contracts, so there's no room for that, especially when you work for a household name. Some people just have no respect for anyone. I think one of the major problems in the construction industry is that, well, people just assume that somebody like him's going to get what's coming to them, but it rarely happens because they don't get reported. If you assume that somebody else is going to do it, and that somebody else assumes that somebody else is going to do it, it never happens, and this idiot still gets to run rampant like they're doing right now. So, they actually got to face some consequences in this case, because OP did what they were told to do, and made sure that the upper management knew that this guy was being a gigantic butthole. More people really do need to be held accountable for their actions. This next story comes to us from Ronark. 10,000 steps a day or else? Let's jump right in. Years ago, long before smartphones or Fitbits, a coworker of mine, Bob, had a relatively mild heart attack. We joked in secret that it was caused by his wife, but the other secret is we weren't really joking. She was awful. She was just an intolerable person, and no one liked her. I'm pretty sure Bob didn't like his own wife. If he did, it was probably Stockholm Syndrome. At any rate, when Bob returned to work, he returned with a pedometer clipped to his belt. Every day, Bob would walk as much as he could when he wasn't pinned down to his desk. But he was suffering, and his work was suffering. As his supervisor at the time, I figured he was struggling with his recovery, so we just moved a lot of his work to others and left him with the cases he specialized in. That worked for everyone, because those cases drove others nuts and he was a whiz at them. His other work was comparatively easy. However, at the end of his first full week back, the issue became more clear. I overheard Bob's wife berating him in the parking lot because he didn't even meet half of his step goal. Turns out, the pedometer didn't come from his doctor, it came from his wife. She was demanding that Bob increase from his current 4,200 steps a day that were almost killing him to somehow 10,000 steps a day. This will read at least 10,000 at the end of every workday, or it'll be your butt, were her words. Now, Bob was a tall guy with long strides, so she was somehow expecting him to fit in over six miles of walking during his workday while recovering. But you know, since he'd had a heart attack, 
maybe she was just looking out for him, right? Nope, his doctor had actually cautioned him against overdoing it. He was only supposed to be walking 1.5 miles a day and not all at once, but his wife wasn't having it. She demanded more, and he tried but wasn't doing so well. After another week of this and another chewing out in the parking lot, we developed a plan. Bob's pedometer just sat on the corner of his desk while he was working. If anyone had to walk down the hall or to the other building, they'd grab the pedometer on their way out of the office. Bob did have to tolerate another couple of butt chewings because we ramped him up to 10,000 steps instead of jumping straight there. We figured that would be suspicious otherwise. In the end, Bob got his 10,000 steps every day. Well, Bob's pedometer registered over 10,000 steps every day, and almost a third of them were actually his steps. Bob was overjoyed to have the help, and we were all willing to keep the secret because we were frightened of her turning on us. Teamwork makes the dream work. Okay, is anybody else here wondering if Bob's wife has a hefty insurance policy on Bob? Because it sounds like she wants him to have another heart attack. This is echoed by a commenter down below named Ace of Nations. They said, it sounds like that woman was intentionally trying to provoke a deadly heart attack. OP responded to this one and said, I don't care what the subject is, what your expertise is, or how little she knows about the subject, she'll often have a contrary opinion and demand it should be treated as the word of God. So maybe she was trying to kill him off, but completely disregarding the doctor's orders and imposing her own unreasonable demand was totally on brand for her. One time, she'd made Bob apologize for insisting that Arkansas is a state. When it had been pointed out to her on a map, she claimed that it was Arkansas, and Bob was only calling it Arkansas out of ignorance. We may or may not have made a point of fitting Arkansas into discussions anytime she was in earshot. Since we dealt with state agencies, that wasn't hard. I've genuinely never known a more disagreeable person. Okay, this woman sounds horrible, and you'll wonder why Bob had the heart attack in the first place? Probably because he had to deal with her on a daily basis. I need to remind you all again that life is too short to be unhappy, so if you're in a situation like Bob is in, it might be time to move on and find somebody that will, you know, compliment your life, be part of your life, not try to destroy your life like his wife is right now. Our last story today comes to us from Len Testa. Apartment manager doesn't take cash for a two cent bill. Malicious compliance ensues. Let's jump right in. In 2019, I moved from an apartment complex in Celebration, Florida to a condo. As usual, when you move out of an apartment, you get a final bill, which includes your last month's prorated rent, deductions for damages, security deposit refunds, and the like. We paid it. The next month, I get a call from my wife who says we've gotten a follow-up bill in the mail from the apartment management company for two cents. We're both in the tech field, so we laughed that this company's IT department didn't catch the edge case of spending 50 cents in postage to collect two cents in revenue but it happens. My wife prints out a copy of the bill. I grab two cents from the change jar. The apartment complex is on my daily drive, so I swing by the office. I walk in and tell the manager that I want to pay my last bill. I say, it's two cents, here's the bill, and I have the two cents if you want it. The manager says, we don't take cash, nothing else. There was an awkward pause. I say, I don't expect you to take cash, I expect both of us to have a laugh about how silly computer systems are and for you to write off the two cents because it'd cost you more to process the payment. She says, I'm not going to do that. Again, awkward pause. I say, so you want me to write you a check for two cents and mail it and you're going to process that check? The manager says, yes, send us a check and we'll process it and then walks back into her office to end the conversation. So I go home and set up an automatic monthly bank payment to my apartment complex for three cents. And then, because I'm a programmer, I write some code to send a letter once per month saying, I'm so sorry, I've overpaid my bill. Please send me a check for the overpayment. And I use an online service that sends postcards in ridiculous sizes, up to around 18 inches by 24 inches, figuring that'll be my escalation strategy. The first of the next month, I get a call from the apartment company's regional manager. 
after introducing himself, the next two minutes were the most sincere, oh god, we made a mistake, please don't do this, we'll never contact you again, apology anyone could have hoped for. I stopped the mail and never heard from them again. Did I spend several hours on malicious compliance for two cents? Yes. Was it worth it? Absolutely. I highly recommend going to the link in the description for story number four, because there are so many similar stories in the comment section for this one that I spent entirely too long reading through them, and I recommend that you guys read through some of them as well. All right, our first story today comes to us from Baroness Indecisive. Vote with my feet? Don't mind if I do. Let's jump right in. In my old role, compliance for a financial institution, we used to be split into two groups, investigations and alerts. Alerts did the first level of processing of items that came in and then determined whether they should be escalated for further review, sent to investigations, or closed out. Alerts was expected to get through 8 to 15-ish items per day, depending on referral channel and other factors, while investigations was lucky in some areas to get through two per day. Some cases could take days or weeks to do. I worked in investigations, specifically within Treasury, which was considered the most complex area, and I primarily dealt with the high scrutiny, high complexity items like law enforcement referrals. I was also the main trainer for Treasury, particularly complex cases, and had created all of the training materials and processes. Additionally, I worked as the point of contact representative on the procedures management group, so I knew them inside and out. What it boils down to is that I made myself the keystone species of the department, albeit inadvertently. As happens with any organization, there was an ebb and flow of employees in our area, but for the most part we stuck around because we were treated fairly, enjoyed our work, and had senior leadership who actually tried to understand what we did and why we do it. We weren't dealing with people who thought they knew better and who would make arbitrary decisions for the sake of implementing change and saying that they did something. Sure, it wasn't perfect, but it worked pretty well. That all changed when they decided to merge alerts and investigations together and make everyone do everything. Things went downhill quite quickly, especially because the leadership that was given control was from alerts. As far as they were concerned, a case is a case is a case. It's not. And you should be able to get through all things quickly. You can't. And they're all created equally. They aren't. They put undue pressure on folks to get through the caseload far faster than was feasible, if you do it right anyway, and removed all specialization, which made it incredibly difficult to get into the groove of the work because different areas had different expectations and procedures. To add to that, they promoted people who had no business being elevated, Peter Principal anyone, and ignored tenured investigators who should have been first up. All that did was piss off the good employees and create a whole bunch of post turtles in leadership roles. As one would expect, attrition skyrocketed. They weren't paying us nearly enough to deal with the BS, so people left for both internal and external roles at alarming rates. When the pandemic hit, we were, for the most part, stuck. Hiring freezes galore, and there's always a fear of leaving and then getting screwed and being jobless during the disaster that was and is the world. A bit more background, at work I have always had a reputation for honesty and for speaking my mind, sometimes to the chagrin of senior leadership. As far as I'm concerned, you can't complain about something if you don't try to fix it. So when everything was at peak awfulness, I said something on a call with the aforementioned senior leadership, knowing that it was unlikely anything was going to change, but at least I would know I tried. I was later pinged by one of the managing directors in our overarching department, not up my direct reporting line, but in the same organization. We'll call him C. I worked with C a number of times over the years. He had a rocket strapped to his butt and was perfectly content to ride that puppy until he could go no further. He is definitely a bit of a yes man, but that's what generally happens when you're in that type of role. I am unlikely to ever become a yes woman because it's not my personality, but it takes all kinds, and you never know what might happen in the future. When C pinged me, he asked if I could chat and give him some more details about the situation. I knew I had nothing to lose. C, Keystone Species. So we got on a call and I explained the problems and my opinions on proposed solutions. 
more staffing, revert back to specialization in case types, pay industry standard, have leadership work on acquiring a better understanding of the job so as to be able to make more informed decisions, etc. Nothing unreasonable, though I knew that it was unlikely any of it would be done. C's response? Vote with your feet. About what I expected, but I was impressed that he went right out and said it. Especially because we both knew the whole department would be screwed if I left. I'm sure he figured I would never leave. After all, I had stayed for almost 8 years already, even though the awfulness didn't truly start until fairly late in the game. Fast forward a couple months to summer 2021. I had been focusing on finding another role. I had been even before talking with C, but that gave me renewed incentive. I was being particular about what I applied for because I didn't want to leave for the sake of leaving, especially knowing that any internal move would mean I was stuck for a year and didn't want to risk screwing myself out of something perfect by jumping the gun. My caution paid off and I was offered an amazing internal opportunity that pretty much fit me like a glove. I kept my move quiet for a variety of reasons, only telling my manager, but I knew it would eventually make it up the chain. I just wanted to keep it as quiet as possible for as long as possible. Well, a week or so before I was scheduled to start in my new role, I got a ping from C asking me to hop on a call. He had seen the leave report and wanted to ask me why I was going and whether they could convince me to stay. They couldn't. I got on the call, video, and when he asked me why I was leaving, I looked at him and said, well C, I'm just doing what you told me to do. He gave me a cocker spaniel look, complete with head tilt, and I just smiled and said, I'm voting with my feet. The satisfaction I got from the look on his face when he made that connection brought me so much joy. He was so crestfallen. It was just chef's kiss. Now, OP didn't add an edit onto the story itself, but fortunately when I was digging through the comments on this one, I found an update from OP. It says, for those asking, the department has imploded since I danced my way out. They have lost all but one of their original people, one of them I may have poached for my new department, and the one left is only staying because he needs the flexibility in his schedule that he was able to put into place before things got super horrible. Permitted because it was for childcare. He goes in, does precisely his job, and leaves. And even he is actively looking. So they're going to lose him sooner rather than later because even with the flexibility, he knows it really isn't worth it. My old manager was finally able to escape too. Senior leadership in that department has a reputation for blocking internal moves unless someone with more pull manages to push it through. So it took a long time before he was able to get away from it. The powers that be don't seem to understand that blocking you from leaving isn't going to force you to stay, it's going to make you go external and they'd lose you entirely, rather than just to a different area. But when the next consent order hits, they'll wish they had made other choices I imagine, and I will play a tiny, tiny violin for them. And I did make sure that C and his boss were among those who received my best of luck to everyone, it's been swell, I'm off on a new adventure email, complete with new title, which they refused to give me in my old group. OP, thank you so much for this comment where you wrapped up a little bit more of what was going on. We don't get that on nearly enough of these stories. Now, this boss telling you that you should vote with your feet? I'm guessing they thought you wouldn't. They must have thought that saying that would shut down what you were thinking and that you'd be staying in that job forever like a good little worker bee. But I guess they don't understand that there are many other jobs out there that you could be doing and, well, you just tried to better yourself. It's not your fault if management doesn't have a contingency plan when you're the only one who knows how to do things in your department and you decide to leave. That's completely not on you, that's on management. Our next story today comes to us from I Look Better Than You. <laughs> you want me to work at full capacity? No problem. Can you tell my colleagues to say goodbye to their bonuses? Thanks. Let's jump right in. I work in a help desk call center as a first line agent on purpose. My job is easy. We work from home where users can call, email, chat us, and we fix their most basic computer problems, often resolved by a restart or redeployment of some sort. I took this job on purpose to get away from a very stressful career that killed my social life and frankly, my will to live. This job cost me exactly zero energy, 
giving me the space and energy to have the social life I've always dreamed of. The pay in this job is based on the languages you provide help in, and because of my language skills and a promotion I'm not allowed to tell my colleagues about, I make more than anyone else in my team. For this simple reason, I refuse to take any promotions that bring more stress but are not financially compensated, causing me to have worked in first line for three and a half years now while most of my colleagues have had promotions. Because this company has a huge turnover, I often get new colleagues and managers. I usually train the new colleagues and have a friendly, cordial relationship with the managers, but I always try to stay private and reserved as much as possible to save all my energy for after work activities. Most days I don't talk to anyone. I log in, I work on the tickets, calls, emails for 50% of the time while studying, reading, watching movies, or listening to music the rest of the time. What's important to know for this story is that we can get a bonus of up to 10% of our monthly income depending on our productivity. I always get the 10%, but for some newer colleagues it's difficult because the limits are pretty high. If I like a colleague, I will sometimes help them by closing tickets in their name. I also usually take the more challenging tickets and leave the easier ones for the newer team members. Further bit of information is that the company I work for has their help desk for 12 languages. So to cover all the languages, we have a team of eight. So now to the malicious compliance. One of the people I trained became the new team leader, which I actually encouraged. The guy is exactly the manager type and understands the job. Unfortunately, the pressure from the operations manager got to him and he started checking our stats, noticing that for about four hours per day, there is no activity from me. I explained to him that this is on purpose to give everyone a chance to get their bonus and that my output is still higher than anyone else in the team. He also noticed that I sometimes close tickets in my colleagues' names for which I couldn't give him the real reason cause it's sort of fraud. I just told him I rush sometimes and just don't notice. He told me no more relaxing times and no more closing tickets in others names. He actually said he would be checking up on me to make sure I work the full 8 hours I'm paid for. I explained to him that this was a very bad idea, that the team is doing really well and the current status quo is perfectly balanced and he shouldn't upset it but he was young and reckless. Fine. For the next two months, I worked at full capacity, where normally there was a good balance of closing tickets and everyone getting a fair shot at their bonus. Now, all of a sudden, I did about 70% of the work, leaving very little for my colleagues who, except for one other, both months didn't qualify for their bonuses, causing huge conflicts in the team. I tried to stay out of it, but was soon accused of stealing all my colleagues' tickets and not giving them a chance to earn their bonuses. I replied professionally to all the accusations via email, making sure to CC all relevant managers, including the operations manager. After the two months, our new team leader was reassigned and the status quo returned as it was. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Iced Maggot. Ew. Being a manager when there is a well-oiled team without any performance issues already in place, is literally the easiest job in the whole world. You do nothing. Upsetting that balance is literally the worst thing you can do. Another user called Nighthawk something responded to this one and said, you talk to people and say, tell me what you need from me to make sure that you keep doing your job the way you've been doing it. That's it. Yeah, unfortunately this doesn't happen a lot, especially when it's a new manager coming in who wants to make all the right moves, that's definitely in quotations, to impress their higher-ups because they're the new manager and they know what's best. It takes a really special kind of person to turn, look at everything that's going on and say, wow, this is actually working really well, and all I need to do here is keep the machine oiled so that it keeps doing what it's doing. I can sit back and let the team do what it does, which is work very well together. This next story comes to us from MEHC011, Cost of $40 per month is too expensive for the accounts team. Let's jump right in. My work involves analyzing all kinds of data. This instance occurred around the time when our company was somewhat new, but still large enough to have 150 employees and rapidly growing. So far, our data analysis had been retail companies, travel agencies, or even the housing market. For the first time, we received a request to analyze health data from five hospitals in our area. 
the health data is very sensitive, so the raw data itself and the analytical result could not be shared via email or Dropbox. For the first time, my team gets to see that sensitive companies go through channels that have a lot of security to share the data between us and the client. These channels cost money, but nothing too expensive which our organization couldn't afford, something like $40 per month. Four out of the five hospitals have this data sharing channel, which meant that my team was able to receive the raw data and also be able to provide the analysis via the same channel. The fifth hospital was new and they did not have this channel. Either our company or the fifth hospital needed to have this channel. So I raise a request with the accounts team to purchase this channel and it is denied. Myself and my manager both raise it again and also discuss it with the account supervisor and it is approved verbally but declined on the system once again after two weeks. We try again for the third time after discussing with the higher accounts manager and still no approval at the end to buy this channel. It is declined and we have been told it is the hospital's responsibility to share the data. And if we reach the hospital, they ask us to reach the health ministry, which then asks us to get in touch with a local member of parliament, etc. So just a lot of bureaucracy that I shouldn't be managing. While this entire request of data sharing is being worked on, the time for us to receive and analyze this data is running out. We are waiting only on a single hospital's data, which is ready to be sent to us, but only via an appropriate channel. So I've had enough. I find out from the health ministry email response while working on getting the hospital to buy the data sharing system that the data can also be shared practically. Specifically, if I was to take a USB with me to get the data physically at the hospital and also return the output to the hospital the same way, this practical data sharing capability is deemed entirely safe. And that's what I started to do. Every Monday, I drive 30 minutes to the hospital at 11 a.m., go to their admin team to retrieve the data in my USB, and then drive back to my work reaching at 1 p.m. Then I go have lunch at 1 p.m. I repeat this same task again with our analytical output on Thursday. Our contract is to analyze the health data for the whole year. After doing this for three weeks, one of the upper management people, whose office is opposite my desk, starts to think that I've been taking a very long time for lunch from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. He comes to my desk and asks if everything is okay and why I was away from my desk for four hours. I tell him the whole story. He is not happy at all. The cost of that data sharing system is nothing compared to the cost of paying my salary while I physically collect the data every single time. He puts the accounts team into their place by finding out that they approve of this system verbally each time and then deny it every time after a few weeks. And literally that day, we have this system all purchased and then installed overnight. Although I do miss the bi-weekly travel while listening to music to only do a copy-paste of files into and out of a USB drive. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called P0D0. It says, I'm still stuck on the part where the secure alternative is letting you show up and plug up your own USB into the hospital computer. OP responded to this one and said, The USB stick belongs to the hospital. Because of the work we needed to do, they allowed a single person from our team to use the USB stick. I had to provide appropriate ID and sign their document to use the USB and return it once I no longer need it. And the USB return part was hilarious because they have set days once every few months where all external people who have hospital items but no longer need them must physically show up to return. We confirm that we are returning the item by signing another document. Items like medical equipment is sent to the cleaning room and the USB stick which I returned was broken with a hammer. I'm still kind of stuck on that one myself regardless of what their procedures were after they got the USB sticks back. I mean, once OP leaves there with that USB stick, they're responsible for all that data. That's a huge burden on OP especially if they happen to lose that USB for any reason. Could you imagine? I'm really surprised the hospital let that data leave on something mobile like that. But let's get back to the part where they smash it with a hammer because you might be surprised how hard it is to destroy electronic devices. On a USB stick, that information is stored on a very little silicon chip. 
and you need to destroy that chip completely, like burning it, incinerating it, whatever, but a hammer will not do that. Some of that data will still be recoverable. And I'm amazed that using a hammer is their solution at a brand new hospital. That is dumb. All right, our first story today comes to us from Lateralis, Railroad Malicious Compliance. All aboard, let's jump right in. The following I posted as a reply in a thread about railroad workers not being able to strike. Not very familiar with this subreddit, but hopefully you all enjoy. For reference, I am a US Federal Railroad Administration certified conductor and engineer who used to work for a major railroad, union, you know, ending my career in 2018. We weren't allowed to strike, so instead of striking, we could and often did utilize the 40,000 plus rules that all contradict each other for some very sweet, malicious compliance. Story time. John is a great guy, never calls off, been with the company over 20 years. He knows his job well and often will take the time to train eh, newer switchmen, brakemen, and conductors. He is very personable and just a generally easy guy to talk with. He was also our union rep for a long time until his wife became ill, so he resigned from those duties. One day, I heard a manager yelling at him because he was late to a scheduled train during what I would call a pretty major storm. This is the Pacific Northwest, snow, hail, and rain coming down on very graded terrain. Manager tells him that when he gets to his destination, he is going to personally meet him there to counsel him. I hear John utter the words, you'll be waiting a while. Now, to understand this piece of track, you have to understand it is very mountainous, and at a single point drops down to a single line of rail between two major intersections of track. Very busy, but due to the grade, only a single train can do it at once. This area is also very difficult to do maintenance on in good weather, since it requires essentially off-roading mountain roads with steep cliffs and areas that aren't otherwise easily manageable, nevertheless during this icy storm. John hops in his scheduled train, train takes off, my engineer walks in from outside, and had spoken with John beforehand, they were good friends, like Sunday barbecue with each other's families on the regular friends. He tells me to put my paperwork down, that we aren't going to be going anywhere, kick my feet up, and enjoy getting paid for nothing all shift. A bit confused, he tells me to watch the line traffic monitor. Sure enough, John knew this choke point, set his train on it, blocking all transfers from most of the west coast, at least the northern portion of the US, Portland, Seattle, and Canada, and stated that due to worsening weather, visibility, and safety, that he would not move the train until it was safe to do so. Hit his 12 on duty, then waited another 4 for a ride. I was sent home after 2 hours of waiting, but could monitor from a phone app and my laptop. I calculated his pay for all this and the deadhead he had back to our station and it was close to a thousand dollar day for him. None of us complained, we got paid regardless of the train status, and he was in fact following the company and the FRA's rules, which are very strict about safety. OP added a really somber edit at the end, it says John passed away last year due to cancer, but that stretch of track is now referred to as John's Pass. Down in the comment section below, a user called CoderJoe1 asked OP, Epic, any fallout? OP responded with, none, it's a safety issue. Company knows the FRA would start nailing their coffin if they tried to counsel or do anything about it. Company itself is also very big on safety, so it would harm them in the long term. John knew all of this and really stuck it to them in a place they had no recourse other than to wait, delay shipment, and get another crew the next day. If that next crew felt it was unsafe, they could also cite safety and sit there for their entire shift. Simple as. To add, John also gave the new crew overtime as they had to deadhead to the locomotive, so easily a two hour nap in the back of an SUV, easy money. John sounds like one of those guys who wouldn't take crap from anybody, especially somebody from higher up that's trying to make them do something that breaks the rules of the company they work for. Naming that pass after John is just the icing on the cake. It's a memorial that he definitely deserved. Our next story today comes to us from Ven Marcus. How much malicious compliance can I pack into one job? Maybe with some revenge, only one way to find out. <laughs> 
let's jump right in. This had happened several years ago now. I was working in IT on a contract to hire basis for a company that likes to ship things. Standard 60 day to hire full time contract. Another guy with the same deal started a week before me, relevant later. So we both put in our time and he gets converted to full time. Cool, sounds good. I'll be real soon as well. But wouldn't you know it, between when he went full time and me, there was a big management shakeup and they completely forgot to convert me to full time. I brought this up several times and they first played it off as we'll get around to it, which then moved to you need to work harder to get converted. Well, that's not what I was promised when I started working. So I asked if I can start putting in overtime then, as there was a hard no for contractors allowed to do overtime. They told me I needed to work for free to show that I was willing to be converted. That's a no from me, dog. First thing I did as soon as I got out of the meeting was emailing my contractor company and explained everything that was going on. They would back me 100% that if I charged any overtime to them and the company I was contracted to didn't pay it, they would be sued out of existence. I also asked if I can just work my 40 hours a week and call it a day because I'm meeting what was technically in the contract. They said that is fine as well. So here started my malicious compliance with no overtime, no on call, no extra effort. At 4 o'clock, the whole place could be on fire. I was nowhere to be found. I reached my hours for the day and week and was gone. So then we were all trained up on ITIL's practices and were supposed to follow them. I took care of third level support and an issue finally made it up to me. I fixed it and closed it out, sent it back to the help desk for them to call the customer and relay everything was fixed. This led to the help desk getting angry with me and complaining to my boss. So I asked I thought we were doing ITILs and first point of contact was to be the last point as well. He told me that no, we do not follow ITILs here, never mind the training we just did I guess. So I did what I do best. From that point on, I never updated or closed a ticket that was put into my name. I think I had hundreds of tickets racked up in my queue. See, I actually completed the work, but would never touch the ticket. I mean, why would I have to? There were no standards we followed. So for my final act around the start of December, my boss pulled me into his office and told me I might not have a job at the start of the new year. I shrugged and said, okay. I remained quiet, but later that day, I set up an interview with my friend at another company. This went on for three weeks, never said anything to the boss, but I had signed an offer and was starting my new job after New Year's. Last day before break, I casually came into the office and debanned my laptop. We were supposed to save off important material and reformat laptops when someone left. Oh darn, I missed the first part. Maybe if there was an actual process? About that time, my now ex-boss quickly comes into the room flustered. I just got a call from the contracting company. They said you don't work here anymore. You said I wouldn't have a job at the end of the year, so I got a different one. But we should have talked about this. Oh my gosh, where are all your automation scripts you wrote? On my laptop, I told him as I stood up and walked out. A month or two later, one of our old co-workers had died and I went to the funeral. My old ex-boss was there and he couldn't even look me in the eye. I also heard the guy they hired to replace me was getting furious because he had to go through all my open tickets and every time the customer would tell him that it's already been fixed. I think something that management doesn't realize sometimes is that they need the worker more than the worker needs them. There's other factories, there's other jobs, there's many other things that that person could be doing besides working in that role there. Places like this with management teams like I've just described, unfortunately, well, they still thrive because they're not just screwing the employees, they're usually screwing the customers too, and they make bank from it. Our next story today comes to us from KM Cauliflower. Karen demands I prove that I'm handicapped and immediately regrets it. Let's jump right in. For background, I, 20 female, have a genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos or EDS. Among other things, it causes my joints to be very weak, and so I have several subluxations, partial dislocations a day, mostly my shoulders, hips, and fingers. I would like to say that I do not recommend doing this. It caused me a lot of pain during and after this. I do not recommend hurting yourself to make a point to anyone, but I was feeling petty, 
and was not in the mood to be talked to in that way. So I was being a good little patient and going to the store to get my medications. My aunt drove me to the store. I can't drive due to seizures and my EDS. So we pull into a handicapped parking spot. I hang up my disabled pass on the back mirror and hop out of the car. And behind us, a typical Karen minivan pulls up and we hear the screeching mating call of a Karen. Excuse me. I already know what's going to go down. My aunt seems annoyed, but I turn around with a smile. Hi, can I help you? In her nasally voice, she says, You're not allowed to park there. I fake a confused look. Why not? She huffs loudly, Because you're not handicapped. You look just fine. My aunt is about to go off, but I give her a look that says, Let me handle this. I turn back to Karen and said, Ma'am, I am handicapped, but it's not obvious. Before Karen spoke, I knew what she was going to say and I started mentally preparing myself for what I was about to do. She smiles smugly and says, Prove it! I try to explain that it's not safe to prove it and I try to explain what I have, but she keeps demanding proof. I'm already exhausted and her voice and attitude made it even worse and pissed me off. So I look her right in the eyes and grab my hip and pull it out of place with a sickening pop and crack. I smile to hide the look of pain on my face. I park close so stuff like this has a lower chance of happening. Karen looks like she's going to faint, vomit, or both. I then move my shoulder out of place with the same sickening pop and crack. Karen stumbles back and the disgusted and fearful look in her eyes made it so, so, so worth it. Okay, okay, I get it, stop, that's actually so gross. While dry heaving, she runs back into her car and speeds off. My aunt quickly helps me into the car so I can put them back in place. My aunt then leaves me in the car and gets my meds, but also gets me my favorite ice cream. After we get home, she gets me situated in bed where I eat my ice cream. My aunt says she's proud because I put Karen in her place, but to never do that again. 100% worth it, but also hurt a lot. And again, I do not recommend hurting yourself to make a point. OP added a really quick edit at the bottom. It says, I'm doing well, and fortunately, I recover from dislocations quickly, and I'm doing as well as I can be for my situation. Okay, this is honestly none of Karen's business. I don't know why OP would even go through popping a joint out to show Karen what the problem was. I think the only real way to deal with a situation like this is to look her right in the eyes, that Karen, look her right in the eyes and say, are you my doctor? No? Then mind your own fucking business. I don't curse very often here on KCC. I try to keep it as family friendly as possible, but a Karen like this just honestly pisses me off. This is the worst type of Karen. Our next story today comes to us from Spoil Tees. I need a degree to get promoted? Fine, I'll leave to go get one. Let's jump right in. While I was a college student in the 80s, I accepted a job as a second shift computer operator at a large regional bank. The job duties were processing all the checks and payments, printing statements and checks, running all the backups, and so on. On the day I showed up for the job, I learned that I wasn't getting that job but a lower one which physically loaded the check readers, loaded printer paper, signed checks, burst forms, and so on. The lead computer operator had apparently threatened to quit if they didn't promote internally and give the job to one of the current people in the position I just ended up in. They later got married, so you can probably figure out her actual motive, but the department manager, Mr. Biggs, my boss's boss, told me that I would be promoted to computer operator as soon as anyone left the position. You guessed it, two years later, no one has left the position, and we acquired another regional bank. Our CEO told the CEO of the acquired bank that no employees would be fired. So, suddenly, we had an extra computer operator on every shift. But Mr. Biggs insisted I'd still get promoted because he knew I was the most computer literate employee he had something he used to his advantage in numerous side projects, which should have been paid at a much higher rate. Six months later, one of the computer operators finally transferred to the programming department. I asked Mr. Biggs to promote me to the position, and he told me he was working on it. 
A few months later, he finally tells me that they still have too many computer operators because of the acquisition and I wouldn't be promoted until more of them left. Clearly, this wasn't working. So a few months later, another position opens in the programming department and I apply for it. Mr. Big signed the form, allowing me to apply and wished me luck. The interviews went well and programming wanted to hire me, but a few days later, the computer operator who transferred there told me, privately, that Mr. Biggs went to the head of programming and asked him not to consider me for the position because I was his best employee and he couldn't afford to lose me. The head of programming told him, no, I'm going to hire the best person for the job. The next morning, the HR director calls me to say that one of the executive vice presidents wants to interview me for the position. She's flabbergasted because he's never asked to interview anyone of that level and couldn't explain why he wanted to now. After the interview, the HR director called me, apologized profusely, and told me they were giving the position to another candidate because he had a college degree. No, it wasn't related to the position in any way. The degree was from an unaccredited college which had actually asked me to teach computer courses there, which I'd turned down. Of course, I knew what had really happened, so I told the HR director that I hadn't realized how important a degree was and that I would immediately switch to part-time instead of full-time so I could take more hours of classes to finish my degree more quickly. There are no part-time positions in Mr. Big's department, so it meant transferring to the department run by his biggest competitor within the company. She transferred me immediately at the same pay I was making in the previous department and I never worked for Mr. Biggs again. Ah yes, another important thing to learn about the corporate world, if you are irreplaceable, you're also unpromotable. In this situation, I'm not sure how OP would even get out of that other than finding another job somewhere else because they don't have the authority to bring somebody else on and make sure that that somebody else knows how to do their job so there's not a big gaping hole if they move up to a different position in the company. It's just a no-win situation for OP in that case, unless they leave the company and move to greener pastures. All right, our first story today comes to us from Kinkar66, pissing off the base commander. Let's jump right in. When I was 20, I got drafted into the army. I live in the Netherlands and this happened in the 80s. I got trained to be an ambulance driver, two months of general training and how to drive a Land Rover, and two months of medical training. After that, I was ready to take on any medical emergency that came my way. After my training, I got placed in a staff support platoon, a mismatch of different roles that are there to support the higher army staff in whatever they need. Make coffee, admin, drive them around, tech support, etc, etc. I was their ambulance driver. I was probably helpful when we were at war, but they had no use for me during peacetime. After I got settled on the base where I got stationed, I was called in by my lieutenant, telling me I had been volunteered to work at the small local military post on our base. I was okay with it as it gave me something to do during the time I had to serve in the army. It was a small post with a clinic, one permanent doctor, and one drafted right out of medical school, and several other grunts like me. Downstairs was our clinic and a few rooms to treat patients. Upstairs, about 12 beds for patients who were sick, but not bad enough that they had to go to a real hospital. We worked at the clinic and took care of the patients upstairs. And maybe two to three times a week, I had to pull out with the ambulance we used. More often than not for a planned trip to transport a patient to or from an actual hospital. I started with the rank of soldier and I was expected to end my one year career at the rank of corporal. As you can imagine from the title, that never happened. I did not hate working at the post. On the contrary, I actually felt I did something useful. And while I was stationed at the post, I learned many practical medical skills, having other soldiers to practice on. But it was a waste of my time. I wanted to start my career in IT, and this was holding me back. I also did not care much about the hierarchy or ranks. I respected my fellow army men and women for who they were, their actions, and how they treated others, not by the number of bars, stars, or stripes. And being an actual medic on our base, I got away with that. We had no roll calls, and I slept in a two-person bedroom instead of the 12-person one my platoon mates had to use. No inspections, no military training, and wearing white instead of green. Anyways, to the malicious compliant. I was tending to a patient at the clinic, 
he and his buddy had walked into a door, their words, and it had a glass window that shattered and cut them both up. One pretty bad, and he was treated by our doctor in one of the rooms, as he needed quite a few stitches. I had to stay in the clinic, and as the other soldier only had minor cuts, I treated him on the spot, as no other medical staff was available at that time. The slightly larger cuts I glued shut. For others, a band-aid would suffice. He was sitting in one of the chairs, and I was on one knee in front of him, taking care of a cut on his leg, as I heard somebody walk into the clinic without looking up as I was holding a glued cut together with my fingers until it had set, I politely asked to please have a seat and that I would be right there. Do you know who I am? I'm the base commander, Colonel so-and-so. Yes, he actually said that. I can still hear it in my head 35 years later. His booming, indignant voice, full of air of how important he was. I was not impressed at all, mostly annoyed by his attitude and told him, Congratulations, please have a seat and I will get to you once I finish treating the cut I was working on. That was not what he wanted to hear and he started chewing me out. Finally, I was done with the cut, let go of my fingers and got up. Ignoring his barrage, I asked him how I could help. I need to speak to the doctor, I have an appointment. Okay, not an emergency. I explained to the colonel that the doctor was treating a patient who needed urgent medical attention and that he will have to wait till the doctor finished his treatment. He has none of it and tells me he does not have the time to wait. Then he orders me to tell the doctor that his 3 p.m. appointment is waiting for him. I knew the doctor would drop everything and be running to the colonel if he got wind of who it was that was waiting for him. He did not have much of a spine and his career was primarily based on the colonel's input and assessment of him. But the colonel had given me an order, and I had to do it. So I went to the treatment room and put my head in. The doctor was busy stitching up the more injured soldier, and I complied with the colonel's order. Doctor, your 3 p.m. appointment has arrived. The doctor, not realizing or remembering who the 3 p.m. appointment was, told me irritably to have the patient wait till he finished, and that it could be another 5 to 10 minutes. He repeated what he had told me several times before to only disturb him for emergencies. I go back to the colonel and tell him that the doctor is still busy treating the patient and would be available in about 10 minutes. The colonel was not happy and told me to go get the doctor now. I told the colonel I had explicit instructions to only disturb the doctor in case of an emergency and that his appointment was not an emergency, he would have to wait. He grumbled but, in the end, sat down till the doctor arrived, and he started berating the doctor about how precious his time was, and how he had made him wait. The doctor apologized and almost groveled as they moved into the doctor's office. I had to go upstairs for something, and the colonel had already left after I got down. I did get a good ear washing from the doctor, telling me I should have mentioned to him that it was the colonel who was waiting for him. I argue that it should not matter who was waiting if he was treating a patient who was bleeding all over the place, and that he told me himself that he could only be disturbed for emergencies. I never got that promotion to corporal or even soldier first class, still worth it. Down in the comment section for this one, there's one from a user called Knight Otter. It says, no matter how low their rank, a medic treating a patient outranks any officer, unless they are there to tell you there's someone who is even more injured or ill. OP responded to this comment and said, That is probably why I never officially got reprimanded, though it was more that I morally felt in the right than caring about official rules. I was 20, and he thought he could bully me because of his rank. Not happening. You know that colonel is one of those people that takes that same attitude in their civilian life as well as their military life. He's one of those people that has his head so far up his own butt that he could lick his nostrils clean from the inside. And you definitely know if he's married, his wife is one of those people that wears his rank like a badge of honor. <laughs> Can you tell I live in a military town? Anyway. Our next story today comes to us from Sado Sun. Why yes, I'd love to convert a 10 minute task into a 3 day project. Let's jump right in. Alrighty lads, this has been a chuckle in my team and I think enough time has passed for me to finally post it. I work in the events department for a large company. Projectors, microphones, computers, etc. If it's required for an event, then we handle it and it probably passes through my workflow for helping to organize. My department also handles catering for events. While it's not my team specifically, we work side by side. 
the associate director runs the catering and event coordinators. My manager only runs the AV side and doesn't report to the associate director. Don't ask, it's a messed up organizational chart that nobody can make sense of. Despite not being specifically part of my job description, I also do the technical side of getting new staff members online within our system, getting their staff account created, and also getting Teams and OneDrive online on their mobile so they can see all their paperwork. And the reason why I am happy to do this is because with the catering team being a revolving door of staff, normal in my industry, getting them online needs to be done immediately and fast. You can go to the greater IT team to do this, but you can be waiting days for them to get it done. Whereas I can do it within 5 to 10 minutes with them, and staff that aren't online on our system can't work. HS forms are part of this setup, therefore they wouldn't be able to complete the assigned shift, and IT won't touch the request until they show up for their first shift, at which point you then wait days for them to get onto it. See the flawed logic here? Note, setting up a new account also involves setting up their personal work email, group email access, system permissions access, and to a limited extent, their access card swipe permissions. Normally, this would be done by the security team, but 10 years at a company really comes with its perks of being connected to the right people. And when you want to get something like this done fast, it's often easier for one person with permissions to do it as opposed to multiple people in their own workflows. Second note, if you're asking why a rotating door of catering staff needed personal work emails and group work emails, this account setup is supposed to encompass more than just them. Alright, enough setup, on to the story. Recently, my boss has thrown another bout of trying to micromanage the heck out of my team. We all hate it, but I guess we can just ride this wave out again. The associate director asked me to go to one of our other offices on the other side of the city to set up a group of new staff in one large batch order. My own manager looked at the request, got one of those time for some micromanagement shenanigans faces. Hey boss, associate director wants me to go to the other office to set up some new staff in the system next week on Friday. Uh, nope. I need you here in case something happens, OP. Very busy day on that day. There's nothing on the roster for that day, and I'd still be available remotely. Just write the associate director a document about how to get people set up in the system, and he can do it himself. Uh, are you sure? I do it fast because I'm trained on the system, and he doesn't. Including travel, I'd only be gone for about 3-4 to four hours. Writing the document on how to get someone set up in the system would take much longer. Write the document and put everything he needs to know in it. It only needs to be what? Half a page? Can't be that hard. Everything? Alright. Cue malicious compliance. What my boss expected was a half page instruction manual on getting a new account created within the system. I don't think I could have kept it that short even if I tried. What followed was a three day project writing out the instruction manual for how to get someone set up in the system which comprised of 34 pages, not half a page. Large portions of it are troubleshooting steps, accounting for different models of phones, and likely fixes when they do weird things. iPhones are great because they work. The infinite variations of Android phones can sometimes throw up strange errors either on the system or within the phone itself. Most of the information in here was collective knowledge I'd built up over the years, as well as who else to phone in IT for the most outrageous issues that had to be resolved that I didn't have permissions for, and who could generally do it immediately. I warned the associate director that this was going to be a very large technical manual, and he should probably read it before heading to the other office. Isn't it half a page? My boss said to put everything in it. Oh no. What followed was the associate director attempting to take somewhere between 10 to 20 people through this very technically written manual about getting someone set up in the system. To anyone not technically inclined, it could have all been in a different language for all they could understand it. After 30 minutes, he called me, put me on speakerphone and camera to the new staff and said, just do it. Sitting at my computer, I spent the next 40 minutes getting everyone online. Technical support over a phone can be straining, you all know what I mean. And they were fine to start their ships. Finally, the associate director asks me something in private afterwards. OP, did it need to be this complicated? Actually, I summarized some sections to make it easier. Didn't want to make it difficult for you. Wasn't the intention. 
but my boss told me to write down everything, so I did. Good to know, thanks. Following the weekend, I was notified that when I was requested to go get a new staff member set up, I should find a time that I am available to go and do it, irrespective of other tasks. Not sure what happened up top, but I think my boss got a very heavy smack for it. OP, destroy that manual as quickly as you can. Make sure nobody else has copies of that because you've just told them how to do your job. Yeah, it's 34 pages long, but somebody else could learn that very quickly. If you're getting up higher in the pay scale, your job could be in jeopardy now. Mind you, you did say this was only a small part of what you do, so I could be completely wrong on that, but I just don't think that there should be a full manual of exactly what somebody does in their workplace, because unfortunately that full manual makes you expendable. Our last story today comes to us from Intrepid She. They refused me an office, I complied, they regretted it. Let's jump right in. I got my first grown up job while I was finishing my bachelor's degree. I was just getting started in a highly technical and emerging field. Very few people back then were doing this kind of work, and I seemed to have an aptitude for it, which is probably why I got a job before I had any credentials. The department I was hired for was brand new and had the potential to take customers from other departments while also generating new business. Interestingly, the other departments had been offered the opportunity to start the service themselves but refused, even actively trying to prevent it from happening. That's the reason I ended up in a malicious compliance situation. The leaders of all the other departments conspired to prevent me from getting an office. I didn't understand it at first because at that age I didn't imagine professionals did petty, immature things. When I realized what was happening, I knew they'd get exposed if I went along with it. So I happily did my job wherever I could find a place, which often ended up being in the mailroom where lots of people would notice. I hope maybe the leaders would start to feel guilty or annoyed and change their minds, or they'd be caught by their bosses. Either way, problem solved for me without a fight. Little did I know how well it would go. I started to be well liked by a lot of the leaders because I helped them with their computers. There was one leader who still inexplicably hated me. I never spoke with him, not even one word, but he continued to insist I did not need an office. I wasn't even the level of a secretary, according to him, which I took to be a dig at my lack of a degree. I heard about him saying that from a friend who was in the meeting when they talked about changing their minds. It's too bad for them they didn't change their minds because the president came through the mailroom multiple times and finally stopped clearly annoyed. Why don't you work in your office? That was my golden moment. I had complied politely with not having an office. I sweetly told the president, I don't have an office. What? Why not? There isn't room, no space available. According to whom? Mr. So-and-so. But you've been working here for what, three months? They could have found a space for you by now. Ooh, the president was beat red at that point. I just smiled and said, my understanding is there is no space. The president literally stomped upstairs to the offices of Mr. So-and-so. I distinctly heard the yelling from downstairs. People outside probably heard it. The president came and brought me upstairs to the conference room where the leaders were all seated looking down. There was a pile of keys on the table. I was afraid at that point. Was she having me pick someone's office to take? While that might have been sweet revenge, it wouldn't have been good for my working relationships with any of them. But no, she handed me a key to the conference room and said, this is your office. She scooped up the rest of the keys, which I learned later were all their copies of the key to the conference room, and said, your office is the largest office on campus, even bigger than mine, enjoy, and she walked out. That was probably the best mic drop moment I've ever seen in my life, and the story ends with my compliance not only winning me that office, but all the other leaders, except Mr. So-and-so, becoming great colleagues. OP added an edit follow-up onto this story. It says, I mentioned in the comments that there was another chapter to this story that I guess sort of puts a bow on it. One sunny day, about six months later, Mr. So-and-so passed me on the stairs outside the building. I was leaving and said good morning to him. We were the only two people, or so I thought. I wouldn't pass by a coworker like that without a polite greeting. 
I was in my office quietly analyzing some data about an hour later when once again a furiously red-faced president stormed into my office. I swear she was 12 feet tall in her anger. She demanded, what is going on between you and Mr. So-and-so? My heart was racing at probably 150 beats per minute and I couldn't comprehend her question. What do you mean? What's going on? I have no idea what you're talking about. I started to imagine she was accusing me of having a relationship with the man and just, ew. She said she wanted to know why he just said what he said about me. I was flummoxed. I'm sorry, I still have no idea what you're talking about. I never have more than a greeting to say good morning worth of conversation with Mr. So-and-so. I can't think of anything whatsoever he would have to say about me. She told me that my sibling had just burst into her office raging about Mr. So-and-so. Turns out when I walked by him and continued on, the next person he encountered was my sibling, but he did not know that. We both worked for the same company, but I was married and we had different last names. If he bothered to get to know me at all, he would have known that. He walked right up to my sibling and said, there goes a bee with her head up her butt. He assumed, I guess, that everyone else hated me too. He barely knew my brother, but felt comfortable saying that. So my brother walked right into the president's office, interrupting a meeting and repeated what Mr. So-and-so said. The president assumed I was aware, but my brother hadn't gotten to me yet, and I didn't realize just how much Mr. So-and-so hated me. I told the president I genuinely didn't believe it was really about me. It couldn't be because we never spoke. It had to be about what I represented, which was a major change to the organization. She walked to his office, then more yelling ensued. Pretty soon, they were back in my office. He apologized, and I repeated what I told the president, that I didn't believe it was really about me. Mr. So-and-so agreed. Later on, I had a project with him, and he started to trust me. We ended up being able to work together with no further issues. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Bartronicon. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be calling any of them leaders. Leadership and management are two very different things. OP responded and said, right? Such a great point. Unfortunately, in the corporate world, a lot of people get moved up into positions that they're really not ready for just because they've been with a company for a very long time and people higher up think, well, we need to promote somebody. So let's put this person who's doing a great job in their current role into that one because they can handle it, right? yet they have no idea that that person can't manage a broom closet. Also just wanted to mention that when OP said, I didn't imagine professionals did petty immature things. <laughs> the first time I read that, I actually laughed out loud. The corporate world is all petty. All right, our first story today comes to us from Obsidian Winter. Don't deviate from the flow chart? Okay, if you insist, let's jump right in. About a decade ago, I had the misfortune of working in a call center for a company which provided phone, broadband, and satellite TV channels. This was the days before fiber, so the setup was slightly different from what you see these days. To begin with, I worked in customer services doing things like booking pay-per-views, changing billing dates, and upgrading packages. After a year or so, the powers that be decided the whole call center would be trained on phone and broadband tech support, and we would take those calls instead. Lots of people complained because they weren't technically minded and found the idea of fixing tech issues daunting. I was not worried because I was a massive nerd and was building my own computers from age 12. My dad started teaching me when I was about 8. This new type of call sounded much more interesting and I was looking forward to it. The staff were told, don't worry, we will train you, it's simple really. To be fair to them, they were right, kind of. For those who don't know, the original internet connection dial-up was an issue because the phone line was totally used up by the internet connection, meaning you couldn't make calls at the same time as using your glacier-like connection. Broadband revolutionized this system because it allowed both phone and internet to be used at the same time, and it improved the connection speed to allow for more data to be transferred. Think of dial-up as a country road, slow speeds, and only one kind of traffic at a time, or you end up with a massive queue of cars, lorries, and tractors clogging the road with no filtering space for motorbikes. Broadband is the equivalent of a dual carriageway. Two lanes of traffic in each direction means you can get more traffic into your city at higher speeds. 
The issue with more traffic is that you need to add more road signs to direct it to the correct destination. Phone signals to the phone, broadband signals to the router. To do this, you need to have a microfilter as the first thing plugged in to every single phone port in use in the house. The TV installation, which happened first, did not include a microfilter, and customers would assume the TV installation wouldn't need to be messed with, so they didn't add one when they set up the router. The number one complaint on the tech support line was caused by that filter being missing. It resulted in slow or intermittent broadband connections and static on phone lines and drop calls. People would phone up and scream at me because the connection was fine to start with, but the phone line has always been bad and now the connection keeps dropping. As I mentioned, most of the staff were upset at being moved from a customer service role to a tech role, so the higher-ups had a troubleshooting system created. It was basically a glorified flowchart with a pretty interface. The issue is that whoever created it didn't think it through. No matter where the problem was with the tech issue, the chances were that the customer would need to be calling on a mobile phone so that the right steps could be followed. Most customers did not call on mobiles because in those days, calls from mobile phones were expensive. Even calls to landlines and especially calls to 0845 numbers like call centers. This information was missing from the flowchart and it meant that if the customer tried to change the way their equipment was connected or if we ran a line test, it would result in the call dropping because they were disconnecting their landline handset or we were stopping all signals down the line for a couple of minutes to do the test. It was assumed that we would call our customer back if this happened, because it was impressed into us that the point was to resolve the tech issue. If the customer has to keep calling back and speaking to different people, then it slowed this process down. The flowchart did not say, call your customer back. The thing with me being kind of techy was that I could usually identify the fault in the first minute of the call based on the symptoms described by the customer and I seem to have a knack for being able to explain tech issues using accessible language, so the customer understands what is happening without feeling condescended to. This meant that my calls were shorter, more efficient, and my customer satisfaction survey results CSATs, were high. What's not to like? Well, you know how I mentioned that the powers that be decided to take non-techy people and put them in a tech role? It went about as well as you would expect. The flowchart worked to a point, but people who had no tech knowledge tried to cut corners, and it resulted in problems. Free replacement routers were issued for external line fault problems, which is like replacing the roundabout on an interchange when the problem is a tree on the road 10 miles from there. Engineers were sent to resolve external faults caused by dead master phone sockets, about as useful as doing roadworks the next town over in an attempt to get more traffic through a flooded slip road at your town's boundary. Repeat calls were up, resolutions were down, customer satisfaction was low for the call center as a whole. There were about 20 of us who were doing well because, of course, I wasn't the only nerd in the call center. We used our common sense and tech know-how to get results, and my team of about 15 was around 50% tech nerd. Our manager loved it because we had the best results of the whole call center, and she looked amazing, despite being a Luddite herself. Head office kept trying to get the rest of the call center up to our level. They couldn't figure out why people hired to be glorified phone concierges couldn't fix the phone lines. Obviously, the problem must be the staff. Word was issued from on high, thou shalt not deviate from the flowchart. I foolishly thought that they only meant the people with CSATs which were through the floor. I thought the people who knew what we were talking about would be left to it. Slowly but surely, the rest of the call center scores started climbing out of the toilet. Our team was still constantly the highest, but the gap wasn't so embarrassingly massive anymore. Others were resisting using the flowchart. People at the peak of Mount Stupid on the Dunning-Kruger graph fought the idea that they didn't know enough to act without the dubious support of the admittedly quite bad flowchart. Upper management started thinking of ways to make them use it. A new score was added to our stats, adherence to process. Quality control started failing our work if we deviated from the flowchart. My manager started writing me and the others up for it. We tried to explain that the flowchart worked for the people who didn't know how computers actually worked because it methodically went through every possibility over the course of about an hour and a half. 
if you don't know where the fault is, then eventually you will stumble over the right fix. But when you have some knowledge and can tell within the first five seconds that Mr. Smith has accidentally turned off his wireless card, surely it's better customer service to jump right to that? Apparently not. She said that if we deviated from the flowchart again, she would start the disciplinary process, which always and without exception resulted in the person being fired sooner or later. Okay then, no more using our brains. All of us stopped using our prior knowledge to fix the faults quickly. I stopped explaining the issues to the clients. We literally just read the flowchart instructions in all their mind-numbing and typoed glory. I also stopped calling customers back when the line dropped due to flaws in the flowchart. Every time this happened, I would leave a note on the client's profile, line dropped when doing X test. I have been told to never deviate from the flowchart or I will be taken to disciplinary stage. There is no instruction to say I can call my customer back, so I didn't. If customer calls back in, test result was Y. One of my colleagues delighted in telling his customers, yes, I know exactly what the problem is and it will only take five minutes to fix, but first I'm required to do these other tests. It will take about 40 minutes to get to the point where I am allowed to fix your issue. Why? Well, manager has threatened me with unemployment if I use my brain. So I have to go down the list here and it will take 40 minutes to get to the one that I know will resolve your problem. Suddenly, our team was at the bottom of the CSAT board. Our repeat calls were through the roof. We were the worst performing team in the call center. Our manager was being questioned by upper management about why our scores had plummeted. The head office was going to take us off tech and put us onto debt management lines if we didn't start getting our score back up to where it was. Obviously, that didn't happen. Most of the techie people left the business. I stuck it out long enough to see the tech role removed and the debt lines instated. Just before I started my new job with my current employer, head office sent out their annual feedback survey. I ripped them a new one in brutal feedback. From the micromanaging to inappropriate staff roles for the people hired, to predatory upselling to vulnerable customers and unethical debt management practices. I heard that some of the managers were fired, so it seems other people spoke out too, and there were some top-down changes which fixed some of the superficial issues. Oh, and that terrible flowchart, they prettied it up, added the fiber options, and put it on their website so that people with mobile data can fix their own broadband issues. At least they got rid of the typos first. This is one of those stories where you can really tell that OP works in the job that they're talking about because they were very good at taking all of these technological things that were happening and dumbing them down for the readers like me who may not understand all that techy stuff. Also, most of you know that I've worked in many different jobs and, well, eight of them happen to be different call centers. <laughs> and I can tell you that what OP is describing here unfortunately isn't just something that happens in the call center that they worked in, it happens in a lot of them. Usually, one hand doesn't know what the other one's doing. You know, sometime I need to write the story about how my whole team was fired from the call center for doing something that our team lead told us to do over and over and over again, and was backed up by the site director as well. <laughs> yeah, we were all walked out, including the team lead and the site director. But that's a story for another day. Our next story today comes to us from a deleted account. Karen Boss desperately needed my uniform back the next day? No excuses. Let's jump right in. Okay, so a little backstory first. I am a 20-year-old college student full-time and doing 23 plus hours a week on top of classes to make ends meet. I live paycheck to paycheck and have a car I am and was paying off. I used to work at McDonald's in my hometown, but since I moved to live on campus, which was 45 minutes away from my old job, and I wasn't willing to make the commute, so I decided to apply and got accepted to a small sandwich shop 10 minutes from my college, which was a blessing. It started out great, plenty of hours, easy work, fast days, till the old manager decided to switch stores. The new manager was one of the biggest Karens you have ever met. Like bad, and when I say bad, I really mean it. She completely changed the procedures and made things so much worse. And when I'd have to stay over, sometimes two to three hours after closing, she'd burst in the next day yelling and screaming at the top of her lungs, Stop staying later! You have to be out by 8.30! We won't pay you for any time past then! I had no choice, 
because the list she gave me to do to close the store alone every night, may I add, was extremely time consuming, especially with no help. I was expected to stop serving at 8 and do 5 people's worth of work in 30 minutes. It simply wasn't doable. Hearing I wasn't going to be paid for time I worked, time I spent making sure everything was done on the list before I left, otherwise I'd be fired for not doing all of it would go unpaid, as well as I'd be fired if I stayed longer than 8.30. There was no winning. On top of that, the moment management switched, they decided they were giving people too many hours and cut me to only three hours a week. That went on for four weeks till I decided enough was enough. $45 work weeks wasn't even worth putting in the time and effort to even show up. So on one of my weekends, I was with my parents off campus. I was due to work that day. Three hours, of course, my only day that week. I was shopping near said sandwich shop. It's located inside a Walmart. My mom and I were discussing for the last week how I should just quit since it seems they're trying to fire me without saying they're firing me and wanting me to leave on my own so they wouldn't need to fill out paperwork. Right then and there, I decided, know what? F this job and F my entitled Karen boss. I sent her a text that I quit on the spot and do not expect me to come in that night for my shift. She texts me back ranting about how, since I'm not giving her a two-week notice, I'll never be able to work at one of those sandwich shops again. At that point, I didn't care. I already had to give up my brand new car of only four months because I couldn't pay my loan and insurance. It was a nice car too, a white shimmery 2016 Hyundai Sonata. I loved that thing. I told her at some point that week I'd try to get the brand new uniform that funnily enough they had just gave to me the week prior, a whole three and a half months after I started working there. But I warned her my classes run till right before closing and I didn't know when I'd be able to do so. She texts back in what I could only imagine was the snarkiest tone possible. No, I really need that uniform back tomorrow. I told her I'm sorry, but that may not be possible due to my school schedule, and I'm not willing to ditch a class to drop off a few pieces of clothing. She said, no, you'll bring it back tomorrow. Don't even try to lie to me. You were seen in store the day you quit. No excuses. Okay, then. She said no excuses. I didn't want to go into an argument with her over it, and knowing she herself would be closing that day, and my classes ended at 8 exactly, I happily complied. I made sure I'd arrive right as she was closing the lock on the gate. I was bringing the clothes in my reusable shopping bag. I had no throwaway bags, and since she can't take and claim my bag as her own, I was just going to give her the clothes one piece at a time. Knowing she would have to carry them out of the store, juggling them back home made me happy. When it came time to deliver my uniform to her, all the stars seemed to align perfectly. I arrived at 8.30, caught her on the way out with the outfit not even in a reusable bag to begin with. As a touch of sweet, unplanned irony, it was raining outside. Hard rain. The sidewalks, I guess, were extra slippery and muddy, because on my way in, I slipped and landed chest first into the mud. I was mostly spared, though because the clothes were there to break my fall and absorb most of the filth. Dropping off the muddy, loose clothes, seeing her reaction, watching her stomp her feet, wrench in disgust, holding the clothes 10 feet away from her body, huff and puff, marching out of the store in pure shock and disbelief. She didn't even have words for me. It was the sweetest revenge I had ever seen. This did mean I had to buy a whole new set of clothes and change in the Walmart bathroom, but it was all worth it to see her reaction in the end. After I had returned to my dorm that evening, I sent her a text saying simply, enjoy, and blocked her number. Safe to say, karma really did pay out on my end. A bunch of people in the comment section for this one made sure that OP knew that this seemed like a constructive dismissal case because they were cut down to three hours a week. They were trying to get OP to quit, that's for certain. Being cut down to three hours a week probably opens you up to being approved for EI as well, so that's something that OP should probably look into. Another thing I hope that OP takes away from this experience is that you can report a lot of things. You don't just sit back and take it. We have labor laws for a reason, and you can use them against terrible employers like this. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Zane the Raptor. Doing my job. Let's jump right in. Okay, I am really quite terrible at recounts, so I will try to keep this quite brief. 
Basically, I was working casually for a pizza chain, the one that you can't out pizza, and I had to call out for a shift to go to the hospital as I was the victim of some domestic issue and injured my arm. The managers were fine with it, although out of the four I spoke to, none of them asked if I was okay, but that's a different matter. I went to the hospital and the doctor looked at it and just put a band-aid over the wounds on my arm and said not to do any heavy lifting and use my arm as little as possible for a couple of days. I questioned whether he could just glue the wound or stitch it, but he refused. I have no idea why, it 100% needed to be glued, and my regular doctor said as much the same when I showed the injuries to him nearly two weeks later, as they still hadn't healed. But after I got to my house from the hospital, I rang my store manager and told him I would only be able to do light duties for a couple of weeks, knowing the doctor at the hospital was wrong, and he said that was not a problem and that he appreciated that I was still willing to work. Anyways, I went back to work two days after the injuries occurred. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have been going to work, but I needed money and wasn't going to have any otherwise. As soon as I got there, the manager, not the store manager, let's call them Tammy, told me I would be on dispatch, cutting and boxing all the pizzas and sides. I apologized and explained I wouldn't be able to do that, as the pans can get quite heavy, and the doctor had asked me not to use that arm. I also showed her the bandage I had wrapped my arm in. Tammy asked why I even came to work then, and I explained that I had told the store manager about my circumstances, and they had been happy for me to do light duties. Tammy rolled her eyes and told me to answer the phones and serve customers instead, which I was happy to do. We got quite busy and dishes started piling up, and Tammy told me to get on wash up. I reminded her of my arm and suggested it probably wasn't a good idea to put a fresh wound that was still bleeding slightly in water that was being used to clean dishes. Tammy rolled her eyes and said she was going to the office and she would be back in 20 minutes and that I had better have all the dishes done and put them away. I tried to explain that I wouldn't be able to lift the fresh out of the oven pans into the sink to wash, but she ignored me and said my arm couldn't be that bad or the doctor would have glued the wound or given me stitches and that she wanted the work done. Cue the malicious compliance. I started doing the dishes and was very careful to only lift an amount that I could handle with one hand, despite it not being very safe. 10 minutes later, Tammy yelled out that I wasn't moving fast enough and that I needed to use two hands. So I lifted up a larger pile that I could usually carry quite easily with two hands. But in this case, my arm went numb and I dropped them and in reflex tried to catch them, which completely busted the wounds open and blood started dripping everywhere. I quickly bandaged my arm again and cleaned up the blood, but one of the customers had started yelling that I needed help. Tammy came and told me to move out of her way. She then spent the rest of the night cleaning the dishes as the store manager had checked the cameras and seen me doing the dishes and told her they needed to be redone with clean water and I continued doing the light duties I'd been assigned, aside from a number of admin tasks that I normally did, which she for some reason refused to allow me to do. I found out later Tammy didn't go home until 1 a.m. and kept two other staff there to help her when we closed at 10 because she wasn't able to get her work, plus the work she refused to let me do, done on time. Sorry if this is poorly written or doesn't sound like the typical malicious compliance, I promise it was, I'm just really bad at recounts. Now, I do want to mention that right at the beginning of the story, OP mentioned that they went to the hospital because of a domestic issue. They were asked in the comments down below if they were okay and in a safe place now, and they responded that yes, it was a bit of a journey, but they are safe now. Going back to the part about the store manager here, I know they were okay with OP coming in to do light duties, even if the manager that was on duty wasn't, but you'd think that the store manager would have brought on another person at that time, scheduled another person to be there as well, knowing that OP wasn't going to be able to fully do their job. So it seems to me like there was a bit of an issue as far as the management is concerned, where they weren't prepared for this issue with OP even though OP gave them plenty of notice. But also, Tammy spent her time in the office and didn't really come out and help either, so maybe the store manager was thinking that Tammy would pick up the slack? I guess they were wrong. Our next story today comes to us from Wild Butterscotch 977 Oh, my paper isn't long enough? Okay, let's jump right in. 
Another post reminded me of my own little bit of malicious compliance back in college. This was more than a decade ago. So in my junior year, I was taking an art history class on medieval art and architecture. Partway through the course, the professor assigned a paper and the instructions were that the paper length was to be five to nine pages. I wrote my paper and it ended up being five pages. I said everything I felt was necessary to say in that amount of pages. When I got the paper back, I received an A-. Now, I'm not usually the type to complain about an A-, but in this case, I knew I wrote a strong paper. I was an art history major, and at this point was three years into my program. So I had a buttload of art history classes under my belt, and I effing knew when I produced a good art history paper. So I really wanted to hear why I got the minus instead of a straight A. I went to the professor's office hours to ask why he graded it as such. Yes, he was quite amused someone was complaining about an A minus. I didn't give an F. I wanted to know why he took off points and what he thought could have been improved. He hemmed and hawed for a few minutes because there wasn't anything wrong with my paper. And finally he said, well, it could have been longer. I said, the prompt said five to nine pages and I was within that range. He replied, it could have been longer. Okay, fine. Next paper that came around was the term research paper and this time the prompt said at least 15 pages. Q, malicious compliance. I worked my butt off writing this research paper and out of pure spite, I made this dude read no less than 29 effing pages about some stupid medieval church. Now, I had written papers this long before, and a year later when I wrote my honors thesis, it was nearly four times that length. But for this particular topic, I was really stretching it. The verbosity was a bit ridiculous. A week or two later, he returned the paper A plus grade. He handed to me and said with a genuine smile, it was great, I loved it. You should submit it for publication to a history journal. I begrudgingly submitted my maliciously compliant paper to the journal and it was accepted and published. Admittedly, I was probably the one that suffered the most from my own malicious compliance, but I didn't care and I'd do it again. Wow, malicious compliance that turns into a publishing credit that you can put on your CV? <laughs> that worked out in your favor. This story actually reminds me of way back when, when I first met my wife. We were both working in a call center and she was the quality lead who was sitting with me for a call. I didn't like selling on the phone, and she kept pushing to me that I needed to sell to this customer. I needed to sell to this customer. So I very sarcastically decided to mention it to the customer, and they bought it. So, yeah. <laughs> this next story comes to us from Bubbly Kitty 2425 my dad's cousin's ex. Let's jump right in. I was told this would be good here. Let me tell you a story. My dad's cousin, she's in her late 70s, early 80s. Well, she was married to a super high up of some big company. They had two kids, but had a wonderful prenup and it was ironclad. Where if they got divorced, she got nothing, but what was acquired during marriage, and he paid child support. If she cheated, she forfeits everything but child support. If he cheated, he had to pay her alimony and child support until she got remarried. No matter what she made, it was said that she got $5,000 a month alimony. After the kids were 18, her alimony went down to $2,500 if she still was unmarried. The man was loaded. Well, he cheated and she got proof. Actually, his boss caught him and liked her, so he told her even testified to it. Plus, he didn't deny it in court. He was having an affair with his young secretary. So she got alimony and child support. Well, years later, after she finished cosmetology school, she ended up opening her own hair salon in the South. She has a lot of customers in those upscaled assisted living facilities, so now she's also loaded. She drives a super cute red convertible Mercedes. Well, they divorced when she was 30. She still has never remarried. He's still paying alimony. She has a serious boyfriend for 30 years, but she said just to spite the ex, she will not remarry unless he dies. So he has been married four more times, but no matter what, because of his prenup, he insisted on, she still gets that $2,500 a month. Well, for at least 40 to 45 years so far, he's been paying. She said after what he did to her, making her give up her dreams and sign a prenup, 
she was going to make him pay. She did eventually go finish school and follow her dreams after the kids were grown. She's the nicest person too. His other wives got nowhere near that. He made sure his prenup granted them nothing but child support. Also, her boyfriend and her don't live together. They have been neighbors for years. They both want their own space. He also has his own money. She doesn't even need her ex's money and just puts it in an account for her grandkids' colleges. She also likes to donate some to a woman's shelter. She donates it in his name, so he gets notifications or notes that money was donated in his name. She says the day he dies, she and her boyfriend will go to the courthouse. Everyone in the family knows, and every time we see her, my father laughs and says, So, the ex still alive and paying? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If that's a registered charity, and she's making the donations in his name, isn't he able to claim a receipt for those and then have it taken off of his taxes? I mean, I'm pretty sure that's how it works where I live, but I'm not sure about where OP lives. If that's the case, OP might want to think about stopping doing that because they're not actually hurting him, they're actually helping him out. Because some of that money that he has to give her on a monthly basis, he's just able to write it off on his taxes. Our next story today comes to us from Diligent Cockroach 700. No pass, no entry. Let's jump right in. This happened quite a few years ago. I started a new job in IT support. After a couple of weeks training and orientation, I was put on my first early shift. IT support were always the first in the building to make sure all the systems were good before the working day started. So I was given my own key to the front door to unlock the building. The entrance had a kind of airlock system. The outer door was unlocked, but then there was another automatic door that needed a swipe card to open it. Everything was fine for the first few days, entered the building, got on with my work. Then, this particular morning as I unlocked the door, the head of HR walked up behind me. I recognized him as he had sat in on my job interview. I said, good morning, swiped my card and walked in. He followed me. As soon as we were in the building, he pulled me up and told me I shouldn't have let him in without him swiping his pass. His argument was that he might have been fired the day before, so might have been trespassing. The swipe card system was not used to monitor people's work hours or anything like that. I apologized profusely, and he said he'd let it go this time as I was new. Fast forward two weeks, I'm unlocking the door and a complete stranger walks up behind me and tried to follow me in. I turn round and ask him to use his pass. He says he has forgotten it. I say then I can't let you in. Then he drops the bombshell. But I'm the CEO. I apologize and say sorry. I only have your word for that. And I'm under strict instructions from the head of HR not to let anybody in without a pass on pain of disciplinary action. He got quite angry and said again he was the CEO. Later that day, I got a phone call from the head of HR. I thought he was going to bullock me, but instead, he said that I did the right thing and he was going to get the CEO to apologize to me. I did get a short email from the CEO to that effect later in the day. Yeah, OP, even if you knew who the CEO was and you'd been working there for a very long time, I think you could have gotten yourself in some deep doo-doo by letting them into the building. Your HR person was completely right in saying that, well, you don't know if they got fired the day before or not, and you could be letting in somebody who's coming in to make a big fuss or damage things or people, who knows? I mean, that CEO could have even been in cahoots with the HR person, and it could have been a test for you anyway, so that's another thing you gotta think about. This next story comes to us from Hooked on, um, adult phone stuff, yeah. Micromanaging 101. Let's jump right in. I am an amused bystander to this. I was working on a compliance project at the time. The practice had once consisted of a single compliance officer, but the company had grown and responsibilities had been split up into multiple departments. The person who had once run the entire practice alone was having a hard time handing off responsibilities to the newly created departments and would find petty ways to claw back control at any time. This person would also panic about investigations that could prove that previous work had not been done consistently, so would revise procedures, definitions, department requirements, etc. to suit whatever agenda happened to be at play. Sometimes this meant ignoring important things. Sometimes this meant filing unnecessary reports. Things changed on a weekly basis. 
For some unfathomable reason, this person was very concerned about in-person coverage. The entire department had worked remotely throughout COVID. All other departments continued to work remotely. This department had to be in the office, period. To make things worse, working hours were defined as 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. with a one-hour break. On multiple occasions, this person would complain, claiming someone had mentioned that the department was deserted before 5 p.m. on Fridays, the day before holidays, etc. Didn't matter that staff was working around 60 hours. Also didn't matter that there was nobody there to complain, as this was the only department on site. There were duties, which occasionally required someone to be on call until 6 or 7 p.m. On-call staffers suggested that the person responsible could start late on those days, but no, the workday starts at 8 a.m., no exceptions. The two hourly staffers took two to three hour lunch breaks so that they could still cover the required 8 a.m. start date, be available until 7 p.m., and still meet their no overtime requirements. The salary exempt staff wasn't having any of it though. Calls were no longer answered because staff was to work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and there was to be no flexibility regarding attendance. Staff got tired of this and mutually agreed to give this person exactly what they asked for. They started sending group texts of their work lock screens showing that they were at their desks at 8 a.m. They'd send texts showing that their computers had been locked at 5.01 p.m. I was briefly on this text chain and had to mute it due to the barrage of daily petty texts. The individual in question intended to mean that staff had to be there at least between those hours. Unpaid OT was totally reasonable, but there was to be no concession made to allow staff some flexibility in the way they split up their working hours. That couldn't be said for obvious reasons, so they harped on the 5pm minimum end to workdays. As you can imagine, this was followed by a wave of resignations. Over a six-month period, the department collapsed, leaving them with less staff than they had before the expansion. Great for us, we ended up winning a lucrative contract to manage and rebuild their entire practice. The staffer responsible for this great resignation was found to be incompetent after their work started to get reviewed independently. The sheer volume of missed issues became impossible to justify, and this person was eventually quietly replaced. A lot of companies over the course of COVID were forced to have their employees work from home, and then they realized, wow, we can actually do this and maybe save some money by not needing all the lights on in this big building we have to house all these people. But then there's always the ones that are stuck in the old times, and they don't think that anybody could work from home and be productive, that we all need to be stuck in one place together so we can all be watched over closely. Yep. Times are changing, bud. Get with it. All right, our first story today comes to us from A Horse Has No Name. Start using icebreakers to talk to customers to get them to buy stuff? You got it. Let's jump right in. This story is over a decade old, back when I was fresh out of college and dedicated to doing nothing important for as long as possible. I worked for an electronics store, a big one, and I lasted there for about 18 months before I realized I was wasting my time on garbage pay that I ended up blowing on games and movies. My manager, Bob, but not really, was a pretty decent guy, and I never had too many complaints about him, although he was wasted at that particular store because he was a pretty good manager. I could tell he was getting a lot of flack from the GM, Jim, but not really, because home theater, me, sales were stagnant, clarification good, but not growing, and not hitting our ridiculous quotas. I worked in the mornings until afternoons when there were maybe 10 people visiting the department in total, and you could tell that 8 of them were just watching TV, waiting for their spouse's cell phone plan to be activated. Unfortunately, since there was so little foot traffic, management's decision was to drill into us how to use every marketing and customer manipulation tactic to encourage people to buy things. I was a good salesperson, and I could sell the crap out of home theater using tactics such as getting customers to use their imagination about their options, or presenting new options in ways they hadn't considered. I listened, I learned about their needs and what they were looking for, and they frequently left the store with something completely different than what they thought they needed. I recall that the number of returns I had was so small that I could probably count them on both hands over 18 months. I, however, 
was completely effing disinterested in marketing tactics, sales tactics, or manipulating customers for upsells. This meant upselling or changing how I communicated with them to speak their language in a way that marketing showed increased sales, but was blatantly manipulative. F that. So when Jim tells Bob about their new push to encourage customers to buy things they normally wouldn't buy, he knows I'm going to be a challenge, but he does a pretty good job at trying to convince me. He comes to me and we have a floor meeting and he asks me to try breaking the ice with the customers by chatting them up a little about topics unrelated to their viewing habits, home theater, etc. to get them to like me enough to want to make a purchase. Malicious compliance time. I was ready to quit and move on, and I was no longer interested in playing the game. He wanted me to try breaking the ice with people, so I started flirting with all the customers. Black, white, guy, girl, rich, not rich, old, not old. Everyone got a smile and a compliment about their outfit, and I'd compare them to a celebrity they reminded me of if possible. I was good at it too. I kept completely mild and inoffensive. Our uniforms were blah, and I wasn't really trying, but on more than one occasion, a bored older woman or housewife gave me their phone number. Our overall numbers started going down because I was busy chatting with customers then making sales. So eventually, I got hit with a secret shopper and the jig was up. Bob finds out about this from Jim and I can hear him laughing from across the store before coming to my department to ask me to go to the back of the store for a private meeting. He wrote me up for inappropriate communications with customers. I told him I wouldn't sign the write-up report because I received no directives saying I couldn't flirt with customers. I wasn't violating the employee handbook, I made sure, and I never said anything that was offensive or sexual, even though several customers took it in that direction. But more importantly, I was given my two weeks notice, but if the write-up was a deal breaker, I could leave now. Bob was sad that I was leaving but understood. Jim was pissed that I was leaving because I was a good earner, even though the department goals were ridiculous. There's not a lesson from this for managers out there, so don't read into it. I was an acerbic jackbutt. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Series Hybrid. It says, Management 101. Set impossible goals so those lazy bees try harder. Set your employees up to fail so they feel bad about failing to meet your impossible goals. Never admit that anything is management's fault. Always flip it so any problems are somehow the employee's fault. Sit back and watch all that sweet money flow in. Gee, this reminds me of a former manager of mine who thought that everything he did was the way it was supposed to be and there was no other ways. In fact, I don't think we were even allowed to think. I haven't said this for a very long time in any of the KCC videos, but screw you, Rick. Getting back to this story and management in general, I think that there's a problem because if they're not actually on the front lines working with the customers every day, then they really can't know what to do to make those sales better. You really need to get your staff and find out what's working for them, bring them together, have a town hall meeting find out what's working for them and implement their strategies. Because if you're not the one out there selling to the customer, how do you know what's going to work? Our next story today comes to us from Outlandishness1681. As you wish, let's jump right in. This happened a couple or three decades ago in the military. I was in charge of the squadron budget and made sure all unit expenditures were proper, right funds account and funds were available. I was also to make sure that our budget lasted the whole fiscal year. We got a new commander who was the worst micromanager I saw in my 20 year career. I made an appointment for my initial budget brief and proceeded to lay out our current expenditures, funding available, and the plans to spend it all by the end of the fiscal year. My new commander then tells me that he wants oversight on every penny spent in the squadron. I said I could do that but I needed some clarification. He said very condescendingly, Did you not hear me, Sergeant? I said every penny. I will approve every penny spent in this squadron before it is spent. I said, Yes, sir. Do you want me to send paper requests or email them to you? He said email would be sufficient and dismissed me. I knew exactly what to do. I called all the bosses who ran the different shops and told them what the commander had said and that I had no choice but to comply. 
none of them were happy, and a couple of them caught the tone in my voice and figured out what I was doing. I even told the squadron chief what was going to happen, and he told me that he would have my back. So I took all 27 spending accounts down to $0 available. Even the most critical aircraft parts couldn't be ordered until they sent me an email which I forwarded to the commander. He never once responded. It took two weeks for everything to hit the fan. It was longer than I thought it would take and I was starting to get nervous. We were in a staff meeting and the commander was pissed. He had just gotten his butt chewed by the colonel because of all the broke airplanes waiting on parts to be bought. He turned to the first flight chief and asked him why he had so much equipment that wasn't getting fixed. The chief said with a straight dead poker face, Sergeant won't approve us buying any parts. The commander whipped his head toward me and angrily asked what the problem was. I looked him straight in the eye and said, Sir, I sent those requests to you two weeks ago. You could see the color drain from his face as he quickly looked down. We'll talk about this after the meeting. I kept my straight face and I swear that I heard more than one muffled chuckle from the chiefs at the conference table. When the meeting was over, the commander told me to meet him in his office. The chief that threw me under the bus winked at me and smiled. I walked in right behind the boss and reported formally. We normally only do this if we were in trouble or getting praise, but this guy insisted on it from everyone every time. Mike, apparently I was now on a first name basis, you seem to have a pretty firm grasp on the budget and what the flights need. I think you can approve the normal day to day stuff and just bring the big things to me. Yes sir, was all I could say without busting out in laughter. Every request was approved and ordered within an hour and I was never questioned again. Now, OP added a little edit onto the end of the story. It says, Postscript, Chief equals Chief Master Sergeant, the highest enlisted rank in the US Air Force. I found out later that the Chiefs had all gotten together and decided to go along with my idea. They could have stopped it immediately, but decided to teach the commander a lesson. Somehow, the colonel that chewed my commander's butt had gotten word of what was going on and decided enough was enough, but he still didn't let on that he knew the real reason. Apparently, he thought my commander needed some education too. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Ogioni. It says, Regardless of the branch, it's the NCOs who actually run things. A good officer learns this early in his career and knows that when a sergeant says, Are you sure you want to do that, sir? That alarm should go off and he should seriously reconsider what he's doing. I think the same thing goes for management as it does in a military setting all of the people that make the day-to-day -day decisions and do this day in and day out every single day of their working slash military careers, which I guess is still a working career, they know exactly what they're doing for the most part. They might need a little bit of oversight, but fun fact, if you let them do their jobs, they'll do them better than you might think. Our next story today comes to us from Zigster23. Do you trust us? Let's jump right in. A little light on malicious compliance, but there were definite consequences. I've worked in IT at universities most of my career. Several years ago, I transferred to a new university to try something new. I immediately regretted it, for several reasons. One, the entire department was under review from HR for low morale. A survey was sent to the staff to gauge morale. I learned later that the VP had been demoted because of it before I was hired. Two, the new director barely spoke to me when hired and had her door shut for almost three straight days. Three, I was asked to consider which of my staff I wanted to replace or fire to better help with the new software implementation. Later learned that they had several lawsuits for wrongful dismissal. Four, I had two staff that lived 90 minutes away that frequently asked to work from home during inclement weather. I was told to be strict about this and deny their requests. Of course, if my staff called or text the director, she would cave and let them. Ugh. Five, my director received a promotion, executive director, and a consultant was hired as our new director. She was a consultant with the very company whose software we were implementing. Foreshadowing. Now comes the craziness. The VP brought in a group therapist to meet with all of the managers. We learned about team building and that a good team has a foundation of trust. We had several managerial meetings after this, 
where our old director and the VP would grill the mid-level managers about trust. We were asked bluntly, who doesn't trust us? Everybody was afraid to speak up. My anxiety was now through the roof. I had to be put on medication just to help me get out the front door to go to work. I couldn't quit because I needed health insurance for my family, pre-Obamacare. Now comes the malicious compliance, not too malicious. They continued to berate us about how trust was key over several meetings. Who doesn't trust us? I finally raised my hand. You asked, so I'll answer you. I said, I don't trust you. I've been in meetings where you've belittled and made fun of our staff in front of vendors and clients. Who knows what is being said about me when I'm not in the room? You have unrealistic expectations and the lowest morale of any place I've worked. Trust needs to be earned. They were a bit shocked that I had answered them. I was fired within two weeks. I was well liked by my colleagues, which meant that whatever trust still was out there crumbled immediately. They replaced me with a consultant from the same software company. He was fired within a month. Trust was now completely abandoned. Within the year, 75% of my department either quit or retired. Thankfully, I had already started interviewing for positions before being fired. I found one within two months and have been there for 10 years. Best job I've ever had. Unfortunately, they're still up to the same shenanigans. Just recently, 10 plus years later, the university fired the whole IT division and outsourced them to the same software and consulting company. The whole university is in financial hot water, having to cut 14 academic programs. Yeah, the problem wasn't in the IT department, the problem was the organization of that place altogether. If they were having to cut 14 academic problems, well, the issues in that place go right up to the top, I can guarantee you that. OP, I'm glad you were able to get out, even if it was forced, and find a better job that you've been in for a very long time now. Congrats on that. Our last story today comes to us from Sad Day St. Pete. You want every single denied claim filled out as if it was approved? You got it. Let's jump right in. I worked as a claims adjuster for a few years that did claims on anything with wheels or propellers. Automotive, RV, motorcycle, ATV, boats, jet skis, we did it all. Doing automotive claims were our bread and butter and easily documented in full because it's easy to find part numbers, prices, and labor times. Now, RVs on the other hand, they were a B. There weren't any industry standardized part numbers, several labor guides all having extremely vague and vastly different times for the same repair, etc. Everyone hated getting an RV claim because it took forever to gather all the info and enter it into the claim. Same goes for boats because we got one of those maybe twice a month. You would literally have to Google parts websites and attempt to find a similar part with a price close to what they were asking if it was going to be approved. One of the good things about the process was all of the contracts, regardless of vehicle, had very definitive reasons a claim would be denied. Example, covered under manufacturer warranty, listed as excluded in the contract, owner negligence, stuff like that. Whenever one of those came up, you thanked the old JC because you could just take down their estimate and deny it without verifying their estimate. Now, our VP, the highest manager in the building that actually reviewed our work, was the classic, I don't like to do the work, I just supervise, type. Then it happened. One day, a denied claim, rightfully so, was elevated all the way up to him thanks to constant bitching by a Karen who was at a large dealership. The VP decided to approve it anyway, even though it was cut and dried, not covered. The problem? The adjuster didn't verify the parts and labor estimate before denying it, as it was about as clear as day it was to be denied. The VP had to spend, God forbid, five minutes verifying two parts and a labor time. He flew off the handle at this and after the fact called a department-wide meeting stating that from now on, regardless of the claim, we had to verify every part and labor cost before denying. When asked why, he even said with a laugh that he didn't like to do work, but had to on that claim. So now it is on us. Did I mention the job was ran like a call center with calls constantly in queue from repair facilities? We had calls in queue nonstop from clock in to clock out. If we weren't answering them quickly enough, we'd get an email that said, calls backing up, watch the queue. 
That was the most work he wanted to do. I think you can see where this is going. In comes the malicious compliance. From that point on, I made sure to take my time and document every single aspect of every denied claim, regardless of the reason for denial. Diesel F-250 with 20,000 miles needs an entire fuel system replacement that's covered under the factory warranty? Well, I could just take your part numbers down and deny, but not now. Oh, there are 50 part numbers and four different labor ops? I'll go ahead and verify those and then deny. Water intrusion into the shocks of this RV, even though it's clearly stated water intrusion isn't covered, I'll gladly take the 20 minutes required to sift through RV parts websites to verify pricing. Oh, and you have a requested labor time? Let me check our five labor guides to try to find it. Another 20 minutes gone. The best part was, I would get claims on vehicles and from customers that weren't even ours, but one of our competitors that had a similar name as us. Being the dutiful employee I was, I made sure to create a customer profile for them, a profile for the repair facility, one for their vehicle, and started a claim. Fully vetted it and then informed the facility it was actually our competitor who had the contract, not us. Now they were wasting 20 to 30 minutes on the phone when I already knew it wasn't with us. I verified every effing claim that was denied. I spent more time verifying denied claims than I did approved ones. Our call queue times more than tripled after a couple months. Then, we had to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the VP to discuss why our production was falling. When my meeting came up, he said I went from being the fastest, most productive adjuster to failing below average and asked what was happening. Did I have issues at the office, issues at home affecting my production? I wanted to smile and laugh, but I stayed as stoic as possible and told him that I remembered how much he hated to do work, so I wanted to make sure every denied claim had every T crossed and I dotted in case it came across his desk. He asked why I was doing it for claims that clearly would never be considered for approval, and I said that I was a lowly adjuster and could never know when he might have to approve an otherwise denied claim and wanted to do my job to the best of my ability to help him out. <laughs> I left a couple months later, but was told by a friend who worked there that the VP left the company to pursue other opportunities, and was replaced by the awesome manager who I had reported to directly. I guess the dealership started complaining about wasted time on the phone, on top of all the queue delays. The complaints finally got sent up to the CEO, and out he went. Isn't this classic manglement 101 take a system that's working and then improve it so that it takes three times as long? Funny, that seems to be a trend in the stories today. Hmm. Maybe all of the OPs if they listen to this video should send a copy of it to their managers so their managers can listen to it and realize just how much of a big idiot they actually are. Oh, I guess that's wishful thinking. But here it is, it's 12.30 a.m. and my brain just went there because sometimes you just gotta stick it back to the managers. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Obsidian Winter. Do you want it done right, or do you just want deniability if someone tries to sue? Let's jump right in. Many years ago, I got a temp job at a local soap shop. You know, the fancy kind where it's five pounds for a bar of handmade soap. The manager didn't like me. I did things thoroughly and methodically, not quickly, and good enough for now. I also have a very good memory, and I remember things people say and do especially if those things don't add up. The manager would exaggerate things that made her look good and conveniently forget things which didn't go her way. I thought she had made a genuine mistake, so I corrected her once and she never forgave me. It was time for the monthly deep clean and I was tasked with doing the stairs. The shop had a metal spiral staircase which led up to the storeroom and we had to go up and down it with massive jugs of warm water so customers could try the products. Given the nature of the products, there was also soap flakes everywhere, and they got stuck to this high traffic area. There was about a quarter of a centimeter of soap caked into each step. The manager explained in front of most of the staff how important this job was and that it had to be done right. People could get hurt, you see, and you don't want that, do you, OP? She spent more time than was necessary making it very clear that if someone got hurt, then I would be to blame. It was also the most isolating and tedious job. It was obvious that this was revenge for my humiliating the manager. Fine, 
I went into my little world and started scraping. She wanted all the soap gone, I would remove every scrap of soap. Half an hour later, I had done a couple of steps and I was told that I was being too slow. She suggested that not all of the soap needed to be removed, only enough to make it less slippery. I replied that no, I was doing it properly. The soap on the second layer is just as slippery as the soap on the top layer, so if this was a safety concern, then obviously I needed to remove all the soap. I reminded her that she didn't want anyone to get hurt. The manager continued to criticize me for another half an hour, until she had no choice but to swap me with someone else. She had publicly made a big deal of how important the job was, so now she couldn't backtrack and leave it. A few days later, she spilled a full basin of water down the stairs. The four steps I had cleaned were safe to walk on. All the steps she had assigned to someone else, another six or so, were slippery as all heck, and she slid down the stairs on her back. She was off work for several weeks, and when she came back, she tried to blame me for not doing the job properly. I reminded her that she slipped on the stairs which were cleaned by someone else and that I was pulled off the task for being too thorough. Fortunately, it was a temp job and I moved on after a couple of months. She still works there and I've noticed that none of the other staff last more than a year or two. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Captain Get Your Gear Off. <laughs> you may want to put in an anonymous tip to your local work safety board. At least then, it starts a paper trail for others if some crap happens. OP responded to this comment and said, This was years ago, and the shop has moved venue now. Had I thought of it closer to the time, then I absolutely would do that. Well, OP, you mentioned that the manager still works there, and regardless of what location they're in, I'm betting you if they're still heading up the place, that it's still in the same condition regardless of where it is. So making that call might still be worthwhile. OP, I'm glad that was only a temp job for you and you were able to move on after a couple of months. I'm also glad that your boss learned that karma can be slippery, and apparently it foams up quite nicely. Our next story today comes to us from Mommy Macbeth. You can't reserve seats on public transport. Let's jump right in. We, my aunt and uncle, cousin and dad, were on a long sightseeing ferry ride. It was a two hour ride with one stop in the middle. We were the first to get on the ferry, so all of us blocked the window seats in a straight line. It's public transport and there's no concept of reservation, it's first come first serve. We were sitting in the air conditioned cabin and had the option of going out onto the main deck. Just as we stopped in the middle, my dad went out on the main deck to take some pictures and enjoy the fresh air. Another man gets on the ferry at this stop and takes my dad's window seat, though there were a few other window seats left. My aunt and I told him a number of times, quite politely, that someone is sitting there, but he only said, I speak French, and proceeded to not hear us. My dad came back and told him he was sitting there, and this man called the security and complained about my dad. The security told my dad, Sir, this is public transport. Seats cannot be reserved. My dad said, Alright, and sat down next to him. So the scene right now is, Window, man, my dad, empty seat, aisle. About 10 minutes later, the man was about to step out on the deck. He left his bag on the seat and got up to leave. My dad asked him to kindly remove his bag. He refused. So my dad refused to get up and moved to let him out. My dad said, you can't reserve seats. You showed me the rule. Kindly follow it yourself. He became very flustered and started clapping his hands and calling for security. Security was also on the deck for the time being, but a barista was there. The man called the barista to help, who didn't understand French either, so he told them in Arabic that my dad was refusing to move to let him out of the seat. The barista was flabbergasted and asked my dad why. I know Arabic, so I intervened and clarified the situation. That is, the man was keeping his bag and reserving his seat, which he told my dad is not allowed. By this time, the man had sorta climbed over my dad to go and call the security, and my dad hasn't budged. Keep in mind that my dad isn't a small man and is quite big with broad shoulders, and the sight of a tiny French man climbing around him was really funny. The security came in and the guy is still feeding them the part of the whole story in Arabic. When they came to ask my dad, he said, You told me moments ago that reserving seats aren't allowed. He was keeping his bag and going out to the deck, thus reserving his seat because no one would sit down in a seat with a bag in it. 
The security told him he wasn't allowed to do that and removed his bag. Now, my dad got up and told him that he can sit beside the window. My dad just wanted to prove a point and came and sat beside me. The man was fuming and muttering, camera, police, and a number of colorful French abuses, which I know because I have a French friend. He's glaring at us as I'm writing this, and guess what? He isn't sitting in the window seat anymore. OP added an edit at the bottom of this one. It says, edit, for everyone saying we should not have blocked a bunch of window seats, Firstly, the ferry was mostly empty, and a lot of window seats were empty because we went during non-peak hours. Secondly, it was a vacation, all of us paid for the seats, and wanted to have the best experience. It wasn't traveling from point A to point B, it was a sightseeing tour, and we wanted the best views individually, not sit as a group and have one person enjoy it. And no one was screaming to talk to others, we might take the best seats, but we are still courteous. OP added a second edit after this one. It says, edit two, my dad didn't call security the first time or the second. In both instances, the man called security. The first time, my dad requested him once and he said he doesn't speak English and got security involved. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Not So Chi Couple. It says, your dad is nicer than me. That bag 100% would have been kicked down the aisle and the seat stolen had it been me. What did that guy think would happen after making a big stink about not saving seats? Yep, I do kind of agree with this comment. However, I don't think I would have kicked the bag down the aisle. I would have given it either to the security guard or to the barista and said, hey, this was abandoned on this seat. You might want to take care of it in case they come back for it. Our next story today comes to us from Ossipgrd. <laughs> Terrible policy turns into a double refund. Let's jump right in. I recently purchased a rather lovely reclining sofa from a large furniture warehouse type company. We'll call them Sleepy Country. The sofa was on sale, marked down from about $5,000 to around $3,100. I had been searching for a few days online until I found this one, and I decided to purchase it without seeing it in person. I don't really like salespeople or people in general, but I digress. The sofa was delivered, set up, and everything was great. This should be the end of the story, except two days later, I received a promotional email from Sleepy Country saying they had a once a year sale happening for the next five days. I checked the same sofa on their site and sure enough, it was an additional $500 off. Sleepy Country is known for decent customer service, so I tried texting their helpline. The agent there, while initially kind, became irate when I brought up the price match issue. Hello, is this regarding a Sleepy Country purchase? Yes, it is. You have five days from the day of delivery to receive a full refund. I'm actually hoping to price match per your guarantee. I purchased this from you just two days ago, and it's gone down in price at the same store. Our once a year sale doesn't apply to prior purchases. Here are the terms. Q, malicious compliance. I'm within five days of receiving my item, so can I return it for a full refund? If I can't get the price match, I'm just going to request a return and then just purchase the same item again at a lower price. Radio silence. Next I call, I clearly was talking with the same person because they sounded like they had been made well aware of the issue. Well, you're going to have to pay to have it returned to the store if you want to proceed with the return for a refund. That's fine. It will still be cheaper than $500. Let's go ahead and get that scheduled, please. Clearly annoyed, agent transfers me directly to the store to deal with the return. The cool store manager answers, Hi there, thank you for calling Sleepy Country, how may I help you? I fill him in on the entire situation. Wow, it doesn't make sense to do that. Since it's so close to the date you purchased it, let's go ahead and process the price match. Great, thank you, I appreciate your great customer service. CSM has trouble processing the refund because they rarely receive refunds on web orders, they put the refund directly on my card instead. Still not the end of the story, a week later, I saw another refund on my card for the same amount for over $500. I thought it would drop off, but it stayed on for some time. Having somewhat of a conscience, I called the CSM to tell him what had happened. So, I talked with you the other week, I received a second refund for the same amount. So you didn't receive a refund? No, I received two refunds. Hold on just a second pulls up my record. Yeah, I don't think there's anything differently I would have done here, so if it's okay with you, I think we can just leave it as it is. 
All right, that's fine with me. Thank you. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Have Reddit. Great username, by the way. Manager's thought process, this is not worth my time to unravel, and I'm following store policy, so I don't give a flying F. Honestly, OP, if you could see the margins that these stores have on that kind of product, your $3,600 couch didn't cost them even a small fraction of that money. Besides, you can walk away from this one with your conscience completely clear because you did let them know and they decided not to do anything about it. That's a win for you in my books. Our next story today comes to us from Long Suffering Squid. Some can be taught, others have to screw up first. Let's jump right in. A customer called up to place an order on October 10th, 2022. Good afternoon, Widgets International. This is Squid. How can I help you? Hi, this is Chuckles, and I'd like to place an order for widgets for everything and a bag of widgets, location number 12345. After the order is placed. All right, and what is the PO number? The PO is 101022. Are you sure, sir? Everything in a bag of widgets corporate usually requires a seven-digit PO number, and this looks like today's date. You're new, aren't you? Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. I am most definitely not new, and it will not be fine, but okay, sure. Very well, sir. The order has been placed. The order number is ABCEZAS123. You should receive in about two weeks. I place an internal note on the order describing the conversation. Two weeks later, I was lucky enough to learn about the fallout of the above conversation when I take the following call. Good afternoon, Widgets International. This is Squid. How can I help you? Hi, this is Chuckles from Everything in a Bag of Widgets store number 12345, and I want to know why I haven't received order ABCEZAS123 yet. Let me look that up, sir. Checks notes, recognizes the order. It looks like it's been delayed, probably because of the girl I placed the order with. She was kind of clueless. Uh, yes, I'm sorry about that, sir. She's new and not terribly bright. Let me see if I can find the exact reason the order was delayed. I dig deeper into the notes. Here we are. It looks like the order has been delayed because we don't have a PO number. I gave the girl a PO number. Sorry, sir. I mean, we don't have a legitimate PO number. Everything in a bag of widgets corporate rejected it because it wasn't seven digits. And, hmm, because it was just the date you placed the order. Sorry, sir. The girl you spoke to should have caught that. We'll need a new PO number. Really? Oh, sorry. Let me generate a new PO number for you. Okay, the PO number is 2460137. Thank you, sir. I've updated the order. You should have it in about a week. So long, I placed the order two weeks ago. Sorry, sir. Some people won't listen until you repeat yourself multiple times. I'll make sure the girl knows what she did wrong, and I'll rush this order as much as possible. Thanks, you've been a great help. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Rhino Rise. It says, you shouldn't have pretended to be someone else talking down one of your colleagues. It was far too subtle for them to realize. You should have been brutal and honest. Ah, it says here, sir, that when we were given the PO, we tried to confirm it was valid as it wasn't in the usual format required by everything and a bag of widgets corporate. And it would likely be delayed if it was incorrect. But the guy who did the ordering was adamant that the date would suffice. Maybe he was new and needs some more training. If you're able to provide a valid PO, I'd be happy to get the order processing for you. Ah, <sighs> a lot of companies have that customer is always right attitude. That kind of service is actually responsible for a lot of incredibly rude, entitled people that they get on a daily basis. Because they think that the company can't say no and they're going to get exactly what they want. Finding a way to take the person's words and throw them right back at them is just oh so satisfying. And when I worked in call centers, that's something I love to do myself. All right, our first story today comes to us from Tay3600. My failure to plan is now your problem. Let's jump right in. So I work in customer service in the automotive industry. As part of the services, we offer guests, we perform a state mandated car inspection so people can register their car with the state. It's a simple process that can take about 15 minutes if you book an appointment with us. But every month we get flooded with people who forgot to do the inspection on the last week of each month. It is a mad dash for last minute appointments to fit people in before they're late. Now, we don't make money off this type of service. In fact, it's a state set fee and we realistically lose money doing these inspections on labor cost. 
I preface this to state that doing these state inspections does not benefit my shop, but we do it because it helps our customers. Front door opens to a male Karen coming in on a Friday afternoon midday. This distinguished gentleman, we'll call him Tim, walks in at around 1 p.m. in the afternoon and slaps his keys on the countertop, informing my front counter teammate that he needs an inspection now. Now, understand that even though all of our appointments were booked up days ago, we will still bend over backwards to help someone out. We totally get that things don't always go according to plan in life, so we do what we can to help. That is, as long as you're a nice person. When you start trying to dictate how we're going to help you, that does not fly at my store. Tim decided that today, he was going to do exactly that. After we advised him we can either wait almost two hours to try to work him into a slot as we process our already scheduled appointments or book an appointment for him next week, Tim lets us know that booking an appointment the following week after the deadline was not an option for him. But he's got time right now, so he's going to generously give us two hours of his time, and we need to figure out how to get him in. Q Malicious Compliance I stepped in to take over the conversation for my front counter staff who have been dealing with him up until now. Okay sir, we're happy to help. I'll get your keys out to the technician. You just have a seat and make yourself comfortable. Immediately, I walk the keys out to my technician with explicit instructions. After explaining to my tech that Tim is acting like a dirty trash can full of poop, I gave the express instructions that we will not even touch his vehicle until two hours have passed. Mind you, as Tim sits in the lobby stewing, I have the pleasure of servicing several other customers who set their appointments days ahead of time. 15 minutes here, 20 minutes there, and even a 7 minute inspection for an all electric car. Things are flowing so, so smoothly for all of the appointments who did the things the right way, and it's showing on Tim's face. After the first hour, Tim finally has the courage to speak up. I really appreciate y'all trying to work me in, but do you know how long it's going to be? No, Tim, you don't get to be nice now and try to expedite your vehicle. You don't get to be nasty to my staff and still get it your way. Sorry, Tim, we're still trying to get it fit in. Like I said, about two hours before we can see the truck. Mind you, the lobby's totally empty and all customers have already been serviced early. It's perfect. Fast forward another hour and his multiple attempts to make small talk to amend his horrible manners and treatment to one of my staffers, and his cars finally being brought into the shop bays. Then moments later, my technician walks into the lobby with a giddy smile. Boss, his truck needs wipers to pass inspection. They're torn and fail the vehicle. Passing on this wonderful news to Tim, he agrees to have the tech install some because he, of course, did not bring any of his own. At this point, I feel quite satisfied that Tim's learned his lesson with a little additional help from the universe in him needing to also replace wiper blades. But apparently, the universe was not quite done teaching Tim a lesson. His car still failed the inspection. The last part of the test is run by a computer that reads the internal control modules of the car. It's a totally automated process that can't be tampered or affected by the inspector. The only thing that can interfere is if the cars have the battery replaced and those control modules have been reset. But that's exactly what Tim did. Hours before coming to see me, he replaced the battery and cleared those exact modules. So at the end of the day, Tim was his own worst enemy and failed his own car, having to book an appointment for the following week. But with a little help from the universe, he hopefully learned a very valuable lesson that service workers are not your slaves and to always tip your waiters. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Chance University 92. It says, I guess he didn't know about the old standby of here's $100 for you and another $100 for the tech. For lunch, of course, also to not be a dick. Yep, a little bit of respect can go a very long way. And also, your failure to plan does not constitute an emergency on my behalf. So what I'm getting out of this story is that the guy replaced his battery to clear the codes out of the sensors on the car. Meaning that if there was something that was wrong on there, it's been cleared out and he didn't want it to show up on the test. But the test knows when they've done that, so he really screwed himself. 
That's the kind of person that when they're walking out of your store or dealership or whatever it is, with their tail between their legs, you just want to stand back and give them a rousing round of applause. Our next story today comes to us from With Trees. Control your friends. Okay, let's jump right in. Disclaimer, I tried to abridge some details both in attempts to make it shorter and in order to avoid accidental recognition. If something is messy or unclear, it might have to do with said clumsy attempts. Background, I work in a community-related nonprofit. The chairman of the board, Anthony, not real name, is trying to get into a political career. It's no secret that Anthony and I do not see eye to eye ideologically. I try to be diplomatic about it for the most part, However, he makes it a point to both shoot down everything I say and attempt to steal it and present it as his own, while clearly not understanding any of it. I'll also note that part of my job is focused on minorities, which generally get either ignored or approached in a very clumsy manner. Recently, Anthony launched a policy open table, an idea that he stole and misunderstood from me, but that's a different problem. Since I figured it's going to be a group of white men with ideas that are the policy equivalent of a stale instant vanilla pudding, I invite friends to join. There wasn't really any strategy involved, just people I appreciate and thought would want to participate. As we arrived, it became clear that I was right to a comical extent. Half the table was a group of white men, and the other side of the table was people I brought. The men Anthony invited didn't hide their disinterest, and disrespect for whatever a group of women and other minorities, and ones who didn't bother themselves with respectability games at that, had to say. Attempted to ignore or dismiss them, a couple of my friends were having none of it and kept calling them out. They started arguing loudly. At some point, I got a text message from Anthony sitting across the table saying, Control your friends, I can't have any discourse going like this. Malicious Compliance Part 1 as I found the request incredibly ridiculous, I screenshot the conversation. As we left, I sent it in our group chat on WhatsApp. My friends, who were quite upset and frustrated, decided to put up a bit of a theater. Next meeting, I arrived with two of my most outspoken friends, Liz and Rhea. Except this time, they showed up in full professional mode, equipped with a written agenda, references, and prepared talking points. They present themselves professionally, Liz being a lawyer and Rhea being a social worker with five years of field work down her belt. At first, they said nothing. As soon as I spoke, one of the men began arguing. I nodded, Rhea. Rhea cuts him off, citing the precise number supporting our claim, where the numbers are from, and ended with the remark that this information was, in fact, freely available for anyone who made the minimal effort to look it up. The man moves in obvious discomfort, but attempts to double down, now claiming that the plan we were suggesting is not legally plausible. Liz? Liz dryly quotes the exact law he was referring to, and without stopping to breathe, explains precisely what the law in question does and does not cover. It is perfectly plausible, and in fact, was done before in Example 1 and Example 2 again pointing out that it was a non-vague, explicit wording. All it took was checking. The conversation got heated again, with Liz and Rhea slipping back to calling out the other's misogyny, transphobia, racism, and general incompetence. I wait a little before saying quietly, Liz, Rhea, that's enough. Liz and Rhea, as we agreed on ahead of time, immediately stop arguing. Anthony looks slightly terrified. Malicious Compliance Part 2 the second part wasn't really orchestrated, but was way more satisfying. Since we started talking about politics a lot more, as a result of the inciting incidents, mapped all of the resources and players on the field, created work plans, and so on. We realized we could very well organize for real, so we founded an operation group. As of last week, members of the newly founded operation group met with the VP, who happened to be my direct boss, and the CEO on two different topics, hand two position papers regarding policies, listing precisely the same things that were on our agenda to begin with. Now, instead of nicely discussing it casually with Anthony and his friends, allowing him to take credit for it and use it to his benefit, it was sent to the entirety of the board and overseeing committee, with the full backing of the VP and CEO, 
who pointed out publicly that it supports my work plan, which Anthony went out of his way to shoot down. At the moment, he's mailing me constantly asking me to schedule a meeting on integrating it into the organization's official policies. My boss replied politely on my behalf that I'm quite busy and he will have to wait until I have the time for him. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called HMS Slarty Barkfast. Okay. So to be clear, Anthony likes stealing others work and taking credit for it. In this case, you were able to steal back your idea, get it implemented, and take into account the very people Anthony was trying to exclude. Bravo, well done. Especially when Anthony is all but asking you to do it. OP responded to this one and said, yeah, and turn around the power balance while at it. We're not trying to make him sit down and listen anymore. Funnily enough, this is precisely what we were trying to tell him in the first place. You want to run for office? We can get you the backing nobody else has. You know, OP might actually be doing Anthony a favor by exposing him to the criticism he'll receive when he actually runs for office. He can learn from this experience and become a better and more successful politician. But I highly doubt he'll actually learn. So, moving on. Our last story today comes to us from Just Doing It. Don't want to pay me for my work? All right, I'll undo it. Let's jump right in. Not exactly sure if this is malicious compliance or pro-revenge, but here we go. I'm naming the company name because I've had many issues with them, and everyone should be warned. So, have to say this first, beware of working for the delivery service shipped. Today, I picked up an order for delivery. It had gone promo, money added on, on ship. It was for delivery in a town that is 15 minutes from the store of purchase. Alright, not too bad for $16 especially since I live within 10 minutes of the town I was delivering to. I take it. I go to the store, receive the groceries, and I'm on my merry way. I send a text to the customer that I'm on my way and will reach them before said time. No response, so I give a quick call. It does a weird thing and ends. Doesn't even go to voicemail. Huh, what of? I sent them a text, get to the house, knock, no answer, leave the bag outside the door, and walk away. Make it to my car, start said car. Woman pokes her head out the porch door as I'm about to leave. You were very lovely woman on porch, thank you for your kindness. Waves me down, looking highly confused. So I, unfortunately, stop the car and get out. Woman asks what this is. Why, your order ma'am, I say, looking all happy. I didn't order anything, she says. Oh, no. Did anyone else in the house? Nope. Oh, no, no, no. So, there is a wrong address on the delivery. I've never dealt with this before, and I have to leave to catch a movie with friends in 30 minutes. Cue me going next door at each house on that small street, while reaching out to ship support, and while trying to call the customer again, does the same weird thing with the phone. Give up on that, proceed to knock on doors. Nope, 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 nobody's. All right. Ship suggestion? Just drive back and return it. Um, no ship. I'm a delivery contractor. I'm not a volunteer, nor am I a charity. I am hired by you to fulfill deliveries. As far as I am concerned, I have delivered to the address on file. I'm not reaching into my bank account to correct someone else's mistake. For the total extra 30 minute round trip, I'll need $10 on top of the initial pay. Thanks gas for being so expensive. No, they say, we'll give you $8.10. No, I say, I have plans in now 10, what should have been 30, mind you, minutes that I will now miss. $8.10 will not cover the gas and wear and tear for the extra 30 minutes. I will need no less than $10, or I will leave them on the curb of the noted delivery address, 580 Blanking Street in Dickoff. We'll give you $5 and can't do any more than that, they say. Wait, I say, $5 on top of the additional $8.10? to make it $13.10 on top of what I'm being paid, or just $5. I want everything in writing, specifically because I knew Shipped was going to do exactly what they did next. Oh yes, $13.10, but we can't do any more, they say. Fine, I'm returning it to the store now, I say. Go to the store, do the whole return process, get in contact with Shipped, as they directed me to with the requested information. Get a message on my phone from Shipped to the effect of, your order has been cancelled and $20.80 issued to your account. What? I contact Shipped, say I'm confused, 
say it looks as though they were only giving me $5 on top of the original order payment when they said I would be compensated $13.10. I was told, oh, we won't give you any more than $5. But you already said, is there someone else I can speak to? Nope, $5, take it or leave it. All right, fine. Don't want to pay me the agreed upon wage? That's a breach of contract, meaning you never actually paid me for this return. So what did I do? I marched right back into the store, asked the worker who had taken the return what she had done with it, snatched the bag up, strode up to a manager, informed them of what happened, and told them since I wasn't being paid to return the groceries, I would be taking them back to the last place I was contracted and paid to deliver them. 580 Blanking Street in Dickoff told him if he wanted to be recompensated for the groceries, he could charge shipped as they were not willing to pay to have them returned. Message shipped from my car informing them of this and gave them 30 minutes. Yep, plans definitely ruined. It's now two hours later to rescind their rescension and pay me what they actually agreed to and owed me. Had to reach out two separate times because the first girl, despite me being very polite, would not go to anyone else, such as management, to ask for an exception to this policy, considering they had literally told me they would pay me more. Actually had the gall to ask if I had taken the items I had returned, and all I had to say in response was, did you pay me to return them? Second girl was much more helpful, reached out to her team to see if anything could be done, shipped still wouldn't be swayed, but I thanked her profusely for at least trying. So in the end, they said they wouldn't do any more than $5. I told them, all right, I reject that offer. Just pay me for the original delivery because 580 is where they'll be. You can pay another ship chopper $15 to come get them. Drove back, it was on my way home, dropped them off and left. I'm not a charity, I don't work for free, and I certainly don't pay to work. I'm going to be messaging ShopRite Corporate directly along with New Jersey Labor Board because this is not the first issue with wages I've had with Shipt, and honestly, ShopRite should seek compensation from them. Have fun paying for the more than 13 ton of groceries that are now rotting on the curb, Shipt. Now, Opie added an edit onto this one at the bottom responding to people who said that they were being entitled. It says, Side note, to anyone who may say, you're being entitled, no, I am not. It is not entitled to expect an agreed upon wage. It is extortion to expect me to work for less than agreed. Imagine you accepted an order from a delivery service, fulfilled that obligation, and suddenly they decided to pay you less than half for that completed order. Or you're working a job and they suddenly cut your pay without any notice or agreement upon your part. As I explained to them, I never would have returned the groceries for $5 because it wasn't my mistake. Would have returned them no problem if it had been. And I would be paying to return them, plus the missed plans, plus the lost time. So no, I am no way in the wrong and I don't care what anyone who thinks otherwise has to say. Well, OP, I've done a little bit of this delivery stuff myself for that DD place that's up here in Canada. And well, I can tell you one thing, the address that comes up is the address that you take the things to, you drop it off, you don't look back, and you get out of there as quickly as you can because, honestly, you fulfilled your obligation and they have to pay you for that. And you don't need to go back and fix a mistake that wasn't yours to begin with in the first place. The customer who didn't get their order at whatever address they're at will call back in or place another order through the app and somebody else will deliver it, and that company will end up paying more to get that stuff out to the proper address. Again, not your problem. Drive away. Don't even look in the rearview mirror. You're done. That comes to us from Star World 8311 Oh, you're giving all of us a failing grade on our final project? We're going to talk with the dean of the department then. Let's jump right in. The background. My humanities classes were taught by three professors, team teaching, lectures, small groups, etc., and that worked out most of the time. However, our final project was a classroom simulated society, and they split the class in half to do this. They told us all that we had to stay in the rooms in a portable and couldn't leave. The rules for the project were that the students were split into upper class, middle class, and lower class groups, with each group having an irregular amount of tickets for travel, money, and food and drinks. The upper class got 10 tickets for almost every category. 
the middle class got five and the lower class got two. Each of the three had to decide how to spend their tickets and could give them away if they chose. The upper class was the only one that had travel tickets and the lower class was the only one that had entertainment tickets, TV time. In the first of the two sections of the group project, all the students stayed the whole four hours and the project went about how you would expect it to go, with the upper class ruling the other two and taxing them in tickets. That section of the project was during the school day, between lunch and dinner. Our section was directly following them, so we couldn't go to the dining hall for dinner. We also couldn't bring outside food or drinks. I had to eat on a schedule for medical reasons, but was told that I would only be allowed to do so if I bought food or drink with our group's tickets. I was put into the upper class, so we had enough tickets for me to be able to do that, but then there were none for others to have anything. We, the five of us in the upper class, ended up splitting a can of pop and a small bag of chips. The people in our section of the project were mostly missionary kids, I'm not though, so we were mostly an idealistic bunch to begin with. All but one of the lower class group left the building to go eat dinner because they knew they weren't going to get fed otherwise. They weren't allowed back in and got failing grades because they didn't follow the rules for the project. The malicious compliance. The rest of us followed the rules to the letter but did it our own way within the confines of those rules. The tickets got spread around mostly evenly so everyone could travel, have at least one food or drink for their class to split, and have entertainment tickets. When it got to be hour three or four, our class started singing, show me the way to go home. Then we started singing all the most annoying songs we could think of for the last hour. We absolutely drove the profs up a wall, but they couldn't tell us to leave because then they would have not followed the project rules either. We knew we were playing with fire with this one because the project counted for a good chunk of our final grade, but we didn't care after finding out that the profs weren't going to allow any exceptions to the rules, even for medical reasons. After we were done, we went to see if there was any way we could still get dinner, and the cafeteria stayed open for us a half hour after it was supposed to close, so we could eat. It was on a Friday night. The fallout. On Monday afternoon, we all came into the lecture hall, buzzing about the two extremes of the project. The people who ran off knew that they were going to fail, but the rest of us in both sections were sure we were going to get passing grades. We were all told that the first section, the one that imploded, would get passing grades, and the second section, the one that shared more equitably, would fail. One of my friends worked at the campus bookstore and knew that each stack of the project ticket and rule books came with a teacher's manual. Since these profs did this project for all their humanities classes at this level, they didn't get a new teacher's manual each year unless the project changed drastically. So the rest of the teacher's manuals were sitting in the back of the bookstore, locked up though. The friend told his boss what happened and his boss gave him a teacher's manual. Those of us who had completed the failed section of the project had the professor's words on tape because we were allowed to record lectures. We took that and the manual and made an appointment as a group with the dean. The dean thought that the profs had been utterly ridiculous and we got passing grades for the project. The profs tried to argue that there was no way that the project could ever have had that outcome. But the dean didn't go along with that. His answer? You teach at a Christian university and expect that your students aren't going to follow their beliefs? The profs had to change the syllabus so the next year had the simulated society project removed and something else put in its place with better rules. Okay, so there's a couple of points that need to be made about this story. Number one, a medical exemption means you're exempt. These professors could have killed somebody with the attitude that they weren't going to let them eat even though they have a medical exemption that means they have to eat. That is a bunch of bullcrap. Number two, this is a Christian university and the group that adhered to the Christian principles are the ones that were deemed to have failed? Uh, I don't understand that one. So if somebody here wants to explain that to me in the comment section down below, I'd really appreciate it. Our next story today comes to us from Chaotic Ridiculous. Don't touch the tomatoes? Okay, there will be none. Let's jump right in. This happened to my mother recently. For context, the neighbor and her have driveways that are side by side with a small patch of dirty gravel and weeds between that is basically no man's land and is just there. It's about a foot and a half wide 
runs the length of the driveway and no one really takes care of it, leaving it as a border. My mom also has plenty of tomatoes growing in the backyard, including cherry tomatoes that are a favorite of crows stealing them and other birds. Now, this spot was a favorite for birds to drop the tomatoes or pick them apart, because there were no dogs there while there were in the backyard or main yards, or at least that's how my mom tells it. Eventually, the seeds sprout and there are small tomato plants starting to grow. Noticing them, my mom begins to water them regularly as she waters her front yard plants as she has to walk by them with the hose anyway. This leads to cherry tomato plants sprouting and becoming incredibly fruitful between the driveways. After a while, they were disappearing and my mom figured it was a combination of the birds and the wife of the neighbor's couple because she was home all day. My mom didn't care because these were just chance tomatoes. She had plenty in the backyard garden and it was just nice to have something more than dirt and gravel between the driveways. All was dandy until my mom went to grab a few to snack on while working in the front yard and the woman next door confronted her. She told my mother those were not her tomatoes and she needed to leave them alone. The neighbor woman continued that the patch of dirt and gravel was on her property, not my mother's, though our water meter was in it and ultimately it was likely a 50-50 split if you even cared to look, which when it was just nothing, no one cared to. So rather than argue with her, my mom said it was fine and she would leave them alone. A few weeks later, they had started to dry up and die without the frequent watering from my mom, eventually ending in the dirt and gravel patch, becoming just that again. I love that the neighbor thought that the tomato plants were theirs and they didn't realize that somebody had to be watering those in order for them to be fruitful. Now, Opie's mom stopping watering them once they had that confrontation might actually lead to another confrontation because if the neighbor didn't realize that somebody was watering them to keep them going, well, the neighbor might think that Opie's mom actually sprayed something on them to kill them at this point because they disappeared so quickly. One thing is definitely for sure, they should put up a fence down the middle line of those driveways because good fences make good neighbors. I think State Farm says it best, like a good neighbor, stay over there. All right, our next story comes to us from Unorthodox474. I have to account for all my time? Okay, let's jump right in. So this one isn't for work, but school, and a dispute I had with an instructor who was looking for a way to shaft my GPA. I'd proven him wrong in front of witnesses, and he was looking for a payback. I was a student Pew Pew Smith at the Colorado School of Trades when this happened, and part of the last section of the program was working on a minimum number of customer supplied Pew Pews, kind of like how salon colleges offer discount hair services to real customers so that the students can get some experience. I had angered the instructor for that department by protesting when he dinged me a grade point for failing to document the size of the gas port on a pew pew that didn't have one. A Benelli inertia driven long pew pew and then proved in front of witnesses that he was wrong about how the pew pew worked and forced him to change my grade. After that, he looked for every way he could to shaft me, and I could see his big play coming in the form of the school's very strict rules about how carefully we had to document how our time was spent, which would have allowed him to ding me for every unaccounted for minute, of which I was sure I had a few over the months. Enter malicious compliance. Early on in this section, it was called design and function or DNF. I had been assigned an old Arasaka Pew Pew to clean, and the screws were seized so thoroughly that I was afraid I'd strip them out if I wrenched on them too hard. So I'd applied penetrating oil and put it in my locker, then moved on to other pew pews while I waited for the oil to work its magic. Once I realized what the instructor had planned for me, I simply forgot to get that pew pew back out of my locker and left it in there for months while I worked on other pew pews, letting it sit there until I was nearly finished with the section. Then, when I was near the end and the instructor started smirking and asking me about how well my time was accounted for, I produced this crusty beast from my locker, along with the timesheet for it, on which I'd accounted for every spare minute of my time in the section that wasn't on the other sheets and claimed it was all spent on this thing, and told him I was sorry but I just couldn't get the screws out and I'd take an F on that one pew pew out of the 35 I'd worked on as part of the curriculum. The look on his face as he read the paperwork and realized what I'd done was pretty priceless. 
I think he just about tore a hole in the final grade sheet, writing that my time was in perfect order. And he didn't say another word to me the whole time I remained in school. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called It's Just Me 405. It says, I was a welding instructor until COVID closed the school I worked at. There was one student who told me I had a machine set up wrong. I told him it was right. He said it wasn't. I asked him to show me exactly what I had done wrong, so he did. I still told him I was right. Then he pulls out his phone, opens the provided ebook, and says, look, this is what's wrong. I had the polarity backwards, not going to hurt the machine, but will affect the actual weld. Not only did I go back and check every single machine, but he got extra credit, and I let it be known that I had learned, relearned I guess, something from a student that I needed to slow down once in a while and not rush through the simple stuff. There are definitely teachers out there that just can't deal with being wrong, often characterized by them getting extremely upset when called out on something. To be honest though, I don't think I personally would have called out that professor in front of everybody else. I think I would have done it in private and give them a chance to learn from their mistake. Especially if you don't know how that professor is going to take the news that they screwed up. There really aren't very many people out there like the commenter that we just read who can take that constructive criticism from a student and work with it and let everybody know that yeah, sometimes I can be wrong. Our next story today comes to us from Humble Human Bob. Don't make that new order for the large Canadian. Let's jump right in. Yesterday, I was looking for something easy for dinner and phoned the nearest pizza from a small building. I ordered a large Canadian pizza for pickup and the person on the phone confirmed the location and my phone before telling me I could pick it up in 30 minutes. At no point was price mentioned in this exchange. I had specifically ordered this because I was looking at the website and saw they had a large banner on their site which stated they had specific types of large pizzas for $16.99. On arrival at the red roofed pizza from a small building location, I went inside to pick it up. That'll be $27.67. I'm sorry, I thought your website mentions this large pizza for $16.99. Sorry, we don't offer that price over the phone. It's online only. I was planning my compliance. I'm sorry, you're telling me that if I call in, my pizza is almost double the cost as ordering online? Sorry, the details are on the poster behind you, and you can see the small print in the corner says online only. The details were, as promised, in very small print on a very large poster. Throughout this, she had been holding the pizza out toward me, waiting for me to take it after paying. I admit, I could have been a bit more polite, but I was a bit hangry and grumpy and just wanted to eat my pizza for the advertised price. I turned abruptly away and left her with the pizza. I walked back to the waiting area and pulled out my phone, placing an order online for the same pizza I had ordered over the phone. I refused to make eye contact, but watched her quizzically looking at me in my peripheral vision, all the while holding my pizza. She turned to put it down, but glanced at her computer, presumably seeing the notification for the same order, under the same name, with the same cell phone number. She looked from her screen to me, where I sat looking at my phone, watching her out of the corner of my eye. I'd like to think this was our pizza standoff, our duel of wits, our respective slices of stubbornness, after a few drawn out seconds, she called me back up. Okay, you can pay for your pizza now. The total comes to $17.83. I paid the $17 in cash and they handed me the same pizza they had been holding the whole time. The pepperoni on the pizza, icing on the cake, was hearing them call into the kitchen just before I walked out. Don't make that new order for the large Canadian. Okay, totally have to admit that when I read the title of this one being a Canadian myself, I'm sitting back and kind of wondering why my body mass index would make a difference in this pizza shop that they didn't want to serve to the large Canadian. Now that I've read the story, as a true Canadian, I kind of feel like I need to apologize to OP for thinking that in the first place. So OP, sorry about that, eh? Our final story today comes to us from Ancient Educator 76. You're gonna need to repeat that back to me, double malicious compliance. Let's jump right in. Hey y'all, it's drive through OP again. I'll start off by saying this. If you ever feel petty enough to ruin a drive through person's day at work, ask them to repeat the order back. This isn't because it takes too long or it's difficult. 
so much as it is insulting to our intelligence. I still do it with a smile, mostly, but not this evening. When a car drives in the drive-thru, it sets the sensor off instantly, and we hear everything everyone in the car says. My headset beeps, I greet the customer, and I hear, Oh, sweet, mellow yellow peach. I ask whether he wants a small, medium, or large. No, butthat, not you. How about you pay attention? Enter malicious compliance number one. I'll pay attention, all right. In the meantime, I tell him to let me know when he's ready. He orders in the most convoluted way possible, insulting me directly in between every other item. I even do him the favor of making his items a combo, because I've learned that, when in doubt, err towards nice. He then stops me as I'm about to say the total. Look dude, you're gonna need to repeat that back to me. I know you messed that crap up. He had a very rude tone the whole way, which I'm learning to be better at picking up on in my twilight years, 46. Enter Malicious Compliance Part 2, which unlocks Part 1. Time to employ my memory and voice acting skills. You got it, sir. In my California surfer Keanu Reeves voice, dude, sweet, mellow yellow peach. I then go back to my voice for my parts, small, medium, or large. No butt hat, not you. Well, let me know when you're ready. Okay, man, I want a bacon burger, a big one. Which burger, sir, we have? Look, dummy, a bacon burger. I keep going back and forth, switching between exaggerated and insulting California dude crush voice and my regular voice. Each of the five times he called me a name in the transcript, I make it in my voice, so it's me insulting him with his own words. My manager Bruce jumped behind the ice machine to laugh his butt off in full support of my churlishness. I repeated like 98% of the convo verbatim, right up to the request to repeat it back to me. He finally says, you know what, goodbye, and go fork yourself. I say, have a nice evening, and wave to a man who was in the process of ruining his tires just to make a gesture with his hands toward me as he unsuccessfully passes the drive through window. I couldn't have planned it any better. He seriously popped his tire as he hopped the right curb. The best part? The two family nuggets he ordered, 50 nuggets for $11.99, didn't have to be made. Bruce was happier than any of us about this, as the cost to the company was so great. This guy disappeared into a flurry of yellow lights, clanking chains, and customers with carfuls of food, hopefully never to be heard from again. Wait a second, aren't the twilight years 13 to 18? <laughs> oh, wrong twilight, never mind. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Icy Silver Dragon. It says, The problem is not repeating back the order. The problem was the guy's insults while ordering. I've had my order messed up before, so I always ask to repeat if there is no screen. But I'm always polite about it. Sometimes they miss when I say no whatever, usually something I'm allergic to. Never had them be mean about it because I'm not insulting them. Now, that completely leads to the fact that if you treat people with kindness, generally you'll get kindness back. But if you're going to treat somebody like a butthole, well, you're probably the butthole yourself. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Lilith Zerky. If you say so, I'll comply. In the end, we all get screwed. Let's jump right in. Tiny bit of pertinent information, in 2014, I had a C-section to bring my son into the world. I was let go from my previous job because they didn't want the liability if something happened to a pregnant woman on the job. I was rehired by the fast food company where I held my very first job, which is not McDonald's. It's a bit higher priced than that, where you could get fried chicken, a hot dog, and a double cheeseburger at the same time. There will be no mention of my child's father because he wasn't there for us. I lived with my eldest sister who was more like a mom to me, which is why she is mentioned in this story. She was the person I had with me when I had my C-section. She has been the one there for my son every moment of his life. My doctor said that if I was going back to work before his recommended four to six weeks of healing time and rest, that I had to be on light duty and that I was not to lift more than the weight of my son, which is six pounds. The story. I was rehired by a fast food company that was always extremely busy at each major point in the day. Lunch made over $800 between noon and 1 p.m., and dinner made over $700 from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Of note, the only reason I was rehired was because 
Hiring manager loved me to pieces. When I left the first time, she told me I always had a job with her because she loved my work ethic. She said that I was the best worker she'd had in years. Nobody ever picked up extra shifts as quickly as I did. Nobody cared to learn as fast as I did. So since I had previous experience, they wanted me to work lunch rush, but I begged them to let me work dinner. Dinner would allow me to spend quality time with my newborn and my sister, who I lived with, would be home from her job to take care of my son while I worked. Now, I started a month after my C-section, right? Wrong. I started two and a half weeks later. If I didn't, I couldn't be hired. I had actually gone back to my doctor and asked his office to write a full letter explaining my light duty requirements and took it with me my first day back. I walk into the manager's office expecting to see my hiring manager or at least a manager I recognized. Nope. Enter in stupid manager who had worked as an hourly employee at another location and thought she knew better than everyone. I handed stupid manager my doctor's note and she looked at it like she was holding a dirty baby diaper. I asked her to make sure hiring manager sees it and she doesn't respond. I shrug it off and walk to the back where the break room was. I saw that all of my coworkers were the same from the last time I'd worked there and they all crowded around me to see baby photos. I was crying the entire time because it felt like a homecoming. It felt like I was finally surrounded by a support system until stupid manager screamed that we needed to get to work when there wasn't even a customer. We all scattered like flies and made ourselves look busy. I kept my phone in my pocket before clocking in and I periodically checked it, always between customers, to make sure nothing had happened to my son while I was gone. I would think most, maybe not all managers would have understood that I hadn't been texting, just quickly checking for new notifications but not stupid manager. She hated it. She'd been sitting in office, checking the cameras, and I supposed I'd checked my phone one too many times. Yay, postpartum depression and anxiety. Stupid manager came flying around the corner at light speed and stared daggers at me. Hazel, what the F do you think you're doing? You cannot be on your phone while you're clocked in. You should know this already. Now, I'd never been one to deal well with being yelled at, so I just said I was sorry. Some of my coworkers stood up for me, which again made me cry. Stupid manager apparently hated crying too. She turned back to me, shooting the same daggers into my soul. What the F are you crying about now? Thankfully, a customer walked in, so she just stormed off. I saw red. Within the hour, I watched her start to get ready to leave her shift, which I thought was a blessing. Of course, it wasn't. Enter lazy manager who I'd had issues with the last time I worked there. Not that I said anything, she just never worked. She sat in the office staring at the cameras, eating food from the line, which the company said is illegal. You don't get free food. You get a discount on food. Did she ever pay for it? Not once. She wrote it off as part of the end of day throwaway food. I can't remember what it's actually called on the end of the day report. Lazy manager saw me and her face fell. Oh, hey Hazel, she said with disdain. I put on the sweetest smile and attempted to make small talk with stupid manager, but they made a major mistake. They left the door cracked and wouldn't you know it, I worked on the side of the line closest to the door where I could hear everything. This is how it went. I thought hiring manager told her no. I guess not, she's been on her phone all day. Of course she has. She's the worst employee we've ever had. Ugh, I'll call hiring. She seems pretty lazy. Oh, here's her pitiful doctor's note. Ha ha ha, we'll see how that works. It's not like we've never had kids before. Now, that fully pissed me off. But I bit my tongue. I waited for what I knew was coming. I knew exactly what I was going to do. Because I was just plain sick of being bad-mouthed by others. Stupid manager leaves and lazy manager calls me to the office. I was in the middle of making an order, but she is the manager after all. I left that poor person's order sitting right on the line and walked into the office. Yes, lazy manager. She doesn't even look up from the computer. Hazel, what's this doctor's note for? I just take my phone out of my pocket and try to show her pictures of my son. Oh, you had a kid? In a tone that implied nobody would want to be with me or something. I smiled sweetly and nod, a plan working itself out in my head. Fast forward four days, lazy manager hasn't been helping us close the store at all, 
and I've been getting home after 2 a.m. every day from a place that closes at 10 on weekdays, 11 on weekends. I'm done. My sister can't keep taking care of my child like this, and it's completely unfair. Lazy Manager is working again, and we're really busy. I go to put fries in the fryer because our fry cook is busy making chicken tenders. I open the little freezer beside the fryers, and it's empty, which I knew it would be because I never saw anyone put a new box in. Huh? That sucks. Hey, we're out of fries out here, I yell. No response. Hey, coworkers, fry cook is busy and we need fries out here. Nothing. Odd. Oh, well. Hey, lazy manager, we need fries out here. Lazy manager opens the office door. Get them yourself, Hazel. I walk over to the office. Lazy manager, I can't. My doctor says I can't lift more than six pounds. Lazy manager rolls her eyes and looks dead at me. Look, go get the darn fries out of the freezer now. Two boxes. I don't care about this my doctor said crap. Do it and stay the heck off your phone. And there it was, my opportunity for malicious compliance. I walk into the freezer and look at the box of french fries. Hmm, I really shouldn't. This could be detrimental to my health according to my doctor. But lazy manager said so. Now, I'd noticed that morning that a couple of my stitches hadn't started dissolving yet, so I'd already called and scheduled an appointment about two weeks early. This was all lining up perfectly. I grabbed that fry box on the bottom shelf and shifted it where I could read its weight. I wasn't supposed to be on my phone, but she obviously couldn't see me in the freezer. I snapped a picture of the box. I sent it to my sister with the message, manager told me I have no choice but to do this myself, doesn't believe my doctor's note at all, can't respond, she won't let me use my phone anymore either. I made sure the message was sent and then switched my phone off, grabbed that fry box and lifted it and carried it to the little freezer 20 feet away. I'll say one thing for adrenaline, it definitely works to numb the pain until it wears off. I felt a wetness in my pants and excused myself to the break room. Not the bathroom, that was too private for this. I turned where the cameras couldn't see me and looked in my pants. Blood. I was bleeding. But from where? Oh, that's right. The stitches that hadn't started healing yet. But there was another pain I'd never experienced. I walked to Lazy Manager with a napkin covered in blood. Thankfully, the line wasn't anywhere near the office. I would never contaminate someone's food because, of course, I tried to stop the bleeding. I was immediately sent home to my sister, who was in a severe panic over the message. I called my doctor's office with 10 minutes to spare and explained the situation and was scheduled for the following day and told to go to the hospital if the bleeding continued. My sister and I bandaged me up to the best of our ability and I waited for my appointment. When my doctor found out why I still picked up that fry box, he sounded more like a concerned father figure when he said, I'll handle it. But I assured him I had it myself. All I needed from him was a doctor's note. You see, I'd found out that hiring manager, who was also the store manager, who was lined up to become district manager, had come back from vacation. She was actually scheduled for the following day, and I was supposed to work. I walked, no, waddled into that store, in uniform, doctor's note clutched in one hand, the other grabbing every solid surface it could to absorb some of the shock of movement. She took one look at me and guided me to a chair in the break room, concern written all over her face. Hazel, what happened? So I told her everything. She asked me if I ever gave either manager a doctor's note, and I said I had. She couldn't find it, but she didn't need to. What lazy manager and stupid manager didn't know was that my sister had a printer that could scan documents, and we had a weird feeling that we would need a copy of the first doctor's note. So not only did I have a new note clutched in my hand, but stapled to it was a copy of the original note that told the managers that I was supposed to be on light duties because if I ripped a stitch, it could lengthen my healing process. The new note explained that since I was not given light duty, I not only ripped a stitch, but pulled a few muscles in my lower body. When hiring manager read both notes, she was furious. She checked the schedule, and when she saw neither of the other managers were working, she called them both in for a meeting. She asked me if I would stay for said meeting, and that I could sit in the office in her comfy desk chair while we waited. I took that seat and waited for the show. 
30 minutes later, hiring manager was giving them an earful, telling them they had no right to disregard a doctor's orders and that they should never have told me to stop being on my phone. Turns out, hiring manager had worked for this establishment when she had her youngest child, so she knew the anxiety of being away from a newborn for too long. I watched stupid manager get fired on the spot, but not lazy manager. Lazy manager was demoted to line cook because hiring manager told her she needed to relearn some humility. She worked as a line cook at another store for about a month and was then fired for stealing food. OP posted an edit down in the comment section. It says, final notes. When I first posted this, some people were wondering why I didn't sue the company. First, it didn't even cross my mind because I'd never been through something like that. Second, when it was brought up to me by my best friend, my sister said it wasn't worth it for some reason. Third, I was more worried about the immediate need to provide diapers and formula for my son. If you were curious, hiring manager found alternative ways for me to work. She gave me a comfortable stool to sit at and trained me on the cash register. I got to sit there and take orders instead of walking around while going through another two months of healing. And I was given an extra meal a day through the company at her request. She also helped me get to the restroom every time I needed to go, gave me extra break time, and if she couldn't help me, she made sure someone could. Maybe it was so she didn't have to worry about a lawsuit, but part of me thinks it's because she cared about me like a mother figure would, well before I had my son. My son and I are doing great. I healed amazingly well. Yes, I know my stitches weren't healed, and yes, my logical brain said, this is bad, don't hurt yourself for these people, but I also didn't realize I'd actually rip the stitches out of my body, nor that I could tear muscles that easily after a major surgery. I didn't ask, the doctor didn't tell, and my sister didn't know either. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. Much love, Hazel. Underneath that, another Reddit user named DrunkCPA responded to OP's comment. It says, You could have and should have sued both companies in this situation. Firing because you're pregnant is against the Equal Employment Opportunity Act and Americans with Disabilities Act. I think that is the one. The second is just absolute discrimination. Ugh, awful people. I think OP honestly had the opportunity to sue both companies, the one they worked for previously, where they were let go because they were pregnant, which is an absolute no-no, and then the one that they were working for most recently, where they were told to do something that was against their doctor's orders on a note that they brought in and they physically hurt themselves because of it. OP, this is how you become a millionaire. Honestly, if this wasn't that long ago, I would still be talking to a lawyer, especially about the second one, because you injured yourself doing something that your manager told you to do that was against your doctor's orders. You have written proof from your doctor that this happened. Any lawyer would look at this and say, yeah, I'll take it and you can pay me out of your settlement. All right, our first story today comes to us from Sauzer. Can't work on your laptop without my name badge? Guess it wasn't that critical. Let's jump right in. I worked for a university IT department as a student worker for a little over four years. We had a sister department, the Media Center, who loaned out laptops, projectors, and other technology to professors as needed. In my fourth year in employment, I was on a first name basis with nearly all of the employees of the university, including the head of the Media Center. We'll call her Karen because, <laughs> obviously. Karen was the queen of her kingdom and had quite a few obnoxious rules in place, but most importantly was an ironclad employee ID policy for checking out laptops. Under normal circumstances, I completely agree with this policy. However, this wasn't a normal circumstance. We got a call from her at 4.40 p.m. on a Friday. We closed at 5 that a laptop she was trying to loan out to a very important professor wasn't able to log into the network, and she requested we come look at it. Sure thing. I make the 10-minute walk across campus from our office to the media center with my toolkit. When I get there, I see the professor and Karen and ask to see the laptop. She says, wait, Saucer, you need your name badge. Where is it? Flash to my name badge, clip to my jacket, hanging on a coat rack in the ITS office. Ah, it's on my jacket, Karen. I forgot to grab it rushing over here. I chuckled a bit. Deadpan, she says. Sawzer, you can't work on this until you go get your badge. 
Karen, I thought this was an emergency. Do you need me to fix this right now? Yes, of course, Karen explained. But we still need to always follow policy. Fair enough, policy is incredibly important. I'll go get my name badge. I left the office, trekked the 10 minutes back to my office, then I picked up the phone and called her. Hey Karen, just letting you know that because it's 520 and policy states student workers can't work after hours, I'll have to come back Monday, have a great weekend. She fumed at me for a few minutes until I essentially hung up on her. Policy is very important. OP added an edit to this story that gives us an update. It says, My boss did not like Karen at all. He was an amazing guy in general, late 50s, survived cancer, has MS, but still ran security at biker rallies. He'd been with the university for about 30 years and had 8 weeks PTO, so he would take months off and ride around the country with his equally amazing wife. This was in 2005, and he set the standard for what I would consider a good boss. So he came in Monday morning to a bunch of voicemails from her about it, yells over to me, Sawzer, did you leave Karen hanging on Friday? Yeah, Chuck. His real name, because he's amazing, forgot my name badge. Yeah, you are pretty forgetful sometimes. He shrugged, and that was that. Karen had to loan her individual work laptop to the professor for the week. For the curious, the problem was that in Windows XP days, when logging in, Windows would attempt to connect to every saved wireless network top to bottom. Because this was a loner and there were literally hundreds of hotel, airport, and restaurant Wi-Fis, it was taking 8 or 9 minutes for the login prompt to come up. It took me around 30 seconds to clear out all of the saved Wi-Fi connections and return the laptop to them. Karen was not in the office when I went to work on it Monday morning. Now, OP added a second edit here. It says, I 100% was in the wrong here because I forgot my name badge. I didn't float the name badge policy on purpose. It was a mistake. Anyone familiar with the Midwest will confirm that sometimes it's bitter cold in the morning, but by late afternoon, it's warm enough you don't need a jacket. During my morning tickets, I was wearing a jacket and had my name badge on it. Over lunch, I took my jacket off and didn't need it. It was a mistake, and Karen decided that the badge policy was too important for her to overlook my mistake, which is definitely her prerogative. And it's mine to overlook the student workers cannot be paid overtime rule. The laptop was fixed within 45 business minutes of her reporting the problem to our office, which in my opinion is relatively fast. Name badges and security policies are important, and I could understand her not wanting to let me check out the laptop as if I was a faculty member using their services. But I was an IT employee working late on a Friday even though I wouldn't be done in time, so we both could take care of that professor. I wasn't taking the laptop home, I was working on it in front of her. Additionally, it was her department's policy that she wouldn't let people handle laptops without signing them out, but not ours. Our department had no official name badge policy. There's one more edit on this post by OP. It says, well, there are a lot of assumptions going on. Guys, this was 2005. The purpose of the name badge was so when they wrote down who has the laptop, they could write down who had the laptop. But I wasn't taking the laptop anywhere. In no other department and in no other course of our job was our ID required. And at no point in any other part of our jobs did we have to sign for equipment. It was literally this one woman's department. In the comment section down below, there's a user called Gumnos that asked OP a question. It says, at what point in the story did you know this would be the outcome? I'm thinking as soon as she made you head out to retrieve your badge, you knew she wasn't getting it fixed on your watch. OP replied to this comment and said, the millisecond I realized I forgot my badge walking through the front door. I knew she was going to greet me by name and that it wouldn't matter. You know, part of me is sitting back here thinking, well, OP was just about to leave for the day. They said it was about 20 minutes before the shift ended. You know, if you just happen to quote unquote forget your badge in your office, going over to the place where you know there is stickler for it, and oh no, I'll have to walk back to my office to get it, but by then it'll be past quitting time. Come on, OP, you're not fooling anyone. Our next story today comes to us from Odd Sense of Humor. Sign in, even though I've worked here for 12 years, you got it. Let's jump right in. So my malicious compliance started about a month ago at my workplace where I've been for the past 12 years. 
on the fateful day, I had forgotten my key fob to buzz through the security gate. So I asked the guard, who I've known and chat to for several years, to let me through. As he was getting up, the moody older guard, some of my staff named him Nasty Nick for good reason, next to him, stopped him and rudely told me to sign in. I explained that I've been working here for over a decade and I'm known to this guard so he can vouch for me. He said it doesn't matter, it's a health and safety thing in case there was a fire. Not true, this is a shared building and each company is responsible for accounting for their staff. I know because I helped set up this plan with the building's owner. I explained this to him but he wasn't having it and directed me to the sign-in book which funnily enough had a printed sheet which stated it was for guests only and had a line saying permanent staff should get a sticker to ID themselves. When I asked about the sticker, he said this was the new process and I had to sign in and out each time I entered or exited the building without my fob. I asked if he was sure, he said 100%. Cue malicious compliance. The UK health and safety body says that ideally, you should take a 5-10 to 10 minute break each hour away from your computer screen. Not wanting to get RSI or anything, I took it upon myself to take even more regular breaks, especially when Nasty Nick was on shift. So for my break, I would go on short walks outside, and would you know it, I am getting very forgetful in my old age and keep forgetting to bring in my fob. So each time I come to sign in, Nasty Nick would need to get up, open his door, undo his keys to buzz me in. Quite often, I would forget something in my car just as he's about to let me in and he'll need to make his round trip back to the little office. My record was 13 little breaks over the day. After about two weeks of this, I managed to have a catch up with the younger guard and he explained that he checked and there was definitely not a need for me to sign in each time and even better, Nasty Nick was constantly moaning about me to the other security guys about the idiot who keeps forgetting his fob. OP added an edit onto this one, it says, Edit, I can't spell for all the tea in England. Just to clear up some points as I can't respond to all your lovely messages. I'm a dick, wanker, Karen, small pee pee for doing this. Well, yeah, isn't that what malicious compliance is? Obeying the letter of law, if not the spirit, and making it a slight inconvenience to the person enforcing the malicious compliance? You should have followed the security process. Malicious Compliance Guard made up own rules in contradiction to the set policy for security, which was why Operation Malicious Compliance went into place. If he had stuck to the set policy, he wouldn't have been the target of Malicious Compliance. Leave the old man alone. He's mid-40s at most, not overweight, just very, very rude, hence the nickname, and prone to making up own rules. Why are you not working? How have you got so much time to maliciously comply? I'm in the UK, where a lot of modern companies value health and well-being of their staff and use this as the backbone of a successful business. Frankly, I'd be very upset if I heard any of my staff were upset, overworked, or stressed. I always make a point to have them take regular breaks. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, there's one from a user called FroggyC19. It says, At my old job, it didn't matter who you were. If you didn't have your card, you had to be signed in by security and are then given a temp pass that you hand in at the end of your day. They would check to make sure you still worked there before you got your temp pass. This story actually got me thinking a little bit because they gave you a fob in the first place to get through the gate. That records when you go into the building and thus they know how many people are in the building if something bad happens like a fire or who knows what else. So signing in when you go in through the security guards makes sense, honestly. Any place I've worked at in the past that required you to buzz in or have a badge of some sort would have had a policy like this as well where you had to sign in if you forgot it. It would just be normal procedure. It's time to get some opinions from those listening though. What do you guys think on this story? Do you think OP was in the right for maliciously complying with this guard because they were inconvenienced and had to sign in? Or do you think the guard was right getting them to sign in and, you know, follow policies? Our next story today comes to us from Aqueller Fiction. Fired in two weeks. Let's jump right in. I hope this story isn't too long. It's a little convoluted. I worked for five years as a federal contractor and eventually rose through the ranks, through blood, sweat, and tears, to a low-level supervisor. 
I managed a team of 13 working two federal contracts. Both contracts were new, and I was supposed to make them successful so the contracts would be renewed. This started right before COVID. Even before the poop hit the fan, my second contract was going badly. The agency flooded us with work, and my boss repeatedly refused to ask them to slow it down. That was literally his only job. As a result, late work began piling up and costing the company lots of money. We did our best to keep up, which in reality meant a ton of unpaid overtime for me. Then COVID hit, and things only got worse. My staff asked almost daily if there would be layoffs, and my boss's response to them was, we don't know. To me, the answer was that my job was secure, but the others weren't. If the contract failed, he said, I'd have a place on another team. Obviously, the contract failed. My boss personally fired me and, unbeknownst to me, most of my team. I learned who was staying and who was going by talking with each of them personally. No one knew it was going to happen to them until it happened, and they were all shocked that I'd been fired as well. This was August 2020. Panic ensued. After firing me, my boss, who until that day I'd considered a very good friend, had the stones to call and ask me if I'd help him end the contract on a high note. I got fired two weeks before my official last day because that company is run by Satis. I told him I'd do my job. As a proud Slytherin, I immediately began doing everything I could, within the rules of course, to send my fired staff home in the best shape possible. We all knew our unused PTO time would cash out, but sick time wouldn't. Everyone was sick those last two weeks, and my boss ended up doing most of the work himself. I also sent a ton of people to work from home with COVID-like symptoms so they could use their time to interview for jobs, etc. I was immediately hired by another federal contractor, and I brought my best former employee along with me. Since then, she and I poached about a dozen employees away from our former employer, who eventually threatened to sue her if she had hunted anyone else. I'm proud to say that our revenge fueled efforts have taken so many of their good employees that the company is now openly failing and will soon go out of business. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Long Past Due Date. It says, As a federal contracting company, there are really only two things that have to be done right. Keep your customers happy and keep your employees happy. Fail at either and you will fail as a company. Shocking how often companies fail because they can't do those two things at once. I think the commenter here is forgetting one thing because a lot of companies, well, they just want to keep their shareholders happy. Because if the shareholders are happy, their company still has money. In fact, I'd probably go as far to say as most companies only care about the customer and the shareholder. Because the employees are replaceable, as OP found out in this story. Our first story is actually a two-parter that comes to us from Dead Procrastinator. The first part of this story was posted a year ago to Malicious Compliance and the update was posted yesterday. Here's the first part. You want me to take my jacket off? You got it, boss. Let's jump right in. I work at a secondary education institution. Anyone who has worked in academia will confirm that it's a different brand of crazy. Adding on to that, our staff has no balance in gender or ethnicity, so it's the opposite of toxic masculinity. Toxic femininity doesn't quite roll off the tongue. Anyway, with weak management, it has essentially become a mean girls club. The boss ladies PA is basically queen bee, with the rest of us being lowly worker bees. As I am not someone to kiss butt, I am often not very well liked, hence the lowest worker bee. Work buys staff shirts for everyone with our logo on about three or four times a year. They are usually nice golf shirts or button-up shirts, but the last time? Oof! This is an actual shirt Queen Bee was wearing one day. Boss Lady literally squealed in delight like a toddler when she saw it, insisting that all of us get one of these. Guys, let me describe this monstrosity. It was mainly navy blue, with a type of print. Think paisley, but not quite. The shirt was filled with cartoonish squiggles and doodles that made absolutely no sense. Apples, fleur-de-lis, seashells, even tiny little fish skeletons. They danced and merged in every direction, in violent shades of teal, beige, salmon pink, turquoise green, and neon purple. So versatile, you can wear it with so many different colors. 
And if the design wasn't bad enough, the fit was even worse. A size that normally hugs my figure fit me like a circus tent. It billowed out from right under my chest and was so long, the bottom seam came in just above my thighs. The most unflattering cut I have ever worn. It was like a blind person tried to make maternity wear and changed their mind halfway through. It was also sleeveless. The only one of us who voiced her reservation was forced to give it back. She was visibly happy that she wouldn't have to wear it, and this pissed management off. The shirt was made mandatory on Mondays. Being a person that never gets hot, I wore a jacket over it every time, showing as little of it as I could. One day, to solidify our loyalty, it was decided to take a group photo that purposefully excluded the shirtless one. Being super short, I was placed in front. Boss Lady looked us over and promptly declared, OP, you'll remove your jacket, thank you. I replied that I would really rather not. She insisted and we go back and forth. But they were all of them deceived. I'm quite reserved, so no one at work really knows me. I never wear anything sleeveless because I have tattoos all over my shoulder and halfway down my upper arm. I always look normal and professional wearing tailored jackets, cardigans, or three-quarter sleeves. Cue malicious compliance. You want me to take my jacket off? I insist. No exception? None. I remove my jacket and toss it out of the frame in one of the coolest gestures I have ever been able to perform. I turn forward with my left shoulder facing the camera and reveal a grim reaper with a sweeping scythe and blue wings that actually matched the ghastly shirt quite well, now that I think about it. There is a noticeable intake of breaths and the whole group falls silent, waiting in anticipation to see who would triumph. It was like a shootout in a western. I look at her blankly, internally screaming, "Da F you gonna do now, B? And I'm pretty sure she heard me. Boss Lady realizes she can't go back on what she said without looking like even more of a butt than she already does, and turns to face the camera. Y'all, that was one of my favorite pictures of all time. Pissed off Boss Lady in front, with a smile that just doesn't reach her eyes, tatted up admin immediately to her left with the biggest grin in the whole picture. Everyone else's faces were a mixture of amusement and confusion, Queen Bee slightly frowning as she was still trying to figure out what the F just happened. Marketing showed it to me before deleting it, and we had a few laughs. Needless to say, that photo did not make it into the newsletter as was originally intended. On to part two of this story posted by the same OP one day ago. This one's titled, You Want Me To Wear This Shirt? Again? You got it, boss. Let's jump right in. So this post follows on a previous post from a year back regarding a hideous shirt we had to wear to work. I think it's pretty cool, and if I have to recap, this post will be too long. Socially and politically, our work environment is a mean girls club. I work at a secondary education institution on the support team. For stupid reasons, a hideous shirt that one of the support staff was wearing one day became our mandatory Monday shirt. Cue this week, it's photo week. We are taking group photos of all the staff, learners, and various teams and committees. These are all going in the annual magazine, which is quite a big deal. All staff were informed that they could wear whatever they wished, as long as it lined up with the color palette of the magazine. This was shared with everyone. They actually chose really pretty shades of pink, peach, mauve, and sky blue. The support team was really happy we could skip the ghastly shirt, until we couldn't. Last week, Thursday, it was communicated to us that we would wear the monstrosity. Of the whole institution, our group would be the only one that looked like crap. The next day, Friday, I was at the hairdresser, and inspiration struck. I already have a short pixie cut that I color ultraviolet, basically very dark brown with a purple sheen. I revealed my plans to my stylist, and she loved it. After my haircut, I went shopping. Now, one of the things touted as an advantage of the ugly shirt was the array of colors it contained and how versatile it is, as you can wear it with so many colors. I just don't think you were meant to wear all the colors together at once. Now, in my previous post, I ruined the photo when the sleeveless shirt unexpectedly revealed the tattoos on my left arm and shoulder. 
so I knew this year they would strategically place me with my right side facing forward. I know how they compose and space these photos by now. I've been here too long. So imagine their surprise when I pitch up with an asymmetrical pixie cut. Long bangs, sweeping to the left, regular sideburns to the left, and the right side shaved in a buzz cut. All colored bright purple. Seriously, when I'm facing that way, I look different. So they try to subtly hide me in the middle at the back, slightly behind the person to the left, to hide those pesky tattoos. Because if I'm facing forward, I look sufficiently professional, but I'm wearing killer platform heels, something I haven't done in 10 years, which makes me almost a hand taller than everyone else. I politely decline their request to take my shoes off, so I have to sit in the front. Now, you can clearly see my formal dress pants in bottle green, as well as my undershirt in vibrant teal, my killer heels in pale sparkly gold, and my wide salmon pink belt. Now, I didn't waste any money on these items, wearing any of them alone or in different combinations looks fine, so I will be using them all. No matter what they tried, they could not find a way to make the group look coherently polished and professional. Because one way they had a tatted up admin, if they photoshopped those out, I would complain politely but firmly. The other way they had an angry emo boy. One way the height was off, and the other way they had someone in an ensemble so garish, it offended the senses. This afternoon, a while after work, we were informed that the group photo would be redone for the support team. We were kindly requested to wear the colors as indicated in the color palette tomorrow. In the group WhatsApp, I commented, duly noted, and received a ton of PMs joking about it. On the brighter side, I have received a ton of compliments on the hairstyle. Something so daring, in a sane environment, I never would have tried it. I've colored it back to dark ultraviolet, box color yo takes 20 minutes, which complements my light pink dress nicely, and the wide salmon pink belt rounds it off well. In the comment section for this one, there's one that really stood out to me. It's from a user called McFlame13. It says, we need to abolish making people look professional, as it would actually show that the company has no creativity. If everyone wore what they want, as long as it wasn't offensive or promoted anything illegal, it would show that the company is a good company and would rather have people that are good at their jobs than people that look good. While I can agree with what the commenter is saying, I honestly feel really good when I dress to impress. And I feel when I am dressed to impress, I have a lot more productivity. There's got to be something to that. A lot of places these days don't really require professional dress anyway. They rely on business casual, which is comfy clothes that still looks pretty good. Well, OP, I have to say, after getting an update a year later, I hope that next year around this time, you have another epic story of how you messed up their perfect photo. Our next story today comes to us from K Saves. You want your magazine? Fine, I'll deliver it right to your hand. Let's jump right in. Recently, I, 15 female, started getting complaints on the paper round I work. I work a paper round for extra income since I'm not 16 yet and legally in the UK cannot get a proper job. I've had it for two years. Lately though, about two months or so, I got a new house on the round and they've been nothing but a pain. Not only is it out of the way of my round, so pretty much a hassle to get to, they have to be very rude too. Lately, my boss has been forgetting to put magazines into the papers, and they've constantly been complaining, resulting in me getting reprimanded. That in itself isn't very bad, but they've yelled at me for not closing their gate properly, getting too close to their ring doorbell, and waving at their child from the window in the morning. All small things that led to this malicious compliance. Five weeks ago, however, they were still complaining about getting no magazine, despite me making sure before I delivered that it went through and I was getting tired. The next time I delivered their papers, I knocked. Bear in mind, I have to get these papers delivered quickly, so it was 6 a.m. at this point. However, I knocked and knocked until the wife of the grumpy guy opened the door, half asleep and looking agitated. She coughs slightly, and in a typical Karen voice she goes, What the hell do you want? I look at her with fake stun, as if I don't know what I'm doing, and tell her, I'm just delivering the magazine like you asked. 
At this moment, she knew she couldn't complain, because one, her ring doorbell caught it all, and two, I had physically handed it to her this time. Undeniable proof. For the next upcoming weeks, I knocked until they answered the door, making sure to knock extra loud. This morning, however, the husband answered the door and he looked defeated. He flat out looked at me and apologized. In his words at least, we get it, we're sorry about the complaints, please stop knocking so early and just get the paper through the door. After that long round, nothing felt more satisfactory than the sweet taste of malicious compliance. I may be underpaid, but it was all worth it to see that face. Jumping down to the comment section in this one, we have one from a user called 87 Lonely Girl. You learned a valuable lesson that some adults never do. Manners cost nothing, and the poetic justice of giving someone exactly what they want can be so much better than getting yourself worked up. This will be a story you tell for decades to come. OP replied to this comment and said thank you. Hopefully, I'll have a lot more malicious compliance to come. People on these rounds are all pretty entitled when it comes to getting their papers on time. <laughs> well, OP, if you ever have another person like this on your round, I have something you could do that might get them a little annoyed. Every single time you go to deliver a paper, deliver it a couple inches closer to the road and not to their front door. Every single time, keep moving it back further and further and further so they have to come right out of their house to get it. It's just a little bit of petty revenge mixed with some malicious compliance, but trust me, it works. Our next story today comes to us from I Carem. The day the dishwasher exploded. Let's jump right in. Standard disclaimers here, English is not my first language. Feel free to dunk on my grammar all you want. I was reading my daily quota of malicious compliance when I remembered a distant memory that might apply here. I was a young girl at the time, around 10 years old I believe. Being from a somewhat well-off family in Brazil, we used to have helpers around the house. On weekdays, a nice old lady would come in to clean the house and cook lunch for us. On the weekends, it was me and my sibling, nine years my senior, who were tasked with cleaning up after lunch, and that meant loading up the dishwasher. Now, my sibling is a master dishwasher loader. They do an incredible game of Tetris with the dishes, and it somehow works. With that in mind, my mother decided it was a good idea to let prepubescent me take a shot at the dishwasher. First time, it didn't go well. I loaded the dishwasher as best as I could, but there were still a lot of dishes left. Me, being a little kid, didn't understand the tricks of finessing cups on the plate holders and whatnot. Understandably, my mother was a bit frustrated considering she was used to my sibling's sorcery and told me, and I quote, Next time, you better fill the dishwasher up. Bad mistake. Cue to next weekend. Me, being a smart butt, loaded that dishwasher up as much as humanly possible. I remember stacking glass trays up on each other, jamming cutlery in the cutlery holder until it was akin to a solid block of metal and I'm pretty sure I put multiple plates on each row. And then I put the soap in, closed that bad boy, and turned it on. I wouldn't say the dishwasher exploded, but the content sure as heck did. I assume due to the hot water jets, some dishes, all made of glass by the way, kept clanging against each other and broke, and the glass shards flew out, breaking other dishes. Hours later, while I was entertaining myself in the yard by trying to find worms in the dirt, I heard a scream from the kitchen. The dishwasher sat there, very much broken, with water and soap gushing out. There were glass shards everywhere. My mother stood there, staring at the dishwasher, with what I assume was terror in her eyes. She turned to me, what did you do? Me, the devil spawn, knowing exactly what I did, I filled it up, like you said. Next time, my sibling taught me how to load the dishwasher properly, after we bought a new dishwasher, and a new set of dishes. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called My Thick Beach. We're being specific on pronunciation there. It says, I hate parents that get mad because their kid doesn't know how to do anything. Why don't they know anything? Didn't you teach them? OP replied to this comment and said, my mom tried to make fun of me to her friends about how I don't know how to wash clothes. 
I did turn to her and say, well, no one taught me how, not even you. So now she only makes fun of me when I'm not present. OP, I'm glad your sister was able to show you how to get it done properly, because it sounds to me like your parents just didn't want to bother. I also want to mention that pretty much every time we see one of those English isn't my first language disclaimers, the writing is so much better than people who have been brought up on English and have it as a first language and have been speaking it their whole life. OP, I don't think you need to use that disclaimer anymore. Your English is better than mine. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Gavilla438. You want updates? You got it. Let's jump right in. I remembered this particular scenario and wanted to bring it up here. It's a long one, so grab your popcorn and drinks. Here we go. So, one of the first IT jobs I worked was for the corporate headquarters of a Midwestern sandwich chain. My brother's best friend was the IT manager of this place and was given full reign to hire anyone he wanted. We had previously worked together in another place and he liked my work ethic, so he ended up asking if I'd take the job. Of course, I said yes, since I genuinely enjoyed working alongside this friend, and I thought it would be cool to report to him. Anyway, a few months go by and everything is going well. I had met and enjoyed mostly everyone in the IT department. Then one day, the CEO congratulates and welcomes a new CTO. This confused me as I thought that my friend's boss was the CTO, but I then was told that he was actually an interim CTO the whole time. So, being green and naive, I decided to take it upon myself to meet the new CTO. The conversation goes more or less like so. Hi, my name is Jerry. I'm one of the help desk technicians here. It's a pleasure to meet you and looking forward to working with you. Sticks out hand to shake hands. CTO blank stares at my hand, then back at me. Uh, yeah, so if you need anything or have any questions, I will do my best to help. So just because I am a woman, I need help. And what exactly can a help desk help me with? Don't offer to help me unless I ask for it. Got it? My friend saw this and was honestly shocked. To this day, that entire exchange still haunts me. In any case, I moved on and ensured to try to stay out of the CTO's way. I decided I wanted to just do my job and work with my friend. The entire time I worked there, my friend had kept me in the loop with all his projects and his work so that I could hopefully be successful in the field. Then, one day, when I get to the office, I am informed that my friend was fired by a demand of the CTO since he was not meeting expectations, despite all the reports showing that his leadership and changes did in fact yield very high ratings for ticket closures and customer satisfaction. That same day, the CTO comes to the help desk room and walks up to me. She then says, Hey, you, you worked alongside that manager, right? Well, I'm making you the interim manager since you know most everything he was working on. I felt like this was two slaps to the face. One being that she didn't refer to me by name, and the other that she gives me my friend's job the same day he was fired. A few weeks go by and I just experience going to meeting after meeting. I keep getting told that performance ratings and customer satisfaction is dropping. In particular, the biggest gripe that was reported was that work orders were not getting any updates for days on end and that the requesters were beginning to feel that we were ignoring their issues. I tried to reply with a plan that I had to help alleviate this, but the CTO said, we will make sure this is fixed and would not let me speak. After all those meetings, the CTO sets up a meeting with myself, the director of infrastructure, we'll call him Matt, and the previous interim CTO, who we will call Joe. Okay, how are we going to fix the problem with the work orders? Well, I've got a plan that should help with this. See, what I need to do is canvas the tickets and see what, if I needed a plan, I would have asked for it. I want an answer now. Okay, well, I'm trying to give you the answer, which is a part of this plan then it's useless if you can't get to the answer. Any other ideas? At this point, we all stayed fairly silent and the CTO was just more or less rambling to herself. At the end, her response was glorious. Okay, so moving forward, no matter what it is, I want every ticket to be updated immediately with anything that's going on with the request as it's being worked on. Everything that's going on with the request immediately as it happens? Are you sure about that? I feel like that's going to cause I know what I said. If I have to repeat myself, consider yourself out of a job. Silent for a second and then understood. 
She then proceeded to send an email summarizing almost everything that happened in the meeting. She then writes that I have no constructive information to provide, but again, see her plan there. It was then that it occurred to me. Q malicious compliance. I go back to the help desk room to announce the immediate change. Hey everyone, just wanted to give you a heads up that moving forward, you are to provide every work order with any and all updates possible. That includes anything from looking at the ticket, to moving a laptop, to typing on it, just anything you do must be related and entered into a ticket. Um, you want everything in tickets? Yep, you heard that right, everything. As you work on the tickets, keep those updates coming. But if we do that, we could potentially trigger the spam filters. Also, it's going to flood the requester's mailboxes. Did you mention this to the CTO? She didn't care to hear about it. It's apparently not constructive information. The other four technicians stayed silent until one of them said, A storm is brewing. This is going to be fun. And we all laughed, knowing what was going to happen. I went to the email that the CTO sent regarding the summary of our meeting and opened it in its own window on my computer. I then continued to do as she had asked, and so did the other technicians. It wasn't even an hour before our updates were beginning to get blocked by the spam filters, and we started getting emails from the requesters asking us why we were updating the work orders so much, others asking to be removed from future ticket updates, and many demanding to speak to a manager regarding this sudden disturbance. I updated the IT help desk email with an automatic reply that said something along the following. Thank you for your message. If this is in regards to your ticket updates, rest assured that we have your best interest in mind. A new policy is in place to provide you with as much transparency to your IT requests. This is in hopes to provide a better customer service experience. Please rest assured that we are aware of the amount of tickets this may produce. We hope to provide further support to you and look forward to completing your request shortly. Company IT Help Desk it was not long after this that the CEO came into the help desk room and demanded to know what the heck was going on. I could tell he was ready to fire someone when I calmly said, Good afternoon, sir. We are simply following orders and pointed at my screen to the email with the meeting summary. The CEO looked at me and growled, Follow me. As we were walking, we passed by Matt's, Joe's, and the CTO's office. Each time the CTO growling at them, In my office, now. We get to his office and the conversation goes like this. What the hell is going on? I will reiterate, I am only following orders. And what exactly were those orders? Reiterates the new orders. Here's the email from the CTO regarding this order. Sir, I can explain. I was just thinking that. And did no one stop to think what issues this would cause? Well, Jerry did try to explain a plan to the CTO. If I am not mistaken, Jerry knows that the exchange servers detect multiple updates coming out like this in a small time window. It triggers a spam blocker. And that's why my plan was to update each ticket only once a day, rather than after every single thing that was done towards the request. I asked you to update at the end of the day with everything that happened with the work order. According to your summary, you did ask for ticket updates as they occurred, and Jerry's team provided this. Why did you not listen to Jerry's plan of action? Well, sir, I have been working in the field since before 2000. What can someone like Jerry provide me with? Well, he can provide you with the information to tell you why your idea has just caused the company a ton of money, since now our exchange server got overloaded. When I was talking about canvassing, I was trying to say that I wanted to reach out to each location's manager to compile a list of tickets to update in a scheduled manner, rather than do them all at once. But since you wouldn't listen to me and even threatened to fire me, I only complied with your plan. I cannot believe this is happening. Why am I being targeted here? At this point, the CEO asked Matt, Joe, and me to leave while he had a word with the CTO on what teamwork means. Several minutes later, the network infrastructure team was able to reboot the exchange servers and remove the IT help desk mailbox from the spam filters. I later provided a mass email update to the organization apologizing for any inconveniences that were caused and that I would be reaching out to provide planned support. I would soon find out that the CTO was placed on an unpaid leave and further investigation was pending. I ended up quitting a few months after that since after the incident, the CTO was frequently trying to take her grudge out on Joe, Matt, and me. I did leave reporting the incidents to HR. I did later find out that the CTO was terminated and arrested for embezzlement.
Now, OP provided an update at the bottom of this story. It says, update. I am genuinely shocked, sort of, at how much this blew up. Thank you all. Well, I suppose I will do my best to tie up some loose ends. For starters, for those who don't believe this is real, there are actually court documents out there regarding the embezzlement issues. I won't link them since I would rather not get this story traced back to me, but just think really hard of a popular United States Midwestern-based sandwich shop and look for embezzlement. You might find your proof. Another thing for anyone who thinks that I was being respectful towards the CTO on my introduction, no, it was not because of chivalry. I respect everyone equally, despite their status or position, or power I suppose. When I started at this company, everyone was super friendly and genuinely liked working with one another. So greeting new staff in a friendly manner and offering to provide assistance was just a norm. So the fact that she came in with that large of a chip on her shoulder and further accused me of being sexist really threw me off. Furthermore, to clarify, that experience haunts me every time I speak to any female staff, and thoughts race through my head, making me wonder if what I did or said could be deemed sexist, despite knowing darn well that I'm being respectful and professional. Okay, now for the juicy bits, the embezzlement. When I found out about the embezzlement, I had already jumped ship from the place and moved on to a much better company. At the new company, I actually ended up poaching some of the best staff from the previous company to come work alongside me. Although I had almost no connections left at the Sandwich HQ place, some of the people I had brought over still had quite a number of connections back there. When I left, the company was no longer as friendly as it used to be. It was obvious that it was going down the crapper and overall becoming toxic, completely opposite from the image they tried to portray. So one day I come into work and one of my buddies just shoots out of his chair, walks over to my desk, opens Google Chrome, and types in a certain set of keywords, hit search, the top item was the public court documents. I read through it and found out everything. I reached out to Joe to see if he was still there. Sure enough, he had left a few months after the scandal. He informed me of what had happened. So it turns out that Mark and one of his employees were taking money from one of the vendors to be able to basically remain one of the company's utility companies across the US. At this time, the CTO was looking to switch to a different provider, but this particular provider did not want to lose the company since they were their biggest contract. So the CTO made a deal with the head of the provider company, where they were suddenly accepting unreported funds. What ended up happening though, was that one of the employees reported his earnings in taxes, which somehow ended up going back to the company. I'm not sure about how this worked out, I am not a tax guy. But then it went to finance department. This is where I called my contact from the finance department. My contact had told me that she saw the reported income, and it did not add up at all. His income was basically doubled, but she worked alongside payroll and they knew his wages. The fact that he reported almost double his income could get both him and the company in serious trouble. So she did the only thing she could do, which was have an audit done. They reported this to the CEO and agreed to bring in an outside auditor, just to avoid any sort of possible conflicts of interest. The auditor then comes back to find where the extra funds came from. Being a special contract with Mark, his employee, and the CTO signed off on it. They worded it very carefully so that it would go under the radar, but the taxes would be charged to the company. A week after the audit, some officials arrived at the company and arrested those three individuals. I'm not sure if they served jail time or something, but they sure as heck were walked out of there in handcuffs. Oh, and to answer one final question, for those wondering how in the heck the CTO got to her position in the first place, she was friends with the CEO. She apparently is out there, still being a CTO to this day. At my current job, one of my coworkers asked me if I knew this person's name, and I crap you not, I was like, how the F do you know her? Only to later find out, that coworker worked for the CTO and hated her. My coworker was going through some major issues while at that company, and when she opened up about it, the CTO threatened to fire her as she was just a liability waiting to happen. My coworker is in safe hands now, where she gets the treatment and therapy she needs. Hopefully this answers any questions you all may have. I will update again if you have any further questions. 
cheers. OP did add one more really short update at the bottom. It says, some of you are really good sleuth. <laughs> Regardless, I'm neither going to confirm or deny the company name, especially because I don't want to dox anyone. Nobody should be doxed. I did see this in a comment, and I will admit that I'm unsure as to why the CTO's name isn't in the court documents. I couldn't tell you since I wasn't there for that. All I know is that she walked out in handcuffs. When a new executive joins a company and treats people like that, they're basically painting a big target on their own back and then handing out pew pews to everybody who works under them. In this case, the reason the CTO was so defensive might have been because they were trying to cover up the embezzlement scheme. When somebody is being dishonest with a company, they're always looking over their shoulders and they're not going to allow anyone to get really that close, except for the people that they're conspiring with. So this makes complete sense in this case. What really doesn't make sense in this case is that OP said that they are still a CTO somewhere. How? With an embezzlement charge on your record? How are you not flipping burgers for the rest of your life? if you can even get a job there. All right, our first story today comes to us from Punk Linux. Oh, you think the trade shows are actually vacations wrought with fraud and you want to impose strict controls over a business you don't understand? Good luck. Let's jump right in. Many years ago, I worked for a company that hired an incredibly obtuse financial department who took over when they first organized. It used to be a loose collection of managers, but the year after I started, they went for a more organized and separate structure. To be fair, this is more about my boss than myself. We had a travel team, a group of volunteers from sales and IT who would go en masse with equipment and techs to do setups, displays, and network at trade shows. We had a booth, some sales guys would be there, and networking would commence. There was always a set of volunteers from the IT department because some of the shows would be in big cities, and you'd get to attend vendor events, parties, and hang out with the sales guys, who were mostly gay alcoholics for some reason, and super fun. There was a kind of seniority to who got to volunteer, but nobody really complained, and everyone got rotated who got to go. You got to go to DEF CON last year, it's my turn now. Okay, fair. The travel team lead was also a volunteer position, but commonly someone high up, like a manager. Their job was to orchestrate equipment, rentals, expenses, travel plans, convention center fees, and shipping. They also ended up getting a lot of free stuff too, from sales and our partners, which they'd pass along to the travel team. It was all kind of a perk, to be fair, for everyone involved. But when the new director of finance started, she put in some new and strict policies. Some of their policies started with, 1. Travel team is not allowed to get reimbursed without explicit approval and nobody was approved post-event. Two, travel team does not get a credit card of their own or even a company card. Three, travel team gets gift cards for a set amount like $150, which was to be used for all expenses. Sadly, places we needed it for like airlines, rental agencies, hotel rooms, gas pumps, and toll booths do not accept gift cards. Finance denied these were gift cards and even specifically disallowed people in meetings to refer to them as such. Pre-approved credit balances, I think we had to say. But to the rest of the world, they were 100% exactly the same as gift cards with gift card restrictions. For, no matter how early you asked for it, often finance waited until the very, very last minute and usually after half a dozen reminders to get anything approved which incurred a lot of unnecessary costs, like expedited shipping, same-day rental penalties, or inflated airfares. 5. If they forgot, it was your fault or your manager's fault for not reminding them enough. Okay, you reminded them four times to buy the team airline tickets and it wasn't done? Should have reminded them five times, so your fault. This was all in response to the Director of Finance's claim it would reduce fraud, an issue that, as far as anyone could tell, had never happened. The Director had this Dolores Umbridge approach that somebody somewhere might get away with something. She was a patronizing git with a smug grin and this annoying head waggle when she downsplained something to you. So we'll call her Dolores. Before her, the travel team would just submit receipts and get reimbursed. Dolores put an end to that, specifically saying that the previous lead of the travel team was just going to spend all the money on steaks and wine. 
he, understandably, told her to go F herself and quit the company when the dust settled. In his wake, Dolores used his free stuff from vendors as a shiny example of stolen opulence and swag hoarding that she put an end to. Oh, behold the mighty on his throne of Airborne Express stress squishies and free Uline catalogs. That left my manager to take over his duties, and he'd never done Travel Team, so he wasn't really sure how it all worked and didn't push back on Dolores at first until he was forced to travel with the team. He was surprised he didn't have an expense account or a corporate card, and when he asked for one, he got the gift card. When he tried to use it, it was rejected pretty much everywhere he needed it, except various restaurants. He paid for everything else on his personal American Express card, including stuff for the rest of the team, and was rejected for reimbursements because he didn't ask for it beforehand. He was on the hook for $40,000 plus in various things from two week-long trips. Of course, he complained to the top management. Dolores threatened to quit if she wasn't allowed to do her job, and the top managers never had to deal with her before and were kind of wishy-washy about being the bad guy here. Like, well, she says she lets you use gift cards, so... And when my manager said they were rejected, Dolores said, he's not trying hard enough, he's afraid of confrontation, he needs to be a big boy and fight back. But in the end, the top management reimbursed him under pressure from the legal department. After that happened, Dolores settled on having certain things prepaid for, like hotel, travel, truck rentals, and shipping. But they waited so long to do them that often they tried to get hotel rooms or truck rental the day of a popular event, sold out, or got the wrong hotel. Washington, D.C. is not the same as Washington State. Or waited so long for shipping, it cost $250 to send something overnight that would have cost $40 to send it a few weeks prior. They also didn't understand how much anything actually cost, and how we save money by doing things ourselves. And in some cases, finance did everything wrong. So the team would arrive at the hotel and found out that finance didn't submit an authorized approval for a card, for say, incidentals, a requirement for most hotels for trade shows, and nobody could reach them. So again, people got dinged on their personal cards. Again, Dolores said, they just can't accept what the hotel desk, convention center union, or dumb minimum wage bunny at the toll booth tells them. They have to fight back. We can't spoon feed and coddle these guys because they're too scared of conflict. Ever fight with a Jersey Turnpike toll booth collector? Yeah, neither had she. After two of these disasters, my manager said, just stop. Stop volunteering for these events. I will not approve time off for it. He declined being travel lead for future trips because he just couldn't afford it. This was an unpopular move, at best, but he told us, just wait, let her do things her way. He was a master at malicious compliance, and with no resistance, Dolores went into fifth gear with the smug grin. Now we're going to act like a real company. That leads to the next issue. Some of these travels were in major cities, like Chicago, New York City, Washington DC, etc. Dolores again said that people were just going to these events to get the company to pay for a drinking vacation. Management was like, uh, yeah, we wouldn't get volunteers otherwise. Well, Dolores didn't like that idea, so she decided she would hold a staff lottery and you could enter your name and she'd have a drawing on who got to go to be fair to everyone. This fairness seems awfully slanted on her own staff, by the way, which we'll get to shortly. The point of these trade shows was not to take a vacation, something Dolores made absolutely sure to point out, but she didn't grasp the entire reason we went, to increase our business. It had to be IT folk for setup and sales folk for the schmoozing, but that concept never got past her ears into the cognitive understanding. Well, since those IT and tech folk who already couldn't go didn't want to pay for it, we didn't volunteer. So the travel team ended up being other company staff who had no idea how to work, act, or deal with trade shows, which was a horrific expense disaster. Imagine the administrative assistant for marketing on the fifth floor winning a ticket, only to find out she had to pay for everything. Plus, Dolores always sent one of her own to keep an eye on everyone. But none of them knew how trade shows worked either. They only knew how to kowtow to Dolores and her control issues. 
What is a union fee? What is corkage? No, we did not approve some union to give us power. You plug your boost stuff into an outlet or something. They won't let you? Who is they? Well, then stop using TV screens in the booth. You don't need them. We do not sell TVs anyway. Did you know that if you have a conflict with an event center union and decline their help, they charge you anyway at max rate? Yeah, Dolores and her team didn't know that either. And let me tell you, paying those guys a few thousand bucks ahead of time is a lot cheaper than just letting them charge you fines afterwards. Oh, she tried to fight back because she was not afraid of a little conflict, but lost heavily. Ironically, despite Dolores stating otherwise at great length, the non-IT or salespeople who went actually thought it was company paid vacation-ish, just like Dolores warned about, making it a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. The fact that they had to work was surprising at first, then after the word got out, nobody would enter into the lottery, so now they had no volunteers. So Dolores assigned them to interns. Interns! I could write an entire novel from that disaster alone. Imagine sending a bunch of college kids to Vegas, telling them they had to pay for things, and putting them in a job conflict situation where they were guaranteed to lose? I am sure many laws were broken. Dolores then had to send along chaperones to manage it, who were more of her finance department flunkies, and our company ended up with massive fines for various issues, including paying bail for the interns. Because the interns got into so much trouble, Dolores started hiring room monitors for the hotels, and fully legal adults had to go to the show, work the entire day at the show on their feet, then check back into their room. She also put four to six people to a room too, like they were a high school band or something. She even had breathalyzers bought for it to make sure nobody was drinking. Adults. She treated adults like this. This was brought up by the sales team as a PR nightmare, and my boss said, just wait, okay? Let her hang herself. The first year of this, the travel team's expenses increased by over 4,000%. You heard me, 4,000%. Trips that used to cost $3,600 were now costing $144,000 or more, often because of last-minute fees and penalties. The travel team expenses went from $110,000 annual on average to over $2.something million. Because crap was so badly mishandled, we lost a lot of our booth slots and booth renewals, so we lost half of our trade shows and looked like idiots to our clients. But the main reason we went to those trade shows in the first place was for networking, so there was literally no reason to go anymore. This was pointed out to Dolores multiple times by the sales team, so she doubled down and cancelled the travel team after just one year. Finally, top management got involved, who actually fought with Dolores for a year until she retired for personal reasons to dedicate herself to her family. Then, it took nearly two years to rebuild the travel team from scratch. People got corporate cards, travel team lead became an actual job, and when we hired one, she handled all the financial stuff for us. So it was much better, and saved the company a ton of money in her first year. And there was much rejoicing. OP added a couple of edits onto the story where they answered some questions that they had down in their comment section. The first one says, why was she not fired when the spending went from 110,000 to 2.1 million? OP said several reasons, the biggest being she was director of finance, so I am sure when she gave her fiscal report she downplayed the mistakes. We also had some really good years in the early 2000s, so if we made 2 million in profit the previous year and 3 million the next, that loss would have gone unnoticed until someone realized we should have made 6 million instead. That's my theory at any rate, based on the aftermath. Dolores was friends with two of the top managers, and supposedly had a come-to-Jesus meeting with them about the state of our company's financial standings. So that's why they hired her in the first place. By the second year, several directors had quit, including friends of top management, who took them for drinks later and got the entire scoop. Dolores has got to go. The trade show thing was only one of the cases she aft things up, she also completely hosed one of our major supply chains by lowballing them and making a few enemies that nearly destroyed the company and gave away some of our more lucrative contracts with vendors to competitors because that broke their anti-competitive clauses. 
there were more issues, but that comes closer to identifying some people, which is a huge no-no here. The next question for OP was, what happened to the Christmas party? OP said, the Christmas party wasn't nearly as interesting, she just didn't have one. This was near the tail end of the whole, now we're going to run this like a real company fiasco. But once the budget for events was 2.1 million from 110,000, the Christmas party was probably far down her list of worries. I don't even think she knew she was supposed to have one. Some people think she was funneling that money to cover up the massive expense increase for the trade shows fiasco, but I can't imagine that those budgets were from the same pool. I think around November, people started asking, don't they have a holiday party every year? But nobody knew who was doing it. Usually, it was three people who were a huge part of it in previous years, but were no longer with the company. They had quit mostly because of Dolores. But even they didn't run it per se, they hired and catered it out at some fancy hotel locally. Our fiscal year was January to December, so December was huge for tying things up. And this was her first year running fiscal year end stuff. She came on board late in the previous year, and so the finance would have been normally very occupied anyway. The next question to OP was, how was she let go? OP responded with, she just gained too many enemies in the company. It took a while, but after she had been with us for a year and a half, she accumulated too much negative drag on her inertia to get things done because there started to be a very strong passive resistance. This caused her to spiral out of control and try to start a coup which gained no traction and singled her out as being mildly unhinged to say the least. By the time her second anniversary came and went, she started taking sabbaticals until one of them became permanent. Her assistant took over but then was let go and they brought in some consultant group who started a new financial team. They were the ones that suggested someone have the travel team lead as an actual separate paid job. The woman who got hired and ran that was amazing. The final question for OP was, is it true she tried to sell keychains and pens? The answer was, no one asked this, but a former coworker reminded me that she was appalled when we were just giving away some of our normal booth freebies like stickers, pens, shirts, and keychain flashlights. She demanded we charge at least a nominal fee for them, but nobody followed that mandate. I only personally knew she sent out a memo admonishing employees that a lot of the keychains went missing, and she was seeing them on people's desks. Those cost the company money and wanted to charge employees $3 for them, but apparently she wanted to charge the people at the booth as well. Okay, so we jumped down to the comment section on this one, and there's one from a user called JR Freddy. It says, It floors me how in these cases, upper management can't see that this person is subtracting value from the company. Did she not have a boss asking her to explain why a $4,000 expense turned into $144,000? Why not? Sometimes people make mistakes or unexpected things happen. But the second time this happened, she should have been a thread away from firing. We can't afford to pay you because we're paying for all your mistakes. The fact that she had that much rope to hang herself with is some pretty colossal mismanagement from the executive team. OP replied to this one, it says, it's been nearly two decades, but she was a friend of a friend who got a lot of their financial stuff organized and up to regulatory standards. That's why they were hesitant, because she could take her football and go home, so to speak. But after a lot of these incidents where she prevented teams from doing their jobs and dropping the ball on our annual Christmas party, they were like, we gotta do something about Dolores. My question on this one is just how buddy-buddy was Dolores with the CEO? I mean, if I was a manager, I would have been floored that someone was that incompetent. You can't tell me one of the higher-ups didn't notice that an expense account was up 4,000%. What did Dolores have on them that would cause them to let her stay in the company? I guess we'll never know. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Nova Evil Capitalist. Card dealer tells me I shouldn't waste my time and go to a competing dealer because they also won't give me the price they listed on their website. Let's jump right in. This took place eight years ago when I was buying my first new car. Not just a new to me car. I spent a good amount of time researching the options available, both in terms of other models from other manufacturers and option packages on the car in which I was most interested so I knew exactly what I wanted coming in the door. 
in 2014, card dealer websites hadn't quite gotten to the level of borderline bait and switch trickery you see these days. So if a dealer's website said they had a particular car on the lot at a particular price, they almost certainly did. There were several in the region that matched what I was looking for, one specifically at my existing dealership. This wasn't a smaller dealership. It was one of the largest in the Northern Virginia area for this particular brand. I had had a reasonably good experience with their service department overall and figured I'd give their sales department a chance to shine. That was my first mistake. I showed up on a Wednesday after work. It was early June, so with the Mercury being in the upper 90s, I was dressed in a comfortable but still very presentable combination of a polo shirt and khaki shorts. When I entered the sales side of the dealership, I could see what appeared to be all the salespeople in a conference room laughing and joking while taking scissors to the tie of one of the men present. Later, I found out that was a rite of passage after making your first sale. I waited around for a minute or two as the conference room had glass walls and it would be impossible not to notice me as I'm not exactly a small fellow at 6 feet 6 inches tall. When no one came out to greet me, I went up to the receptionist desk and said, Hi, I'm interested in model of car and there's one in stock I'd like to see. Her response without even looking up from her phone was, Okay. I stood there for another 20 seconds or so and then politely asked, would someone be able to show me that car? This finally prompted her to look up from her phone. She looked me up and down, scoffed a bit, and said she'd go get someone. I was willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, hoping that things would turn around. That was my second mistake. The receptionist came back with what looked like the youngest, most wet behind the ear salesperson she could find, as evidently I wasn't worth the time of the more experienced folk. I explained that I was interested in a car that their website said they had in stock and provided him with the printout showing the stock number, price, and all other pertinent details. It took him a while to find the car on the lot, but after a brief test drive, I knew it was what I wanted and began the sales process. I had a trade-in, which had been primarily serviced by them and for which I already had a written offer from CarMax, so I knew how much I should receive for it. He quoted me just over half of that figure. When I pointed out that I could get several thousand more by taking it to the CarMax just up the road and had a written offer from them for that specific amount, he went and got his sales manager who offered to drive me there and pick me up afterwards, but that they wouldn't match what CarMax offered. I was a bit surprised that they didn't want a nice used car to sell for themselves six years old, top of the line, reasonable mileage, and serviced by them specifically. But again, cut them more slack than they deserved. When we got to price, things really fell apart. He quoted me a price that was several thousand dollars higher than what they displayed on their website. When I showed him the printout again with a noticeably lower price, he looked to the sales manager for guidance. The sales manager immediately took the line that the price listed includes all available rebates and special offers and you may not qualify for all of them. I was now frustrated and showed them printouts from other dealers in the area that had a similar price shown and said that if they weren't willing to honor the price listed on their website, I'd just go to the next closest dealer that had that model in stock at that price. His response sealed the deal for me. Go ahead, waste your time and go to competing dealership. We won't hold it against you when you come back here. I told them, okay, thank you for your time. I'll go to the competing dealership and got up to leave. No one stopped me and the receptionist said nothing as I walked past her out to the parking lot to drive to the other dealership. When I got to the competing dealership, it was already around 8 p.m. as I had spent a fair amount of time at the first dealership and Northern Virginia traffic has never been known for being reasonable. I had a salesperson approach me immediately upon entering the dealership, and I explained, I've just come from first dealership and want to buy particular model of car. Both of you have that car in stock with the options I want. They wouldn't give it to me at the price shown on their website. If you will, I'm ready to sign on the dotted line right now. The salesperson immediately took me to his office, verified that they had the car, and confirmed that yes, the price on their website was accurate and I could walk out the door with that price. We started the process and when we got to trade-in, 
I further explained how the other dealership tried to lowball me on the trade. He said if I could produce a written offer from CarMax for the price I mentioned, they would match it. I gave him that paperwork and without any further discussion, he agreed that they would match that and we moved on to financing. I hadn't gotten this far with the other dealer, but I had already lined up financing through my credit union. He asked if I'd be willing to see if his F&I guy could match or beat that figure. I agreed to let him try, and he came back with a rate that was 50 basis points lower. Needless to say, I was already very happy with these people, but that definitely sealed the deal. Right as I was finishing the paperwork, the salesperson from the first dealer texted me to ask if they would give me the car at that price. I responded back that they would, and I was finishing up the paperwork at that very moment. He immediately tried to call me, then texted me saying he'd give it to me for $500 less. I responded to his text stating that I'd already signed the paperwork and he had lost the sale. Once the paperwork was complete, the exceptionally pleasant and helpful salesperson at my new dealership spent an additional half hour after the dealership had closed for the night running me through some of the features of the car and showing me how the infotainment system worked. This was completely above and beyond what I expected, as I thought I'd just be reading the 300-page user manual to figure it out on my own. I drove home that night with my shiny new car, a very happy camper. The next day, I decided to rub a little salt in the wounds of the first dealership, so I drove there straight from the office. For context, I work in the banking industry, and at that point, it was still very much business formal dress. I showed up in my suit with my briefcase and had people falling all over themselves trying to help me, including the receptionist who clearly remembered who I was midway through me asking for the particular salesperson I dealt with the prior day. She offered me a seat and asked if I wanted some coffee while she went to get him, and I politely said, no, thank you, I won't be here long. She somewhat quietly sheepishly responded that she'd be back with that salesperson very shortly. There was a couple in the waiting area who seemed a bit displeased that they'd been waiting for a salesperson, but I got one the moment I walked in the door. No more than a minute later, the salesperson and his manager came out. The salesperson recognized me and with a look of defeat on his face, shook my hand and asked how I was today. Before I had a chance to respond, the sales manager spoke up to introduce himself as if I hadn't spent an hour and a half with him the previous day. After I reminded him that I was there yesterday and he had said it would be a waste of time to go to the competing dealer because they'd never give me the car I wanted at the price shown on their website, his demeanor very quickly pivoted back to the snotty, insolent person I dealt with the previous day. He proceeded to ask, well, did they? With a bit of a sneer. I said nothing, but turned to the side and clicked the remote for my new car so the horn would give a few chirps. He said, good for you, in a rather curt tone and walked away, leaving the poor salesperson on his own. I shook that salesperson's hand, thanked him for his time, and turned around to leave. The receptionist spoke up as I walked past her and asked in a rather chipper voice if I needed any further assistance. I politely responded that no, the other dealership had provided me exactly what I needed, and I was all set. To make things just that little bit better, as I passed the couple sitting in the waiting area, I saw them exchange looks with each other that seemed to say, perhaps we should go to the dealer he mentioned. I said nothing further and walked out of the building wearing the smile of a winner. I think OP could have gotten back at their original dealership even more if they'd mentioned to the sales manager that they're not going to bring their car there for maintenance anymore as well. That's where the dealership really makes their money, and if you don't bring your car in there, that's probably the best way to hurt them. On the way out, when the other couple said that maybe they should go to the dealership that OP went to, OP should have told them about the salesperson they worked with at that other dealership. That would have been a huge compliment for that salesperson. And it might have even gotten OP a kickback of some sort for sending that sale to them. Our next story today comes to us from Daibe Flaw. What would a man know? Let's jump right in. Many, many moons ago, I worked in a department store. It was a weekend contract gig while I was at university. It had departments for a variety of things, 
and for no particular reason, I ended up in the basement on homewares. No grumbles from me, money, even if it is minimum wage, is money. Work was easy and my team was awesome. First week there, I recall someone saying, retail would be great if it wasn't for the customers. I was saddened. What a morose mentality to have for the place you spend most of your waking week. It took me a few years to figure out it was 100% true. The amazing customers absolutely do not outnumber or overshadow the monsters. One thing in retail I didn't realize was how amazingly helpful a good memory is. And believe me, back then especially, I had a phenomenal memory. We had to type in dissection codes and prices into a printer for barcodes and place them on stock. I very quickly got a reputation. See, most people would remember their specialty codes. They were 15 digits long. That is still good. A few seasoned, withered husks with manager name tags would remember a few other specialty codes. I had them memorized for the entire basement. Seven departments, hundreds of codes. They were formulaic per department, so once you remembered each department's formula, you just had the last four digits per dissection. After a while of being noted for this, I got moved from cook shop, global knives, LSE teapots, etc. into home care electricals, vacuums, pressure washers, and irons. You think a good memory is helpful for printing labels? I was like a walking thesaurus on that crap. I didn't gloat, but colleagues would use me often. Quicker to get OP than go into the office and check the catalog or Google something. Warranty info, user specs, power ratings, maintenance routines, all of it. And I enjoyed the prestige. I wasn't a dick about it. I happened to be perfectly positioned to excel in this because of my memory. I would gladly help out people rather than salesperson them if I could. That 900 pound machine, what would you use it for? Yeah, you can get that from this 100 pound machine instead. I didn't get commission and I brought return customers who liked me helping them. People liked a passionate teenage man helping them with all of the knowledge I could muster. One woman even wrote me a letter saying she would send flowers but didn't for fear of upsetting my wife if I had one. <laughs> She was about seven decades older than me, bless her heart, but I digress. Malicious compliance time. One day a woman came in, this was the aughts, but by today's standard, a Karen. Instant hatred of everything and everyone. My job is to help customers, so her distaste for existence and pleasure for misery really mattered not at all. She is picking up various generator irons on the shelf, inspecting them and looking out of her depth. These things can be used in-home, and some of the models we stocked you could use professionally. They started at expensive and went up to crazy money. It was pretty normal I would have to go through all of the specs for customers. If you're going to part with £249 for an iron, you want to know what you are getting for your money. I get it. So I walk over to her to help. Anything I can help you with today, madam? She looks at me like I'm a fart that has just gotten into an elevator with her. I want to buy an iron. Way to state the obvious, but the customer is always right, so I smile and go on. What type of iron are you looking for? Are you using it at home or professionally? It is for me to use. I am the woman of the household. Now, the way she stressed woman wasn't a gripe at her lot in life. It was more like when someone reminds you that this is their turf, their specialty, their baby. Hey, no problem by me. I'll see if I can help with that. No problem at all, this model here is normally used commercially, and you cannot access the water tank. Since it generates such a lot of pressure, you have to buy these CalStop cartridges to prevent lime scale buildup. Otherwise, the machine can break and won't be covered by your warranty. The benefit is the dry steam boost function for doing dresses, curtains, etc. without soaking them. By comparison, this one has a cartridge water chamber, which is easier to manage. However, yeah, can you get me a woman? Perplexed, I wonder what I said wrong. I needn't wait long to find out. She saw the look on my face and went on. It's just a woman really gets these things. You clearly wouldn't know. I am chanting in my head, customer is always right, and managing my breathing to stay composed. No problem, madam. Allow me to get my colleague Doreen to help you then. Now, the department was built around a big pillar, irons on the east face, vacuums on the south and west face. 
till and accessories on the north face. So I walked around the corner to the till and got Doreen to go help this delightful woman who decided I didn't know what I was talking about. I headed around to the west face to cover vacuums. Not two minutes later, I hear Doreen heading towards me saying, Honestly, you need my colleague. They are the absolute expert on irons and they know so much more about them than me, they will be able to find you the perfect iron. That woman's face as she realized it was me she was being brought to as the expert on irons was priceless. She fumbled a quick question on a Morphe Richards unit to justify coming back to me and then quickly hit the escalator to get the heck away from the awkward she had generated. Gee, it's really too bad that Karen got all steamed up when she asked for a female but instead needed Iron Man. <laughs> I bet that whole interaction got her a little hot under the collar, and I hope she didn't wrinkle her skirt on the way out. Alright, our first story today comes to us from Liberty or Death. Arrogant coach teacher threatened to send me to the principal? I obliged. Let's jump right in. This is over a decade ago. Time is a cruel mistress, so some details are foggy. Going into senior year of high school at a small rural high school where the smart kids all get sent off to the distance learning building their junior year and senior year to take college courses. Junior year, the woman in charge of us in distance learning had been teaching at our school district for 15 plus years. She knew us, our families, taught us in multiple grades, and coached about three quarters of us in track or tennis. Keep in mind, our entire student body, K-12, wouldn't have broken 500 kids, even if they padded the numbers with voluntary pre-K and GED students. She knew us, our antics, and generally trusted us to get our work done. She made sure we actually watched our classes and didn't get into a bind on our assignments. Outside of that, as long as we were doing something productive and had our main stuff done, our time was ours to use as we saw fit. In my case, it was mostly spent playing guitar and reading up on the playbook for whatever athletic competition I had that week. I was an academically good but insufferably lazy student. Summer passes, first day of senior year comes around, the teacher we all adored had moved away. Her husband got a job elsewhere that paid big money. In her place is some tall red-haired jackbutt none of us have ever seen before. Turns out he's the new head coach for girls basketball and our new distanced learning supervisor. Our college courses didn't start for a couple weeks, so he spent the entire first day pontificating on how lucky we all were to have him, since he had spent the last 10 years in the university world and knew how it worked and would make sure we weren't just slacking off because we were seniors. The fact that he went from university to high school should have been a red flag to the people that hired him. Whatever. A couple weeks go by of this coach, we'll call him Bob, making us do pointless practice assignments like writing a paper on respect in APA format or researching a new car for his wife while citing our sources. All under the guise of making sure we were prepared. The students all politely informed him that these courses were through a community college and were generally no more difficult than a normal AP high school class, except for the STEM courses. Fast forward two weeks and courses start, finally, we thought. Bob's antics throughout the year would have been bearable had he not made a habit of insulting students who did something that wasn't to his liking, or held a political view contrary to the university culture he came from, which was all of us. He went to demanding that we submit all assignments to him before our actual professors, which he then did not go through quickly causing a great many of us to lose points for late assignments. We started ignoring this and sending him a copy at the same time we submitted the assignment, and telling us all that we were in no way mature enough for this kind of learning. We all had to maintain an institutional GPA of 3.0 or better to stay in the program. We averaged 3.8, and if it was up to him, he'd take our entitled butts right back over to the main building for real classes. The straw that broke the camel's back came at the end of the fall semester. We'd all taken our finals, passed, and were looking forward to an easy few weeks. Bob came in that morning in a worse mood than usual. 
I found out years later this was the day his divorce proceedings began and started berating one of the girls for how she was dressed. She ignored him as did the rest of us. We all were just making it through to the end of the semester. Bob then began one of his speeches about how terrible and entitled we all were. No one was paying attention, which made him even more angry, but he knew he couldn't really punish us for anything. So he zeroed in on one kid that had been placed in the classroom for remedial learning as it was a quiet, consistent environment. He was the one student in the room actually working on something. The convo paraphrased as this was over 10 years ago went as follows. So what are you doing? Somewhat rudely, I'm trying to study for my test coming up so I don't get held back. For what? So you can eventually go flip burgers at the Dairy Queen? Makes a six-figure income as a welder now? Please, you're not going to get it done anyway, so have some respect and pay attention when an adult is speaking. That was it for me. You see, that student happened to be my cousin. I was intimately familiar with his academic and personal struggles and knew how hard he was working to straighten up. Our family is a rather well-known and affluent one in our community, and that student was cruelly regarded as a screw-up by some folks outside of our family, despite his overwhelmingly kind disposition. Now, this move-in crapstick was insulting the most vulnerable member of the class and my family. It was time to hurt this guy in the worst way I could think of without hurting myself too badly or getting arrested. You see, my mother had been teaching for 25 years in the district at that point, and my stepfather is a retired guidance counselor, so I knew the rules. I'd previously refrained from honestly discussing his conduct with my parents because Bob's daughter had actually become part of our friend circle, and I knew how hard life would be on her if her dad lost his job, as his reputation made her life hard enough. The college course's kids also did theater and athletics together, so she was part of our life. Again, tiny school, half the varsity offensive line, was part of a district-winning production of Flowers for Algernon, and our star running back, also a regional qualifier in robotics. But she was graduating with the rest of us and going to school out of state, so collateral damage would be minimal. Knowing what would happen next, I casually remarked, Coach Bob, it seems to me that if you knew half as much about basketball as you think you know about this student, you'd probably still have your job at the university, or would have gotten your contract renewed for another year at the last school board meeting. Where will you go after the school year ends? The room went dead quiet. That info wasn't in the newspaper yet. Bob's face turned an absolutely vibrant shade of red. His voice shaking, he tells me, outside, now. I calmly set down my book and stepped out into the foyer of the building. Bob followed me out, closed the door, and proceeded to scream every insult and cuss word he could think of in my face for at least four straight minutes. I was the most smug, lazy, entitled little crap he had ever seen, apparently. I may have been able to pull the wool over the eyes of my pastor, every other teacher, his daughter, and all my coaches who were constantly irritated with me for being lazy, but dang it, I couldn't fool him. I was never going anywhere in life, and I was just going to ride my family name like a parasite. To be honest, his lung capacity was kind of impressive. I don't think he took a single breath for the entirety of his rant. Once he stopped to catch his breath, I asked, Coach Bob, may I go back to reading now? Bob screamed, no, your butt is going straight to the principal, and I will write down exactly what you said, and you will sign the darn thing, do you understand? Yes, sir, I'd be happy to sign it. Bob gave me a questioning gaze. Actually, I'd be happy to go down to principal's office. I need to ask him for a letter of recommendation for a scholarship, and of course, he will ask me what led to me saying something so disrespectful. Of course, I can't lie to him, and then I'll mention our little chat out here. By this point, the teacher in the other classroom, who I also happened to be related to, came out to see what the commotion was and heard at least the tail end of his glorious speech. She was about to say something, but I turned and gave her a smile and wink. I had it in the bag. 18-year-old me was riding high. Bob sent me back into the distance learning room 
and followed me in. I stood by the door awaiting my office referral. A minute went by and it never came. Sit down, Jones. Coach Bob, I believe classroom insubordination requires an office referral. If that's the way you want to go, Bob's voice started to raise, but at this point he understood his situation. He wrote up the official referral and I walked happily down to the admin office. The principal was surprised to see me and even more surprised that I was sent there on disciplinary action. I told him what had happened and I got detention for one day as punishment for open disrespect of a teacher, which I kind of deserved, and a thank you for my honesty. The next two weeks were heavenly. Bob barely spoke a word and spent most of his time glaring at me or looking at job listings. At the start of the spring semester, he wasn't in distance learning. In fact, he was nowhere to be seen. Turned out, he'd accepted a last minute opportunity somewhere else before the Christmas break and had to move there in time for spring practices to start. What a coincidence. I found out years later that Bob was soon let go from his next coaching job and he had gotten divorced. Other faculty had apparently repeatedly complained about his conduct and he was on incredibly thin ice long before my little stunt. Honestly, I kind of feel sorry for the guy after writing this memory down. Congratulations to everyone that made it to the end. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Sufficient Display. It says, this is beautiful. Thanks for sticking up for your cousin, especially at 18. OP replied to this comment and said, he had done the same for me in an even less savory situation once. I mouthed off to a drunk idiot at a dance. Drunk's friends wanted a fight. Cousin rolls up out of nowhere and apparently had a reputation. Drunks went stumbling off into the night without a word. He owns a thriving little welding business now. I completely agree. Congrats to OP for standing up for their cousin. I mean, OP absolutely destroyed Bob and his self-esteem in one sentence. That was absolutely amazing. Our next story today comes to us from Rocketman3487. You want to fire me in the middle of my shift, but have me stay until the end? Okay, I'll bite. Let's jump right in. About 15 years ago when I was about 20, I got a job at a new Panera opening in my town. I worked there exactly five days. After two days of working the salad line and making sandwiches, which was honestly fun, I was told I was being moved to the kitchen. I didn't mind because I love to cook and bake, so I was excited for about a whole minute. When I showed up on my third day, I get walked to the kitchen. I'm so stoked. I stop at the chef line, but the manager keeps walking. I stop at the baker line, but the manager keeps walking. He stops in front of the dishwasher. He says, I'm going to be washing dishes for a couple days because they hadn't hired one yet. Or he quit instantly, but I'll never know that. I give it my do best attitude for two and a half days. It's a darn big pill to swallow. I suddenly realized the back end of a bakery and restaurant to be much harder than I ever thought. And I've worked in the back prior, just not at this level before. So mucho props to all of you back of the house workers. I have always worked counters, even maintenance, but never that hard. And I started to fail because I was feeling dejected and being talked down to. Come my third day on dishes and the last day at Panera, I show up on time and it was a pretty busy night, so there was lots to get to. I try so hard, but by then we're open, so freshly dirty plate tubs are coming back in groves. Starts piling up on the counter, then on the floor. Halfway through my shift, my lunch is late. Before I go to lunch, they pull me into the office and tell me they're letting me go like this. We're so sorry to say, but we have to let you go. You're just not keeping up. But would you please stay and finish your shift first? I was floored, but I did it, just not with my do best attitude. I proceed to wash one pan at a time in the industrial washer we have. More tubs are piling up, my coworkers asking what's going on. I explain and they understand and support thankfully, so even more tubs pile up, now on the floor before I even finish the pans. Come the end of my shift, 
I knew my managers were going to have to stay and wash the dishes, but they were courteous enough and told me that as a parting gift and thanks for trying, I could take home whatever I wanted from the store. So I did, over $120 I think in fresh breads and pastries of all delicious varieties. I gave most of it away. Heard from a friend like a year later they were pissed about that for a while but couldn't do anything which got them even more pissed. It wasn't my finest hour but I don't regret it one bit. Moral of the story, don't fire your employees mid-shift but ask them to stay and expect any kind of quality. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Southie and it's perfect. It says, Firing you for not keeping up as a dish pig was your giveaway that they had no intention of making you the dishwasher temporarily while they hired a permanent guy. That was you. That was going to be your full-time permanent position. When you couldn't keep up, they didn't switch you back to what they'd allegedly hired you to do. That was just the bait all along. So to me it sounds like OP actually dodged a bullet because according to the comment section down below this story, no one really gets promoted out of the dish pit to a better paid or more responsible kitchen position. They're just kept in that job until they get fed up and quit and then the next person takes over. OP, you seem to be a better person than I am though because you actually put some items through that industrial washer. I think in my case, I would have been finding random things from around the kitchen to put through there just to see what they look like when they come out the other side. Our last story today comes to us from Bored and Sleeps. Scrub the walls of the parking garage with a magic eraser? Okay, see ya in about 6 hours. Let's jump right in. Okay, so this happened about 3 years ago. I was working for a cleaning company in governmental buildings and FYI, this is a manager that I and plenty of other people had issues with. One day, I went into work like normal, everything was fine. My manager needed me to do some extra floors to vacuum. Sure, no problem. Told her that I didn't have that many floors to do and could do them after, just needed a list of the floors to vacuum. No argument from her, just an, mm, I'll have it for you after, and off to work I went. About two hours go by and I'm done my floors. I go to the office to get a list of the floors she needed me to do and turns out she needed me to do them early morning, news to me, and ended up sending someone else and I should have waited. Told her she never said it was time sensitive, otherwise I would have waited. She rolls her eyes and just repeats the same thing and that I still should have waited, but whatever, what's done is done. And when I ask her if there was anything else that needed to be done, she tells me to grab a bucket, some gloves, and some magic erasers and scrub the walls of the parking garage. There's five levels, and I knew that it wasn't part of the contract to clean it. Plus, this was a method she used as a form of punishment for insubordination. She expected me to have it all done by the end of my shift. I grabbed my stuff and did as told, but was only able to clean one level. By the end of my shift, I told her, along with my supervisor, that I was only able to do one level of the parking garage and that I would try to get more done tomorrow. Now, my supervisor had no idea that's where I was since she didn't tell him and was needed elsewhere for something more important that ended up not being done at all since no one could find me. Couldn't get a radio and signal sucks, so there's no texts or calls. He was livid. He asked everyone to leave, and then the very loud argument started. Why would you send her there? It's not even part of our contract. You were warned about pulling this crap on employees. She wasn't fired. Three strikes and then you're out kind of thing. But with the two higher ups, regional manager and regional supervisor, there with her the next day, was forced to apologize for what she made me do and wasting my time face to face. My only reply, thank you for your apology, but you didn't waste my time and money. It's the company's time and money that you wasted. Now, unless there's something else, I'll get my floors since I have a busy day of vacuuming and just left. She hasn't given me any trouble since. Unfortunately, in a lot of jobs, competent management is just really hard to find. But unless it's a safety issue, you should do what they ask and do it spectacularly. If the boss is bound and determined to suck, help them do it and you can highlight it for their higher ups. 
All right, our first story comes to us from Forest Dragon Slayer. Don't leave until the bathroom is spotless. You got it, boss. Let's jump right in. During my time of working at a grocery store, I went through multiple managers. Some were good and I got along with them and others not so much. The manager of this story wasn't the worst I've had, but I can definitely say she was the most annoying to deal with. She was one of those types that went, I don't know your duties all that well, but I will micromanage you and you have to do things my way, and got angry if we didn't do things her way, even if her way wasn't the most efficient. Around the time she started as manager, a new store policy was being implemented about cleaning the small public bathroom in the back of the store every two hours. Honestly, I was not against that. As the public bathroom was only a single toilet and sink, a quick mop and spray wouldn't take too long anyway, and cleanliness was made all the more important when COVID first started. Unfortunately, my manager's micromanaging came into play even here. Basically, if the place wasn't clean enough to eat off it, it wasn't clean according to her. Yes, somehow she expected that level of cleanliness every two hours whilst all of us are busy with our own work. It didn't help that occasionally there were doodles and other such on the walls that were hard to get out if not impossible with just normal cleaning supplies. I even remember that one time some guy used spray paint to do some graffiti in there. Anyway, one day it's my turn to clean the bathroom. At the time, it was considerably busy due to a lack of cashiers that day. As I was often used as a backup cashier at that point, I didn't have the time to do such a deep clean like my manager wanted at the first two hour mark. A bit later, my manager apparently must have saw the bathroom herself and she decided to pull me away to berate me. The following is an abridged version of what was said. Why didn't you clean the bathroom? You were supposed to earlier. I did, but I didn't have the time to deep clean everything. I had to help some customers at the cash register. There are some things I can't clean in there anyway. No excuses, you're not a full-on cashier anyway. Now go back and clean it again, and do it right this time. I want it to be spotless. Don't leave until you're done. Aye aye ma'am. And now it's finally time for the malicious compliance. As mentioned earlier, sometimes there were things on the walls that would just not come out with the cleaning materials we had on hand. Hence why we usually had a cleaning company do such deep cleaning at night. This naturally resulted in not being able to leave as I had no way of cleaning these things myself. So I just did my best to clean what I could and then just sat on the toilet doing stuff on my phone. I had nothing else to do after all and nowhere I could go. Of course, I wasn't mean spirited enough to make the customer's bladders suffer for my compliance so I did exit the bathroom when someone needed to use it, but I went back in afterwards. All in all, I didn't do much for the next five hours or so. I just got paid for sitting around on my phone and occasionally cleaning. Hooray for having a charger on hand. The fallout outside the bathroom, however, was much more eventful. Turns out that a bit after I was sentenced to being in my bathroom jail cell, one of the cashiers ended up clocking out for the day and another cashier had called out sick. That just left one cashier, technically two, but one has to run the self-checkout, and my manager to deal with the horde of customers wanting to check out during one of the busiest days of the week. As expected, I was called over the loudspeaker multiple times to come help, from that manager of all people. But I'm like, you ordered me to stay in here, so I'm staying in here and didn't respond to those calls. It didn't help that I knew she called because she just didn't want to do any cashier work. Eventually, that other cashier also ended up having to clock out for the day, so when normally me and the one who called out sick would be at the cash registers, my manager had to do this mostly by herself. Unfortunately, I couldn't see this in real time as I was in the back but I do hope she had to suffer a bit from angry, rude, and entitled customers. I ended up leaving my prison a bit after 8pm, which was after she left for the night. I hadn't had my lunch break after all, and I actually felt like helping after she was gone. During my next shift with her in charge, I got pulled into the office by her and sat down with another manager, I suppose as a witness or something. Once again, the below is the abridged version. 
Where were you that day? You didn't respond to any calls and nobody could find you. You must have left the store. I was simply following orders. Your orders, I might add. What are you talking about? You told me that I couldn't leave the bathroom until I made sure it was spotless. Well, it shouldn't have taken you that long. I did tell you there was stuff I couldn't clean with the supplies I had on hand, but you insisted. Even said you'd fire me if I didn't do it. Okay, the last part was a lie I made up to get the other manager in the room more on my side, but it also had the unintended effect of getting the micromanaging manager to nearly lunge at me and she started full on yelling at me. Despite willingly taking part in trying to piss her off with the malicious compliance, I still had some anxiety issues and they kicked in during this time. That was enough for the other manager to step in and stop this. In the end, I was just told I could go back to my normal duties and that I didn't have to keep the bathroom that clean. Unfortunately, my micromanaging manager didn't seem to get much more than a slap on the wrist. To be fair, it made sense as she didn't do much else besides yell at me and there was no physical altercation. But even then, I managed to have some fun before I left that job, for unrelated reasons, by simply watching her frustrated face knowing that she couldn't micromanage me as much anymore. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Voluntold9276. It says, Good story. If only you had known that only employees trained in biohazardous waste removal could be asked to clean a bathroom, you could have just said no when asked by micromanager. But then you wouldn't have this story to tell. OP responded to this comment and said, Huh, I did not know that. Then again, biohazard training could have been part of my employee training and I completely forgot since it's been a few years since I left. Even then though, the original task was simply mop the floor and make sure the bathroom isn't overly dirty. My manager was the one who decided to crank that up to insane levels. Now, I believe I've told this story before but this one brings me back to my time being a front end service clerk at a grocery store when I was 16 years old. Now, I got called front end service clerk to the back bathroom for a cleanup. And when I walked into that washroom, there was feces everywhere. And I mean everywhere. We're talking all over the floor, on the walls, even on the painting on the wall. I'm not sure how that happened. After bringing a couple more people in to see the carnage, we decided to grab the sanitation hose that was in the meat department, which happened to be right next to the bathroom dragged it over to the bathroom and sprayed that whole darn thing down. That painting would never be recovered, but the bathroom did get clean. Although I'm not quite sure how many rules we broke and I'm glad the health department never heard of what we did.